This is Audible. Brought to you by Penguin. Barbarossa, How Hitler Lost the War by Jonathan Dimbleby Read by Jonathan Dimbleby Preface Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941 was the biggest, bloodiest, and most barbarous military enterprise in the history of warfare. The specific purpose of Operation Barbarossa as the Führer codenamed this cataclysmic venture, was also the most decisive campaign of the Second World War. Had Hitler achieved its objective, the annihilation of the Soviet Union, he would have been the master of Europe's destiny. As it was, by the time his armies had reached the gates of Moscow less than six months later, any prospect he might once have had of realising his delusional vision of a thousand-year Reich had already vanished. The Wehrmacht, the collective name for the German Army, Navy and Air Force, would of course go on to launch further major offensives and secure many dramatic victories as the war progressed. But these were ephemeral triumphs. By the end of 1941, at the very latest, the Nazis had already lost any realistic chance of winning the war. For three and a half more years, the soil of Eastern Europe would be saturated in the blood of tens of millions of people, victims of a hideous endgame, the outcome of which had already been ordained. Disconcerting though it may be for those who, for understandable reasons, assert that the valiant Allied troops who landed on the Normandy beaches in June 1944 became the principal agents of victory over Hitler, the evidence is otherwise. It was the Great Patriotic War, as Stalin called the struggle on Germany's Eastern Front, not D-Day, that settled Hitler's fate. This is not remotely to suggest that those who offered their lives in that latter endeavour did so in vain. On the contrary, it is to them above all that countless millions of their fellow citizens in Western Europe owe the freedom and democracy that the Soviet dictator was to deny to their neighbours who were later to fall under the Kremlin's sphere of influence. That Stalin was able to bend so much of post-war Europe to his will sprang from the fact that it was his soldiers, not his Western allies, who broke the Third Reich on the battlefield. Although the timing and the manner of the final destruction of the Nazis was determined in concert by the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, the failure of Operation Barbarossa was the most important terminus of the war in Europe, the point at which, after less than six months of intense struggle, Nazism's demise became inevitable. It is also not to diminish the scale of suffering endured during the First World War, when the Battle of the Somme alone claimed more than a million casualties in a little under five months or in other struggles during the Second World War, when the Battle of Stalingrad claimed a similar number of casualties in the same period. To note that the long history of military conflict cannot yield a scale of carnage to compare with that of Operation Barbarossa, when, within a comparable time span, around six times that number of young men were listed as killed, wounded, or missing in action. The Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union took Stalin by surprise and sent shockwaves around the world. It was almost universally assumed that the Red Army would crumble within weeks. But the German triumphalism proved premature. This book charts the progress of Operation Barbarossa from its inception until Hitler's armies reached the capital at the end of the year. It does not attempt to explore every one of the scores of battles fought on three fronts in a vast military theatre. In this respect, its focus is on Army Group Centre, the force that spearheaded the invasion and which was to lead the assault on Moscow. 
In charting the progress of this army group, I draw extensively on the reports, diaries, letters and memoirs of its leading protagonists, including its commander, General Fedor von Bock, his field commanders, who included the Third Reich's most celebrated panzer general, Heinz Guderian, and the officers and men serving under them. Many of these men wrote to their loved ones with guileless candour about the fear and elation of battle, the killing, the camaraderie, their longing for home, their endless marches across an arid terrain in searing summer heat, the cloying mud of autumn that brought vehicles to a standstill and trapped foot soldiers and the horses that were used to pull artillery carriages in its glutinous embrace, and the Arctic winter, where temperatures fell to minus 35 degrees centigrade and tens of thousands lost limbs to frostbite. Far from proving to be a recipe for certain victory, Operation Barbarossa became a cauldron of bitter disputation between the generals at the front and army high command at the rear. As this schism deepened, the army chief of staff, Hans Holder, sought in vain to mediate between them and the Wehrmacht's mercurial commander-in-chief, Hitler, a nightmare task about which he wrote openly in his daily war diary. Like those battles fought by army groups north and south, army group centers campaign against the Soviet armies, led for the most part by Stalin's greatest commander, General Georgi Zhukov, was relentless, arduous and ferocious. But it was not a conventional conflict, either in scale or in character. The Eastern Front was a battlefield on which courage was conspicuous and duty was sacrosanct, but where neither side paid more than scant regard to the niceties of common humanity. In place of chivalry, there was hatred, a reductive atavism that was inflamed by the peremptory and implacable directives that poured forth from Hitler and Stalin. These not only sought to direct the course of the military struggle, but also insisted that no quarter should be given and no mercy shown. The rules of warfare as defined in the prevailing Geneva Conventions were ignored in this titanic struggle between the continent's two tyrannical behemoths. The invading armies had been repeatedly instructed that their enemy belonged to an inferior species of humanity, and their troops reacted accordingly. On and off the battlefield, Soviet soldiers and civilians alike were routinely subjected to acts of horrific brutality. Torture and murder by the troops under their command were routinely overlooked by the Wehrmacht's senior officers, who on frequent occasions presided over what was effectively the summary execution of those found to be political commissars, spies or partisans. Such murderous excesses by the Ostheer, Army of the East, were reciprocated in full measure by Soviet troops, who had no qualms about treating Germans as violent criminals against whom no punitive measures were too extreme to merit sanction. On both sides, a lethal combination of loathing and fear gave license to rare savagery. The descriptions of such incidents, proffered by those who participated in them or who watched on without demur, were notably self-serving, often defiant, and only occasionally laced with shame or disgust. No account of Operation Barbarossa can afford to sidestep this overwhelming evidence of a terrible truth. Most of those serving in the Red Army fought either from patriotism or to recover their homelands, others from ideological conviction, but all in the knowledge that Stalin's regime ruled as much by terror as by consent. The Soviet dictator's paranoid conviction that he was surrounded by ideological saboteurs was allied to a pitiless indifference to the life of others. In war as in peace, he was swift to exact mortal retribution on those who displeased him. Generals were subjected to summary execution or arbitrary imprisonment. Those who fled the battlefield or surrendered, even in the face of insuperable odds, faced the death penalty. Their families punished, not only by that disgrace, but also by losing livelihoods and pension rights. 
At Stalin's behest, the Stavka, the Soviet military high command, established blocking units that were deployed behind the front to shoot down those men who withdrew en masse rather than be mown down by the advancing enemy. Yet, the Soviet leader managed to secure the allegiance of the overwhelming majority of the population as they rallied to the cause. As their letters and memoirs, some of which have only recently been recovered from the secret depths of the Soviet archives, reveal, soldiers and civilians endured with the stoic resolve of men and women who were united against the invaders. Many of Moscow's major landmarks were shrouded by camouflage, and the city was placed under curfew. Under constant aerial bombardment, workers managed to dismantle thousands of strategically vital industrial plants, transporting them to safety in the Urals, where they were soon back in full production and at a rapidly accelerating rate of output. In the autumn of 1941, as the Germans threatened the outer ring of Moscow's inadequate defences, the capital was placed under a state of siege. Miscreants, or those who breached the curfew, were shot on sight. Under Zhukov's overall direction, tens of thousands of ill-equipped volunteers, men and women young and old, worked with dogged resolve to shore up the city's inner barricades digging trenches and tank traps in the deep mud or frozen ground of a harsh Russian winter. A regime that ruled by terror alone would never have been able to command the allegiance of a people without whose commitment defeat would have been certain. The crimes against humanity committed on the battlefield by both sides were dwarfed in scale by the atrocities committed by the Nazis behind the lines. Soviet troops who survived to become prisoners of war were force-marched into captivity. Abused, beaten, and whipped along the way, they were also denied medicines, food, and water. Tens of thousands died before reaching the makeshift prison camps into which they were herded like animals to huddle behind barbed wire and where they lacked shelter or sanitation or any other of the most basic means of survival. Denied nourishment, some prisoners resorted to cannibalism, but the great majority starved to death. This book chronicles a pitiless brutality that formed an integral part of Operation Barbarossa. By May 1945, some three million Soviet soldiers had died in captivity. Two-thirds of these men died from starvation or at the barrel of a gun before the end of 1941. And there was even worse. In the eastern territories that the Wehrmacht brought under Nazi control in 1941, four Einsatzgruppen, task forces or action squads, led by senior commanders, roamed from city to city and town to town, authorised to commit mass murder. The establishment of the Einsatzgruppen was approved by Hitler and organised by Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich, who, as head of the SS and chief of the Reich Main Security Office respectively, were the principal architects of the Holocaust. Initially, under orders to execute Jews in party and state positions, the death squads were soon encouraged to kill any Jews, men, women and children, with indiscriminate fervour. The commanders of the Einsatzgruppen were competitive zealots, striving to outdo one another with higher and higher rates of execution. At their instruction, the victims were rounded up, robbed of their belongings, killed by firing squads, and buried in mass graves. These killers did not operate alone. The most senior generals in the Wehrmacht, despite their vehement post-war protestations to the contrary, were not only aware of the Einsatzgruppen's role, but also, in many cases, complicit in facilitating it. In every one of the countries invaded by Hitler during Operation Barbarossa, regular soldiers, indigenous police forces and local militia combined to assist the killers in their task. There is copious evidence of this from official orders and accounts as well as reports from the perpetrators themselves and statements from eyewitnesses and those few victims who survived. These testimonies are as incontrovertible 
as they're dreadful. No adequate description of Operation Barbarossa should exclude them. In the early weeks of the invasion, this commitment to murder was not matched by efficiency. Gradually, though, the killers streamlined their operations until they perfected a systematic means of shooting large numbers of men, women and children at speed. Macabre achievements, which they reported to their superiors in cold statistical detail. Within six months of the Nazi invasion, and after a series of gruesome experiments with various kinds of poison gas, the first death camps, among them Auschwitz-Birkenau, came into operation. The industrialization of mass murder had begun. By Christmas 1941, the first million victims of Hitler's final solution had been exterminated, either with guns or in gas chambers. It is a grotesque irony that the most unspeakable crime of the 20th century was the sole element in the Führer's apocalyptic vision for the Third Reich, that until the closing months of the war was not unduly impeded by defeat on the battlefield. To bypass this aspect of Operation Barbarossa would be to avoid identifying one of its most direct and immediate outcomes. A full account of Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union requires consideration of its cause as well as its effect. Operation Barbarossa did not take place in a historical vacuum, but was the direct outcome of a high-wire political drama that began following the First World War and the unresolved miseries that engulfed Europe in its aftermath. For that reason, perhaps to the surprise of some readers, Part one of this book opens in the spring of 1922, when the Soviet Union and Germany, so recently at each other's throats on the First World War battlefields and treated thereafter as pariah states by the rest of Europe, signed a Treaty of Reconciliation. The European democracies were aghast. The treaty was a diplomatic coup de main that left the British Prime Minister Lloyd George floundering. His painstaking efforts to build a continent-wide consensus in favour of sustainable economic development and thereby peace and security was in tatters. To disentangle the interwoven strands of the political drama that was played out subsequently on the European stage, it is hard to make any sense of Operation Barbarossa otherwise, is to lay bare the arrogance and fear that led the disunited democracies of Western Europe to regard the Soviet Union with an aversion that not only precluded a meaningful dialogue with the Kremlin, but also led most of them to regard Germany's unhinged Führer as the lesser of two evils. From the ruins of Versailles to the rise of Hitler in Germany and Stalin's murderous consolidation of power in the Soviet Union, all the way to the shock of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in August 1939, the official papers, letters, diaries and memoirs of the chief protagonists illuminate only too starkly the irreconcilable or unobtainable objectives that left Europe's leaders at a loss, while the continent drifted ineluctably towards a second conflagration that no one wanted, except Hitler and possibly Stalin, whose main objective was to avoid direct involvement, but which none of them could stop. Within a year of starting the Second World War, not only had the German panzers subjugated most of Western Europe, but Hitler had also decided to postpone the invasion of Britain in favour of destroying the Soviet Union first. There were multiple reasons for this fateful decision, but the trigger for launching Operation Barbarossa lay in the Balkans. This book therefore highlights the bitter contest between Moscow and Berlin to control that combustible and strategically vital region of Europe. When the direct negotiations between the Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov and Hitler reached a testy impasse at the end of November 1940, the Führer ordered his generals to make detailed plans for the invasion of the Soviet Union for the following spring. In June 1941, by which time he had occupied Yugoslavia, and driven the British out of Greece, he found himself at war on two fronts at once. Operation Barbarossa 
was thus not quarantined from what was rapidly becoming a global conflict, which is the crucial context within which I framed the invasion. Within hours of the news that the Wehrmacht was on the warpath within the Soviet Union, Churchill, followed in less grandiloquent terms by Roosevelt a few days later, declared his unequivocal support for the Soviet cause. Before long, both Washington and London found themselves in an unlikely alliance with the world's only communist state, the three leaders soon becoming known as the Big Three. This was a seismic rapprochement that not only had a direct impact on the war on the Eastern Front, but on the post-war history of Europe. For that reason, my account of Operation Barbarossa also focuses on the intense human and political drama of this turbulent, often acrimonious, but critically important three-way partnership, as diplomatic emissaries from Washington and London traipsed into the Kremlin to parley with the mercurial Soviet dictator. Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union changed the course of history. As its subtitle suggests, this book was conceived in the belief that the last six months of 1941 were of greater moment than any other period in the 20th century. Operation Barbarossa was not only a fatal gamble, but it was also how Hitler lost the war. Part 1. The Slide to War Chapter 1. Paving the Way Over the Easter weekend of 1922, the elegant resort of Rapallo on the Italian Riviera was thronged with affluent Italians who favoured the balmy climate along this part of the Mediterranean coast. The town's quietude and lack of vulgarity had long appealed to foreigners as well, and especially to those with cultural sensibilities. It was in the lanes around Rapallo that the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche first incubated the ideas that were later to form the basis of his magnum opus, the novel Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which was widely regarded as impenetrable. Among others to have enjoyed the town's reticent streets and discreet cafes were Guy de Maupassant and Lord Byron. Its contemporary habitués included Ezra Pound and the English essayist Max Beerbohm, who was renowned for his dandified caricatures of the English upper classes. Rapallo was graced by a ruined monastery, an ancient basilica with a leaning bell tower, numerous medieval churches, and the remains of two castles, one of which was on a rocky promontory at the edge of the harbour, where it had once stood sentinel against marauding pirates. For the louche, there was also a sprinkling of discreet casinos and an occasional nightclub. The most imposing building of all was the Neo-Palladian Excelsior Palace Hotel, which boasted more than 140 rooms and a bathing establishment overlooking the sea. The hotel was greatly preferred by the reticent rich and international diplomats in search of privacy and discretion. It was here on that Easter weekend that the German Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau and the Soviet Union's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Georgi Chicharin, sat down together with their delegations to put the final touches to an agreement between their two governments that had been in secret negotiation for several weeks. As they would certainly have been aware, the Rapallo Treaty, as it was called, was a diplomatic time bomb which was primed to detonate on Easter Monday just under 40 kilometres along the coast in the city of Genoa. Its effect was to be devastating, the collateral damage irreparable. As he strode through the jostling mass of cameras and newsmen into the great conference chamber in the 13th century Palazzo San Gorgio in Genoa on the afternoon of Monday the 10th of April 1922, the British Prime Minister Lloyd George was quite unaware of what was being hatched in Rapallo. He exuded confidence and resolve. After a sustained bout of shuttle diplomacy, he had managed to cajole 34 fractious European nations into attending a great conference at which he hoped their deep animosities would be reconciled by an international treaty 
that under his presiding genius would finally restore order and prosperity to a fractured continent. The scale of Lloyd George's ambition was boundless. In the House of Commons before his departure for Italy, he declared that Europe was broken into fragments by the devastating agency of war, and that his purpose at Genoa was nothing less than the reconstruction of the entire continent. In that spirit, he had timed his entrance into the palazzo for maximum impact, confident that the assembled delegates would rise to reward his endeavours with a prolonged ovation, as they did. The British Prime Minister was not only a flamboyant politician who shone in the limelight, but also a man of genuine strategic vision and imagination. As one of the leaders of the four Allied powers, Britain, France, Italy and the United States, who had wrangled their way towards the Treaty of Versailles three years earlier, he had been among the first to realise that the Paris Peace Conference had done nothing to heal the gaping wounds of the Great War and very little to prevent them festering with potentially cataclysmic consequences. At best, the Versailles Treaty had wrapped a bandage round a separating lesion. It had imprinted new boundaries on the map of Europe, carving out a myriad independent states from diverse regions that for the last half-century or more had suppressed their internal ethnic and cultural animosity under the tutelage of four competing imperial autocracies. The European balance of power, a concept forged by the Austrian Chancellor Prince Clemens von Metternich and his Holy Alliance in the early 19th century, and elaborated by the German Empire's Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck with his proclamation of the Second Reich in 1871, was already crumbling well before 1914. By the end of the Great War, it had collapsed entirely. At Versailles, the Austro-Hungarian Empire that had once held chaotic sway over a swathe of central and southern Europe was dismembered. Only its fairy tale capitals, Vienna and Budapest, served as reminders of the lost imperial splendour of the Habsburgs. Similarly, the Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe, which had been fraying at the edges well before the outbreak of war, saw its Balkan possessions confiscated by the victors and redistributed among its quarrelsome constituent parts. The turbulent despotism of the Russian Empire had succumbed to a Bolshevik revolution. Tsar Nicholas II, the last of the Romanovs, had been assassinated, and the largest nation on the continent was now consumed by civil war. No less spectacularly, the German colossus that under the last of the Kaisers, Wilhelm II, had bestrode Europe for a generation, was broken and humiliated. The peoples of Europe, who had previously endured the certainty of imperial edicts, were adrift amidst the swirling detritus of a war in which there had been more than 40 million casualties, including some 10 million soldiers killed on the battlefield and more than 6 million civilians behind the front lines. A further 10 million people had been internally displaced or were criss-crossing the new borders hastily established at Versailles as refugees in search of safety, shelter and food. Though some countries enjoyed a post-war boom that engendered a cautious optimism, much of Europe's economy lay in ruins. With unemployment rampant and a destitution commonplace, grief and misery prevailed. It gradually became clear that Versailles foundering on the rocks of high-minded self-delusion, had failed to achieve its brave purpose, the creation of a bedrock for the resolution of this existential crisis. The most ambitious vision to be mooted at the Paris Peace Conference had been the creation of an international forum for global security, based on the assumption that all states might be persuaded to replace their instinct for self-preservation with the disinterested quest for international harmony. In deference to President Woodrow Wilson's romantic notion that thereby the world could finally be made safe for democracy, this morally impeccable vision was embodied at Versailles by the formation of the League of Nations. This was a grandiose scheme 
but far too fragile to withstand the violent aftershocks of the 1914-18 earthquake. Its fragility had become cruelly apparent soon after President Wilson returned from Versailles to Washington, boasting to the Senate that, at last, the world knows America as the saviour of the world. This hubris may have flattered some American egos, relieved to be advised that their sons had not died on the European battlefield in vain. But the great majority of U.S. senators were underwhelmed. More than that, they chose to adopt the guiding precept of their most revered founding father, George Washington, that the United States should in future avoid entangling alliances with any other nation. Congress therefore refused either to endorse Wilson's commitment to the League of Nations, which in consequence was terminally enfeebled, or to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, wherein it had been begotten. For almost two decades thereafter, the United States all but withdrew from the front line of European diplomacy in favour of a policy of detached neutrality, intervening only spasmodically and self-interestedly in the affairs of what for many Americans had become a faraway continent about which they knew little and cared rather less. It would not be until the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939 that President Roosevelt felt strong enough politically to inform a reluctant Congress that entangling alliances had once again become unavoidable. In the meantime, the Europeans would have to find their own salvation. Far from making Europe safe for democracy, the Versailles Treaty served only to aggravate the tensions that for numerous reasons were very soon to envelop Europe. After many weeks of anguished and often angry wrangling, the victors finally confirmed the tribute to be exacted from the vanquished German Leviathan. In the hope of eliminating forever the threat of German revanchism, the newly constituted Reich, whose leaders had been excluded from the negotiations that sealed their fate, was to be stripped of all its conquests, hobbled militarily, weakened economically, and punished financially. When the elected leaders of the Weimar Republic were summoned to hear the sentence imposed on them, their worst premonitions were confirmed. Their nascent democracy was required to surrender a great swathe of territory that either had formed part of Germany's 19th century empire or had been conquered during the war. Alsace and Lorraine were to be returned to France. The Rhineland was to be occupied by the Allies. The Saarland was to be placed under French administration for 15 years, and further territories were to be surrendered to Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Poland and Lithuania. It took five years before all the complex sessions of territory devised at Versailles were finally put in place. Though Versailles left the Reich still in possession of the largest land mass in Europe to the west of the Soviet Union, the Germans felt as though their great nation had been dismembered, an indignity compounded by the decision of the Allied powers to confiscate their African colonies as well. The Reichswehr, the German defence force, was to be so pinioned as to turn an imperial war-making machine into a military police force, equipped with no more than 100,000 men and forbidden to manufacture or maintain armoured cars, tanks or warplanes. Even more controversially, the so-called War Guilt Clause imposed a punitive scale of financial reparations to compensate for the destruction that the Kaiser's belligerence had provoked. In the relevant section of the Versailles Treaty, the opening paragraph, Article 231, stated, The Allied and Associated Governments affirm and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected, as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. The hapless leaders of the Weimar Republic faced a simple choice, either to accept these surrender terms or face invasion and occupation by the Allied powers. They duly signed along the dotted line. Although this retribution was less extortionate than the victims would claim, 
Germany was not left quite as prostrate and helpless as was widely presumed. It was enough to incubate a deep bitterness in the national psyche at what was generally regarded as a cruel and vindictive punishment for crimes for which they believed they had not been responsible. For different but no less divisive reasons, Russia had also been excluded from the Paris Peace Conference. Like President Wilson, Lloyd George was prone to sympathise with the uprising of the Russian proletariat against the tyranny of the Tsars, which, he believed, sprang from a legitimate demand for a radical change from centuries of oppression. To say that we ourselves should pick the representatives of a great people was contrary to every principle for which we had fought, he advised the French Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau. In so saying, he reflected a widespread popular attitude across Europe, as well as in Britain. However, Clemenceau, who had been unyielding in his insistence that Germany deserved the punitive measures imposed at Versailles, insisted that any diplomatic dalliance with the Bolsheviks would feed a nascent appetite for revolution among Europe's impoverished and alienated working classes. The French leader's disdain was echoed with great force by the British Secretary of State for War, Winston Churchill, who did not shrink from giving public expression to his animosity in the most colourful terms. Civilization, Churchill boomed into a crowd at an election rally in November 1918, is being completely extinguished over gigantic areas, while Bolsheviks hop and caper like troops of ferocious baboons amid the ruins of cities and the corpses of their victims. Unlike Lloyd George, Churchill believed that far from being biddable, the new regime in Moscow was hell-bent on revolutionary conquest. Of all the tyrannies in history, the Bolshevik tyranny is the worst, the most destructive, the most degrading, he instructed an audience in London, an outburst that prompted Lloyd George to reflect dryly. His ducal blood revolted against the wholesale elimination of grand dukes in Russia. Ducal blood or not, in due course, the future Prime Minister would be forced by events to adopt a very different tone towards the regime in Moscow. The European consensus in favour of excluding the Russians as well as Germany from Versailles had been too strong for Lloyd George to resist. Even as the Paris delegates dotted the I's and crossed the T's of the treaty, 180,000 Allied troops drawn from Western armies were still meddling in the Russian Civil War, which had erupted following the 1917 revolution. The Allied support for the white Russians against the Bolsheviks did not lack purpose, but was without a coherent strategy. In the course of 12 months, the troops had managed to advance in a crab-like fashion towards an obscure objective, only to be withdrawn soon after Versailles, for no discernible reason except to demonstrate their lack of resolve. Thereby, they not only failed to divert the leaders of the fledgling communist state from their revolutionary path, but also confirmed Moscow's deepening sense that the West was united in seeking to frustrate and, if possible, undermine the revolution by any means that might from time to time come to hand. In the years ahead, Stalin's paranoia served merely to aggravate this well-grounded suspicion. By the time of the Genoa Conference, it was clearer than ever to Lloyd George that the two largest states on the continent could no longer be treated as outcasts. They were too big, too populous, and too explosively unstable to ignore. Both pariah states would have to be brought in from the cold. Without their presence at the negotiating table, he believed it would be impossible to reconnoitre a way out of the worsening European crisis or to construct a sustainable framework for stability across the continent. Conversely, with a foresight evidently denied his fellow leaders, he feared that perpetual isolation would drive Germany and the Soviet Union to put aside their ideological differences in favour of forming a close economic and strategic partnership, which, were it to prosper, would destroy Europe's fragile equilibrium. In the months leading up to Genoa, 
he had therefore expended a great deal of political capital in arm-twisting the French into accepting Germany's presence at the conference table, while simultaneously overriding the repugnance of several other participants, not least conservative members of his own rickety coalition, at the very thought of sitting alongside Bolshevik revolutionaries. Although Moscow and Berlin were not strong enough to boycott Genoa, neither was gratified by the invitation to attend Lloyd George's conference. They arrived in Italy with little expectation of being released from the handcuffs the Allied powers had placed on them at Versailles. A few days earlier, the Prime Minister had informed Chicherin that the Soviet Union would receive economic assistance only if the Kremlin agreed to repay the huge debts and loans to the West accumulated by the Tsarist regime before the revolution. Chicherin was a cultivated intellectual who had inherited great wealth. He had travelled widely and spoke every major European language. He had written a book about Mozart, and he admired Nietzsche, though whether he was aware that Rapallo was one of the philosopher's favourite watering holes was not known. He'd also been one of Lenin's closest confidants and a dedicated Bolshevik. He was evidently thin-skinned as well as quick to sense a slight. Inadvertently, the Italians gave him an opportunity to take offence by billeting his party, along with the Germans, well away from the main conference centre in Genoa. Before his arrival, the Manchester Guardian's well-connected Moscow correspondent Arthur Ransom, soon to become famous as the author of the Swallows and Amazons series of children's books, wrote that Chicherin had formally protested that the only communication with Genoa is a long road especially convenient for assassination. It may be impossible for us to go to Genoa if we have to run a daily gauntlet. His protest was ignored. If he needed proof, this was yet one more example of the West's disdain for the Soviet Union. Chicherin's German counterpart, Rathenau, who had only been appointed to the post in January, was a prominent Jewish industrialist. A liberal intellectual, he was renowned for his tolerance and integrity. He was also insistent that Germany should honour the terms of the Versailles Treaty, disagreeable as these were. For this, as well as for advocating dialogue with the Soviet Union, he was regarded politically as being on the extreme left. He had every bit as much justification to fear assassination as Chicherin. In the run-up to the Genoa conference, he had even written of his premonition that he might be murdered by one or another group of fanatics. Though he abhorred Bolshevism, which he mocked for seeking to impose compulsory happiness on the Russian people, he believed that economic and political cooperation with the Soviet Union would prevent German ultra-nationalists from seizing the political agenda to demand the creation of a greater Germany. From the Reich's perspective, a deal with the Kremlin also made practical sense. France had not relented in the three years following Versailles. The Quai d'Orsay, as the French foreign ministry was universally known, continued to insist that the Reich would have to pay the reparations bill in full, an intransigence which had severely constrained Lloyd George's room for diplomatic manoeuvre. Although the British Prime Minister had been much influenced by the eminent economist John Maynard Keynes, who'd resigned from the Treasury in protest at the abhorrent and detestable punishment inflicted on the Reich at Versailles, he had little choice but to tell the German government that, whatever else he might conjure out of the ether, it would not be possible to negotiate any reduction in what he regarded as a crippling drain on the Reich's exhausted Treasury. Despite their differences, Moscow and Berlin thus had more than enough common ground to negotiate an agreement that might allow them jointly to circumvent the humiliations of Versailles and to liberate themselves from the perpetual impoverishment of isolation and debt imposed on them by the victors of the Great War. Their search for reconciliation required only that the continent's two behemoths reopen ancient links and adapt them to fit these different times. Before the First World War, when Austro-Hungary, the Ottomans, Russia and Germany, the central powers that still held sway across the continent, 
circled one another, making and unmaking alliances to balance their overlapping but competitive interests. The relationship between Russia and Germany had been artfully calibrated to avoid conflict. Thanks to Bismarck's ingenuity, they had even signed a secret treaty in 1887, aptly named the Reinsurance Treaty, under which they agreed to maintain a relationship of benevolent neutrality and, under certain circumstances, to offer each other military support. Though the treaty itself collapsed with the Iron Chancellor's dismissal three years later, cordial diplomatic relations, underpinned by family bonds and mutually advantageous economic ties, persisted until the eve of the First World War. The 1922 Rapallo Treaty was thus a revival of a Bismarckian realpolitik that required Moscow and Berlin to see beyond the bitter legacy of the First World War. Only four years earlier, in February 1918, German troops had crossed the Russian border, threatening to occupy a great swathe of a country already crippled by civil war. With this sword of Damocles hanging over him, Lenin had been forced by Berlin to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk on 3rd of March 1918, the terms of which were every bit as harsh as those that soon afterwards Germany was required to accept at the Paris Peace Conference. Yet, almost as soon as the Versailles Treaty had been agreed, neither the Reich nor the Soviet Union, in true 19th century style, had qualms about opening secret talks to re-establish the pre-war economic ties that had been so valuable to both states before 1914. Bizarrely, these negotiations were initially masterminded from a Berlin prison. In December 1918, Karl Radek, a Marxist revolutionary, had been sent to Germany at Lenin's behest to assist the nascent Communist Party led by Rosa Luxemburg in fermenting revolutionary change in a nation seething with discontent. Radek was not discreet. Soon after his arrival, the tension between the dominant Socialist Party and the Communists erupted into open warfare on the streets. The Spartacist uprising in January 1919 led to the deaths of at least 160 insurgents and civilians, as well as more than 30 casualties among the paramilitaries sent in by the government to crush the rebellion. Luxembourg was captured and summarily executed. Radek was more fortunate. He was arrested and incarcerated in a Berlin jail. Despite the punitive terms of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, which had been nullified by Germany's defeat in the war, Berlin's attitude towards Moscow was guided by a new realpolitik. Since both Germany and the Soviet Union saw themselves as victims of Versailles, a mutually beneficial relationship began to seem highly desirable. To mark this shift, the German authorities moved Radek to distinctly superior surroundings in another part of the Moabit prison, where he was treated like a senior diplomat rather than a dangerous criminal he was allowed to establish what he described as a political salon, where leading German industrialists and government officials came to confer with him, including the foreign minister, Rathenau. By the time of his release from prison and his return to Moscow in 1920, his diplomacy had started to bear fruit. A succession of trade delegations, which notably included Europe's largest company, the arms manufacturer Friedrich Krupp AG, were soon hustling back and forth between the two countries to restore their lucrative pre-war operations. In the post-Versailles period, numerous reports of these burgeoning commercial ties surfaced in the European and American press. In the months before Genoa, a flurry of rumours and press reports had started to circulate in Berlin to the effect that a formal agreement between the Soviet Union and Germany was in the offing. Despite this, the idle and incompetent British ambassador in the German capital, Lord Dabernon, either failed to read the runes or was remarkably insouissant about their import. Either way, he neglected to alert London. As a result, the Prime Minister was in blissful ignorance of the Soviet-German negotiations until he was told about the Rapallo Treaty on that fateful Easter Monday. His dismay at the news was matched by his fury. As a pioneer of personal diplomacy, 
he had staked his credibility as an international statesman on a successful outcome to the Genoa Conference. Nor was it ever far from his mind that a new pan-European treaty would do much to restore his own reputation at home, giving much-needed new life to the tarnished glitter of his prime ministerial career. The Welsh wizard, who was widely held to have won the war, had every intention of being crowned as the man who also won the peace. As soon as he heard of the Moscow-Berlin deal that had been sealed behind his back in Rapallo, he knew that these hopes were in ruins. He was not yet aware of the terms of the treaty, nor did he need to be. It was enough that it had been signed. He was outraged, but he should not have been surprised. Three years earlier, in the days before the leaders of the United States, Britain, Italy and France put their signatures to the Versailles Treaty, he had sent a private note to Georges Clemenceau, warning him that the harsh punishment France wished to inflict on the defeated aggressor would drive Germany to throw in her lot with Bolshevism and place her resources, her brains, her vast organising power at the disposal of the revolutionary fanatics whose dream it is to conquer the world for Bolshevism by force of arms. On Easter Monday, 1922, it looked very much as if something of that kind had just been agreed. Lloyd George's chagrin was intense. At a formal dinner for the delegates, he berated the leaders of the German delegation and publicly accused Rathenau of duplicity. The Prime Minister's wrath was laced with despair. All that he had worked to achieve in ten fraught weeks of international diplomacy lay in tatters. When he heard what had happened, even the notoriously two-faced Foreign Secretary, Lord Curzon, who loathed Lloyd George, was moved to note disgustedly, we seem to be relapsing into the deepest slime of pre-war treachery and intrigue. Characteristically, Lloyd George soon recovered his poise, contriving to paste over the truth with a glossy varnish of Welsh oratory that deceived no one. After a further three days of rambling debate, the New York Times reported that the conference has seemed to feel itself in the shadow of failure, and the various delegations have been casting about to decide upon whom to fix the responsibility. It is like a party broken up by a mischievous boy, and the question is, who must be pronounced the guilty one? By the time the diplomats filed out of the Palazzo San Gorgio for the last time on 19th of May, it was plain to all that nothing of note had been achieved. Not only had Genoa been an irredeemable flop, doomed to be the last conference of its type for a generation, but Lloyd George returned to London without that peace for our time message he required to convince colleagues in his already disintegrating coalition that he had any future as Prime Minister. He was duly ousted in October 1922, never again to return to the front line of British politics. The man he had castigated for duplicity also paid dearly for putting his name to the Rapallo Treaty, but his was the ultimate price. On the 24th of June 1922, as Walter Rathenau was being driven to work, a large Mercedes drew up alongside his car. One of its occupants opened fire with a submachine gun, killing the foreign minister instantly. He was not the first honourable politician in Germany to lose his life in this way nor would he be the last. It was becoming the new normal in a country still traumatised by both war and peace. At both Versailles and Genoa, the governments of Europe had demonstrated that although they had the will to heal the wounds of the Great War, they were riven by too many competing visions and conflicting agendas to realise that purpose. In the absence of the Western world's most powerful state, they proved incapable of devising a coherent blueprint for recovery, without which, as Lloyd George had forewarned, further convulsions were all but inevitable. The shock of Rapallo was a portent, serving notice on their adversaries that the two largest nations on the continent would not allow themselves to be chained by the will of others, that by one means or another the two former foes whose soldiers had so recently been slaughtering one another on the battlefield, were quite ready to collaborate in constructing a way out of the predicament imposed upon them. 
Rapallo did not cause Europe's downward spiral, but, with the benefit of hindsight, serves to illuminate the harsh truth that the war to end wars had achieved nothing of the kind. Although the formal wording of the Rapallo Treaty was confined to promises of diplomatic and economic cooperation, the normalisation of relations, the mutual enunciation of all territorial claims and an agreement to stimulate trade and investment, the understandings between the two sides went much further and were of far greater import. In defiance of Versailles, the deal provided diplomatic cover for secret military talks between Germany and the Soviet Union designed to circumvent the restrictions imposed at Versailles, which were intended to make it impossible for the Reich's armed forces to take offensive action. Britain was unable to establish firm evidence of this menacing prospect, but the Foreign Office was suspicious. In a note to Curzon, ten days after the news of the Rapallo Treaty burst on the world, an astute Whitehall official warned, I am convinced that there is a perfect understanding between the two parties that the Germans will help to build the Russian army and especially the Russian navy. Such a cooperation revolutionises the outlook in Europe. His warning was not quite on the mark. Although the Soviets gained important military insights, the main effect of the treaty was to provide the Germans with the opportunity to evade the terms of the Versailles Treaty by rebuilding their armed forces far away from the prying eyes of Western Europe. Within weeks of Rapallo, Moscow agreed that the Reichswehr could establish a flying school at Lipetsk, 460 kilometers to the south of the capital, and a chemical weapons plant at Volsk, 300 kilometers to the south of Samara. Under the guise of building tractors, weapons manufacturers such as Krupp and Junkers set up factories near Moscow and Rostov-on-Don to build tanks. At a training ground near Kazan, German commanders tested battlefield manoeuvres that would be adapted by panzer commanders to slice through the French defensive lines in 1940 and, in the grimmest of ironies, to devastate the Soviet forces that would be ranged against them in the early summer of the following year. Heinz Guderian, who would become famed as one of Hitler's most brilliant panzer commanders on both fronts, later played oblique tribute to this most cynical of compacts, writing, Since 1926, a testing station had been in existence abroad where new German tanks could be tried out. In return for Moscow's largesse, an exchange programme allowed Soviet officers to be trained at German military academies, where both sides learned a great deal about the other's organisation and methods. This military entente was underpinned by a trading agreement between the two nations. In return for extensive loans, the Bolshevik government exported huge quantities of grain to the Reich. In 1923 alone, in the immediate aftermath of a famine in which five million Soviet citizens in Western Russia died from starvation and related diseases, this amounted to more than three million tons. In return, Moscow used the credits extended by the German banks to buy industrial machinery and supplies to reconstruct its own military-industrial complex, which had been ravaged by war and revolution. Disconcerted by the rapport between the two continental giants, the British watched from the sidelines, baffled and anxious. We cannot afford to have Germany or an eventual Russo-German combination supreme on the continent, Austin Chamberlain, the British Foreign Secretary, noted as his officials sought to shape a countervailing policy that was framed by a deep aversion to communism. A widespread prejudice in the Foreign Office against the incessant, though shapeless, menace of the Soviet Union led London to conclude that Moscow posed a greater threat to European security than Berlin. Notwithstanding Versailles, Britain set about prizing the Weimar leaders away from the Russian bear. Supported by France, Belgium and Italy, London devised a series of interlocking agreements to reassure the Germans that the Reich was no longer regarded by the other European democracies as an outcast. The 1925 Treaty of Locarno was the fruit of this diplomatic offensive. Under the terms of the treaty, 
the Germans and the French agreed to their common border and renounced the use of force against one another. The French, together with Belgium, withdrew from Germany's industrial heartlands in the Ruhr, which they'd occupied in 1923 following the Reich's failure to pay its annual reparations bill. The militarization of the Rhineland imposed at Versailles was confirmed, and Germany was formally accepted back into the family of Western Europe with an invitation to join the League of Nations. Locarno was hailed for delivering that peace for our time, which had proved so elusive at Genoa three years earlier, but it was a fragile chalice within which to contain the grudges and fears that Europe still incubated. The Russians, who had put intense pressure on Berlin to reject the Locarno terms, were aggrieved by the Reich's decision to succumb to London's blandishments. Anxious to reassure a paranoid Moscow that they had no intention of joining an anti-Soviet cabal, the Germans moved swiftly to reaffirm the economic and military ties established by the Rapallo Treaty. In April 1926, four months after the Locarno Treaty came into force, the Soviet Foreign Minister Chicherin arrived in the German capital, where the two sides pledged themselves, in the form of the Berlin Treaty, to renew their neutrality pact for a further five years. As Austin Chamberlain complained, the Germans had opted to run with the hare and hunt with the hounds. Though frustrated by the Weimar leadership, British ministers were far more acerbic about the Bolshevik regime in Moscow, which they abhorred and feared, seeing in the Kremlin leadership the personification of the urge to subvert freedom and democracy in the West and to replace capitalism with communism and its accompanying dictatorship of the proletariat. This was a justifiable attitude, but it was also blinkered. In the febrile years following the rise of Hitler, it had a profoundly adverse effect on diplomatic relations between London and Moscow, which ill-served British interests. Contemptuous of the Kremlin's pretensions to great power status, Austin Chamberlain not only rebuffed Soviet efforts to secure Western loans, but adopting the patronising tone prevalent in Whitehall noted, they really are suffering from swollen heads, they are of less consequence to us than they suppose, and they grossly flatter themselves when they suppose that British policy is dictated by thought of them. Like their European counterparts, British ministers were irked by Moscow's determined, if clumsy, efforts to undermine Western democratic institutions while demanding equality of status with their ideological adversaries. In Britain's case, this was exemplified by Moscow's symbolic support for the 1926 general strike by means of a modest donation to the Trades Union Congress. Citing this breach of diplomatic propriety by Soviet diplomats based in London, Lloyd George's successor as Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, severed diplomatic relations with Moscow. Following Locarno, where, according to the Foreign Secretary, the government had been battling with Soviet Russia for the soul of Germany, Britain's overriding objective was unambiguous. In Austin Chamberlain's words, it was to attach Germany solidly to the Western powers and to prevent the Reich succumbing to the temptation to slip back into the Soviet embrace. Though formal relations with the Soviet Union were restored by Ramsay MacDonald's incoming Labour government in 1929, the icy standoff between London and Moscow aggravated Stalin's conviction that Britain was intent on mobilising the European democracies to destroy Bolshevism. Mutual distrust and incomprehension so disfigured Anglo-Soviet relations as to make a constructive dialogue between London and Moscow all but impossible for the next decade. A more immediate and far more dangerous challenge to Europe's fragile stability came not from Bolshevism, but in the form of the Wall Street crash in 1929. For the previous five years, following a series of complex negotiations, the US banks had been keeping the German Reichsbank afloat with massive loans that had helped offset the cost of reparations imposed on the Weimar Republic at Versailles. As a result, the faltering German economy had started to recover and the great manufacturing industries to thrive once more. 
a financial firestorm of hyperinflation that ruined lives and livelihoods in the mid-1920s, had been doused. German citizens began to enjoy relative prosperity and stability. But with the sudden meltdown of the global financial system, those US loans were withdrawn, the life support system taken away. The German economy went into free fall. Industrial output collapsed, and within three years, six million or more Germans, both white-collar workers and those who laboured on the factory floor, were out of work. Stricken by the Great Depression, families lost their savings and went hungry. Malnutrition was rife, and children were ravaged by disease. Feeding on this human misery and resentment, a fetid virus, one that had been incubating in the post-war turbulence of a defeated nation and for which there was no apparent antidote, rampaged across the entire nation, rapidly infecting a huge proportion of the population. An obscure, fringe political movement, founded on the 5th of January 1919 with a membership of 24 and calling itself the German Workers' Party, had in little over a decade become the largest party in the Reichstag. Known by then formally as the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP or Nazi Party, its ideology was anti-Semitic and racist and its methods were violent. Its adherents were led by an unemployed Austrian veteran of the First World War who had won an Iron Cross, first and second class, for gallantry but then failed in his attempt to earn a living as an artist. Mesmerised by Adolf Hitler's pseudo-Darwinist theory that the Germans were a racially pure people who would in due course master Europe by subjugating or extirpating any of the non-Aryan races that stood in the path of this apocalyptic vision, his followers were as fanatical as he in their devotion to his cause. Before long, Seduced by Hitler's gift for messianic oratory, huge crowds attended Nazi party rallies, listening to him in rapt attention before raising their outstretched right arms in tribute as they chanted Sieg Heil, while he incited them towards a perdition far more terrible than anything imposed on them by the victors at Versailles. No one who had waded through the leaden repetitions of Mein Kampf would have been surprised by their leader's boundless hatred of the Jew, whom he described repeatedly as, inter alia, a parasite, a pernicious bacillus, and a mortal enemy that had to be expunged. In a grotesque perversion of history, Hitler asserted that it was this subhuman species that had snatched victory from Germany in 1918 and handed it to the Allies. Subsequently, their corrupt and degenerate collusion with their Marxist colleagues in the Weimar government had produced the Versailles Treaty, which was an instrument of boundless extortion and abject humiliation. Hitler's abomination of international jury was entwined with a loathing of Bolshevism and a limitless appetite for Lebensraum, living space, without which the German master race would be unable to re-establish its proper destiny. In Mein Kampf, these themes formed a common, though inchoate, thread. It was an all-or-nothing imperative. The right to possess soil can become a duty if without extension of its soil a great nation seems doomed to destruction. Germany will either be a world power or there will be no Germany. If we speak of soil in Europe today, we can have in mind only Russia and her vassal border states. Here, fate itself seems desirous of giving us a sign. By handing Russia to Bolshevism, it robbed the Russian nation of that intelligentsia which previously brought about and guaranteed its existence as a state. That was not the result of the political abilities of the Slavs in Russia, but only a wonderful example of the state-forming efficacy of the German element in an inferior race. For centuries, Russia drew nourishment from this German nucleus. Today, it can be regarded as almost totally exterminated and extinguished. It has been replaced by the Jew, 
the giant empire in the east is ripe for collapse, and the end of Jewish rule in Russia will also be the end of Russia as a state. Hitler had an unrivaled gift for exploiting the festering grievances and prejudices of a defeated people, and to offer them salvation with a messianic vision of the nation rising from the ashes to become a great world power once again. His vast audiences were roused to a pitch of almost orgasmic hysteria. After little more than a decade of street thuggery and political manipulation, the National Socialists had commandeered the nation, through first the soapbox and then the ballot box. Initially, however, the Nazis appeared to have no chance of becoming a mass movement. On the 8th of November 1923, they made their first move by initiating a violent coup d'etat attempt against the local state commissioner, who was speaking at a Munich beer keller. On the following day, in the hope of inciting the local garrison of the Reichswehr to join them in toppling the Weimar government, they staged a march in the city aimed at seizing key state installations. In the ensuing mayhem, the Bavarian police shot and killed 15 marchers as well as an innocent bystander. Along with Rudolf Hess, one of his co-conspirators responsible for orchestrating the shambolic so-called Beer Hall Putsch, Hitler was arrested, charged, and found guilty of treason. But instead of imposing a long incarceration in a common jail, the judge, who was a Nazi sympathiser, sentenced him to just five years of Festungschaft, house arrest, in a fortress, where he lived in relative comfort until he was released nine months later. As he was not required to exert himself in physical labour, he had plenty of time in which to complete the turgid but terrifying manuscript that was published as Mein Kampf. In the December 1924 election, the Nazis could garner only 3% of the vote, which gave them a mere 32 seats in the 472-seat Reichstag. But within six years, as the Great Depression began to ravage the country, they achieved a six-fold increase in their share of the vote, securing 18% of the 1930 elections. They were now a force to reckon with. Tensions were high. Running battles in the streets between the Nazi Party's stormtroopers, the SA or brown shirts as they were known, and their social democratic SPD and Communist Party rivals gave a dangerous edge to the worsening political crisis. In July 1932, the Nazis won 37% of the vote, which made them the largest party in the Reichstag with 230 seats. The SPD, the former governing party, and the Communist Party trailed far behind, with respectively a 21% and a 14% share. The Nazis had attracted more votes, 13,745,680, than the two other parties put together. However, as no other party was willing to work with them, they were as yet unable to form a governing majority. The result was political gridlock. Four months later, in November, in an attempt to break out of this impasse, President Paul von Hindenburg, who had been in office since 1925, decided to dissolve the Reichstag and call another election. On this occasion, popular support for the Nazis fell by 4%, but they once again emerged as the largest party with the highest share of the popular vote. As the smaller parties were still unwilling to form a bloc large enough to keep Hitler out of power, the Reichstag was once again paralysed. Hindenburg, who was revered as the wartime commander-in-chief of the Kaiser's army, and who had been since the autumn of 1916 the de facto head of government, was at a loss. Although he had become a father figure to the nation, he was tired and enfeebled by age, and certainly no match for Hitler. On the 30th of January, seeing no other way to break the political deadlock, Hindenburg summoned the Nazi leader to confer on him the title Chancellor of Germany. Hitler was sworn in on the 30th of January, 1933. It had been a remarkable coup de théâtre. With a rare gift for populist rhetoric, Hitler told his listeners what they wanted to hear, 
that the most powerful state in Europe had been robbed of its rightful place in the firmament, expelled from its own lands, denied the right to bear arms, and humiliated by financial reparations which, though they had ceased in 1932, he blamed for their impoverishment. When he added into that toxic mix that the principal agency of their current misery was a conspiracy of Jewish plutocrats, a great many otherwise rational citizens did not pause to question the proposition, let alone to ask whether the plutocrats were really to blame, and if so, what was the difference between a Jewish and a Gentile plutocrat? Nor did they choose to recall that while some Jews were indeed bankers, most were shopkeepers, traders and artisans earning modest incomes in what would today be called the service sector. In a Europe which had long been disfigured by anti-Semitism, Hitler merely confirmed their prejudices and gave them focus. In the ferment of that time, little by little, distortion by distortion, lie by lie, he acquired for himself a high enough share of the popular vote to give him the authority to incinerate the very democratic institutions that had brought him to the highest office in the land. Aside from his ideological rantings that made their pulses race so violently, the voters had little idea of what their Führer would do with the power they had bequeathed him. His first formal address to the nation on the 1st of February 1933 left them little the wiser, highlighting the most profound distress of millions of German men and women, which, if it continued, would lead to a catastrophe of unfathomable dimensions. He declared that his first and foremost duty was to re-establish the unity of spirit and will of our Volk. To this end, he promised to wage a merciless war against spiritual, political and cultural nihilism. There was, though, no mention either of the Jewish Bacillus or of Lebensraum. Had the voters been present at a secret meeting of military leaders two days later, they would have been privy to a much clearer and uglier vision. Opposition to the Nazis, he advised the assembled generals, had to be crushed, while extermination was the only means of containing Marxism. Democracy was a cancer that had to be extirpated. The need for Lebensraum would probably require military conquest and Germanization, for which purpose the rapid build-up of Germany's armed forces was an essential precondition. Some of his listeners enthused. Others were nonplussed. None uttered a word of dissent. As Hitler's eminent biographer Ian Kershaw has written, however disdainful they were of the vulgar and loud-mouthed social upstart, the prospect he held out of restoring the power of the army as a basis for expansionism and German dominance accorded with the long-held objectives of Germany's military elite. Hitler turned next to the nation's leading industrialists, inviting, instructing them to come to join him on the 20th of February in a villa belonging to Hermann Göring, an ace fighter pilot in the First World War and the Führer's most trusted accomplice. Göring had joined the Nazi party in 1922 after hearing one of Hitler's rants. Wounded when marching alongside the other leaders of the Beer Hall Putsch, he had been smuggled out of Munich to the Austrian city of Innsbruck. Treated with morphine to relieve the pain, he became addicted to the drug and for a while was confined to an asylum. On his return to Germany, he was elected to the Reichstag in the 1928 elections. By virtue of becoming the majority party in the July 1932 elections, the Nazis had the constitutional right to appoint the Reichstag's president. Hitler chose Goering. When the Nazi leader became chancellor, he appointed Goering as Prussia's interior minister, which gave him control of the largest police force in Germany. By dint of amalgamating a plethora of units, he had soon established a new secret police organization, the Gestapo control of which he would later pass on to Heinrich Himmler. The industrialists were well aware that Goering, like Hitler, was not a man to be ignored with impunity. Once Hitler had finished telling them that the days of parliamentary democracy were numbered and that the revolutionary left would be crushed by force if necessary, he left Goering's villa 
and his number two picked up the theme. Demanding their financial support, he urged them to help fill the party's severely depleted coffers in order to secure victory in the forthcoming election scheduled for the 5th of March, 1933. This election, Goering advised them, will surely be the last one for ten years, probably even for the next one hundred years. For some of those present, this was an irresistible incentive, notwithstanding the fact that it would involve collaborating with the forces of darkness. For those with an internationalist outlook, the prospect was far from enticing, but virtually impossible to evade. Seventeen leading companies duly contributed to an election fund of three million Reichsmarks, a huge boost to the Nazi Party's campaign in the days leading up to the vote. At the end of the month, Hitler took one further step towards consolidating his power. On the pretext of suppressing a mythical communist insurrection, the non-existent authors of which he blamed for the fire that had gutted the Reichstag on the 27th of February, he had no difficulty in persuading Hindenburg, a deeply conservative figure, that civil liberties should be suspended forthwith. In an atmosphere polluted by intimidation and violence by Nazi vigilantes, more than 17 million voters cast their ballots for the National Socialists in the 5th of March election during which opposition parties were banned from campaigning. This gave Hitler a 43.9% share of the popular vote. Armed with this rigged mandate, he went even further. Barring Communist Party deputies from attending the parliamentary session of the 23rd of March, which was held in the Kroll Opera House following the Reichstag fire, he steamrolled the appropriately named Enabling Act onto the statute book. He thereby acquired the power to rule by decree and to use force as he saw fit to maintain public order. There would be no more elections in Germany until the end of the Second World War. On the 2nd of August the following year, Hindenburg died from lung cancer at the age of 87. There was an outpouring of national grief. At his state funeral, Hitler was careful to play a prominent role. By that time, however, he had already destroyed any remnants of German democracy. Following a Schuin plebiscite, he abolished the role of president and, by assuming its powers, acquired direct control over every institution of the state, including the armed forces. The Führer and the Nazi zealots who clustered around him were now free to impose their fanatical will on a population of 67 million. And they knew what they wanted to do establish Germany as the dominant power in Europe, regain the territories stolen from them at Versailles, destroy communism, eliminate the Jewish basilis, and create Lebensraum for the superior Aryan race in lands currently inhabited by an inferior Slavic people in Eastern Europe and beyond. To achieve these goals, the German economy would have to be put on a war footing and any treaties or undertakings that inhibited this would have to be ignored or abrogated. The ways and means, no less than the timetable by which all these objectives were to be realised, were as yet unclear, but that they were deeply embedded in the Nazi psyche was not in doubt. Few Germans resisted. To differing degrees, the great majority from all sections of society were to be complicit, compliant, or cowed into submission. The Third Reich had come of age. Chapter 2. Dictators and Democrats On the 25th of March 1933, two days after Hitler's enabling act was approved by the Reichstag, an unattributed article appeared in the Manchester Guardian. It was a dispatch from the Soviet Union from a British journalist, Malcolm Muggeridge, who had been posted to Moscow the previous year. He had arrived with his wife Kitty, resolved, he wrote later, to go where I thought a new age was coming to pass, and with the intention of surrendering his British passport for a Soviet one. His starry-eyed vision was far from unique. Among many left-wing British intellectuals to share his view were Kitty Muggeridge's aunt, Beatrice Webb, who, with her husband Sidney, was co-founder of the London School of Economics, 
the New Statesman and the Fabian Society, and that society's most luminous supporter, the playwright George Bernard Shaw. As a fervent admirer of the Soviet Union, Shaw had been invited to Moscow two years earlier for a nine-day fact-finding mission. Lionized by the regime, he was driven around the capital in an open-topped limousine with his fellow travelling companions, Lord and Lady Astor. The family owned the vast Clevedon estate on the banks of the Thames. Nancy Astor was a renowned socialite who, in 1919, became the first woman to be elected as a Westminster MP. The aristocratic couple and the socialist playwright were bedazzled by what they were allowed to see of Moscow. Fated by revolutionary writers and artists, they were invited to meet Joseph Stalin at the Kremlin. Shaw was quite overcome. Flattered to be treated as though he were an old friend, he emerged from his three-hour encounter with the Soviet leader to declare on his departure for London, Tomorrow I leave this land of hope and return to our Western countries, the countries of despair. As one of the Western world's most prominent public intellectuals, his approbation mattered to the Kremlin, and on his return to London, the great man did not disappoint. Asked about reports of food shortages and famine in parts of Russia at a press conference, he declared that he had not seen a single undernourished person in Russia, young or old, and then added sardonically, Were they padded? Were their hollow cheeks distended by pieces of rubber inside? Such aperçu from so eminent a figure played no small part in tempting liberal opinion in the West to join communism's fellow travellers in vilifying critics of the Soviet Union as reactionary capitalists or die-hard members of a ruling class that was fearful lest the virus of communism should infect those millions of hungry men and women who had lost their jobs in the Great Depression. In the absence of contrary evidence, it was tempting to believe that the Soviet Union offered the rest of the world an earthly nirvana. Malcolm Muggeridge was not so credulous. Already disillusioned by six months in Stalinist Russia, he decided to find out for himself if there was any substance to the rumours of a mass famine. Early in 1933, he travelled into the North Caucasus and Ukraine, where he was soon confronted by a horrifying reality. In one small market town, he reported, the civilian population was obviously starving. Not undernourished, as, for instance, most Oriental peasants are undernourished and some unemployed workers in Europe, but having had for weeks next to nothing to eat. One of these wretched individuals, looking round anxiously to ensure that he could not be overheard, told him, We have nothing, absolutely nothing. They have taken everything away. Muggeridge passed mile after mile of empty fields. The land was untilled and the livestock had died. The granaries were empty and there was no seed to plant for the next harvest. Everywhere he went, he found only despair and bewilderment. It did not take long for him to realise that he was witness to a humanitarian crisis caused by the regime's determination to secure, in the implacable language of the revolution, the liquidation of the kulaks as a class and to establish collective farms on their expropriated lands. The Kulaks, small landowners often owning upwards of five acres and therefore large enough to employ labourers, were presumed by the Bolsheviks, often correctly, to be viscerally hostile to the revolution as well as being unwilling to surrender their homesteads and their livelihoods to the state. This liquidation, which was an essential component of Stalin's first five-year plan, required party officials to seize all the Kulak's assets and to expel them from homes that had often been in their ownership for generations. The operation was not confined to the Caucasus and Ukraine. In January 1933, party officials across the fertile grain lands of central Russia came under intense pressure to accelerate the programme of requisition and expulsion. As enthusiastically obedient as his counterparts elsewhere to meet the targets set by the Kremlin, 
the first secretary of the Central Black Earth Regional Party, Commissar Josas Ferekis, instructed his comrades that they were to dekulakize between 90,000 and 105,000 households, and that between 12,000 and 13,000 Kulak families were to be exiled, and their counter-revolutionary ringleaders jailed or executed. Within weeks, the chaos caused by this official form of ethnic cleansing meant that bread supplies in this richly fertile region began to run out. Six months later, the director of the regional branch of OGPU, the National Secret Police Agency, was forced to cable Varikis to report that the spring sowing had not been harvested and the crop was rotting and going to seed. In May 1933, OGPU's director reported in just the village of Borisovska, more than a thousand have died of starvation. In whole numbers of villages, the corpses of those who have died are not being collected for long periods. The collective farm workers are abandoning the villages and heading for the towns. So far from being distressed by such reports, which flowed into the Kremlin in an unending stream, the regime demanded even tougher action. Vyacheslav Molotov was Stalin's chosen instrument for this task. As chairman of the Council of People's Commissars and Stalin's closest confidant, he was directly responsible for overseeing the liquidation and collectivization program. The Black Earth region was critical to the success of the program. Covering around 350,000 square kilometres of high-yielding soils, some 700 kilometres southwest of Moscow, it was one of the capital's primary grain baskets. In his icily indifferent fashion, Molotov ignored the starving peasantry, but insisted that the expropriations in the Black Earth region should be neither suspended nor modified. In a personal message to Varikis, he instructed the troubled commissar that no diversions from the plan can be contemplated and there are no mitigating circumstances. Those peasants who threatened to resist were to be sent into exile elsewhere in the Soviet Union, or, if they resisted, executed on the spot. For ardent communists like Lev Kopelev, who, like many thousands of other young party functionaries, was dispatched to the countryside to dekulakize the land, this was a price worth paying. In the terrible spring of 1933, I saw people dying from hunger. I saw women and children with distended bellies turning blue, still breathing, but with vacant, lifeless eyes. And corpses, corpses in ragged sheepskin coats and cheap felt boots. I saw all this and did not go out of my mind or commit suicide. Nor did I lose my faith. I believed because I wanted to believe. Many years later, he was to recant, but at the time the young intellectual believed that World revolution was absolutely necessary so that justice would triumph. There would be no borders, no capitalists and no fascists at all. Moscow, Kharkov and Kiev would become just as enormous, just as well built as Berlin, Hamburg and New York. We would have skyscrapers, streets full of automobiles and bicycles. All the workers and peasants would go walking in fine clothes, wearing hats and watches. This vision, as he would acknowledge, so clouded his judgment that he found himself hating the Kulaks, seeing himself and his comrades as warriors on an invisible front, fighting against Kulak sabotage, and for the souls of these peasants who were mired in unconsciousness, who did not understand the great truths of communism. The great majority of the famine victims lived in Ukraine, and it was here that Kulak resistance to the collectivization of their lands was most stubborn. Knowing that their produce was to be confiscated from them by local officials, in line with the arbitrary and unachievable quotas drawn up by Molotov to ensure a surplus for the cities, many peasants downed tools and refused to till their fields. Those Kulaks, with the courage and cunning to conceal their harvest, faced liquidation in its most gruesome sense. A Politburo decree, authorised personally by Stalin in 1932, had made it a capital offence for the farmers to steal grain. 
a peasant had but to hoard a single sack to face the firing squad. Hundreds of thousands of those peasants who were spared immediate execution perished from hunger, thirst and disease on the long, life-sapping journey from their villages to internal exile in the faraway interior. When the trains carrying these victims came to a halt, their corpses were laid out beside the tracks for instant burial, untold numbers in unmarked graves. Those who survived the journey, administrative exiles as they were officially designated, had to scavenge for food in alien and inhospitable lands. The suffering of the exiles was acute. In May 1933, an unnamed state official, evidently appalled by what he witnessed, reported seeing men and women haunting the villages like shadows in search of a piece of bread or refuse. They eat carrion, slaughter dogs and cats. The villagers keep their houses locked. Those who chance to enter a house drop on their knees in front of the owner and with tears beg for a piece of bread. I witnessed several deaths on the roads between villages, in the bathhouses and in the barns. I myself saw hungry, agonised people crawling on the sidewalk. They were picked up by the police and died several hours later. Despite the clinical diligence with which party functionaries compiled the raw statistics, it never became possible to establish the precise number of those who perished in the Great Famine of 1932-1933. Stalin may not have intended to liquidate the peasantry in the same manner as he did the kulaks, but starvation was the direct result of the policies he devised and unleashed on them. It is probable that at least 10 million Soviet citizens died as a result of either execution, starvation, disease or deportation into internal exile. That so few people in the West appreciated the scale of this catastrophe owed much to a highly tuned Soviet propaganda network at home and abroad that fated, favoured and sometimes financed the biddable and the gullible. Thus, at the peak of the genocide, Bernard Shaw, along with 20 other well-known names, was inspired to pen an angry letter to the Manchester Guardian, protesting that on their respective visits to the Soviet Union, none of them had seen evidence of economic slavery, privation, unemployment and cynical despair of betterment. Everywhere we saw a hopeful and enthusiastic working class, which was free up to the limits imposed on them by nature and a terrible inheritance from the tyranny and incompetence of their former rulers, we would regard it as a calamity if the present lie campaign were to be allowed to make headway. Shaw was not alone. Other international luminaries were no less ideologically fixated, among them the novelists H.G. Wells and André Gide. Although he would not acknowledge it for many years, Arthur Kersler, who was living in Moscow at the time, witnessed starving children for himself. He described them as horrible infants with enormous wobbling heads, stick-like limbs, swollen, pointed bellies, and the famine victims as enemies of the people who preferred begging to work. The most influential of these fellow travellers was a Liverpool-born journalist, Walter Durante, who was the Moscow correspondent of the New York Times. An unashamed apologist for the Soviet Union, Durante was motivated less by ideological conviction than by an appetite for the good life in Moscow, for which he depended on the Kremlin's indulgence. To preserve his privileged status, he went out of his way to vilify anyone who challenged his own Panglossian coverage of Soviet affairs for America's most prestigious newspaper. When his reportage was challenged, even indirectly, he was merciless. In the spring of 1933, a young reporter for the New York Evening Post, Gareth Jones, defying the ban on travel to Ukraine, walked for ten days through village after village where he saw distraught peasants eating cattle fodder. Jones had managed to acquire a visa to enter the Soviet Union, courtesy of the Soviet ambassador Ivan Maisky 
who wished to ingratiate himself with the former Prime Minister David Lloyd George, for whom Jones was working as a foreign affairs adviser. This had not impaired Jones's integrity. When the peasants told him, there is no bread, we're dying, he did not fail to describe their pitiful state. In other circumstances, his harrowing report, which was printed in a number of newspapers both in the United States and in Britain, might well have made a significant impact. However, Duranti, who a few months earlier had been awarded a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of Soviet affairs, was swift to pounce, using his preeminent status to censure the Tyro journalist for writing a big scare story. In a craven determination to protect their own access to the Soviet leadership, most of Duranti's colleagues in the Western press corps, based in the Russian capital, scurried to take his part. Though he was grudgingly to admit for the first time that Russia was facing a food shortage, which he conceded had indeed caused widespread malnutrition, Duranti reassured the readers of the New York Times that any report of a famine in Russia was an exaggeration or malignant propaganda. While the Pulitzer Prize winner's stock in America rose higher than ever, Jones was completely, and in the end it appears, literally outgunned by his opponents. Gareth Jones was murdered by bandits on the 12th of August 1935, while on a reporting assignment in Mongolia. It was suspected by some that he was targeted by the secret police, anxious to get rid of so turbulent a reporter. In Britain, Muggeridge was similarly eclipsed. After witnessing a column of hungry peasants being marched out of their village by a squad of militiamen, he wrote, The worst of the class war is that it never stops. First individual kulaks shot and exiled, then groups of peasants, then whole villages. And he asked, how is it that so many obvious and fundamental facts about Russia are not noticed even by serious and intelligent visitors? Insofar as his challenge was even acknowledged, it was met with incredulity rather than shock. Beatrice Webb, who had herself returned from an eight-week trip to Moscow some months earlier, was perplexed by what she described as Malcolm's curiously hysterical denunciation of the Soviet Union drawing a vivid and arrogantly expressed picture of the starvation and oppression of the peasants of the North Caucasus and Ukraine. Webb's eagerness to swallow the Kremlin's propaganda was widely shared, not only by the liberal intelligentsia, but also, more tellingly, in the chancelleries of Europe. Western governments had access to enough independent evidence to conclude that Muggeridge and Jones were not exaggerating but for the most part, diplomacy dictated that they should be ignored. In line with the British government's policy of balancing its aversion to the Soviet Union with its apprehension about the rise of Hitler, a senior foreign office diplomat, Lawrence Collier, was brazenly insuicent. In response to a British MP's anxious query, he wrote, The truth of the matter is, of course, that we have a certain amount of information about famine conditions, uh, we do not want to make it public, however, because the Soviet government would resent it and our relations with them would be prejudiced. Thus, as in the Caucasus and other parts of Russia itself, the murderous famine in Ukraine, which was held by many Ukrainians to be a deliberate act of genocide to wipe out their nation, was all but ignored by the outside world. It would be several decades before Muggeridge's indictment of the Great Famine as one of the most monstrous crimes in history, so terrible that people in the future will scarcely be able to believe that it happened, was finally accepted as the truth. For the most part, those who evinced any curiosity at all were disposed to share Duranti's breezy assertion that in the phrase variously attributed to Rhodespear and Napoleon, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. In preparing this dish, Stalin had been responsible for breaking 10 million eggs. He would soon break many more. In the United States, the newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt had assumed office in March 1933 with one overriding objective, to bring an end to the Great Depression. Europe was in turmoil. 
Hitler was supreme in Germany, and the Soviet Union was subjecting the Russian people to merciless persecution. Unlike his immediate predecessor, Herbert Hoover, Roosevelt was an internationalist, but he inherited an isolationist Congress and a nation stricken by poverty and hardship. Seeking to inspire hope in the midst of an economic calamity, he began his inaugural address with one of his most famous aphorisms. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, he declared, making it clear that his priority was to conquer what he described as the emergency at home. With social dislocation, unemployment, hunger, and in some areas near starvation, threatening to tear apart the social fabric of the nation, foreign relations were bound to come a distant second to the vital need to reboot America's broken capitalist system. The New Deal was Roosevelt's chosen solution, and in the early months of his presidency it consumed his attention. Europe's post-war predicament did not entirely pass him by, however, nor was he content merely to watch the evolving crisis from the sidelines. After the failure of their earlier efforts at Versailles and Genoa and the limited achievement at Locarno, the European chancelleries were once again making tentative efforts to reconcile their competing interests, in the hope, yet again, of constructing a framework for economic stability and strategic security. Determined to protect US interests in a global economy, Roosevelt dispatched emissaries to two ambitious international conferences that were running in parallel but with different agendas, one in London and the other in Geneva. But the World Economic Conference in London, which opened in June, it soon became clear that the US negotiators, at the President's behest, were no more willing to forego protectionism as the principal means of combating the Great Depression than their European counterparts. As a result, on the 27th of July 1933, the conference was torpedoed by its most important participant. In Geneva, an ambitiously entitled World Disarmament Conference had opened in February 1932. It was soon deadlocked after France insisted that security should precede disarmament, while the Germans argued conversely that they should be released from the shackles of Versailles in order to rearm for their own security. After a six-month break, the delegates reconvened in February 1933 under the ominous shadow of the newly established Nazi government in Germany. This stiffened Roosevelt's determination to make a very, very definite success of Geneva. As evidence of his good faith, he ordered that the size of the US Army be cut from its already modest complement of 140,000 men, only 40,000 more than the level imposed on Germany at Versailles, a gesture that was fiercely resisted by the US War Department. In an angry confrontation at the White House, the Army Chief of Staff, General Douglas MacArthur, was reputed to have told his president that when the United States lost the next war, he hoped that as an American boy lying in the mud with an enemy bayonet through his belly and an enemy foot on his dying throat spat out his last curse, the name of Roosevelt, not MacArthur, would be the words he would utter. Roosevelt was enraged by this flagrant defiance, and MacArthur backed down. But the general was not appeased. Many years later, he recalled, I just vomited on the steps of the White House. The president's initiative had no impact. Despite his message to all 54 participants urging them to seek the complete elimination of all offensive weapons, the diplomats in Geneva demonstrated the same diligent commitment to military protectionism as their counterparts in London had displayed in the name of economic protectionism. The logjam could not be broken. The final blow came in October 1933, when at Hitler's behest the German delegation, which was led by Joseph Goebbels, the recently appointed Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, walked out of the negotiations. For good measure, the Germans simultaneously quit the League of Nations, to which the Weimar government had been admitted in 1926, blaming the refusal of the other powers to grant the Third Reich military parity with them. Chastened by his failures in both London and Geneva, Roosevelt decided to detach the United States, at least temporarily, 
from the political cauldron on the other side of the Atlantic, noting languidly, we shall go through a period of non-cooperation in everything for the next year or two. There was one major exception to this retreat, the Soviet Union. In October 1933, the President summoned two of his most trusted aides, Henry Morgenthau, head of the Farm Credit Association, and very soon to be appointed Treasury Secretary, and William Bullitt, an experienced diplomat who had been sent to Moscow in 1919 in an attempt to broker a peace deal to end the Civil War. He secured a draft agreement for Wilson, but Congress refused to endorse it. In the absence of harmony elsewhere in Europe, Roosevelt instructed them to approach Moscow with a view to improving relations between the White House and the Kremlin, or, as he put it at a press conference, to explain this unexpected overture between two great nations, two great peoples. Gifted with more strategic imagination than his isolationist adversaries in Congress, he judged that the rapprochement with Moscow would send a clear warning to the militaristic regime in Tokyo that any further aggression in a region where Soviet and US interests overlapped would not be tolerated. In 1931, the Japanese had occupied Manchuria, reigniting a long-standing border dispute with the Soviet Union and, in the name of Asia for the Asians, seemed set on yet more territorial expansion that threatened to bring them into direct conflict with the United States in the Pacific. Moscow did not hesitate. After 16 years of diplomatic isolation, following the US decision to sever relations after the Bolsheviks took power in 1917, the lure of restoring formal links with the world's most powerful state, and the last major nation still to withhold formal recognition, was irresistible. Within days, the Soviet Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Maxim Litvinov, a sinuous negotiator of whom it was said he could come dry out of the water, was on a plane to Washington, where he arrived on the 8th of November. Litvinov was an ideal choice for the task. As a revolutionary émigré, he had lived a chequered life, crisscrossing Europe and secretly buying weapons to smuggle into Russia for the Bolshevik faction of the banned Social Democratic Labour Party, SDLP. He had lived in London, where, in 1903, he had a meeting with Lenin in the London Library, shared a house with Stalin during the SDLP's Fifth Congress in 1907, and took an English wife. At the age of 57, he was now an urbane and cultivated Bolshevik diplomat, well acquainted with the ways of the world and unusually well equipped to form easy relations with his Western peers. He was accompanied by the ubiquitous Walter Duranti, whose effusive articles about Stalin's dictatorship in the New York Times had earned him not only the lasting gratitude of the Kremlin, but also the US State Department's admiration. At first, the omens were not encouraging. The talks at official level faltered almost as soon as the pleasantries were over and within two days reached a deadlock. This prompted Roosevelt to intervene personally by inviting Litvinov to a presidential tete-a-tete -tete at the White House. The two men swiftly established a rapport, each charming the other so effectively that by the end of the evening they had sketched out a draft for a gentleman's agreement between the two governments. Litvinov happily conceded two key demands. The first required him to confirm that his government would refrain from interfering in the internal affairs of the United States through either propaganda or subversion, a concession that was unlikely to be worth the paper it was written on except as a gesture of goodwill. The second demand, that the religious rights of American citizens living in the Soviet Union would be respected, was more significant. The issue of religious freedom was of great importance to the Catholic Church and therefore mattered greatly in Washington, politically as well as morally. During the Great Depression, several thousand U.S. citizens had been lured away from the vanishing promises of the American dream to the seductive image of the workers' paradise fed to them by the likes of Durante. Among other rosy portraits of life in the Soviet Union, he reassured his readers that each of the Gulag's concentration camps forms a sort of commune where everyone lives comparatively free, not imprisoned, 
but compelled to work for the good of the community. They are certainly not convicts in the American sense of the word. And there was work. In 1931, Henry Ford had signed a $40 million deal to build a plant at Nizhny Novgorod, some 320 kilometers from Moscow, in which to assemble 75,000 outdated Model A saloon cars. More than 100,000 Americans applied to work there. 10,000 were hired. By 1931, there were enough Americans living in Moscow to sustain an English-language newspaper, the Moscow News. English-language schools were opened in four Russian cities, Moscow, Leningrad and Kharkov, the site of a tractor factory, as well as Nizhny Novgorod. Though many of these adventurers were soon disillusioned with life under Bolshevism, it was not their unhappy experiences that shaped the American attitudes towards the Soviet Union. More importantly, there were plenty of legislators as well as churchmen whose aversion to communism and atheism would ensure that any apparent agreement with Moscow would be under persistent and sceptical scrutiny. To appease the doubters in Congress, Litvinov readily agreed to repay up to $150 million of debt owing since the end of the First World War, which was somewhat less than the $600 million the State Department believed was due. It was enough, though, for a deal to be done. In the early hours of the 17th of November, 1933, Litvinov and Roosevelt signed their concordat, thereby formally establishing diplomatic relations between their two governments for the first time since the Bolshevik Revolution. Durantis' persuasive falsehoods in the New York Times did not determine Washington's attitude towards the Kremlin, but they assuredly cleared away some notable obstacles that would otherwise have stood in its way. Had American public opinion been roused by the truth about Stalin's liquidation of the kulaks and the mass starvation of the Soviet peasantry it entailed, Roosevelt, ever sensitive to the national mood, would have been obliged to use a far longer spoon to sup with the Soviet foreign minister. As it was, any fears that Roosevelt might have harboured about the public reaction to his announcement that America was about to embrace the world's first communist state was swiftly dispelled. The agreement was widely welcomed by business leaders and save for a few sceptics by Congress as well. No less pertinently, the major churches reassured that their own communicants, if not the Russian faithful, would be spared persecution by the Bolshevik regime, did not protest. Roosevelt's acute political antennae had served him well. The president's first official envoy to the Soviet Union arrived in Moscow committed to forging a new era of harmony between the two ideological adversaries. William Bullitt, whose first visit to the Soviet Union in 1919 had not been forgotten, was greeted like an old friend by the Kremlin. With a bonhomie and extravagance rare even by the standards of those days, the new ambassador opened the doors of the US Embassy to anyone who mattered in Moscow. His parties became the talk of the town. On at least one occasion, he treated some 500 guests to a culinary orgy of spectacular delights that was said to rival the most lavish pre-revolutionary banquet. But the more Bullitt learned about the regime, the less enthusiastic he became. The pervasive secrecy, suspicion, surveillance and repression that hung like a fetid pall over the life of the city came to disgust him. He returned to Washington three years later to re-emerge as an ardent and outspoken anti-communist. Roosevelt did not allow Bullitt's vault fast to deter him. Neither the Kremlin's reluctance to honour its outstanding debts, nor the continued activities of Soviet intelligence agents in America, let alone the failure of Moscow's trade czars to facilitate lucrative deals with US exporters, or the growing evidence that Stalin was a murderous tyrant caused him to revise his view that a strategic relationship with the Soviet Union was critically important to U.S. interests and should be preserved even at high cost. It was not by accident, therefore, that he chose Joseph Davies to succeed Bullitt. A skillful lawyer, an experienced diplomat and a personal friend of long standing, Davies shared Roosevelt's outlook but with a loyalty that evidently shriveled his critical faculties. Determined to strengthen Washington's ties with the Kremlin, he blindfolded himself to the evidence of Stalin's brutality 
with legalisms that shredded the ethical values he might have been supposed to represent. Whether or not this nonchalance pleased the White House, his reports were never subjected to serious challenge, an oversight that protected the President from any searching scrutiny of his strategic imperative, the maintenance of a cordial transatlantic relationship with that great nation. During the Great Famine, Stalin had discovered how easy it was to suborn international opinion with a confection of repeated denials and a carefully crafted infusion of half-truths with which to dupe the credulous. This did not mean that he believed his tenure to be secure. The Soviet dictator was born in 1878 in the Georgian town of Gori. The son of an impoverished wife-beating shoemaker, Joseph was a diminutive child who was clever enough to win a scholarship to the spiritual seminary in the town of Tiflis. He was a chorister who wrote poetry of sufficient quality to be included in various Georgian anthologies. But at the age of twenty, by which time he had read Karl Marx's recently published Das Kapital and steeped himself in radical thought, he walked out of the seminary as a committed atheist and a nascent revolutionary. He was soon at the centre of a web of ideologues, committed to overthrowing the repressive Tsarist regime of Nicholas II. Working underground to foment unrest, he was arrested and imprisoned on more than one occasion. Following the notorious St. Petersburg Massacre in 1905, he formed armed squads that raided government arsenals, extorted funds from local businesses, and launched guerrilla attacks on government forces. Later that year, as a delegate to a Bolshevik conference in St. Petersburg, he met Lenin, and soon became one of his prominent comrades. By 1912, he was not only a member of the Central Committee, but also the editor of the then underground party newspaper, Pravda. Throughout his rise to power, he was frequently either in jail or forced into internal exile. By the time of the 1917 revolution, with Lenin and Trotsky, he was a member of the triumvirate who shaped the course of Soviet history. During the Civil War, he demonstrated an unmatched readiness to use the violence of the state to terrorise any suspected counter-revolutionary into submission. Often falling out with colleagues, mortally so in the case of Leon Trotsky, he was as profoundly insecure as he was ruthless and ambitious. Lenin, who did not care for Stalin's boorish nature and disapproved of his offensive and cavalier manner, nonetheless trusted him sufficiently to appoint him as the party's general secretary. Following Lenin's stroke later that year, and his death in 1924, Stalin's rise to absolute power was gradual but inexorable. During his ascent, he had made many enemies, and he feared those about him might either seek to subvert his authority or, as he had done to others on so many occasions already, find ways of terminating his life. Thus, using the pretext provided by the assassination of Sergei Kirov, a leading member of the Soviet Politburo, in circumstances so murky as to implicate Stalin himself, the Soviet leader unleashed what became known officially as the Great Purge. Within two months of Kirov's murder, on the 1st of December 1934, almost 200 senior communists had been shot. No Soviet voice could be heard in protest, while once again the regime's apologists abroad found reason to justify these atrocities. As Bernard Shaw breezily explained, the top of the ladder is a very trying place for old revolutionists who have had no administrative experience, who have had no financial experience, who have been trained as penniless hunted fugitives with Karl Marx on the brain, and not as statesmen. They often have to be pushed off the ladder with a rope around their necks. In operational terms, the Great Purge was a simple project. Stalin already had the means readily to hand a well-established police state bequeathed to him by Lenin, who had established the Cheka to oversee and execute the Red Terror campaign in the early days of the revolution, when between 150,000 and 250,000 counter-revolutionaries were executed. Lenin had also established scores of labour camps to incarcerate political dissidents alongside common criminals where they endured conditions of extreme hardship and brutality. 
those who survived, were treated to a punishment regime by prison officers licensed to go far beyond the bounds of common humanity into the realms of unconstrained sadism. Stalin expanded this network of surveillance, arrest, detention, torture, summary execution and penal servitude, notably creating the statewide gulag, when he inherited Lenin's crown in 1922. The names changed. In 1922, the Cheka was transmogrified into the Ogpu, which was in turn subsumed into the NKVD in 1934. But the vengeful purpose did not. By the mid-1930s, the Stalinists in the Politburo had total control of the levers of state power. Aside from a handful of deviationists from left and right, who muttered in protest but had almost no influence, all significant opposition had been crushed. Though formally he was no more than primus inter pares, Stalin was virtually unassailable. His paranoia told him otherwise, however. He would need to liquidate many more subversives in the vain hope of exorcising the psychotic demons that assailed him. Thoughts were as dangerous to him as any other threat. When they were wrapped in the ironies of a poem, they posed a viral menace. When the great Soviet poet Ozip Mandelstam wrote, Only in Russia is poetry respected, it gets people killed. Where else is poetry so common a motive for murder? He was charged with counter-revolutionary activities. In 1938, he was sentenced to five years hard labour, though he died from cold and hunger in a Siberian transit camp before he could reach his final destination. Among many of Mandelstam's fatal crimes was to circulate a poem which became known as the Stalin Epigram, in which he directly attacked the dictator as a gleeful killer who rolls the executions on his tongue like berries. He wishes he could hug them like big friends from home. Though the entire Politburo was complicit in the terror that Stalin now unleashed upon the Soviet Union, he was its presiding genius. It was he who instigated the purge of lowly members of the Communist Party. He who authorised the routine use of torture to extract confessions from alleged enemies of the people and to incriminate colleagues of crimes they had not committed. And he who conceived the show trials at which, after a travesty of due process, the Supreme Court, proceedings that he occasionally observed from a gallery overlooking the courtroom, delivered verdict and sentence in a pantomime of public justice. At the first of these show trials, it took the Supreme Court no more than six days to find 16 defendants guilty of conspiring to overthrow the government. Each one, as had been preordained, was then executed in the cellars of the NKVD headquarters in central Moscow, the Lubyanka, where innocents were routinely tortured to extract false confessions. At the second show trial, in January 1937, the court similarly took six days before ordering that 13 of the 17 defendants should be forthwith executed by firing squad. The other four were sentenced to many years of hard labour. The US ambassador took it upon himself to attend the entire trial and to take detailed notes of the proceedings. On the basis of these, Davies sent a long missive to the US Secretary of State Cordell Hull, who had been appointed in 1933 and would remain in that post until his retirement in 1945. In this report, he described how in their despair the defendants sat holding their heads in their hands or burying their heads upon the rail as they listened to the state prosecutor reading out their already signed confessions to the military triumvirate who stood in judgment over them. His sensibilities were clearly offended. Nonetheless, the ambassador informed Hull that he had arrived at the reluctant conclusion that the state had established its case, at least as to the existence of a widespread conspiracy and plot among the political leaders against the Soviet government, adding that to have assumed that this proceeding was inevitable and staged as a project of dramatic political fiction would be to presuppose the creative genius of Shakespeare. Shakespeare had his fools. In Davies, Stalin had his useful idiot. One of the three defendants to avoid the death penalty 
was Karl Radek, who received a sentence of ten years' penal servitude in return for implicating some of the most senior figures in the Soviet hierarchy in acts of alleged treason. Among these thus identified were the leading Marxist theoretician Nikolai Bukharin and Marshal Mikhail Tukhachevsky, one of the Red Army's most formidable generals. As a 27-year-old commander during the 1920 Russian-Polish War, Tukhachevsky had proved himself to be a brilliant tactician, and his stock rose rapidly. By the late 1920s, he'd emerged as a pioneering military theorist and a radical reformist. Unhappily for him, he once had cause to reprimand Stalin, who was then the political commander of the Southwestern Front, for interfering in what were purely military matters. Stalin did not forget that clash. By the time he had been formally anointed as party leader in 1929, the charismatic military commander had risen to become army chief of staff. Seeing him as a potential threat to his own authority, the dictator at once set about undermining Tukhachevsky's totemic status. In 1930, spurious allegations that he was planning a coup led to an investigation, which, despite the assiduous efforts of the Ogpu, failed to find a scintilla of evidence against him. Stalin's moment did not arrive, therefore, until the January 1937 show trial where Radek chose to save his own skin by accusing Tukhachevsky of treason. The marshal's fate was sealed. Under interrogation and torture, he signed a confession stained with his own blood, in which he admitted to the preposterous charge that he was a German agent who was collaborating with Bukharin to overthrow the Soviet government. His conviction was a foregone conclusion. On the 11th of June 1937, at a specially convened military tribunal which no defence attorneys were permitted to attend and to whose verdict no appeal was allowed, he was sentenced to death along with eight Red Army generals. Later that evening, after Stalin had approved the death sentence, Tukhachevsky was taken from his cell in the Lubyanka and shot once in the back of his head by the NKVD's chief executioner, Major General Vasily Blokhin, who had been appointed to this coveted role by Stalin in 1928. He led a company of official killers, which, at the NKVD's behest, carried out numerous mass executions, for which Blokhin was garlanded with honours, including the Order of Lenin. After Tukhachevsky's execution, the general's wife, Nina, and his two brothers, who were military instructors, were also shot. Three of his sisters were dispatched to the Gulag, and his young daughter was similarly expelled once she had come of age, remaining in exile until after Stalin's death in 1953. Long before that, in a gruesomely accidental form of retributive justice, five of the eight judges who condemned Chukachevsky to death had themselves been executed. Stalin's paranoia was buttressed by a no less obsessive belief in the higher echelons of the party that the Soviet Union had been in a virtual state of siege ever since the revolution, threatened from without and from within. By the mid-1930s, as the international war clouds gathered across Europe, this dread had become contagious. In the absence of any evidence, the source of the virus was pinpointed to the Soviet high command some of whose most senior commanders had indeed served in the Tsar's imperial army during the Great War, or with the White Russians during the Civil War, which stood accused of incubating an enemy within that was conspiring to subvert Bolshevism by collaborating with the agents of foreign powers like Britain, Poland, Japan or Germany. A swathe of marshals, generals, corps commanders and divisional commanders, along with a senior admiral, were accordingly purged. Within a month of Chukachevsky's education, more than a thousand senior officers had been exposed as conspirators in a military fascist plot against the Soviet state. Some were executed, some were imprisoned, and others expelled from the party. By the late autumn of 1938, 10,000 army leaders had been arrested, and a further 35,000 had been discharged although 11,000 of these were later reinstated. The culture of terror reached into every rank. 
Junior officers avoided suggesting initiatives or showing leadership, preferring instead to behave like zombies, automata, merely carrying out instructions and avoiding the limelight. The decapitation of the Red Army not only removed or crippled many of the brightest and best, but caused a seismic disruption that had a corrosive effect on the overall morale of officers and men alike. More broadly, though its intended purpose may not have been pour encourager les autres, the purges had precisely that effect on every Soviet citizen, suppressing any prospect of challenge or defiance. By now, the agents of the Great Purge were on the rampage across the Soviet Union to eliminate all anti-Soviet elements wherever they could be found. After the exposure of Tukhachevsky's plot, scores of thousands were swept up by NKVD agents working with frantic energy to meet the arbitrary quota of arrests set by the Politburo. Under the overall supervision of the head of the NKVD, a dwarfish sadist called Nikolai Yezhov, confessions were routinely extracted from the accused using torture. Beatings were so harsh that the eyes of the victims literally popped out of their heads. Three-man tribunals, troikas, dispensed summary justice with the stroke of a pen. To run the NKVD was to wield immense power. It was also an extremely dangerous post to occupy. Yezhov had succeeded Genrich Jagoda, who had overseen the mass executions of the Kulaks, in 1936. The following year, Jagoda was found guilty of treason and executed. The year after that, Yezhov was removed in favour of Lavrenti Beria, who immediately found cause to have him shot as an enemy of the people. Beria was to last much longer. It would not be until 1953, following the death of Stalin, that he was to meet a similar fate, and he was responsible for many more targeted killings than any of his predecessors. Stalin was as brazenly resolute in the commission of mass murder as Adolf Hitler would later show himself to be. Along with Molotov and other senior members of the Politburo, the Soviet leader personally authorised the execution of tens of thousands of those who had been rounded up by the NKVD merely by writing the word approved against their names on the death lists routinely submitted to the Kremlin. On one day alone in late 1938, he sat with Molotov as together they dispatched 3,167 people to their deaths by this means. As his loyal henchman was airily to concede, haste ruled the day. Innocent people were sometimes caught. By the end of the year, when Stalin suspended the Great Purge, at least 750,000 victims had thus been liquidated, not because they had committed any identifiable crime, but to ensure that they could not do so in the future. Defining enemies of the people as those who dared to question the rightness of the party line, not only in words but also in their thoughts, yes, even in their thoughts. Stalin presided over the destiny of 160 million people in the name of a socialist revolution with the authority of a despot. Such was the state of the Soviet Union as Europe slipped at an accelerating rate towards the abyss of the century's second great military conflagration. Chapter 3. Shuttle Diplomacy In London, the government's policy of appeasement had by this time seized the political agenda. Strategically, the bloodletting in Russia was a sideshow, which merely confirmed the cabinet's view that the Soviet Union was enthralled to a tyranny exercised by revolutionary barbarians. Since his arrival in London in 1932, Ivan Maisky, the urbane and clubbable Soviet ambassador, had gone out of his way to cultivate some of the most influential figures in London's political establishment. While he was careful to demonstrate that he was a loyal servant of his masters in Moscow, his personal diaries reveal him to have been an astute and acerbic observer. Neville Chamberlain, he noted on the 8th of March 1938, is a consummate reactionary with a sharply defined anti-Soviet position, who feels with his every fibre 
that the USSR is the principal enemy and its communism is the main danger to the capitalist system that is so dear to his heart. Such is the Prime Minister we have to deal with now in England. Maisky might have been even less enamoured of the British leader had he known that following their first meeting in 1932, at which time Chamberlain was Chancellor of the Exchequer, the consummate reactionary had casually described the new Soviet ambassador as a revolting but clever little Jew. Chamberlain's view that Moscow was both ideologically beyond the pale and strategically irrelevant had come to prevail in both Whitehall and Westminster. Ministers and civil servants shared the view that the only way to prevent Britain being sucked into another ruinous war in Europe was to appease rather than provoke the German Führer. The thought that the Soviet Union might play a constructive role in containing Nazism, thereby stabilising Europe, barely registered in the Cabinet's collective mind. Only a tiny proportion of Conservative MPs failed to succumb to this governmental groupthink. Among this minority, only Churchill, now in his wilderness years, and to a lesser degree Anthony Eden, who had resigned as Foreign Secretary in February 1938 in protest at Chamberlain's stance, were able to strike any chord with the public beyond Westminster. Hitler's rise to supreme authority in Germany had tempered Churchill's loathing of Bolshevism. Four years earlier, in July 1934, in a speech endorsing the Soviet Union's successful application to join the League of Nations, Churchill had argued for reconciliation with Moscow to counter what he regarded as the far graver threat posed to the British Empire by the Nazis. His was not an ideological volte face but a strategic assessment of the teetering balance of power in Europe. In the same month, he had commanded the attention of the House of Commons as he urged his colleagues to understand that Russia was most deeply desirous of maintaining peace and could become a stabilising force in Europe. Conversely, he warned that the militaristic regime in Germany not only was bent on rearmament, but also might easily plunge into a foreign adventure of the most dangerous and catastrophic character to the whole world. Britain's future Prime Minister had judged Nazi Germany only too well. As anyone who had paid attention to the relevant passages in Mein Kampf would have known, Hitler's imperial vision was in no doubt. The Führer's demotic genius had been to find a language that would chime with the stab-in-the-back theory popular among Germans, that the Versailles Treaty had been an instrument of unlimited blackmail and shameful humiliation, which had fallen like a whiplash on the people, and with his obsessive appetite for territorial expansion. As he had indicated at the secret meeting with his generals as soon as he became Führer, Germany's only way to acquire Lebensraum was by invasion and conquest. Soon afterwards, in a speech to a gathering of rural policymakers, one of his most zealous adherents is Agriculture Minister Richard Dare, a high-ranking member of the SS, described the proposed geographical contours that would shape the Nazi Empire. The natural area for settlement by the German people is the territory to the east of the Reich's boundaries up to the Urals, bordered in the south by the Caucasus, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, and the watershed which divides the Mediterranean basin from the Baltic and the North Sea. We will settle this space according to the law that a superior people always has the right to conquer and to own the land of an inferior people. There would be arguments about the Reich's military priorities, options and timing, but no backsliding was permitted by those required to establish this new European order. In August 1934, on the death of Hindenburg, all members of the armed forces had been required to swear an oath of allegiance to Mein Führer. Seven months later, Hitler renounced the military prohibitions imposed on Germany at Versailles. A year after that, in March 1936, after formally abrogating the Locarno Treaty, German troops reoccupied the Rhineland. With the exception of the Soviet Union, Europe, like the United States, 
chose to avert its troubled gaze from these persistent violations. In London, there was no appetite for a military response. The absence of any significant protest or demonstration reinforced the judgment of the Secretary of State for War, Duff Cooper, that the public did not care two hoots about the remilitarization of the Rhineland. Similarly, most British MPs, according to one of their number, the diarist Harold Nicholson, were terribly pro-German, which means afraid of war. While Chamberlain's predecessor as Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, observed bleakly that Britain did not in any case have the military forces needed to enforce its treaty obligations. At a private meeting with senior Conservative parliamentarians in July 1936, Baldwin was complacency personified. When a deputation from both the Lords and the Commons arrived, he airily dismissed Churchill's warnings about Hitler, opining that, None of us knows what goes on in that strange man's mind. We all know his desire, and he's come out with it in his book, to move east, and if he should move east, it should not break my heart. If there's any fighting in Europe to be done, I should like to see the Bolshes and the Nazis doing it. In his clumsy way, the Prime Minister had articulated an attitude that was becoming commonplace in Whitehall and which, as Moscow had long suspected, would shape Britain's negotiating stance towards the Bolshevik regime in the next few years. That November in the House of Commons, Churchill, insistent that Britain should rearm against the Nazi threat, had been at his most withering about Baldwin's vacillating leadership. Everything, he assures us, is entirely fluid. I'm sure that is true. Anyone can see what the position is. The government simply cannot make up their mind, or they cannot get the Prime Minister to make up his mind. So they go on in strange paradox, decided only to be undecided, resolved to be irresolute, adamant for drift, solid for fluidity, all-powerful to be impotent. Two years later, on the 12th of March, 1938, by which time Hitler had appointed himself commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, the German Eighth Army marched triumphantly into Austria. To great rejoicing in Vienna, Hitler proclaimed his delight in his acquisition of the newest bastion of the German Reich. But there was much further to go. Within days of the Anschluss, Hitler set about finalising plans for his next conquest, telling his generals on the 28th of May, I'm utterly determined that Czechoslovakia should disappear from the map. The Czech president, Edvard Benesch, was informed that unless he ceded the Sudetenland, where the majority of the population was German, he would face the military consequences of his defiance. This prompted the other major European powers led by Britain to begin a bout of frenzied but despairing international diplomacy to avert that prospect. Willing to make almost any accommodation with Hitler to avoid another struggle on the European battlefield, Neville Chamberlain even boarded an aeroplane for the first time in 16 years to begin his own form of shuttle diplomacy, until, less a peer than a supplicant, he arrived in Munich in the last week of September to confirm that neither Britain nor France would offer any significant resistance to Hitler's demands. There were three and a half million disaffected ethnic Germans living in the Sudetenland, most of whom relished the thought of being liberated by the Nazis. Their relative economic deprivation had been exploited by their own leaders to produce a groundswell of nationalism and demands for autonomy. In an attempt to broker a compromise with the Czech government, Chamberlain had dispatched a mission to Prague in August 1938, led by the national liberal peer Lord Runciman. Unbeknown to the British, the German Sudeten leaders were under orders from Berlin to avoid making any such deal. Runciman failed, but on his return to London reported that the Sudeten minorities urged to turn to their kinsmen in Germany for help was a natural development under the circumstances. More significantly, no Western government, least of all Britain's, was willing to sacrifice its own armed forces in a military venture that was fraught with uncertainty. The prevailing view in London and Paris was that nothing could be done by arms to save Czechoslovakia from the panzers, 
Yet, despite the fact that the Nazis had increased military expenditure to the point where, by 1938, armaments consumed by far the greater part of the Reich's GDP, the Wehrmacht was not nearly so potent as the anti-appeasers believed. Ironically, Churchill's exaggerated claims about the Third Reich's military strength had the opposite effect to what he intended. They increased the support for appeasement. Thus, in his crassly worded BBC broadcast on the 27th of September, Chamberlain spoke for many who feared bombardment by the Luftwaffe when he said, How horrible, fantastic, incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks here because of a quarrel in a faraway land between people of whom we know nothing. And there was very little dissent when he added, however much we may sympathise with a small nation confronted by a big and powerful neighbour, we cannot in all circumstances undertake to involve the whole British Empire in war simply on her account. If we have to fight on, it must be on larger issues than that. Benish was both humiliated and devastated. Excluded altogether from the Munich negotiations, he had no choice but to acquiesce in the deal agreed over his head the following day by the British Prime Minister, joined by the leaders of France and Italy, as they signed away the Sudetenland to the Nazis. Within Germany itself, the Nazis had been working simultaneously to realise Hitler's vision for the Third Reich on the home front. From the moment he came to power, those who dared to oppose Nazism were persecuted by the state police for violating new treason laws and incarcerated in their thousands. Not content with this, Göring, Himmler, who had now been given command of the SS, and Heydrich, whom Himmler had chosen as his successor to run the Gestapo, drew up a hit list of those Nazis they regarded as threats to Hitler's supreme authority. During the Night of the Long Knives at the end of June 1934, the SS and the Gestapo, supported by members of Göring's personal battalion, killed 85 stormtroopers, members of the Nazi paramilitary organization led by Ernst Röhm, whom Hitler feared as a rival. Röhm himself was arrested, imprisoned, and shot dead at point-blank range. Hitler justified this purge on the grounds of Röhm's treason. These killings coincided with a wave of repressive measures taken against those who failed to meet the Aryan ideal. Among those to be rounded up and incarcerated in prison camps were vagrants, drug addicts and homosexuals. Himmler had toughened the pre-existing law criminalising homosexuality. This persecution and purification of Germany bore a similarity to the methods adopted by the NKVD in the Soviet Union. Although the numbers thus imprisoned were far smaller than those who filled the Soviet gulag, the underlying principle was chillingly similar. Likewise, with terrifying intensity, Hitler's determination to liquidate the Jewish bacillus had acquired accelerating momentum. By 1938, only 9,000 of the 50,000 Jewish companies that had been in operation when Hitler came to power still survived. The rest, large and small, had been forced to sell up or close down, greatly to the advantage of firms such as Mannesmann, Krupp and IG Farben, who bought these assets at rock-bottom prices. In the same year, a host of other restrictions was imposed. Jewish doctors and lawyers were forbidden to practice, and in August, a decree was issued instructing all Jews to add either the word Israel or Sarah to their official papers. From October of that year, the single letter J was stamped in all Jewish passports. The assassination in Paris on the 7th of November 1938 of Ernst von Rath, a Nazi diplomat, by the 17-year-old Herschel Grinspan, a German-born Polish Jew, became the trigger and excuse for an anti-Semitic pogrom 48 hours later. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, was an orchestrated eruption of popular hatred. As the authorities watched on approvingly, many hundreds of Jewish homes, schools and hospitals in cities across Germany and Austria, following the Anschluss earlier in the year, were vandalised. 
more than 1,000 synagogues and 7,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed or ransacked. At least a hundred Jews were killed in a murderous spree led by the SA, now headed by Rome's chief of staff, Victor Lutzer, much diminished in influence following the Night of the Long Knives, but no less useful as an instrument of state brutality. Many more Jewish families were subjected to physical abuse and random beatings. More than 1,300 individuals are estimated to have died either from their wounds or by their own hand, so terrified were they by the pogrom. Following that atrocity, 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up and arbitrarily detained in concentration camps at Dachau, Sachsenhausen, both established in 1933, and the recently opened Buchenwald. Here they endured abuse and other cruelties designed to persuade them that their only prospect of salvation was to flee Germany. To tighten the screws still further, the government issued a raft of decrees under which Jews were forbidden to own cars, enter public libraries, theatres, cinemas, concert halls, lecture theatres or swimming pools, have a telephone or even own a pet. In the ensuing panic, long queues formed outside foreign embassies and consulates as tens of thousands of Jews scrambled to find a way of escape. Victor Klemperer was the son of a rabbi, a cousin of the conductor Otto Klemperer, and a notable scholar who had been dismissed from his post as a professor of Romance languages following a ban on Jewish academics. On the 6th of December 1938, Fearing that it would take years for him and his disabled wife to acquire the necessary visas or to buy emigration papers, he wrote in his diary that under the accumulating pressure, our nerves have gone to the dogs. He had heard alarming whispers about the concentration camps, one of which came from his friend Alfred Aron, who had just been released from one of them. Frightful hints and fragmentary stories from Buchenwald, he noted that evening. No one comes back from there a second time. Between ten and twenty people die every day anyway. Kristallnacht and its aftermath were widely reported abroad, shocking civilised opinion in the rest of the world. The persecution of German Jewry could no longer be dismissed as a perverse ideological aspiration. It was, unambiguously and overtly, a flagrant crime against humanity. Klemperer, who was one of only a handful of Jews to survive the war without leaving Germany, was dismayed by those of his peers who were ready to collaborate with the Nazi authorities in the hope of finding an escape route to an establishment of a Jewish state in some remote corner of the world. The solution to the Jewish question, he wrote, can only be found in the deliverance from those who invented it, and the world, because this really does concern the world will be forced to act accordingly. His optimism was premature. In the 1930s, the world, at least in the form of its European governments, had no more intention of confronting Hitler over the persecution of the Jews than it had had of confronting Stalin over the persecution of the Kulaks. When human rights were weighed in the balance against national self-interest, they were inevitably found wanting. By the autumn of 1938, Nazi triumphalism was rampant. A short while before putting his name to the Munich Agreement, Hitler addressed 15,000 members of the Nazi party in the Berlin Sportpalast. In the words of the US correspondent William Scharrer, who had been in Germany since 1933, he was shouting and shrieking in the worst state of excitement I've ever seen him in, full of more venom than even he has ever shown. For the first time in all the years I've observed him, he seemed tonight to have completely lost control of himself. As the Fuhrer sat down, Goebbels leapt up to shout, One thing is sure, 1918 will never be repeated. At this, according to Shara, Hitler looked up to him, a wild, eager expression in his eyes, as if those were the words which he had been searching for all evening and hadn't quite found. He leapt to his feet, and with a fanatical fire in his eyes that I shall never forget, brought his right hand, after a grand sweep, 
pounding down on the table and yelled with all the power in his mighty lungs, Yah! Then he slumped into his chair, exhausted. Chapter 4 Self-Delusion and Bad Faith Chamberlain appeared genuinely to think that he had secured peace for our time at Munich. As he wrote soon afterwards to the Archbishop of Canterbury, I sincerely believe that we have at last opened the way to that general appeasement which alone can save the world from chaos. Judging by the euphoria that greeted his return, most British people were initially only too eager to share his delusion. More than 20,000 laudatory letters poured into 10 Downing Street, along with an astonishing array of gifts, which ranged from fishing rods and umbrellas to a grand piano and a pair of Dutch clogs. King George VI and many of his family wrote to congratulate the Prime Minister. In Parliament there was similar adulation. In this feverish atmosphere, the minority of anti-appeasers in and out of the chamber were rounded on for allegedly betraying their country. Duff Cooper, who resigned from the cabinet the day after Munich in protest, was among those to be denounced as a traitor. When Churchill was similarly traduced, he gave as good as he got, apparently berating one fellow Tory like a Billingsgate fishwife. Beyond the Westminster hothouse, the public mood was no less intemperate. The novelist Barbara Cartland observed that people who were ordinarily calm and unpolitically minded lost their tempers, were furious with those who disagreed with them, rude and offensive at the slightest provocation. The mood was short-lived. As though the nation had imbibed excessively from a heady cocktail, the jubilation was followed by a hangover. As the doubts began to surface, the thin-skinned Prime Minister became peevish, turning on his critics in the Commons who had the temerity to insist that the Nazis should no longer be indulged and that Britain should rearm to confront the aggressor. In one of several similar letters to his sister Ida, to whom he frequently confided his innermost thoughts, Chamberlain betrayed the petulance that so often marred his judgment, complaining that Churchill and his followers were carrying on a regular conspiracy against me. Chamberlain's gall was breathtaking. In a clear breach of the very values he accused Churchill of violating, he was himself about to initiate a conspiratorial venture of his own. Though he shared the widespread disgust at the anti-Semitic rampage on Kristallnacht, he refused to allow the outrage it provoked in Britain to divert him from his resolve to keep the embers of appeasement glowing. Given the febrile atmosphere, though, he had to move by stealth. Without informing his foreign secretary, Lord Halifax, who had started to have second thoughts about appeasement, he sanctioned the opening of secret channels to Berlin, through which a succession of amateur emissaries sought on his behalf to encourage the Führer to abandon his territorial ambitions and instead work with Chamberlain to consolidate the peace that the Prime Minister still thought he might construct on the rickety foundations of Munich. On one occasion, the 29th of November 1938, after the Foreign Office, VAR MI5, found out about a particularly egregious example of this Prime Ministerial subterfuge, Halifax confronted Chamberlain with the evidence, but without revealing his source. The Prime Minister affected to have no knowledge of any such contact claiming that the Foreign Secretary's revelation left him aghast. Halifax chose to believe him. By now, Hitler did not bother to conceal his demented worldview. Addressing a gathering of 3,600 young officers in the grand mosaic hall of Albert Speer's new Reich Chancellery on 18th of January 1939, he demanded their unconditional belief that our Reich will one day be the dominant power in Europe, declaring his unshakable will that the German Wehrmacht should become the strongest armed force of the entire world. Twelve days later, on the 30th of January 1939, addressing a fervently enthusiastic Reichstag, he went further, explicitly linking his vision for Lebensraum with his readiness 
to annihilate the Jews. If the warmongering Jewish media and its political allies in the United States and Britain sought to thwart German aspirations, the Third Reich was ready to resist. If international finance jury inside and outside Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, he warned, the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth and thereby the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. And on the 10th of February 1939, he told a gathering of senior commanders that Germany's future was contingent on the acquisition of more Lebensraum, the thought of which, he promised, will dominate my entire being. I will never draw back from the most extreme measures. A month later, as though he had never signed the Munich Agreement, Hitler summoned the elderly president of the Czech state, Dr. Emil Archer, to Berlin. Barely pausing for the diplomatic niceties, Hitler told him brusquely that German troops were about to march on the Czech capital. According to his interpreter Paul Schmidt, he went on, The entry of German troops cannot be stopped. If you want to avoid bloodshed, you had better telephone to Prague at once and tell your minister for war to order Czech forces to offer no resistance. With that, the Führer terminated the interview. Having no choice but to comply, the ailing Archer signed a joint communique, which had been drafted by Hitler before the meeting, that incorporated Czechoslovakia into the Greater German Reich. Hitler's elation at this bloodless triumph was unbounded. Such was his hubris that he evidently required his two female secretaries to plant a kiss on either cheek as he said, This is the happiest day of my life. I will go down as the greatest German in history. As British officials were well aware, the Führer's appetite was far from sated. A Whitehall memorandum from Gladwin Jebb whose task was to collate the intelligence from a range of European sources for the Foreign Office, was as prescient as it was unequivocal. Germany is controlled by one man, Herr Hitler, whose will is supreme, and who is a blend of fanatic, madman, and clear-visioned realist. He regards Germany's supremacy in Europe as a step to world supremacy. At present, he is devoting special attention to the eastward drive, to securing control of the exploitable riches of the South, and possibly more, of Russia. But Herr Hitler is incalculable, even to his intimates. Hitler's next target was Poland. In 1934, at Berlin's invitation, the Poles had signed a ten-year non-aggression pact with Germany that was designed to deter the Soviet Union. They had cooperated in the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia by annexing parts of Moravia and Silesia, but they reckoned without Hitler's vulpine treachery. When Warsaw refused to surrender Danzig in April 1939, Hitler decided that Poland should be obliterated by force. On this occasion, though, his thuggery did not go unchallenged. Belatedly appearing to acknowledge that to appease Hitler was to feed an insatiable appetite. Chamberlain had stood in the House of Commons on the 31st of March 1939 to give the Poles a formal undertaking that if they came under attack and sought assistance, it would be provided. At last, the Prime Minister had laid down a red line. Were Hitler to march on Warsaw, he would face a military confrontation with both Britain and France as well as Poland. Chamberlain's warning drove Hitler into paroxysms of fury, but he was not to be thwarted. On the contrary, it stimulated him to ramp up an alternative means to the same end. Hitler had been careful not to sever relations with the Soviet Union when he came to power. Although he repeatedly used the most bellicose language in different places at different times, to express his loathing for the Bolshevik wire-pullers who had their international Jewish headquarters in Moscow. His anti-communist tirades were directed principally at his domestic opponents rather than the Kremlin. 
while warning that rapid rearmament was necessary to avoid a victory of Bolshevism over Germany that would lead not to a Versailles Treaty but to the final destruction, indeed the annihilation of the German people, he was well aware that the Reich's industrial output was still heavily dependent on Soviet raw materials. Similarly, although the Kremlin routinely used Pravda as its mouthpiece to ridicule the German Chancellor as variously an idiot or a madman who was possessed by a demon, Stalin was careful to ensure that this war of words should not be misconstrued as evidence of belligerent intent. Like Hitler, he was shadowboxing, not fighting, but sparring. Faced with Chamberlain's ultimatum, a truce in the war of words with the Kremlin appeared to offer Hitler a possible solution to his immediate frustrations. Poland, which had re-emerged as a nation-state in 1918, but since 1926 had been under military dictatorship, formed a buffer between the two European behemoths. If he could secure a compact with Moscow, the threat of a Soviet military response to a German invasion of Poland would be greatly reduced. Despite their ideological animosities, the framework for such a deal was already in place. The Third Reich merely had to rekindle the still glowing embers of an old fire. From 1922, when the Weimar leaders signed the Treaty of Rapallo, until Hitler became Führer in 1933, Germany's special relationship with the Soviet Union had flourished to the benefit of both. Very soon after his accession, despite persecuting communists within Germany and repeatedly advising his cabinet that the primary goal of his foreign policy was the eradication of an international Jewish Bolshevist plague, Hitler had renewed the 1926 Berlin Treaty, which itself reaffirmed the neutrality pledges embodied in the Rapallo Treaty signed by Chicherin and Rathenau in 1922. Under the terms of their trading relationship, Germany was still able to import precious raw materials, including manganese, chrome, oil and iron ore, from the Soviets' vast store of mineral wealth in return for the provision of sorely needed industrial machinery. Hitler was not so lacking in reason as to overlook the fact that without a secure supply of such imports, it would be impossible for Germany to create a war machine capable of any offensive action, let alone powerful enough to establish hegemony over the entire continent. Even with these resources and a massive rearmament program, he was aware of the statistics, which revealed that in an arms race with the Western democracies, even if the United States were to remain on the sidelines, Germany would very soon become the loser. In these circumstances, the attractions of renewing an economic and strategic partnership, even with the devil incarnate, were irresistible. Realpolitik still prevailed. Hitler did not rush to embrace Stalin, but his tone began to soften markedly. During a two-hour harangue at the Reichstag on the 28th of April 1939, he denounced Britain and mocked Roosevelt, but refrained from delivering his usual diatribe against the Soviet Union. Four weeks later, on the 23rd of May, at a private meeting with his most senior generals, he reasserted his determination to carry out the destruction of Poland which, as they already knew, was timetabled for the late summer. At some point after that, he advised them, he would turn on Britain. Britain is our enemy, and the showdown with England is a matter of life and death, he told his pliant listeners. Once again, though, he refrained from delivering one of his familiar anti-Soviet tirades. Instead, he suggested, albeit obliquely, that a political and economic understanding with Moscow might be in the offing. Hitler's timing was fortuitously exquisite. By May, Stalin had come to the view that to open a dialogue with his ideological nemesis in Berlin might be judicious. Faced with the threat of an expansionist Germany, he had to make a choice between seeking an Anglo-French alliance or forming a compact with Hitler. This was not the first time he had nurtured such a thought. As early as 1934, he had spoken admiringly of Hitler's methods, which so nearly mirrored his own. 
At a meeting of the Politburo, a few days after the Night of the Long Knives, he said, Have you heard the news from Germany? About what happened? How he got rid of Rome? Good chap, that Hitler. He showed how to deal with political opponents. And in January 1937, he had authorised his chief negotiator in Berlin, David Kandelaki, to sound out the prospects for Soviet-German political agreement as an alternative to confrontation. At that point, however, Hitler had been unresponsive. Stalin did not take Berlin's Nine to be Hitler's final word, but in the spirit of realpolitik, he decided to try another means to avoid the Soviet Union being dragged into a European conflagration. Despite his abiding suspicion of Britain's political establishment, he had not forgotten that only twenty years earlier Britain had been fighting against him and his fellow revolutionaries on the Civil War battlefield, or that London had treated the Soviet Union as a potential adversary ever since. He opted to recalibrate Moscow's relationship with the British government. He had just the man for the task in his foreign minister, Maxim Litvinov, who had successfully negotiated the reopening of diplomatic relations with the United States in 1934. It had been Litvinov's guiding hand that had steered the Comintern away from its subversive role as an agent of global revolution to become an instrument to promote popular fronts against fascism, and it was his polished diplomacy that in the name of collective security had secured the Soviet Union a place in the European sun as a member of the League of Nations in 1934. Despite the show trials and the purges, the Great Terror as this period became known, he had skilfully managed to avoid committing the Kremlin to any foreign policy initiatives that might further have fuelled Britain's animosity. Litvinov had taken the diplomatic initiative a few days after the Anschluss by using a press conference in Moscow on the 17th of March 1938 to float the proposal for an anti-Nazi alliance that might deter Germany from any further actions of that kind. Chamberlain's response was bleak and hostile. In a rambling speech in the House of Commons, the Prime Minister brusquely dismissed the Soviet proposal as an attempt to negotiate a mutual undertaking in advance to resist aggression, which His Majesty's government for their part are unwilling to accept. When the Soviet ambassador Maisky noted that the Prime Minister feels with his every fibre that the USSR is the principal enemy, he was close to the mark. In a private letter to his sister Ida, written a few days before that Commons performance, Chamberlain wrote of his belief that the Russians were stealthily and cunningly pulling all the strings behind the scenes to get us involved in war with Germany. Litvinov did not give up. A year later, in April 1939, as Europe slid closer to the cataclysm of a war over Poland, he tried once again. On this occasion, he proposed the formation of an Anglo-French Soviet pact to deter Hitler from further aggression by providing mutual support and guarantees to the nation-states of Central and Eastern Europe. According to Halifax's permanent secretary, Alexander Cadogan, the foreign secretary was almost unrecognisable from the H of a year ago and evidently ready to warm up relations with Russia and in due course to dispatch a minister to Moscow. Nonetheless, Britain's initial response to the Soviet overture, which took three weeks to deliver, was glacial. Disdain and mistrust still prevailed. With a Mandarin's dry detachment, Cadogan summed up the Foreign Office view, noting, The Russian proposal is extremely inconvenient. We have to balance the advantage of a paper commitment by Russia to join a war on one side, against the disadvantage of associating ourselves openly with Russia. According to one senior official in the department, Lawrence Collier, the cabinet's attitude was even more brutally cynical. In a note to his colleague William Strang, he wrote that Chamberlain's policy was being driven by the desire to secure Russian help, but at the same time to leave our hands free to enable Germany to expand eastward at Russian expense. The Prime Minister, who had yet to lose his appetite for appeasement, remained adamantly opposed to closer ties with the Soviet Union. Maisky's sour observation that 
For psychological reasons, the Prime Minister is still unable to swallow such a pact, since it would throw him into the anti-German camp once and for all, thus putting an end to all projects aimed at reviving appeasement, was nonetheless acute. Stalin was a victim of paranoia, but in the case of the British Prime Minister, his suspicions were not without foundation. By the spring of 1939, despite Britain's guarantee to Poland, it was not at all fanciful for him to imagine Hitler and Chamberlain trying once more to settle their differences around the conference table at the expense of the Soviet Union. Such brooding fueled his obsessive fear that London would be content to stand aside while the Nazis launched a blitzkrieg against the East that would inevitably suck the Soviet Union into a military conflict for which the Soviet Union was ill-prepared. Frustrated by Britain's reluctance to engage in more than a diplomatic skirmish, the Kremlin, as Britain's intelligence services were by now aware, had already decided to respond positively to Berlin's cautious overtures. Driven by the compelling need to avoid being drawn into war, Moscow thus initiated a twin-track strategy that led in opposite directions, one to London, the other to Berlin. Early in May, to further the Berlin option, Stalin sent a very clear message to the Nazi leadership by publicly and brutally sacking Litvinov, the long-serving advocate and architect of collective security, whose Jewish heritage had long been the butt of anti-Semitic sneers in Germany, where he was mockingly referred to as Finkelstein Litvinov. With his usual callousness, Stalin fabricated treasonable charges against his foreign minister, which were so far-fetched that even his kangaroo court was unable to sustain them. Possibly as a result of this, or more probably because he had nurtured valuable contacts in the West, Litvinov's life was spared. Instead, he became a non-person, until two years later he was rehabilitated as the Soviet ambassador to the United States. Litvinov's replacement as the People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, was the chairman of the Council of Ministers, Vyacheslav Molotov, who had distinguished himself earlier in the decade as one of Stalin's most tyrannical acolytes. Stonas, allegedly so named because Stalin kicked his posterior so often and because he could outsit any interlocutor, was an immensely powerful figure in the Politburo. Cold, cynical and uncompromising, his style and outlook were in sharp contrast to those of his predecessor. Where Litvinov was emollient, Molotov was abrasive. Where the former disdained dialogue with Nazis, the latter had no such aversion. Where the outgoing minister believed that collective security, in the form of a partnership with Britain and France, offered the most promising way of avoiding war, his replacement was scornful of his predecessor's floundering attempts to join hands with London and Paris. The sacking of Litvinov and the advent of Molotov set the dovecots fluttering in Westminster, so much so that Churchill found himself supported by a swelling lobby when, on the 19th of May 1939, in the House of Commons, he argued powerfully in favour of a British alliance with the Soviet Union to counter the dangerous promise of Berlin-Moscow cooperation. The prospective alliance is solely for the purpose of resisting further acts of aggression and of protecting the victims of aggression, he insisted, before in mocking tones asking rhetorically, what is wrong with this simple proposal? It is said, can you trust the Russian Soviet government? I suppose in Moscow, they say, can we trust Chamberlain? I hope that we may say that the answer to both questions is in the affirmative. I earnestly hope so. The chiefs of staff, who had hitherto been vehemently averse to any talk of an alliance with the Soviet Union, though simultaneously fearing a rapprochement between Moscow and Berlin, had also, in Cadogan's words, come round to a whole hog alliance with the Soviet Union. Even the Foreign Office, where anti-Bolshevik sentiment was still intense, was reluctantly drawn to the same conclusion. 
As much as the cabinet felt the same way, the Prime Minister found himself under growing pressure to change tack. But Chamberlain was obdurate. On the 20th of May, Cadogan came away from a meeting with him to note, in his present mood, PM says he'll resign rather than sign alliance with Soviets. Mirroring Stalin's suspicion that Britain would collude with the Nazis to overthrow the Soviet Union, Chamberlain wrote, I cannot rid myself of the suspicion that they, the Soviets, are chiefly concerned to see the capitalist powers tear each other to pieces while they stay out themselves. Yet even he could not ignore the groundswell of public and parliamentary opinion or the shift in his cabinet's attitude. A few days after Churchill's acerbic onslaught in the Commons, he reluctantly authorised a formal attempt to secure a tripartite alliance between Britain, France and the Soviet Union. Moscow clearly believed that in the face of this putative coalition, Hitler would back off. Similarly, Halifax recorded the Prime Minister's opinion that Herr Hitler was not a fool and would never enter a war which he was bound to lose. The only thing he understood was force. Halifax was minded to agree. Meiske urged the Foreign Secretary to lead the British negotiating team himself. Halifax was tempted, but under pressure from Chamberlain, he refused to go to Moscow in person, lest it suggest that the British were overly eager to secure a deal. In his stead, he elected to send a middle-ranking Foreign Office official, William Strang. A tall, donnish, bespectacled figure, Strang was an accomplished diplomat who had already served in Moscow and was most unlikely to be intimidated by an ignorant and suspicious peasant, as Molotov was deemed to be by the ever Washbis Cadogan. However, Churchill's scathing comment that Strang was without any standing outside the Foreign Office echoed Moscow's sense that the Soviet Union was being fobbed off with a negotiating nobody. The mutual distrust between London and Moscow, and to a lesser extent between Paris and Moscow, was exemplified by the icy welcome given to the Anglo-French negotiating team by the new Soviet foreign minister when the talks opened on the 15th of June. What started badly was destined to get worse. To his great frustration, Strang was straitjacketed by Chamberlain's refusal to allow him to discuss a comprehensive treaty that would entail the provision of mutual support in the face of indirect as well as direct aggression. For Moscow, this was a sine qua known for any meaningful cooperation. While the British feared that the Comintern was still a dangerously subversive force that would foment communism in the region, the Russians feared a Nazi inspired uprising in one or other of Latvia, Lithuania or Estonia, the three Baltic states that bordered the Soviet Union. An impasse became inevitable. Molotov's diplomatic style was disconcerting. By turns thuggish and unyielding, he was only too ready to slice through the diplomatic veneer with a crudity that might have dumbfounded a less resilient interlocutor. As Strang would recall, Molotov interrupted one of their exchanges with the words, If His Majesty's government and the French government, whose emissaries in Moscow played a secondary role, treat the Soviet government as nitwits and nincompoops, then I myself can afford to smile, but I cannot guarantee that everyone will take so calm a view. Whether or not this was intended as a threat, it hardly contributed to progress. There was no meeting of minds. Each demanded compromises that the other was unwilling to make, rather as though they were haggling over the price of a carpet in an oriental bazaar, rather than seeking to settle the fate of nations. In London, Cadogan gave vent to his personal antipathy towards Moscow. The Russians are intolerable. We give them all they want with both hands, and they merely slap them. Conversely, as the talks blundered into the quicksands, Molotov, infuriated by London's obstinate determination to limit any agreement to a political declaration of mutual support, likened the British to crooks and cheats. From a Soviet perspective, a political entente without a military commitment was barely worth the paper it was written on. 
Strang, who was frustrated by Molotov's insistence on stubbornly and woodenly repeating his arguments, nonetheless had some sympathy with the Russian position. On the 20th of July, exercising admirable restraint, he advised the Foreign Office that the British negotiating stance by which he was straitjacketed had created an impression that we may not be seriously seeking an agreement. We should perhaps have been wiser to pay the Soviet price for this agreement at an earlier stage. As Strang well knew, he had been sent on something of a fool's errand, as bagman for a British strategy that possessed neither candour nor good faith. The looming collapse of the Moscow talks did not in any way appear to disconcert Chamberlain or Halifax, who had evidently shifted his ground. On the very day that Strang reproached his Whitehall counterparts for the unhelpful procrastinations imposed on him by London, the Foreign Secretary coolly informed his Cabinet colleagues that the prospect of a breakdown in negotiations did not cause him very great anxiety, since whatever formal agreement is signed, the Soviet government will probably take what action best suits them if war breaks out. Chamberlain, who was still intent on reopening a productive dialogue with Hitler that might lead the German dictator to abort his plans to invade Poland, was even less concerned by the impasse in Moscow. On the 19th of July, Sir Horace Wilson, the head of the Home Civil Service, Chamberlain's trusted confidant and an indefatigable appeaser, held the first of two secret meetings with Dr. Helmut Volthat, a senior German trade official sent to London by Goering, who had been appointed the Third Reich's economic supremo three years earlier. Wilson's apparent objective, which he subsequently denied, was to bribe Hitler with a huge loan to opt for peace instead of war. Immediately after their second meeting the following day, Voltart was invited to a private meeting with Robert Hudson, Britain's Minister for Overseas Trade. Hudson evidently proposed a number of ways by which Hitler might be induced to choose peace rather than war. Unhappily, the minister was notoriously indiscreet and could not refrain from boasting about this initiative to two prominent journalists. The following day, the Daily Telegraph and the News Chronicle blazoned their front pages with reports that along with other economic stimuli, Britain would indeed provide the Third Reich with a huge loan in return for German disarmament under international supervision. The impact was immediate and predictable. Pandemonium in the press, questions in the Commons, dismay on the Quai d'Orsay, and, according to Britain's ambassador to Italy, Sir Percy Lorraine, ridicule at Britain's shock-like mania of buying the world. The reports could hardly have come at a worse moment. Halifax's private secretary, Oliver Harvey, who was both fiercely opposed to appeasement and a gifted diarist, noted bleakly that these reports were calculated to do infinite harm to Soviet negotiations. Whether the story is true or not, it is a very silly proposal. The Prime Minister similarly regarded Hudson's indiscretions as disastrous, but for very different reasons. His focus was not on the Soviet reaction, but the reaction from Berlin. Not for the first time, he complained, the trade minister had taken ideas on which other people had been working for years and put them forward as his own. It was particularly galling on this occasion, as Hudson had evidently filched his proposal for an economic arrangement with Germany from 10 Downing Street. It was also infuriating to have his scheme for renewing a secret dialogue with Hitler so rudely preempted by the semi-official air which Hudson's incontinence had bestowed on his own nascent ideas for avoiding war. Despite the scorn that was now heaped on his government, Chamberlain was not willing to alter course. In a letter to his sister Hilda, he spoke of opening discreeter channels by which contact can be maintained for it is important that those in Germany who would like to see us come to an understanding should not be discouraged. My critics, of course, think it would be a frightful thing to come to any agreement with Germany without first having given her a thorough thrashing, 
but I don't share that view. His obstinate resolve was fortified by a firm conviction that an alliance between Hitler and Stalin was inconceivable. He could hardly have been more wrong. With the invasion of Poland still scheduled for late August, Hitler was in a hurry. Rather than seeking a peace dividend with Britain, his overriding objective now was a pact with the Soviet Union that would, in effect, license the Polish offensive. By weaning the Russians away from any diplomatic or military entanglement with the British, he hoped to avoid an unpalatable choice, either to postpone Operation White, as the invasion of Poland was codenamed, or risk prosecuting a war on two fronts, the prospect of which was anathema to the German high command. At the Führer's behest, his foreign minister went on the diplomatic warpath. In a strongly contested field, Joachim von Ribbentrop was as repellent as any of Hitler's many odious acolytes. As the German ambassador to Britain between 1934 and 1938, he had managed to alienate almost everyone except the sillier members of the pro-German lobby. Widely derided as coarse and ridiculous, he was aptly described by his personal secretary, Reinhard Spitzi, as pompous, conceited, and not too intelligent. Nonetheless, he was slithery enough to ingratiate himself with the Führer and thus to acquire growing influence in those critical months of 1939. Bitterly anglophobic, he was only too anxious to broker a deal between Berlin and Moscow. In early June, Berlin had initiated a discreet and cautious flirtation with Moscow. At first, the Russians responded coolly, but it did not take long before they started to show an interest. By the middle of the following month, Ribbentrop felt confident enough to press matters further. On the 21st of July, he dispatched a senior member of his staff, Karl Schnur, to meet the Soviet chargé d'affaires in Berlin, Georgi Astakov. While Chamberlain fantasized about a peace deal with Hitler and the Anglo-Soviet talks headed towards the buffers, Schnur sketched out the contours of a far-reaching proposal, the re-establishment of economic ties, the normalization of relations, and a political treaty that would be buttressed by their shared antipathy towards the capitalist democracies. The Kremlin was tempted. The flirtation became a proposition. In the Soviet capital, the British negotiators had no inkling of Ribbentrop's dramatic overture. But Strang had long foreseen that in his overriding urge to avoid war, Stalin would have few scruples about seeking solace in an alternative embrace with Nazi Germany in the absence of an agreement with Britain. Accordingly, he cabled Cadogan to warn that if we want an agreement with them, the Soviets, we shall have to pay their price or something very near it. That price was Molotov's insistence that Britain open military talks alongside the political negotiations forthwith. Echoing Strang, the British ambassador Sir William Seeds pressed the point, insisting the arrival in Moscow of a British military mission is the only proof of our sincerity which the Soviet government is likely to accept. Every member of the Politburo consider the present British government is imbued with the spirit of capitulation, if possible, to the Axis powers. To preserve an illusion of purpose and progress, Chamberlain reluctantly agreed that a joint Anglo-French military mission be dispatched to the Soviet capital, ostensibly to discuss ways in which their forces could collaborate to deter Hitler from further military adventures. The mission was to be led by Admiral the Honourable Sir Reginald Aylmer Drax, who had enjoyed a good war, but had no significant experience as a negotiator at a senior level, let alone on behalf of his government in the heat of a diplomatic standoff. He was astute enough both to be aware of his limitations and to suspect that he was being sent on a mission impossible. On the eve of his departure, he sought guidance from Halifax. What should he do, he asked, if the negotiations in Moscow began to falter? The foreign secretary paused before telling him that in such circumstances he should draw out the negotiations as long as possible. The urge to keep the Russians dangling on the diplomatic hook, while Chamberlain, 
as the Politburo had suspected, persisted in his attempts to appease Hitler, was not merely a clumsy manoeuvre, but spectacularly ill-judged. The House of Commons was about to rise for the summer recess. Halifax himself prepared to spend the glorious 12th of August, which marked the start of the grouse shooting season, at his Yorkshire estate. Chamberlain looked forward to a spell of fishing in Scotland. On the 2nd of August, their holiday plans were momentarily called into question when Churchill, reflecting a widespread sentiment, used the adjournment debate to join Labour in demanding that the House should curtail its summer recess, which was due to last until the 3rd of October. Warning his colleagues that there would soon be a supreme trial of willpower, if not a supreme trial of arms, the rebellious backbencher castigated Chamberlain, declaring it would be disastrous, it would be pathetic, it would be shameful for the House of Commons to write itself off as an effective and potent factor in the situation. At his acerbic best, he added that he hoped the government would not say to the House, Be gone, run off and play, take your gas mask with you, do not worry about public affairs. Churchill's sarcastic rebuke was to no avail. Guns, fishing rods, buckets and spades disappeared with their owners to various country retreats, while on the 5th of August, Drax and his delegation, accompanied by a French negotiating team, set off for the Soviet Union. As though to demonstrate his intent, Halifax instructed the Admiral that they should travel at a leisurely pace in a cargo vessel, capable of thirteen knots, rather than a British or French cruiser capable of thirty knots, or even an aircraft. Later, Drax justified this decision on the grounds that the government was unwilling to divert a warship or bomber from their vital military tasks. As a result, the delegation did not reach Moscow until the 11th of August. The Russians were already aggrieved by what they regarded as persistent and deliberate distortions of their foreign policy by Chamberlain's apologists in the House of Commons. A few days before his empty-handed return to London, Strang was summoned to the Kremlin by Molotov to be reprimanded in the chilliest manner. You appear to be deliberately misunderstanding us. Do you not trust the Soviet Union? Do you think we are not interested in security too? It is a grave mistake. In time, you will realize how great a mistake it is to distrust the government of the USSR. As soon became clear, the Soviets had no more intention of negotiating in good faith than the British. Nonetheless, such ominous language did little to suggest that Drax, whose lowly diplomatic status was, like that of Strang, interpreted by a prickly Molotov as a gesture of British disdain, would lift the darkening mood in the Soviet capital. For the British political team, it was a momentary relief to discover that the military negotiating baton was to be passed from the Commissar for Foreign Affairs to Marshal Clement Voroshilov, the imposing but ostensibly genial Commissar for Defence. The relief was short-lived. The cordial reception Voroshilov gave the Anglo-French negotiators rapidly gave way to irritation when he discovered that his interlocutors had no negotiating mandate let alone the authority to sign a military accord. Nothing could have been better calculated to confirm Moscow's growing conviction that the British and their junior partners, the French, were merely toying with the Soviet Union, while, in Britain's case at least, seeking to repair the fraying ties with Hitler. Earlier in the year, Stalin had used a speech to claim that the capitalist democracies wished to foster a war between Germany and Russia in the course of which the combatants would so weaken and exhaust one another as to force them as enfeebled belligerents to accept a peace imposed on them by their Western adversaries. The sentiment was crudely expressed, but the Soviet leader's words contained more than a kernel of truth. From London's perspective, it was indeed better if there were to be war and blood spilled, as Baldwin had said, it should be that of the Bolshes and the Nazis rather than the British. It rapidly emerged 
that any residual hope Moscow may still have nurtured for a triple alliance with the British and French was doomed. A killer question from Voroshilov settled the matter. If Hitler were to invade Poland, he wanted to know, would the government in Warsaw permit the Red Army to cross Polish territory in coordination with the two Western democracies to confront the Wehrmacht? Unable to give a clear answer, the embarrassed leaders of the Anglo-French delegation sought advice from respectively London and Paris. The response from the Quai d'Orsay was swift. The French delegation should sign a draft agreement forthwith. In Whitehall, the deputy chiefs of staff met on the 16th of August to urge their political masters that the strongest pressure should be put on Warsaw to permit the Russians to fight the Germans on Polish soil. In so advising, they demonstrated a woeful ignorance of the toxic history of Polish-Russian relations. They may have been right to argue that this was the best way of preventing a war and avoiding the profoundly undesirable alternative of a possible Soviet-German rapprochement, but they ignored the fact that there were no circumstances in which Warsaw would permit Soviet troops to enter Poland's sovereign territory. As it happened, their advice was ignored in any case. The Prime Minister was still fly-fishing in Scotland, where the salmon were evidently in plentiful supply, enough at any rate for him to send one back to London to a gratified Cadogan who had so far refused to burden his political master with affairs of state. The permanent secretary was adamant about this. When Sir Robert Van Sittart, the government's chief diplomatic adviser, rang him on the 18th of August in what he described acidly as a high state of excitement to pass on a warning from a source in Berlin that Hitler was about to invade Poland, Cadogan was unmoved. After consulting Halifax, he decided that Chamberlain should not be disturbed over what he dismissed as a war of nerves. Cadogan's insuissance was pervasive. In Moscow, the British ambassador William Seeds waited in vain for a reply to his urgent request for an answer to Voroshilov's question. The telegram from Seeds was eventually discovered in the relevant Foreign Office archive. A caustic note had been scribbled in the margin. It was not possible to send an answer to this telegram, as no decision was taken. After nine days of fruitless discussion, the Defence Commissar brought the talks to a shuddering halt by declaring bluntly that further talks can lead merely to a lot of chatter. As a leading historian of this period has put it, the Western policy of procrastination had run out of tomorrows. If the British had been perfidious, so too had the Russians. Stalin was not only cynical but adept at pursuing two competing options at once. While Voroshilov was still ostensibly seeking to negotiate a military pact with the British and French, German and Russian officials were simultaneously putting the finishing touches to an economic treaty between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union, worth in the order of 200 million Reichsmarks a year, 7.5 billion in 2019 dollars, for a decade. One of a series of economic accords that had followed the 1922 Rapallo Treaty and its renewal in Berlin four years later. Seen in purely economic terms, it was a commonplace win-win commercial transaction. Germany urgently needed raw materials for the Third Reich's rapidly expanding armory, and Stalin was hungry for the modern technology required to meet the Soviet Union's ambitious third economic five-year plan. But in the summer crisis of 1939, the very fact that such a deal was done was a harbinger of a far more significant and more ominous relationship. After a fortnight of intense negotiations, the German ambassador Friedrich Werner Graf von der Schulenberg told Molotov that Berlin was in a position to draft a formal pact with Moscow. In response, the Soviet foreign minister handed his German counterpart an aide memoir suggesting that the two governments reaffirm in writing the non-aggression treaty initially agreed at Rapallo in 1922. 
For those with a sense of the continent's recent past, the ghost of Rapallo, along with its secret military codicils, must have sent shivers through the chancelleries of Europe when the news broke that the continent's two behemoths, bitter ideological adversaries that had not spared one another the lacerating language of mutually hostile tyrannies, were once again finding common cause. Stalin's unwavering priority was still to keep the Soviet Union out of any European war for as long as possible. Torn between the option of an anti-Nazi alliance with Britain and France and a military pact with his German nemesis, he now opted to clasp the bird in the hand offered by Berlin. If the result were to be a war between the two capitalist states, it would, he argued, at least serve to strengthen communism at no cost to the Soviet Union. Unmindful or forgetful of the ominous warnings in Mein Kampf, the Soviet leader allowed himself to dream that such a deal would lead to the righting of historic wrongs which, deep in the Russian psyche, were held to have been imposed on them as far back as the 19th century and more recently at Versailles. Collaboration between the Soviet Union and the Third Reich, he hoped, might satisfy their competing aspirations and thereby, with luck, remove the cause of significant tension between them. In any case, in his urge to postpone war with Germany for as long as possible, inevitable as it might one day become, he had very little alternative. Hitler's version of peace for our time was irresistible. Though each viscerally abhorred the ideology of the other, they were kindred spirits, not only ruthless and unprincipled, but consummate opportunists, at one in their readiness to use any available means to secure their immediate ends. For both, a deal that Hitler would liken a few days later to a pact with Satan had become irresistible. For the time being at least, a shotgun marriage made in hell was more desirable by far than a premature Gotterdämmerung. On the day their economic treaty was signed, Hitler sent a flattering note to Stalin asking if he would be willing to receive Ribbentrop in Moscow with a view to endorsing a major strategic pact between their two countries. Stalin could not know that ten days earlier he had confided to a trusting German diplomat Everything I do is directed against the Russians. If the West is too stupid and blind to grasp this, then I shall be compelled to come to an agreement with the Russians, beat the West, and then, after their defeat, turn against the Soviet Union with all my forces. Now he waited impatiently for Stalin's response. When this was handed to him, the Führer was at supper in the Berghof, his residence in the Bavarian Alps, where he spent much of the war. According to one of his guests, Albert Speer, he stared into space for a moment, flushed deeply, then banged the table so hard that the glasses rattled and exclaimed in a voice breaking with excitement, I have them! I have them! The prospective meeting of unholy minds was announced on the 21st of August, when the official Soviet news agency TASS reported blandly that Germany's foreign minister Ribbentrop would depart imminently for Moscow as the exchange of views between the two governments has made apparent the desire of both parties to bring about the lessening of tension between them, to remove the threat of war, and to conclude a non-aggression pact. The implications were at once apparent. With the stroke of a pen, Hitler was about to be released from any lingering fear that the annihilation of Poland by the Nazis would unleash a war on two fronts. As soon as Seeds saw the Tass report, he requested a meeting with Molotov. It became an angry confrontation when the British ambassador accused the Soviet minister of acting in bad faith by negotiating a pact with Germany behind Britain's back. Molotov was coldly aggressive, countering that the height of insincerity had been reached when military missions arrived in Moscow empty-handed. Relations between London and Moscow had reached a low ebb. They would soon sink lower. A great burden of responsibility for what followed 
lay with Chamberlain. An Anglo-French military alliance with the Soviet Union would by no means have guaranteed peace in Europe. However, with such a formidable array of firepower and manpower ranged against him, it is possible that Hitler might have been deterred from an all-out attempt to eliminate the Polish state. His high command, with grimly vivid memories of the First World War, would assuredly have argued strenuously against such a hazardous and premature undertaking that might have led to a dreaded war on two fronts. Even if a confrontation between the Western Allies and the Nazis on the battlefield was almost inevitable, an alliance with the Soviet Union in the East would have put Britain and France in a far stronger position to prevail in the West. Chamberlain's vindictive attitude towards his domestic critics at Westminster and his thin-skinned refusal to heed alternative advice even from his supporters betrayed the short-sighted and narrow-minded obstinacy of mediocrity. At no point did he give serious consideration to a strategic partnership with a Bolshevik regime that he loathed and which, with some justification, he regarded as a rogue state. This, combined with his overweening arrogance, duped him into the conviction that he could single-handedly deliver peace for our time by appeasing Hitler while cold-shouldering Stalin. His motives may have been honourable, but in guaranteeing precisely the opposite outcome from that for which he had so assiduously and demeaningly striven, his judgment was fatally flawed. Chapter 5 A Pact with Satan When Ribbentrop strode self-importantly down the steps of Hitler's personal aircraft onto the tarmac in Moscow at 1pm on the 23rd of August 1939, he and his entourage were treated as though they were heroes of the Soviet Union. To the German Foreign Minister's evident satisfaction, the airport terminal was bedecked with the swastika flying alongside the hammer and sickle while a military band struck up Deutschland über alles. The formalities over, the Nazi delegation was whisked into the city, where that afternoon in the Kremlin, Stalin accorded Ribbentrop the rare honour of greeting him in person alongside Molotov. Even by the prevailing standards of diplomacy, the cynicism with which the two men sat down together with a map to carve up the nations of Eastern Europe between them was breathtaking. The draft pact committed each party not to wage war against the other or to ally itself to an enemy of the other. Far more significantly, it also contained a secret protocol, the existence of which would not be revealed publicly until the Nuremberg trials in 1945. In addition to clauses which ceded Latvia, Estonia, and later most of Lithuania along with Finland and Bessarabia, which formed part of Romania to the Soviet Union's sphere of influence, the protocol licensed the partition of Poland into two neat halves, the western slice falling to the Germans, the eastern slice to the Soviets. This diplomatic surgery did not take long to accomplish. After returning to the German embassy to cable the Berghof for Hitler's approval for his handiwork, Ribbentrop was back in the Kremlin by 10pm that evening to inform Stalin that he was empowered to sign the formal agreement. Stalin responded by proposing a toast to Hitler, observing, I know how much the German nation loves its Führer. I'd like to drink his health. At 2am on the 24th of August, watched benignly by the Soviet leader, the two foreign ministers put their name to what would become known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Cameras clicked and toasts were drunk before Stalin bade good night to his guests, reassuring Ribbentrop, I can guarantee on my word of honour that the Soviet Union will not betray its partner. Stalin was jubilant that his sphere of influence restored to the Soviet Union so much of the territory of the 19th century Russian Empire that had been lost in the First World War. He was also as spectacularly steeped in bad faith about the deal itself as Hitler. That night, as he celebrated with Molotov and other senior members of the Politburo at his dacha in the forest near Kuntsevo, he was heard to say, Of course, 
It's all a game to see who can fool whom. I know what Hitler's up to. He thinks he's outsmarted me, but actually it's I who's tricked him. War, he opined, would pass us by a little longer. The initial reaction of the Russian people to the news of the pact ranged from astonishment to incredulity. It left us all bewildered and groggy with disbelief, one Soviet official Viktor Kravchenko was to write. The villainy of Hitler had become in our land almost as sacred an article of faith as the virtue of Stalin. The swastika and the hammer and sickle fluttering side by side in Moscow, and soon afterwards Molotov explaining to us that fascism was, after all, a matter of taste. Very soon, however, shock yielded to relief that Stalin had indeed appeared to save them from the horror of war. The German public was similarly bewildered, and in some cases alarmed by the news. It was an incredible turnabout, confusion, incalculable danger for all Jews, Victor Klemperer noted. Everyone guesses, waits. The tension is too great. Even a number of the Führer's most devoted acolytes were dismayed that their ideological enemy was suddenly to be treated as an ally. So powerful was this aversion that Hitler felt obliged to reassure his own military leadership. At a meeting with his senior generals in Berlin on the 28th of August, looking worn, haggard and preoccupied, his voice croaking with exhaustion, he explained, somewhat opaquely, that his deal with Stalin was a pact with Satan to cast out the devil. Seeking to boost their faith in his judgment, he insisted that ruthless military action against Poland had become an urgent political and economic imperative. Essentially, all depends on me, on my existence. No one will ever again have the confidence of the whole German people as I have, he boasted. We have nothing to lose. We have everything to win. Our economic situation is such that we can only hold out for a few more years. We have no other choice. All that now mattered was victory. Close your heart to pity. Act brutally. The stronger man is right. According to Churchill, the sinister news of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact broke upon the world like an explosion. This was true enough of a bewildered Western public. But it should not have come as a surprise to the British or French governments which had been repeatedly warned not to dismiss the very real danger that the Bolsheviks and the Nazis would find common cause. Finally, though, even Chamberlain had to face the reality that a deal with Hitler was no longer an option. On the 25th of August, Halifax and his Polish counterpart Edvard Raszynski signed an agreement of mutual assistance in which both governments promised to give military support to the other in the event of an attack on either by another European country. The unlikely speed of Britain's unequivocal stand clearly startled Hitler. His immediate response was to postpone the invasion of Poland by six days from the original target date of the 26th of August. But a little before dawn, on the 1st of September, the Wehrmacht launched the long-planned Operation White. Supported by the Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe, some 1.5 million well-armed German soldiers crossed the border in a three-pronged assault, the focal point of which was Warsaw. Spearheaded by six panzer divisions, with a total of some 2,400 tanks between them, the German invasion force had overwhelming firepower against which the Polish army could not possibly prevail. The liquidation of the state of Poland was only a matter of time. Two days later, on the 3rd of September, Chamberlain broadcast solemnly to the British people and to the world. With a sorrowfully self-regarding reference to the bitter blow it had been to him personally that his long struggle to preserve peace had failed, he announced that Britain was now at war with Germany. That same evening, a British passenger ship, the Athenia, en route to the United States with refugees from Nazi Germany, was torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of the Irish Republic, with the loss of 117 lives. The Battle of the Atlantic, as Churchill was to call it, had begun. On land, it was different. For the next six months, 
the French and British armies faced the German forces across the Maginot Line in what became known as the Phony War, watching on from the western sidelines as the Nazis and the Soviets carved up Eastern Europe between them. As the Germans consolidated their conquest in the west, the Russians invaded the broken remains of Poland from the east. A little over two weeks after the Wehrmacht's aggression, more than 800,000 Red Army troops swept into their half of Poland on the 17th of September. By the 6th of October, they had crushed the last vestiges of Polish resistance. The two armies made initial contact in the city of Brest, nearly 800 kilometres from Berlin, and a little over 1,000 kilometres from Moscow. The Polish forces had battled against the Wehrmacht for six days before surrendering the city's ancient fortress to the invaders. When the Russians arrived, the Germans were required to retreat from the forward positions they had established on the eastern side of the demarcation line agreed in the secret protocol of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, including the fortress of Brest, which commanded a strategically important position overlooking the River Bug. For the commander of the 19th Army Corps, General Heinz Guderian, whose panzers had been the first to enter Brest, this was irksome in the extreme. The Polish campaign, he wrote later, had been a baptism of fire for my armoured formations, and the capture of the fortress had cost us much blood. Moreover, the speed at which they were expected to withdraw meant we could not even move all our wounded or recover damaged tanks. Despite this, the two armoured groups managed to put on a show of mutual amity, clambering on each other's tanks and using sign language to communicate that they were on a shared mission. In Warsaw, where the homeless and terrified refugees huddled in the ruins of their former homes, in streets strewn with masonry, broken glass and human body parts, the respective heads of the German-Soviet Border Commission were in jocular mood as they celebrated their conquest. Sharing a post-prandial cigarette with his Soviet counterpart Alexander Alexandrov, Hans Frank, who would soon emerge as one of the Holocaust's most committed engineers, joked, You and I are smoking Polish cigarettes to symbolise the fact that we have thrown Poland to the wind. The crimes and cruelties that were now unleashed upon that benighted nation by both tyrannies were unconstrained by the international rules of warfare as defined by the Geneva Conventions at that time. The atrocities on the German side of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line began within days of the invasion. The explicit Nazi policy was to establish Lebensraum in Poland by ethnically cleansing the territory of its Slavic population. According to two of Hitler's most senior military commanders, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, the craven commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, and Franz Holder, the somewhat less subservient army chief of staff, the Führer's explicit intention, in the words of the latter, was to annihilate and exterminate the Polish people. From the beginning, the Wehrmacht played a much fuller part in this enterprise than its apologists would later claim. In the city of Bydgoszcz, on the 3rd and 4th of September, German troops participated in a pogrom, allegedly in retaliation for the harsh treatment meted out to some of their comrades who had been taken as prisoners of war along with pro-Nazi saboteurs to be summarily executed or lynched by angry Polish mobs. The Wehrmacht, accompanied by a force of SS troops, responded to these crimes in kind, but on a far more vindictive scale, executing between 600 and 800 Polish hostages and later massacring more than 1,000 civilians. Hitler's troops also went on the rampage in the city of Czestochowa, which fell without a struggle at the same time, the 3rd of September 1939. Over the course of the next three days, the soldiers torched shops and houses, looting and pillaging without restraint. In one such operation, the troops rounded up some 10,000 citizens, forcing them to lie face down in the main square in front of the cathedral, before separating the men from the women. Any male found in possession of a firearm, or even a razor or pocket knife, was shot on the spot. The rest were lined up 
as though to be driven into the cathedral. Instead, the troops opened fire on them with machine guns, killing or wounding several hundred in what was officially described by the Wehrmacht as an anti-partisan operation. Nor were these isolated incidents. By the end of September, more than 500 towns and villages had been incinerated with flamethrowers and their inhabitants terrorised. Initially, these violations of military discipline were treated as serious offences by Wehrmacht commanders. When the perpetrators could be identified, they were brought before military tribunals and sentenced to severe punishment. They might as well have been released without charge. Within weeks, Hitler had nullified the authority of these courts by granting amnesties to the guilty men, on the grounds that the suffering they had endured at the hands of the Poles during the invasion was punishment enough. If some Wehrmacht commanders sought to restrain the men under their command, the SS leadership in Poland encouraged such excesses. Hitler had made it clear that only a nation whose upper levels have been destroyed can be pushed into the ranks of slavery, the role he'd allotted to the Polish people within the newly extended Third Reich. In the months leading up to the invasion, two of Hitler's most trusted and depraved lieutenants took up the challenge of executing the Führer's will. Unprepossessingly dumpy in appearance, with a receding chin, sagging jawline and rimless spectacles, combined with a receding hairline and a wispy imitation of a Hitler moustache, Himmler would have fitted ideally the role of anti-hero in a film about a failed bank clerk. However, he wielded immense power. As Reichsfuhrer SS, he had overall command of the Third Reich's entire police, security and intelligence apparatus. Under Himmler's leadership, Reinhard Heydrich ran the Reich main security office, which gave him operational control over the Gestapo, the Kriminalpolizei or Kripo, criminal police, the SS and the SD, the Nazi Party's intelligence organisation. Physically, he offered a faintly absurd contrast to Himmler. Tall, lean and upright, with a long aquiline nose, his face narrow and stern, Heydrich conveyed that sense of menace which Himmler's appearance belied. Together, though they were never close personally, they formed a formidable double act. As the leading architects of the Holocaust, no killers in all history would rival their intensely focused and diligent commitment to mass murder. Poland was to provide the testing ground. With meticulous attention to detail, they drew up a list of 61,000 members of the Polish cultural and social elite. Academics, judges, teachers, social workers, priests, former military officers, civil servants, and any other individuals who could plausibly be regarded as belonging to the Polish intelligentsia. The SS was enjoined to hunt down and execute every one of them. Under Heydrich's direct oversight, this task was allotted to seven paramilitary murder squads, totaling 4,500 men. Heydrich's Einsatzgruppen, task forces, as they were euphemistically christened, relished the chance to demonstrate their commitment. For the most part, these killers were not ignorant thugs. Their leaders belonged to the German elite, often as graduates of universities armed with doctorates. Such education had the signal advantage of equipping them with the intellectual clarity to identify their targets with precision. They did not operate in isolation. In addition to the units of the German army, the SS and the SD, they were supported by the Volksdeutsche Selbstschutz, a homegrown self-protection force of ethnic Germans that had operated covertly as a pro-Nazi fifth column before the war. The SS had no difficulty in persuading them that Hitler's purpose was also theirs. You are now the master race here. Nothing was yet built through softness and weakness. Don't be soft, be merciless, and clear out everything that is not German. Ludolf von Alfensleben, one of Himmler's SS troopers, instructed them. They needed no further encouragement. Illustrating the scale of the operational challenge, even the combined efforts of the Einsatzgruppen, the Selbstschutzer, and army regulars 
were unable to execute their Polish victims at the rate required to meet the schedule set by Heydrich. By the end of October, they had managed to find and execute only 20,000 individuals. Yet, either because they became more proficient or less selective, their rate soon accelerated. By the end of the year, they had killed even more than the quota of 61,000 allotted to them by Heydrich. One group among the 35 million population of Poland was singled out for special treatment. Jewish communities had been established in the country for a thousand years, and despite periodic waves of anti-Semitism which swept through their ghettos, had established deep roots there. By September 1939, the Polish diaspora of some 3.4 million souls had grown to become one of the largest in the world. Following the Nazi-Soviet partition, more than two-thirds of these found themselves under German occupation. But their very existence, in what was intended to become an Aryan nirvana, was regarded with particular odium by the Nazis. Whereas any Slav could expect to become a slave labourer, the Jews had a different destiny. Although they too might be similarly exploited, and some had artisanal roles as well, these were temporary reprieves. Regarded as vermin by the Nazis, their survival was contingent. Their eventual fate, if they did not die of hunger or exhaustion beforehand, was to be eliminated, either by expulsion or by extinction. Poland's Jews were not hard to identify. For the most part, they congregated in their own communities, clustering around their places of worship and nurturing their own traditions. By burning down their synagogues, humiliating their women with intimate body searches and killing some 7,000 of their men, the Einsatzgruppen and their partners managed to terrorise a few hundred thousand families into fleeing their homes for the uncertain haven of the Soviet zone of occupation. This exodus, however, barely grazed the surface of the problem confronting the invaders. More than 1.5 million of the remaining Jews in Nazi-occupied Poland lived in the central zone of occupation known as the General Government. This region, which incorporated the cities of Warsaw, Lwów and Krakow, had been earmarked for colonisation by German settlers and was therefore to be cleansed of Jews. Hitler had made it clear that Poland should be purged not only of Jews, but also of all Poles except those required as serfs. It was essential, he ordered, for the Nazi authorities to seal off these alien racial elements so that the blood of its people will not be corrupted again. It must, without further ado, remove them and hand over the vacated territory to its own national comrades. This was more easily said than done. The nine million Poles living in the regions annexed by the Nazis greatly outnumbered the ethnic Germans already living there. Mass movements of population, mass incarcerations and mass killings of these stateless persons, as they had been designated, would be required to make good on Hitler's edict. The murderous campaign in Poland did not go entirely unchallenged. In November 1939, a small number of Wehrmacht commanders in the field belatedly but courageously alerted the army's commander-in-chief, Walter von Brauchitz, to what was being perpetrated in the name of the Third Reich. The military governor of the German occupying forces, Colonel General Johannes Blaskowitz, reported that criminal atrocities were being committed by men with animal and pathological instincts whose bloodlust was becoming an epidemic. This, he insisted, could be arrested only by bringing the guilty and their followers at the greatest speed under military command and jurisdiction. Barashitz's reaction was instructive. Apart from a mealy-mouthed reference to the regrettable mistakes made by the SS and its acolytes, he failed to demand any further restraint. His feebleness was cowardly but not inexplicable. Hitler had already cut the ground from the Wehrmacht. Ridiculing the childish attitude of his generals and their Salvation Army methods in Poland, he not only removed the SS and the police forces from the jurisdiction of the military occupation forces, 
but further weakened the Wehrmacht by transferring its administrative authority to a civilian body in which Nazi zealots held all the key posts. This shift of responsibility was of ominous import. Not only was the fading status of the military high command terminally undermined, but, as his biographer has noted, Hitler's decision pointed the way to the accommodation between army and SS about the genocidal actions to be taken in the Soviet Union in 1941. In that half of Poland annexed by the Soviet Union, the authorities were no less zealous than their Nazi counterparts and although their purposes and means differed, they were only marginally less murderous. In Stalin's case, a determination to eliminate the Polish hierarchy was not animated by racial hatred or the search for Lebensraum, of which the Soviet Union had more than enough, but by a paranoid desire to stamp out any vestiges of opposition to his communist state. In the course of imposing its military stranglehold on their swathe of the country, the Soviets took 100,000 prisoners of war. Weeding out the rank and file, who were soon released, they held some 15,000 officers in captivity before deporting them to the Soviet Union. That total included military reservists, among them the civil servants, doctors, lawyers, scientists and teachers who formed Poland's educated and administrative elite. These officers were held in three camps, all within the Soviet Union. By the spring of 1940, Lavrenti Beria, who had proved so effective as Stalin's executioner-in-chief during the Great Terror, had turned his attention to these prisoners of war and others held elsewhere. Arguing that they would join the Polish resistance if they were allowed to return to their homes, he proposed in early March that they should be executed instead. Stalin, with the endorsement of Molotov and others in the Politburo, concurred. Using the methods of summary justice that had proved so successful before, Beria created a new set of troikas, three-man committees, who duly condemned to death some 14,700 Polish military and police officers, government officials, prosecutors, judges, intellectuals, landowners, as well as a further 1,000 spies and saboteurs. The killings took place in various locations. In April 1940, 4,500 officers were taken to the outskirts of Russia's Katyn Forest, some 20 kilometres west of Smolensk. There, they were lined up, shot neatly in the back of the head, stacked in piles and buried in mass graves concealed among the trees. Over the following weeks, in a variety of secret locations nearby, a further 17,500 individuals, who were regarded as Stalin as potential threats to the Soviet Union's tyrannical occupation, were slaughtered. Altogether, these killings, known collectively as the Katyn Massacre, accounted for 22,000 individuals. At one of these sites, an NKVD prison near the town of Kalinin, 180 kilometers northwest of Moscow, more than 7,000 were executed. It was a meticulous operation. One by one, the victims were marched into a specially constructed soundproof cell where they were pinioned by two agents while a third shot them in the back of the head. It was an arduous process that could not be hurried. It took some 28 days to kill them all at an average of only 250 every 24 hours. To ensure that his men did not falter, Major General Vasily Blochin, the psychopathic commander of the NKVD's Lubyanka prison in Moscow, travelled from the capital to participate in the operation. Wearing his trademark butcher's apron to avoid his clothes being spattered with the blood of his victims, he set about his task with tireless resolve. In a separate move, reminiscent of what happened during the pogrom against the Kulaks less than a decade earlier, the Soviet occupiers encouraged the Polish peasantry to rise up against their landlords. Not all heeded the summons, but others went on the rampage, wielding axes to hack their former masters to death. In at least one documented case, a landowner was tied to a stake and flayed alive, after which 
he was forced to witness the execution of his family. To eliminate any vestige of resistance, the NKVD rounded up thousands of families who were judged to pose a potential threat to the Soviet occupation. In March 1940, in a single operation, 139,794 men and women, old and young, were taken from their homes at night and loaded into freight trains at gunpoint. In wagons normally used to transport cattle, they huddled together for the long, slow journey into the Soviet Union, where they were destined for the Gulag. In temperatures that fell well below freezing, and sometimes as low as minus 40 degrees centigrade, they trundled across the steppe, half starved of food and water. Some 5,000 of them froze to death before they reached their various destinations deep in Siberia or Kazakhstan. At various halts along the way, the dead were thrown out of the trucks to be buried beside the track in shallow mass graves. Within six months of trying to eke out an existence as labourers in an alien land, a further 11,000 Polish deportees would die from hunger and disease. Between September 1939 and June 1941, the Bolsheviks deported 315,000 Polish citizens and arrested a further 110,000. Of these, at least 30,000 were executed while a further 25,000 died in custody. Albeit for different reasons, these victims were treated by the Soviet leadership as though they were every bit as subhuman as the Slavs and Jews were held to be by the Nazis. With Poland subjugated, the Soviet Union, exercising its rights under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, moved to secure the Soviet Union's northern frontiers, by commandeering the Baltic buffer states of Latvia and Lithuania. Taking a step-by-step -step approach, Moscow began by bullying them into concluding mutual assistance pacts, before exercising a clause in those agreements to establish Red Army bases in all three states. Any further moves to impose its hegemony over the Baltic had to be suspended in November 1939 when Finland proved less amenable to similarly thuggish inducements. For more than a year, the Soviet Union had sought to persuade Helsinki to cede territory on the seaward approaches to Leningrad, which was a mere 32 kilometres from the Finnish border, allegedly to counter the risk of an attack on the Soviet Union by the Nazis. But Helsinki had refused to oblige. Moscow lost patience. On the 30th of November, upwards of half a million Red Army troops, supported by 6,000 tanks and almost 4,000 aircraft, advanced to the border, the Mannerheim Line, so-called because its defensive fortifications had been constructed at the orders of Field Marshal Baron Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim, the commander-in-chief of the Finnish army. The Soviet High Command assumed that the Finns, who had a little over 300,000 soldiers, but no more than 30 tanks and 60 aircraft, would collapse within a fortnight. Instead, they fought with great skill and tenacity. Facing highly motivated and well-trained troops, appropriately equipped for a sustained guerrilla campaign in deep snow and freezing conditions, on one day the temperature fell to minus 43 degrees centigrade, the Soviet armies suffered a succession of humiliating reverses. Poorly led, by generals who lacked strategic vision or operational coherence, the Soviet troops were inadequately trained, badly supplied, and easily demoralised. The Finns sought help from the British, but Chamberlain dithered, veering indecisively between confronting the Soviet Union militarily or using diplomatic means to demonstrate his disapproval. In December 1939, Cadogan advised the Foreign Secretary that if we who talk so much about resisting aggression do nothing about Russia, we shall be displaying considerable inconsistency, to put it at its lowest. However, he offered no advice about what should be done, except to suggest that Britain might have to afford such assistance to Finland as we can, without identifying what that might entail. In response to an urgent request from Helsinki, the British contemplated the dispatch of a task force 
50,000 British soldiers with supporting ships and aircraft to confront the Soviet Union on the Finnish battlefield. There were those in Whitehall and Westminster, notably including appeasers, who found it far more gratifying to contemplate war against the Bolsheviks than against the Nazis. Their voices, inside and outside government, were loud enough to oblige the war cabinet to give serious consideration to that option. The Foreign Office supported such a move, advising that the complete downfall of Russian military power would be to Britain's advantage, as the collapse of Russia was likely to contribute materially to the early defeat of Germany. Though quite how Whitehall's bureaucrats were drawn to this bizarre conclusion is unclear. The government's military advisers were less fanciful, arguing that any such operation would be an act of military folly, almost impossible to mount or sustain, and that, on balance, contra the Foreign Office, it would make it more difficult to achieve our primary object in this war, the defeat of Germany. Plans were eventually laid for the dispatch of a modest military contingent by sea. But, to the relief of Cadogan, who judged these to be amateurish and half-hatched by a half-baked staff, Chamberlain delayed until it was too late. As with the Nazi invasion of Poland, the British once more ingloriously watched from the sidelines, as, by sheer force of numbers, the Red Army began to grind the Finns into submission. Moscow did not entirely escape retribution, however. The Western Allies were able to agree that, by way of punishment, the Soviet Union should be expelled from the League of Nations, a move whose impact was somewhat blunted by the fact that the League was a moribund body that had long ceased to have any diplomatic or strategic relevance. It took three months, one week, and six days from the day of the invasion before the Soviet armies were finally able to declare victory in what became known as the Winter War, and in March 1940 to force Helsinki into signing the Moscow Peace Treaty. The Finns had suffered 66,000 casualties, including 22,700 killed or missing in action. But these numbers were less than a fifth of the losses endured by the invaders, who suffered 380,000 casualties, including 125,000 men killed or listed as missing in action. It was a heavy price to pay for the small girdle of security that Moscow thus acquired in the approaches to Leningrad. Militarily, it had been an expensive fiasco. Politically, it was a humiliation that confirmed the impression in every Western capital, crucially in Berlin, that the Red Army was incompetently led, poorly structured and badly trained. A military machine that was ill-suited to modern warfare and liable to fall apart under sustained pressure. Stalin reacted to his Pyrrhic victory over the Finns with characteristic venom. After one particularly inglorious failure early in the campaign, he had dispatched his Red Army's political commissar, Lev Meklis, who had previously served as a quasi-grand inquisitor during the earlier military purges, to the front line, where the shambolic 44th Division had lost a thousand men, a thousand one hundred and seventy horses, and forty-three tanks. The commissar knew what was required of him. Eschewing the niceties of a formal court-martial, he ordered the execution of the division's most senior commanders, a sentence carried out publicly in front of their demoralised men, who had been summoned for their presumed benefit to witness the shootings. In the debriefing that followed the end of hostilities, Stalin invited his defence commissar Kliment Veroshilov to his Kuntsevo Dacha. According to Nikita Khrushchev, who was one of those present, the Soviet leader lost his temper with Voroshilov, charging him with personal responsibility for the multiple disasters of the Finnish campaign. Voroshilov's oversight of the fiasco had indeed been lamentable, but, as a notoriously brutal satrap, whom Stalin had once endorsed as the legendary Red Marshal, he dared on this occasion to defy the dictator apparently forgetting that he had himself advocated and overseen the decimation of the Red Army during the Great Purge, while personally signing at least 180 execution warrants, he yelled back at Stalin, 
You have yourself to blame for all this. You're the one who annihilated the old guard of the army. You had our best generals killed. The row soon escalated to the point where Voroshilov evidently picked up a platter with a roast suckling pig on it and smashed it on the table. To confront Stalin so openly was to risk mortal censure, but Voroshilov was spared. Though sacked as commissar for defence, to be replaced by Marshal Semyon Timoshenko, he was allowed later to return to frontline duties, where his mediocrity would be on full display once again. Relations between London and Moscow, which had deteriorated sharply following the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact seven months earlier, were now in free fall. The cabinet debated whether the subjugation of Finland prefigured further aggression that might force Britain into a military conflict with the Soviet Union. The Foreign Office, anxious perhaps to demonstrate that appeasement was not its default option, was hawkish. Endorsing the British ambassador's opinion that the Soviets had settled down into an undeclared war against Britain and should be placed alongside the Nazis as partners in crime, the diplomats went so far as to suggest that it had become politically desirable to bring about the complete downfall of the Russian military power, though without specifying how this might be achieved. With the French pressing London to sever diplomatic relations with Moscow, a gesture was judged to be important. Kadagan proposed that the government pick a quarrel with the Russians by dispatching the RAF on a bombing raid against the Baku oil wells, even though he suspected that this would only serve to provoke Moscow to elevate the non-aggression pact into a formal alliance with the Third Reich. With the House of Commons rousing itself to a frenzy of impotent anti-Soviet rhetoric, vivid, seething, overflowing fury, as the Soviet ambassador described the debate, very few voices were raised in opposition to the advocates of a belligerent stance towards the Soviet Union. But these were not without influence. Once again, Churchill, who had returned to government as First Lord of the Admiralty a few months earlier, used his place in the War Cabinet to argue against the demonization of the Soviet Union. Nor was he alone in his readiness to overlook the Red Army's occupation of Finland in Britain's wider strategic interests. More surprisingly, a junior Foreign Office minister, Rab Butler, an erstwhile appeaser, broke ranks with his officials displaying a subtlety that had evidently been denied his more excitable colleagues in the Commons. He commented dryly that although a certain noble purity attached to a policy which tends to add one enemy after another to those opposed to us, it would be wiser to establish a dialogue with Moscow to prevent Berlin presuming that the Soviet Union was a completely subservient ally. That strategic debate was brought rudely to a halt in April 1940, when the Germans launched their drive to occupy Denmark, which succumbed in a single day, and to invade Norway. This not only consumed the attention of the war cabinet, but served as a brutal reminder that the Nazis posed a direct threat to Britain, far graver and more immediate than any action that might conceivably be taken by the Soviet Union. The phony war was over. In its place, Britain faced an existential challenge for which it was as yet ill-prepared. The rapid occupation of the two Scandinavian countries was swiftly followed by a panzer blitzkrieg that overran the Low Countries before circumventing the Maginot Line to advance deep into France. Paris was occupied on the 14th of June. By that time, the British Expeditionary Force which had stood alongside the French on the border with Belgium for the last nine months, had been driven into a helter-skelter retreat to Dunkirk and had scrambled back across the Channel to the relative safety of Britain. It was a heroic but humiliating evacuation from the European mainland that left more than 40,000 troops on the beaches of northern France to be swiftly incarcerated as prisoners of war. It would be four years before a British army under the overall command of the United States, was prepared to set off in the opposite direction to play its part in the final destruction of the Third Reich. For now, Hitler was master of Europe.
If there was any cause for Western optimism, it was that Chamberlain had been replaced as Prime Minister by Churchill. Ironically, Chamberlain's resignation was triggered by a disastrous naval campaign to retake Norway, which had been masterminded by Churchill in his role as First Lord of the Admiralty. Chamberlain self-destructed in the House of Commons with an aggressively defensive account of the debacle. His days were already numbered, but his failure to master the House at a critical moment, the German panzers were simultaneously rolling into Belgium, was the final humiliation. After delivering a withering critique of the Prime Minister, the Conservative MP Leo Amory administered the coup de grace by quoting Oliver Cromwell's words to the long Parliament, Depart, I say, and let us have done with you. In the name of God, go. On the 10th of May, Chamberlain tendered his resignation. Churchill was the only credible candidate to succeed him. Three days later, in his first speech in the Commons as Prime Minister, the new leader declared, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. Mercifully, from Britain's perspective, he had in fact a great deal more to offer. At this point, though, he barely had time to give the Soviet Union a moment's thought, let alone to formulate a coherent strategy that might wean Moscow away from Berlin's embrace and turn it towards Britain instead. That task was left to the Foreign Office, where it was presumed that any such effort was pointless. Fortuitously, but, as it would prove, Greatly to Britain's advantage, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was already starting to unravel. Chapter 6. Thieves Fall Out A little after 11am on the 12th of November 1940, Stalin's foreign minister arrived in Berlin for a meeting with Hitler. For his first venture beyond his country's borders in 50 years, Molotov travelled by train, accompanied by a retinue of more than 60 staff. At the behest of the Führer's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, a sinister master of manipulation, he was given a muted welcome, in notable contrast to the warmth with which Ribbentrop had been received in Moscow 15 months earlier. I ensure that there is no SA Guard of Honour? That would be going too far. Also, no deployment of the general public. Moscow places great importance on this visit. We shall know how to exploit it. Cool reception, Goebbels noted in his diary. The Anhalter station was bedecked with flowers and swastikas, which all but concealed the hammer and sickle of the Soviet flag that fluttered in the background. Molotov was greeted by Ribbentrop, the Wehrmacht's commander-in-chief Keitel, and SS leader Heinrich Himmler. In the square outside, a military band played the Internationale, but at double speed, lest any closet communist who might stray onto the set should be tempted to join in. His delegation, all wearing identical dark blue suits, grey ties and cheap felt hats, which some wore like berries on the back of their heads like cowboys and some low over the eyes like mafiosi, was put up in the splendour of the newly renovated Slosh Bellevue, a neoclassical imperial palace used to accommodate high-profile guests in some luxury. This may have compensated for the cool welcome and the absence of cheering crowds in the streets, though Molotov later claimed to have no recollection of his arrival in the German capital. Ostensibly, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was still intact. On the face of it, it had been reinforced by a further trade deal signed the previous February, which committed the Soviet Union to provide raw materials worth 650 million Reichsmarks in return for a huge cache of military hardware to a similar value, including the Lutzo, one of the Kriegsmarine's small fleet of heavy cruisers. Although the negotiations had been hampered by ill humour, sharp practice, and bad faith, they offered the illusion that all was well between these unlikely bedfellows. It was not. Far from burying the two sides' deep seated and long standing antipathies, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact had merely suppressed them. As one astute British official noted, neither dictator dare turn away lest the other stab him in the back. Their bad faith concordat was about to spawn a poisonous set of intractable disputes. 
The ostensible purpose of Molotov's visit to Berlin was to discuss what his German counterpart Ribbentrop had described in a letter to Stalin as a new delineation of mutual spheres of influence, designed both to refresh and to revise the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This was disingenuous. Berlin's real purpose was to distract Moscow from Hitler's European game plan, in which the Soviet Union was to be not a partner, but a victim. Following his conquests in Northern and Western Europe, Hitler was deflected from the invasion of the Soviet Union by the need to shore up his southern flank, which, following Italian failures in the Balkans, he feared would be threatened by a British invasion that might choke off one of the Reich's vital arteries. It was not enough for him to conquer new lands in the east and colonise their peoples. Lebensraum would depend upon the economic as well as the human exploitation of these territories and a means of importing and exporting goods of all kinds from them. To this end, mastery over the Danube, the major navigable artery that fed into the Black Sea and thence via the Dardanelles and the Aegean into the Mediterranean, was crucial. This fact put Nazi Germany on a collision course with the Soviet Union. There were other issues, notably the formation in August 1940 of an informal military agreement between Berlin and Helsinki that permitted the Wehrmacht to station troops in Finland close to the border with the territories occupied by the Soviet Union after the Winter War. But by the autumn of 1940, it was not the Baltic states, but the Balkans, that had become by far the most combustible source of conflict between the two non-aggressors. Since the time of Peter the Great, free access to the Danube and control of the warm-water Black Sea ports had been regarded by the Russians as essential to national prosperity and security. Any threat to this strategic right had long been regarded by Moscow as an assault on the very fabric of the Russian state and a justifiable casus belli. Churchill understood this. In a remarkably prescient but often overlooked passage of his famous broadcast depiction of Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, only a month after the outbreak of Britain's war with Germany, he added, Perhaps there is a key. That key is Russian national interest. He went on to declare, It cannot be in accordance with the interest of the safety of Russia that Germany should plant herself upon the shores of the Black Sea, or that she should overrun the Balkan states and subjugate the Slavonic peoples of southeastern Europe. That would be contrary to the historic life interests of Russia. In June 1940, Molotov confirmed that Churchill's judgment was spot on. In a meeting with the Italian ambassador, the Soviet foreign minister explained that the Soviet Union had the legitimate right to full control of the Black Sea, which must be exclusively Russian. Romania, which bordered the estuary of the Danube and the Black Sea, an important junction at the crossroads of Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe, was a case in point. Under the terms of the secret protocols of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the historic region of Bessarabia, currently occupied by Romania, fell into the Soviet sphere of influence. As evidence of Moscow's determination to reinforce its presence in the region, Stalin had recently strong-armed Bucharest into relinquishing the neighbouring provinces of Bukovina and Bessarabia, which straddled the border between Romania and Ukraine. Hitler did not formally protest at Stalin's preemptive strike, but with a guile that wrong-footed the Soviet leader, he acted indirectly but decisively. In August 1940, he unilaterally announced the abolition of the International Commission, which for more than 80 years had been responsible for the administration of the lower reaches of the Danube. In effect, this amounted to a declaration that henceforth the Danube was to be a German river, a Nazi waterway giving Berlin control over all access to and from the Black Sea. When the Soviet Union, which had not been a member of the International Commission, protested vigorously at this coup de main, Berlin affected to be perturbed by Moscow's reaction and suggested that the two sides work together to find a resolution to avert a damaging confrontation. 
not surprisingly, given their incompatible objectives, the Danube talks soon became grounded in the diplomatic mud. The implications of this impasse were in little doubt. A report produced by the Soviet Union's Foreign Military Intelligence Agency, the GRU, quoting the Soviet ambassador in Belgrade, was blunt and to the point. For Germany, the Balkans are the most significant asset and ought to be included in the new order of Europe. But since the USSR would never agree to that, a war with her is inevitable. The diplomatic tension was ratcheted up further when, within days of surrendering Bukovina and Bessarabia to the Soviet Union, King Karol II of Romania was overthrown in a military coup. Its leader, General Jan Antonescu, was a fascist who at once assumed dictatorial powers by appointing himself as Prime Minister and planting Karol's inept teenage son Michael on the throne as the titular head of state. His first move was to forge an alliance with Nazi Germany. Hitler was more than happy to cooperate. On the 12th of October, at Antonescu's invitation, German troops established a garrison in Romania, thereby nullifying the impact of Stalin's twin annexations, which for the time being remained in Soviet hands. Just over two weeks earlier, Germany, Italy and Japan had concluded the tripartite pact. Antonescu, who was soon to prove himself as murderous as any of Hitler's henchmen, was eager to demonstrate his credentials. His application to join the pact was accepted on the 23rd of November, ten days after Molotov's arrival in Berlin. Stalin's troubles deepened following the ill-judged decision by the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini to invade Greece on the 28th of October. This led King Boris III, who ruled the quasi-fascist kingdom of Bulgaria, which sat on the opposite bank of the Danube from Romania and was also nominally neutral, to judge it politic to tilt towards Berlin. Eager to signal his support, the king invited a contingent of German troops to establish a base in the country. A few months later, in March 1941, he joined Antonescu in the tripartite pact's warm embrace. Stalin had been comprehensively outmaneuvered. Reports from the Soviet embassy in Berlin on the eve of Molotov's visit raised the stakes further, with a dispatch advising that the Nazi leadership now regarded the Balkans as a new bridgehead for a military engagement against the Soviet Union. The head of the GRU, the Soviet Foreign Intelligence Service, General Filip Golikov, who had recently returned from a fact-finding mission to the German capital, simultaneously warned that Germany was continuing to transfer its troops to the Balkans, albeit he advised, correctly as it would transpire, in readiness for a possible attack on Greece, rather than directly against the Soviet Union. With his antennae on full alert, Stalin's instructions to his foreign minister reflected his acute concern about the way events were unfolding. Molotov was left in no doubt about his prime objective in Berlin. As a prosaic and dogged diplomat, Stonas was exceptionally unlikely to be sideswiped by any vision of the sunlit uplands that Hitler might invite him to contemplate. His overriding task was to make it clear that Stalin would never relinquish Russia's imperial right to control the Black Sea. But he was also mindful of the fact that following the debacle in Finland a year earlier, the Red Army was in no state to conduct a war against the all-conquering Wehrmacht with any hope of success. An escalation of the Balkan crisis was therefore to be avoided. Hitler was no less keen than Stalin to avoid a premature confrontation that might inadvertently flare into an untoward military conflict. The planning for the invasion of the Soviet Union was at a preliminary stage, the war games needed to test those plans had not been scheduled, and the logistical challenge of redeploying scores of divisions that were currently occupying much of Western Europe had yet to be examined in any detail. Moreover, the success of the invasion would depend upon surprise, an attack launched at a moment of Hitler's choosing and certainly not to be dictated or potentially scuppered by events that had slipped out of his control. It was essential, therefore, 
that his meeting with the Soviet foreign minister should appear to be conciliatory. Before his appointment with Hitler, Molotov met his German counterpart in his suite of offices in the former presidential palace, which, according to Hitler's interpreter Paul Schmidt, who attended this meeting as an observer, had been decorated by Ribbentrop in an excessively vulgar fashion. In sharp contrast to the Soviet foreign minister, Ribbentrop was invariably reluctant to use one word where ten would do. So it was on this occasion. In the course of a portentous monologue that lasted over an hour, Ribbentrop laid out a vision of the future in which the Soviet Union might join the tripartite pact and share in the spoils that would accrue from the inevitable defeat of Britain and the dismemberment of its global empire. For most of this meandering soliloquy, Molotov listened impassively, intervening on only three occasions when, in sharp contrast to his host's ingratiating grandiloquence, he spoke with a certain mathematic precision and unerring logic, and as though he were taking a class, gently rebuking the sweeping, vague generalities of Ribbentrop. It was clear that Molotov was keeping his powder dry for the encounter with Hitler that afternoon. Along with his negotiating team and his interpreter, Valentin Bereshkov, the Soviet foreign minister was escorted through a maze of marbled halls before reaching Hitler's office. It was a moment of pure fascist theater. Two tall blonde SS men in black, tightly belted uniforms with skulls on the caps, clicked their heels and threw open the tall, almost ceiling high doors with a single well practiced gesture. Then, with their backs to the door jams and their right arms raised, they formed a kind of arch through which we had to pass to enter Hitler's office, a vast room which was more like a banqueting hall than an office. Being well acquainted with the Kremlin palaces, Molotov was undaunted by this display of Nazi magnificence. Hitler was seated at his desk, but rose to greet Stalin's emissary with an elaborate show of courtesy. The talks began conventionally, with both men expressing their commitment to the importance of Soviet-German collaboration before Molotov seized the initiative, calmly but persistently seeking clear answers to a set of detailed questions about the precise character of the future relationship that Hitler was proposing. In particular, he asked, how do matters stand with regard to the safeguarding of Russian interests in the Balkans and the Black Sea? And how does the tripartite pact stand with regard to it? Paul Schmidt was taken aback. No foreign visitor had ever spoken to him, Hitler, in this way in my presence. The interpreter half expected the Fuhrer to leap up and bring the meeting abruptly to a close, as he had seen him do in past encounters which had become disagreeable. Instead, Hitler responded almost apologetically. The tripartite pact will regulate conditions in Europe according to the natural interests of the European countries themselves, and that is why Germany now approaches the Soviet Union so that she can express her views on the territories that are of interest to her. Since this rejoinder was as vague as his opening remarks, Molotov pressed for more detail. At one point, he said bluntly that the Soviet Union would not consider joining the tripartite pact unless we are to be treated as equal partners and not mere dummies. Hitler was not accustomed to such robust interrogation and was evidently unable to endure it for long. After a while, advising somewhat lamely that a British air raid might be in the offing, he suggested that they suspend their dialogue for the evening. Their meeting had achieved precisely nothing, and of course there was no air raid. Later that evening, Ribbentrop hosted a dinner for Molotov, who sparred and joshed with the Führer's deputy Rudolf Hess and Hermann Göring, now elevated to Reichsmarschall. He might have displayed rather less camaraderie had he known that a few hours earlier Hitler had issued Directive No. 18, which, somewhat buried in an updated blueprint for the Nazification of Europe, contained the following instruction. Russia. Political discussions for the purpose of clarifying Russia's attitude in the immediate future have already begun. Regardless of the outcome of these conversations, 
all preparations for the East for which verbal orders have already been given will be continued. Further directives will follow on this subject as soon as the basic operational plan of the army has been submitted to me and approved. Only a very small number of Hitler's most senior generals were aware of this injunction. It was a well-kept secret. As a result, none of Moscow's agents in Berlin had been able to alert the Kremlin. Stalin was completely unaware of what was afoot. Had Molotov known about Directive No. 18, he would certainly have been better prepared for the serial obfuscations with which Hitler was to disguise his real purposes at their next meeting on the following day. As it was, in a late-night exchange of telegrams, he reassured Stalin he would find a way to press Hitler on the Black Sea, the Straits and Bulgaria, but would avoid saying anything that might undermine the pact he had crafted with Ribbentrop 15 months earlier. This attempt to square the circle would rapidly prove fruitless. The second meeting opened in a chilly fashion, with both men alleging that the other side had violated the pact, the Germans by stationing troops in Finland and the Russians by acting similarly in Bukovina. When Molotov claimed that the Soviet presence in Bukovina was irrelevant to their wider relationship, Hitler did not respond directly. Instead, he said, as though seeking sympathy, that the Soviet government would have to understand that Germany was engaged in a life-and-death struggle, but that so long as they did not fall out, there was no power on earth which could oppose the two countries. When Molotov changed tack to chide Hitler for stationing troops in Finland, pointing out that under the pact the Baltic states fell into the Soviet sphere of influence, the Fuhrer was again evasive but he was clearly nettled, warning that any conflict between them over the Baltic would impose a strain on German-Russian relations with unforeseeable consequences. Molotov was not deterred, but repeated that the German presence in Finland constituted a violation of the pact. Hitler reacted to this impasse by changing the subject to dilate upon a more congenial topic. Britain, he declared, would very soon be defeated and the British Empire, a bankrupt estate, would then be ripe for them to plunder. Let's divide the whole world, he suggested. The Soviet diplomat was not known as Stonass for nothing. In his precise and obdurate way, he brought the discussion back to Europe and the intractable issue of the Balkan states and the Black Sea. I persisted. I wore him down. Molotov recalled with satisfaction. The two men sparred testily until Molotov asked how Germany would respond if the Soviet Union gave a military guarantee to Bulgaria on similar terms to that given by Germany to Romania. Hitler was yet again evasive, saying only that he would need to discuss the issue with Mussolini. Molotov persisted. The Soviet Union needed protection from any attack on the Black Sea through the Dardanelles as Russia had faced in the Crimean War and more recently in the Civil War. Hitler could stand no more. Once again praying in aid the RAF, he advised there might very well soon be an air raid on the capital. The meeting ended without agreement. It would be their last. On this occasion, the RAF was happy to oblige. That evening, Molotov's guests were feasting on the world's best caviar and consuming liberal quantities of vodka at the return banquet for his German hosts, when the sirens started to wail. As the Soviet embassy lacked an air raid shelter, Goering, Hess and others hurried to their limousines in search of a place of safety. Ribbentrop escorted Molotov to his bunker in the foreign ministry, where, against the distant chatter of anti-aircraft guns, the thump of exploding bombs and the ceaseless lament of the sirens, they reopened their fruitless dialogue about their rivalrous aspirations for the division of the spoils once Britain had been forced to surrender. Churchill claimed later that the air raid had been timed deliberately. We had heard of the conference beforehand, he quipped, and though not invited to join in the discussion, did not wish to be entirely left out of the proceedings. The next morning, Molotov left Berlin for Moscow with even less ceremony than when he'd arrived. There had been no meeting of minds. Nothing had been achieved. 
Although the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was not yet in tatters, it was frayed beyond repair. Hitler had been seeking to play a 20th century version of the 19th century great game by luring Moscow into compliance with his vision for world domination until he was fully prepared to turn the entire might of the Wehrmacht against the Soviet Union. In the weeks following his abortive meeting with Molotov, he appeared still to hope that he could maintain the charade for a while yet. It soon became clear, though, that Moscow was no longer willing to play. Hitler's unyielding policy was not merely to confine the Soviet Union to the margins of Europe, but to seize control of the entire Balkan region. There were no circumstances, except for defeat on the battlefield, under which the Kremlin would tolerate this takeover. The gulf between Moscow and Berlin was unbridgeable. Hitler very soon lost patience. On the 5th of December, he summoned the army commander-in-chief, Brauschitz, and Holder, his powerful chief of staff, to a meeting at which, with unbounded confidence, he sketched out his vision for the year ahead. Although he had abandoned plans for a cross-channel invasion of Britain, he boasted that very soon every inch of Gibraltar would be pulverised, the Mediterranean would be under Axis control, and the threat of a British attack on the Reich from the south via the Balkans would be eliminated, if necessary by dispatching the Wehrmacht to overrun Yugoslavia and occupy Greece. The way would thereby be cleared for a full-scale invasion of the Soviet Union in the spring of 1941. A year earlier, well before his triumphs in the West, both Brauschitz and Holder had been so appalled by Hitler's military adventurism that they had contemplated his overthrow. Now, both men, like the overwhelming majority of their fellow generals, found themselves in awe of the Führer's apparent invincibility. Similarly, the Wehrmacht's most senior commanders shared not only his political and military aspirations for Eastern Europe, but also what the German historian Gerhard Hirschfeld has described as his fanatical disdain for Judeo-Bolshevism. Thus, though they may have had reservations about the dangers of conducting a war on two fronts, the army's two most senior generals listened dutifully on the 5th of November as their Führer instructed them to plan in detail for a military operation on such a scale and fraught with such hazard as to be more reckless by far than any enterprise he had yet undertaken. Hitler's decision to move so swiftly against the Soviet Union, even though it would entail fighting a war on two fronts, was motivated by his apprehension that the British, the Americans and the Russians might form a military alliance with enough combined power to crush his European imperium. Following the fall of France nine months earlier, the mood had shifted in the United States. Roosevelt's landslide re-election victory in November 1940 had put him in a much stronger position to see off the isolationists and to persuade Congress to authorise the greatest surge in military expenditure in the history of the United States. He was also far better placed to support Britain and any other of Hitler's adversaries with more than warm words and tough trade deals. For Hitler, the destruction of the Soviet Union was no longer a theoretical vision, but a pressing necessity. Had he been given advance sight of Roosevelt's 29th December fireside chat with the American people, before his meeting earlier that month with Brauchitz and Holder, he would have been yet more convinced that he was right to press ahead. The President used his broadcast to promote a vision of the United States as the great arsenal of democracy. Mocking America's appeasers, he warned that Hitler sought to enslave the whole of Europe, to dominate the rest of the world. If Britain were defeated, the American continent would be at the mercy of the Axis powers, living at the point of a gun, a gun loaded with explosive bullets, economic as well as military. To avoid that fate, he told the American people, the United States had no choice but to support its allies with as much weaponry as their great democratic arsenal could produce. Hitler had convinced himself that if the Soviet Union could be eliminated from the war before 1942, by which time he judged that the United States would be ready to intervene against him militarily, 
Britain would be deprived of her continental sword in the form of an alliance with the Soviet Union, and in consequence, the United States would think twice before waging war in Europe while simultaneously facing the Japanese. If these factors helped determine the timing of Barbarossa, his overriding objectives were unchanged. The establishment of Lebensraum for the Aryan peoples of the Third Reich and the annihilation of Judeo-Bolshevism. The strategic priorities were at the service of and dovetailed with his deranged ideological obsessions. It would be a straightforward victory, he told his generals. The Russian is inferior. The army lacks leadership. We will have in the spring a perceptibly better position in leadership, material, troops, while the Russians will be at an unmistakable low point. When the Russian army is battered once, the final disaster is unavoidable. We must use attack methods which cut up the Russian army and allow its destruction in pockets. The anticipated time for execution is the end of May. On the 18th of December, he confirmed his decision formally with the issue of Directive No. 21. The German armed forces must be prepared, even before the conclusion of the war against England, to crush the Soviet Union in a rapid campaign. In certain circumstances, I shall issue orders for the deployment against Soviet Russia eight weeks before the operation is timed to begin. Preparations which require more time than this will be put in hand now, insofar as this has not already been done, and will be concluded by the 15th of May, 1941. It is of decisive importance that our intention to attack should not be known. The directive was named after the 12th century Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I, a German-born warrior king also known as Barbarossa. Cast in the heroic mould, Frederick I Barbarossa was renowned for his wisdom as well as courage on the battlefield. His overriding goal during a long reign was to restore the empire to the status it had last enjoyed under Charlemagne, if necessary, by force of arms. To conceal the preparations for Operation Barbarossa, for which both Finland and Romania were identified as probable allies, the Führer instructed his commanders-in-chief to involve only the smallest number of staff officers possible. As a further effort to guarantee secrecy, all their instructions were to be phrased as though they were precautionary measures undertaken in case Russia should alter its present attitude towards us. Rumours of the impending invasion had already been swirling around the capital for several days. On the 5th of December, the day of Hitler's meeting with Holder and Brauschitz, the Soviet ambassador in Berlin, Vladimir Dekanuzov, received from an undisclosed source a warning which he took seriously enough to forward to Moscow. To comrades Stalin and Molotov, very urgent. Russia, please be alert, as Hitler is soon going to attack you. It will soon be too late. A little over three weeks later, after the issue of Directive No. 21, the head of the GRU, Golikov, was alerted to a report from Berlin that Hitler was actively preparing to invade Russia. The source was a German diplomat, Rudolf von Schelaila, who had been recruited by the NKVD while serving in Warsaw, where he was given the codename Arietz. According to Arietz, who had since been transferred to the Information Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Berlin, highly placed sources had told him that war will be declared in March 1941. Pressed for more details by Golikov, who was terrified of rousing Stalin's ire by proffering evidence that might force the Soviet Union onto a premature war footing, Ariets replied five days later to confirm that his source was a friend in the military and that the warning was based not on rumours but on a special order of Hitler that was especially secret and known only to a few people very probably a reference to the slightly garbled version of Directive No. 21, which had presumably been leaked to him by his friend. At the end of February, Arietz added further details, reporting with uncanny accuracy that the invasion would be mounted by three army groups, led respectively by three field marshals, Fedor von Bock, Gert von Runsted, 
and Wilhelm Ritter von Lieb. The date, he had advised, was provisionally set for May the 20th, and he added, Preparatory measures have resulted in the assignment of Russian-speaking officers and non-commissioned officers to various headquarters. In addition, armoured trains are being constructed with wide gauges as in Russia. Ariets was one of scores of spies around the world to provide such early and increasingly detailed and accurate warnings of Hitler's plans. Like many spies on all sides of the conflict, Rudolf Schalila's motives were complex and mercenary. He was known to enjoy a lifestyle that his salary could not sustain. He was thought to have a gambling addiction and to maintain a number of mistresses. But whatever the financial motive for his treachery may have been, his abhorrence of Nazism was not in doubt. Moscow was dismayed by the growing evidence of Hitler's intentions, but far from galvanizing the Kremlin into an immediate reaction, they induced a form of collective catatonia in which the relevant officials dutifully recorded the plethora of reports from capitals all over Nazified Europe, but failed to give them the credence they deserved. The raw data was usually passed upwards. Much of it reached Stalin's desk, but it was rarely sifted to assess its credibility or value, although reports were routinely bowdlerized to align them with what it was presumed Stalin wanted to hear, or to exclude conclusions that he might find unpalatable. The GRU's desk officers knew only too well that bearers of bad tidings were unwelcome, and how easily the dictator could be provoked to fury by any suggestion that the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact might be imperiled by countervailing intelligence evidence. Living as they did in terror of his censure, it proved wiser to soothe the anxious brow of the mercurial dictator with half-truths than to draw attention to unassailable facts. With his customary precision, Molotov described Stalin's attitude thus. I think that one can never trust the intelligence. One has to listen to them, but then check on them. The intelligence people can lead to dangerous situations that it is impossible to get out of. One cannot count on the intelligence without a thorough and constant checking and double-checking. People are so naive and gullible, indulging themselves and quoting memoirs. Stalin's disdain was underpinned by the conviction that the Soviet Union was too important to the German economy for Hitler to risk a formal breach. The Soviet Union currently supplied 74% of the Reich's phosphate, 67% of its asbestos, 65% of its chrome ore, 55% of its manganese, 40% of its nickel imports, and 34% of its imported oil. Far from diminishing the inflow of vital raw materials from the country since the 1940 trade agreement, had grown to the point where Germany had become dependent on the Soviet Union for some 70% of all its imports. In January 1941, following an acrimonious but eventually successful round of negotiations, Berlin and Moscow signed a new commercial agreement worth a further 650 million Reichsmarks. Under this deal, Germany became even more dependent on Russia, not only for oil, but also for grain, copper, nickel, platinum, chrome and manganese, all of which were crucial to the Reich's wartime economy. Although he was aware that these exports enabled Germany to circumvent an otherwise effective British naval blockade, Stalin was unable to accommodate the thought that Hitler might be preparing other means of securing these supplies than by a trade agreement. As a result, he continued to delude himself that he had far greater leverage over German policy than a careful scrutiny of the intelligence should have allowed. Paradoxically, Stalin's dismissive attitude towards these warnings was also infused by a gnawing fear that they might be accurate. It was less distressing to presume the spies had based their reports on rumour and gossip, or even deliberate falsehoods designed to provoke war between Germany and the Soviet Union, for which the Red Army was entirely unprepared. Despite starting preparations for a potential conflict in the late autumn of 1940, the Soviet High Command had yet to receive any coherent instructions for the defence of the nation. 
In December, the Defence Commissar, Marshal Timoshenko, became so alarmed by the lack of direction from the top that he complained to the Central Committee of the Communist Party. The Chief of the General Staff, General Kirill Meretskov, was evidently unaware of mounting evidence from Ukraine and Belarusia that the Germans were establishing command posts, transferring troops towards the Soviet border, turning civilian buildings into army barracks and installing anti-aircraft defences close to the frontier. A report warning of the dismal state of the Red Army troops on the front line had been produced, but no remedial action had yet been taken. Eventually, Stalin summoned his generals to a conference at which, in addition to discussing a wholesale reorganization of the armed forces, he charged them to devise new war ideologies without indicating what their purpose might be. By the end of 1940, the atmosphere in the military was laden with gloom, uncertainty, and confusion. In January 1941, these glaring inadequacies were harshly exposed when the Red Army conducted two war games, one simulating a German invasion from the north and the other from the south. In both paper exercises, the Russians were defeated. This shook the confidence of the high command and drove Stalin to a paroxysm of anguished frustration. Summoning the participants to appear before the full Politburo, he demanded an explanation. Meretskov stumbled through a semi-coherent account before Stalin brutally interrupted him. The trouble is we do not have a proper chief of staff, he said, dismissing the dumbfounded Meretskov on the spot. As if that were not enough punishment, the sacked general went to the Bolshoi theatre a few nights later, only to be confronted once more by Stalin, who humiliated him yet again in front of Molotov, Timoshenko and others, saying, You are courageous, capable, but without principle, spineless. By that time, General Zhukov, one of the few commanders to have emerged from the war games with any credit, had been summoned to the Kremlin and on the 1st of February was told he was to replace Meretskov as chief of staff. His brief was to place the Soviet armed forces on a sound, defensive footing. Zhukov was a formidable figure. He had displayed his qualities of generalship in 1939 during the undeclared war against the Japanese on the Mongolian border in the Soviet Far East. During the abortive war games in January, he had secured a reputation for strategic clarity, tactical audacity and ruthlessness. His challenge in the spring of 1941 was immense, to devise a military strategy and establish an operational plan to arrest and reverse any German onslaught that might be launched on almost any section of the 2,900-kilometre front line between the Baltic and the Black Sea. On paper, the resources available to him 171 divisions at the front, with 57 more as a second echelon in reserve, constituted a formidable, if not an invincible, military force. He had weaponry in abundance. By the spring of 1941, the Red Army had some 20,000 tanks of various types and sizes, notably more than the Germans. However, fewer than half of these were stationed on the front line, and most were obsolete in need of repair, or unsuited to the terrain. Although their replacements, especially the KV-1 and T-34, would prove to be far more effective than their German counterparts, these were not yet available in sufficient numbers to make a significant impact. Their crews were ill-trained, and their drivers very often had no more than two hours' experience at the wheel before heading to the front. The mechanised corps with some thousand tanks each, were scattered widely in unwieldy formations. They were far from combat ready. The Soviet Air Force had almost four times as many fighters and bombers as the Luftwaffe, but these two were unreliable and in poor repair. Lacking radio transmitters, their navigators were, for the most part, without the means to maintain contact with ground control. The pilots were inexperienced, and this combined with the delivery of new aircraft that had not been adequately flight-tested, 
led to a great many fatal accidents at the rate of several a day. The situation was so serious that in April, Timoshenko and Zhukov complained to Stalin, demanding that senior heads should roll. A few weeks later, on the 10th of April, the commander of the Soviet air forces, Pavel Richagov, was summoned to the Kremlin to explain these failures to a star chamber court of senior military figures and Politburo members. Angered by the criticism, and his tongue evidently loosened by alcohol, he made the fatal error of answering back, bursting out in exasperation, the accident rate will go on being high as long as you make us fly in coffins. The former fighter pilot had gone too far. Stalin, who had been pacing up and down, sucking on his pipe, stopped, turned, went up to Richagov and said ominously, you shouldn't have said that. Stalin, who was unforgivingly punitive, meant what he said. Richagov was arrested on the 24th of June, two days after the start of Operation Barbarossa. He was held in custody, tortured, and on the 28th of October, executed, along with his wife and 20 brother officers. Zhukov's greatest task was to oversee the training, equipping, and deployment of a conscript army of often raw recruits, led by officers among whom experience, motivation, and commitment were in short supply. His problems were exacerbated by the baleful presence of Communist Party apparatchiks at every level. Despite modest reforms in the late 1930s, the political commissars still retained an iron grip on the military, authorised by the Central Committee to second-guess frontline officers. Although they were well drilled in techniques of indoctrination, they knew precious little about warfare. Their diktats were not only ill-informed, but also carping, demoralising and intimidating. Bitter memories had not faded. Between 1937 and 1940, almost 50,000 Red Army officers had been purged, and though many of them were subsequently reinstated, 90% of the district commanders had been replaced by their subordinate officers. Instead of relishing the prospect of leadership, young officers shied away from taking initiatives. Instead of shouldering responsibility, they frequently chose to be invisible, beneath the radar. An alarming number became clinically depressed by the tension between obeying the doctrinaire whims of the commissars and exercising the initiative flair and flexibility that the realities of life and death on the battlefield required. The official suicide statistics revealed that a tragically large number were driven to take their own lives. In one particularly poignant case, a loyal young communist, who according to the official archives had been living in an earth dugout for months, wrote a final message. I am not able to go on living this hard life. I love my country, and I would never have betrayed it. I believe in an even better future, when a bright sun will shine on the whole world. But here, there are enemies who sit and threaten every step an honest commander tries to take. I decided to take my own life, even though I am but twenty-one years old. There could have been little doubt that the enemies to which he referred were the omnipresent commissars. For those who chose to soldier on but who lacked adequate training or experience, life was made even harder. As Catherine Merridale has noted in her vivid and scholarly Ivan's War, men in the ranks were quick to spot incompetence, while the culture of purging and denunciation did a lot to damage officers' prestige, their own ineptitude was fatal. Insubordination, born of contempt, was commonplace, an attitude the fiasco of the winter war against Finland had served only to exacerbate. All these factors made it hard to find high-quality recruits to fill the empty spaces in an army which had been purged but was seeking rapidly to expand. By the late spring of 1941, the shortfall was 36,000 and rising. Despite Zhukov's tireless and ruthless efforts, the Red Army was an arthritic leviathan which was still far from being fit for purpose. This fact permeated Stalin's thinking, 
to the point where the more warnings he received about Hitler's aggressive purpose, the more reluctant he became to accept them. In relation to Hitler, his paranoid instincts appeared to desert him. Noting the irony of this, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was to write that Stalin did not trust his own mother, God, fellow party members, peasants, workers, intellectuals, soldiers, relatives, wives, mistresses, or even his own children. In all his long, suspicion-ridden life, he had only trusted one man. This man whom Stalin trusted was Adolf Hitler. This double-edged indictment was potent, but did not allow for the fact that the Soviet dictator nurtured the self-deluding hope that by placating his Nazi nemesis, he might postpone an invasion he now regarded as inevitable, at least until the Red Army was in a better state of readiness. In Berlin, the German high command was rather less sanguine about Operation Barbarossa than the Führer, who repeatedly instructed them that victory was certain. In one such meeting he declared, I am convinced that our attack will sweep over them like a hailstorm. At another, the Russians will crumple under the massive impact of our tanks and planes. Nor could his generals have been in any doubt about the means required to deliver the Führer's ends. As he never tired of telling them, the invasion had a far greater purpose than military victory alone. It would be a war of extermination, in which the traditional rules of engagement would have no meaning. He used the term exterminate so wantonly and with such relish as to eliminate all doubt in their minds that for him the annihilation, another favoured term, of Judeo-Bolshevism was every bit as important as the acquisition of raw materials or the establishment of Lebensraum for the peoples of the Third Reich. He spelled out the gruesome implications of these objectives in the Reich Chancellery on the 30th of March, where he addressed more than 200 senior officers, including the commanders-in-chief of all three services. In the words of one of the most senior officers present, General Walter Wallemont, deputy chief of OKW, Wehrmacht High Command Operations, he made it clear that the German soldier need not be bound by the letter of the laws of war or of disciplinary instructions, but that, on the contrary, any type of attack by the inhabitants against the Wehrmacht should be dealt with with the utmost severity, including summary execution without court-martial procedure. Queasiness about the treatment of the enemy would not be an option. Commanders must make the sacrifice of overcoming their personal scruples. Whatever qualms they may have had, the generals did not dare even to question the Führer let alone express any dissent. General Varlamont's defence of this supine reaction, that some of them knew that opposition generally did more harm than good, while others had not followed Hitler's long diatribe in detail and thus had not grasped the full meaning of his proposals, was so feeble as to beg a belief. But feebleness was collusion's handmaiden. On the 6th of May 1940, the Army's Commander-in-Chief, General Brauschitz, published a draft set of formal instructions designed to give quasi-legal authority to Hitler's requirements. At its core was an order that all political offenders captured by the Wehrmacht should be liquidated, if possible, at prisoners of war collecting points or, at the latest, on passage through the transit camps. The official guidelines for the behaviour of the fighting forces in Russia, the 19th of May, that were to be issued to all ranks on the eve of Barbarossa, demanded ruthless and vigorous action against Bolshevik agitators, guerrillas, saboteurs, Jews, and the complete elimination of all active and passive resistance. There was to be no part of Hitler's War of Annihilation from which his generals would be permitted to exclude themselves. An obligation they accepted without demur, and in some cases with enthusiasm. Though planning for the invasion was accelerating sharply following Directive Number 21, 
the generals had qualms about the scale and speed with which they were required to accomplish their Fuhrer's objectives. At the end of January, following a meeting with Brauschitz, Halder had noted, Barbarossa, purpose is not clear. We do not hit the British. Risk in the West must not be underestimated. Their anxiety about fighting a war on two fronts was sharpened by an avalanche of analyses detailing the enormous strategic and tactical challenges that would face their commanders on the battlefield. Reams of documents laid bare the logistical, organizational, and operational complexities of structuring, mobilizing, training, equipping, deploying, and sustaining an army of more than three million men on alien terrain far from the heart of the fatherland. It was at best a daunting enterprise. At worst, they feared, it would be a disaster. Their assessment of the Soviet Union's military potential was also sobering. The more thoroughly they examined the evidence about the Soviet Union's material and human resources, the more obvious it became that their enemy had the potential to offer formidable resistance. For all its evident shortcomings and failures, they judged the Red Army to be a gigantic war machine whose structural and organisational weaknesses were offset by its size, the quality of its weaponry, and, they were advised by their own observers on the spot, by the frugality, toughness and bravery of its individual soldiers. Internal documents, based on close observation of the Red Army, warned against the temptation to be misled by its woeful performance against the Finns. In contrast to Hitler's instinctive disdain for the inferior quality of the Russian soldier, these reports argued that he would fight to the death to protect his motherland, and that in defence he is tough and gallant, and usually allows himself to be killed at the spot where his leader has placed him. Yet, if the German high command feared that Hitler's reach so far exceeded his grasp as to render Barbarossa a perilous or foolhardy venture, they refrained from saying so. As commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, the Führer was constitutionally omnipotent. As the conqueror of the West, and someone who had overridden his cautious military advisers, he was also politically unassailable. He had made it abundantly plain that he would brook no dissent, and that he had no intention of leaving Operation Barbarossa in the hands of his generals. It was his war, he was its mastermind, and he was resolved to control its direction as unequivocally as he had defined its purpose in terms they could not possibly misunderstand. For Hitler, the security of the Third Reich's southern front was an essential precondition for the launch of Barbarossa. Any risk of internal upheaval or that any Balkan state might reach out to either the Russians or the British had to be eliminated first. In late February, with this risk yet to be averted, he was confronted by a rapidly accelerating regional crisis that promised to derail his timetable for the invasion of Russia. Although Bulgaria was about to follow Romania by joining the Tripartite Pact, Yugoslavia had yet to succumb to Berlin's heavy-handed enticement. Even worse, a significant partner faced imminent defeat at the hands of the Greeks. Rather than marching in triumph on Athens to claim his slice of the Balkan cake, as Mussolini had imagined when he launched his hubristic invasion four months earlier, his troops had started to flee across the mountains into Albania. Hitler feared that this blundering retreat would reinforce the Anglo-Greek alliance and thereby threaten his southern flank. The British would acquire a foothold in the Balkans from which to launch a major assault on the Reich, or to bomb the Romanian oil fields that were crucial to the Reich's ability to sustain a war economy. On the 24th of February, as though to confirm Hitler's apprehension, the British Prime Minister ordered General Archibald Wavell, the Middle East Commander-in-Chief, to transfer four divisions from the Desert Campaign to Greece. The impact of this decision on the campaign in North Africa was immediate. The Army of the Nile, as Churchill liked to call the Eighth Army, was at that moment poised to destroy the Italian Tenth Army 
in the Libyan desert and to seize Tripoli. To the fury and dismay of the British commanders in the field, the redeployment of four divisions meant this mission had to be aborted. Churchill's decision, which an initially reluctant Wavell had finally endorsed, coincided to the day with the arrival of General Erwin Rommel in the Libyan capital at the head of two panzer divisions in a bid to prevent Hitler's Axis partner from facing humiliation in North Africa as well as in Greece. However, Churchill was driven by what he regarded as a far more important strategic objective, to secure an alliance with Greece and Yugoslavia that, with the tacit and he hoped the active support of Turkey, would safeguard Britain's imperial interests in the Middle East and Africa from a Wehrmacht offensive. As yet, this was no more than a gleam in Hitler's eye, but urged on by the commander-in-chief of the Kriegsmarine, Admiral Erich Reder, he was already toying with the thought of a detour through the Mediterranean and Africa on the way to world empire. The explosion of violence that was about to erupt in the Balkans owed much to their strategic location as a stronghold for whichever power could master their convulsive rivalries and enmities. At this pivotal moment in the Second World War, it owed no less to the fateful irony that the British and the Germans both feared that each intended to use the region as a launch pad from which to open a second front against the other. As it happened, neither, at that point, intended to adopt any such offensive strategy. But by now, it was no longer possible to avert a military confrontation with the Wehrmacht that the Prime Minister's most senior advisers knew was bound to end disastrously. The Germans could overrun Greece with the utmost ease if they wanted to, the Director of Military Operations Major General John Kennedy had warned, noting tartly, we stood to gain more by winning the African coast for ourselves than by denying Greece to the Germans. Similarly, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Sir John Dill, advised that if the troops were sent in, they would be certain to be annihilated or driven out again. However, he had been persuaded during a visit to Athens with Antony Eden that diplomacy should prevail over narrow military logic. Churchill conceded that there was no more than a good fighting chance, but he was determined to show the world, and especially President Roosevelt, that Britain would honour its commitments and thereby, he hoped, stiffen his allies' resolve to join Britain against the Nazis. For that reason, the Prime Minister judged it was better to try and fail than not to try at all. On the 2nd of March 1941, the first contingents of a British expeditionary force landed at the port of Piraeus. Within two days, more than 60,000 troops were on their way north to join the Greeks in resisting the threatened German blitzkrieg. Churchill had hoped that the presence of British troops on Greek soil would encourage neighbouring Yugoslavia to resist the growing threats from Berlin. But on the 25th of March, Belgrade buckled. As acting head of state, Prince Paul joined Romania and Bulgaria to become a fellow signatory to the Tripartite Pact. Events now moved rapidly towards a conflagration as the Yugoslav army, in close cooperation with the British, staged a military coup. Paul was forced to cede the throne to his teenage cousin, King Peter II, for whom he had been acting as regent. Serb nationalists took to the streets to dance in celebration and to wave British flags in fraternal triumph. The cry went up, rather war than the pact, rather death than slavery. Churchill was almost as elated as the crowds, reflecting, a people paralysed in action, hitherto ill-governed and ill-led, long haunted by the sense of being ensnared, flung their reckless heroic defiance at the tyrant and conqueror in the moment of his greatest power. The rejoicing did not last long. Yugoslavia's impertinent defiance enraged Hitler. His blandishments and threats had come to naught. Barbarossa could no longer proceed as planned. His southern flank was suddenly and unexpectedly exposed in the most alarming fashion. He sent a telegram to Mussolini. I do not consider this situation as being catastrophic, but nevertheless it is a difficult one. 
to launch a blitzkrieg against the Soviet Union with both Greece and Yugoslavia ranged against him alongside the British would be too foolhardy for even Hitler to contemplate. His only alternative was to crush both countries at once or to postpone Barbarossa sine die. On the very day of the military coup, he issued Directive No. 25, which stated bluntly, Yugoslavia must be regarded as an enemy and beaten down as quickly as possible. It was not good enough merely to defeat the Yugoslavs on the battlefield, but as punishment for their insolence, their capital city was to be destroyed from the air by continual day and night attack. In the same directive, he coupled this with the order simultaneously to begin operations against Greece. On the 6th of April, some 350,000 German troops, supported by 700 aircraft, marched on Belgrade from their staging posts in Romania. In a single day of low-level bombing, 17,000 Yugoslavs were killed, almost as many as died in Dresden during the entire month of February 1945. After 11 days and 100,000 casualties, the capital was in ruins. Yugoslavia surrendered. The brutality of Hitler's resolve had been demonstrated with pitiless clarity. On the same day, 680,000 German troops, supported by 1,000 tanks and 700 aircraft, blitzed their way into northern Greece. Exhausted and demoralised by the onslaught, the Greeks fell back in disorder. To avoid its own annihilation, the British expeditionary force had to beat a more or less orderly retreat to the coast. Since the port of Piraeus had been virtually obliterated by the Luftwaffe, the troops made for the beaches, where a hastily assembled fleet of British warships, flying boats and fishing smacks waited to rescue them. In an operation reminiscent of Dunkirk, they destroyed what was left of their artillery, tanks, trucks and even pack animals before trying to make their escape under fire from the German bombers. Some 43,000 men made it to the boats, but 15,000, a quarter of those who had landed at Piraeus six weeks earlier, were killed, wounded or captured. On the 23rd of April, as the British survivors extricated themselves from this debacle, the Greek army laid down its guns. Four days later, the swastika was flying over the Acropolis. Hitler had made himself the undisputed master of the Balkans. Strategically, however, it was to prove a Pyrrhic victory, secured at exorbitant cost. Though it was true that with his southern flank secured, Hitler could now proceed with the invasion of the Soviet Union, the target date of late May for the launch of Barbarossa could no longer be met. The destruction of Yugoslavia and the occupation of Greece had required the mass redeployment of men and weaponry, infantry and armoured divisions from Poland, where they had been mustering for Barbarossa. The invasion could not start before they had returned to their positions close to the Polish front line. This was a daunting logistical task that would take four precious weeks. Though he did not know it at the time, Churchill's decision to come to the aid of Greece thus had a significant, if fortuitous, impact on the Barbarossa campaign. Although the British effort to resist the Nazi takeover of the Balkans had ended in humiliating failure, it had not been entirely in vain. The perceived threat to Berlin's Balkan hegemony led Hitler to postpone the launch of Barbarossa. As a result, the number of optimal war-fighting weeks on the Eastern Front before the onset of the Russian winter was sharply and alarmingly curtailed. Chapter 7. Stalin Ignores the Warnings The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact had so aggravated relations between London and Moscow that negotiations between the two governments had stalled. The animosity and distrust provoked by the breakdown of talks in August 1939 continued to fester. The British government was so preoccupied with the struggle against Germany that the conduct of Soviet policy was largely delegated to the career civil servants who ran the Foreign Office, where both leadership 
and clarity of purpose were noticeable by their absence. In this vacuum, the British ambassador in Moscow, Sir Stafford Cripps, was trapped between the mandarins in Whitehall and the hard men in the Kremlin. Cripps had been in this pivotal post since May 1941, despite the fact that he and the Prime Minister, who likened him disparagingly to a cage in which two squirrels were at war, his conscience and his career, had very little in common except an instinctive mutual aversion. Sir Stafford Cripps was not a conventional diplomat. His otherwise admiring aunt Beatrice Webb thought he was oddly immature in intellect and unbalanced in judgment. Elegant in style, but not emollient by nature, he was clever, arrogant, ascetic, rich and ambitious. A left-wing MP who had briefly been expelled by Labour, he had flirted with the British Communist Party and had been forgiving of Stalin's purges. While Churchill was an unapologetic imperialist, Cripps believed fervently that the war's overriding triumph would be the creation of a new world order in which socialism would be the victor. On one issue, however, they were at one. In 1940, with Britain fighting alone against Nazism, it would be the height of folly to cold-shoulder the Soviet Union any longer. The Foreign Office bureaucrats did not agree. Their collective view, stiffened by the Soviet invasion of Finland, was that the Russians had settled down definitely into an undeclared war against Britain and were Hitler's partners in crime. Cadogan, who wielded great influence, regarded the Soviet Union as beyond redemption. Under Chamberlain, the cabinet did not dissent. Once Churchill had installed himself in number 10, however, the cabinet's attitude changed abruptly. With France almost certain to crumble and the debacle of Dunkirk already in prospect, the atmosphere in the early summer of 1940 was grim with foreboding, even despair. The restoration of relations with the Soviet Union to counter Hitler's growing stranglehold on Europe came rapidly into focus. Cripps had virtually appointed himself to Moscow. After sounding out Maisky, he seized the moment to let it be known that he would like to go to the Soviet capital as a special envoy to fill the diplomatic void which had opened up between the two governments. He certainly seemed to have the right credentials. Four months earlier, he had travelled to Russia on a fact-finding mission when he had detected that the bond between Moscow and Berlin was more fragile than the propaganda from both capitals suggested. He had met Molotov, who left him with the impression that if the British government would adopt a friendly attitude towards Russia, Moscow was ready to restore cordial relations with London. Three months on, in the crisis of May, Halifax, a most unlikely advocate of friendship with the Soviet Union, was persuaded that the Crips mission might serve a useful purpose. Overriding his officials, he put the idea to the Prime Minister. With little time to deal with anything other than the imminent Nazi invasion of France, Churchill waved through the appointment, persuaded, erroneously as it transpired, that Cripps's reputation as a radical socialist might help him to penetrate Stalin's carapace of suspicion and hostility towards Britain. Foreign Office officials, fearful that with Cripps as our man in Moscow, their influence would wane, grumbled about the appointment of such a wayward ideologue who was so clearly not one of us. The tone was set by Cadogan, who noted disdainfully that Cripps was an excellent lawyer and a very nimble debater, but had not yet won his spurs in diplomacy. With very few exceptions, he and his colleagues not only deplored Cripps's ideological convictions, but were also tempted to regard him as a willing tool of the Bolsheviks. This put them at odds with the junior Foreign Office Minister Rab Butler, the former Arch of Pisa, who was one of the few with enough influence to press the case for Cripps. Butler's private secretary, Sir Henry Chips Channon, who shared his minister's outlook, noted that the Foreign Office have learnt nothing and forgotten nothing. In fact, they are still asleep, dreaming in a pre-Hitler, pre-dictator world, foolish, carping, 
finicky, inefficient, and futile. An exaggeration, but a telling one. The mandarins were out of step with their ministerial masters. By the end of May 1940, even before his accreditation had been approved, Cripps was in the air bound for Moscow. The Kremlin, fearful that Hitler might suspect that a diplomatic shift toward London was in the offing, insisted that Britain's emissary should not be granted the status of some astral special envoy, but merely that of a routinely appointed ambassador. His journey was anything but routine, required to fly via Athens to avoid the Luftwaffe fighters that now patrolled the direct route between London and Moscow from their newly acquired bases in Norway, he almost failed to make it when his plane flew into a storm, was hit by lightning and overturned in mid-air. It was not a good augury. He arrived in Moscow on the 12th of June without fanfare or official welcome, to be met at the airport by the embassy staff and his official Rolls-Royce. The embassy itself stood grandly on the edge of the river Moskva, looking across towards the ornate towers and spires of Red Square and the Kremlin. Built on a scale that did not appeal to Cripps's aesthetic sensibilities, his new home was drearily decorated and stuffed with ugly and uncomfortable furniture. He was disheartened at the thought that much remedial work would be required to make it congenially habitable. And then there was the food. As the teetotal vegetarian noted dejectedly, it looks like being very expensive and difficult living for me here, as vegetables are unattainable almost, and fruit is worse. It was but the start of what would prove a dispiriting venture. Though his culinary needs were soon met easily enough, he discovered that his ambassadorial ambitions would be far harder to achieve. To stress the importance of Cripps's mission, Churchill wrote his first letter to the Soviet leader. Addressing him as Monsieur Stalin, he urged that when the face of Europe is changing hourly, the deep political divisions between Britain and the Soviet Union should not prevent the relations between our two countries in the international sphere from being harmonious and mutually beneficial, so that they could face together the threat of Germany's hegemony in Europe. He received no reply. It was an eloquent response. For the time being, Stalin had nailed his diplomatic colours to the Nazi mast and had no intention of pulling them down. A few days later, after a brief and formal meeting with Molotov, the new ambassador presented Churchill's letter to Stalin at the Kremlin. It was a frosty encounter that lasted almost three hours. In the course of a severely frank discussion, Stalin insisted that the Soviet Union did not feel threatened by Germany and that he could not agree to restore the old equilibrium with Britain. The two men would not meet again for another year. Cripps's subsequent requests for high-level meetings with members of the Politburo were similarly rebuffed. The closest he got to the Kremlin's corridors of power was when, three months after his arrival, he was granted an audience with Molotov's deputy, Andrei Vyshinsky, who, despite presiding over the murderous show trials in the 1930s, was no longer influential. Yesterday's great thrill, Cripps noted dryly, was a very long talk that I had with Vyshinsky last evening. As lawyers by profession, the two men swiftly found enough common ground on which to build a congenial relationship, but their meetings were to accomplish nothing of note. To his intense frustration, Cripps's days were marked only by the conventions of diplomacy, a cycle of cocktail parties, dinners, and one-to-ones with fellow ambassadors to pick over the entrails of the rumours, gossip, and titbits of intelligence that came their way. Cripps had long believed that war between Germany and the Soviet Union was inevitable, and he had said so frequently. He also advised the Foreign Office that mere words would not be enough to restore Anglo-Soviet relations. But he was resolutely stonewalled. In private correspondence, he railed against what he detected as the distrust and hatred of the Russian government in Whitehall. In more measured terms, he advised Halifax that the history of the last twenty years, 
had taught the Russians to regard the present British cabinet as fundamentally hostile to the Union and that they distrusted Britain's desire to divorce them from the Axis. Explaining that a great and ever-present fear of Germany dictated Soviet foreign policy, he insisted that a demonstrable change in approach was required to acknowledge Soviet interests and to find a way of accommodating them. His advice was ignored, his proposals rejected. Cadogan set much greater store by securing the support of the United States, where anti-Bolshevism was still rampant, than on constructing any form of partnership with the Soviet Union that might provoke Washington's irritation. Halifax had initially endorsed Cripps's appointment, but with a mind that in Butler's waspish phrase was always open to the last comer, readily succumbed to his permanent secretary's insistent opinion and told the cabinet that the support of the United States mattered far more than the somewhat illusory benefits of the goodwill of the USSR. Cripps was told he was to take no initiatives of his own, but should sit tight. Cadogan, whose loathing for the cynical, blood-stained murderers in Moscow was unabated, evidently relished delivering these snubs. After an earlier meeting with the ever-biddable Halifax, he had sneered that Cripps argues that we must give everything and trust to the Russians loving us. This is simply silly, extraordinary how we go on kidding ourselves. Cripps was thus left on the sidelines, an impotent observer of a rapidly unfolding drama. His counterpart in London, Maisky, did not fail to notice his isolation. It looks as though Cripps is turning into our enemy due to his political failures, failures resulting from the British government's reluctance to move towards rapprochement with us, he noted in March 1941, adding that an ambassador is akin to a travelling salesman. When he sells good commodities, he will be successful even if his personal qualities are quite ordinary. When he sells bad commodities, he is doomed to fail even if his personal qualities are excellent. Cripps has basically had nothing to sell for these past ten months. Britain's apparent indifference to the fate of the Soviet Union confirmed Stalin's brooding but well-founded belief that Britain's strategic objective was to draw the Soviet Union into war with Germany. As a result, any communication from London that could be interpreted as evidence of this duplicity carried no weight with the Kremlin. In significant part, this explains the Soviet leader's response to what Churchill described as the cryptic message he sent to Stalin on the 3rd of April, alerting him to Hitler's intentions. It was the Prime Minister's first direct communication with Stalin since the telegram he had sent introducing the Crips mission the previous summer. In the absence of any firm evidence, Churchill's uncanny intuition had led him many months earlier to believe that Germany might in due course invade the Soviet Union. In June 1940, soon after Dunkirk, but before Hitler had abandoned his plans for the invasion of Britain, he wrote, If Hitler fails to beat us here, he will probably recoil eastwards. Indeed, he may do this without trying invasion, to find employment for his army, which had just crushed most of Western Europe into submission. In October of that year, in the course of briefing his senior commanders, he said that Germany would inevitably turn on Russia during 1941 for the sake of her oil. Apart from Cripps, he was virtually alone among his colleagues in showing such foresight. By the spring of 1941, notwithstanding the prevailing view in the intelligence community and the foreign office, he became convinced that such an invasion was imminent. The Prime Minister was an assiduous student of military intelligence especially of the spasmodic data from Enigma signals decrypted by the code breakers at Bletchley Park. These revealed that as soon as the Yugoslav government had joined the tripartite pact, trainloads of troops, including three panzer divisions, had been ordered to redeploy from the Balkans to southern Poland, but that following the anti-Nazi coup in Belgrade, they were turned back before they had even crossed the Polish border. This was enough for Churchill. 
Your Excellency will readily appreciate the significance of these facts, he advised Stalin in his 3rd of April message. The Prime Minister had presumed, correctly as it turned out, that the to and fro of the German troop movements was evidence that Hitler intended to launch an attack on the Soviet Union, but that he would do so only after Yugoslavia had been crushed. Unhappily, though, he refrained from elaborating this interpretation for Stalin's benefit, apparently believing both that his insight was of unique significance and that the arresting brevity of his message was bound to alert Stalin to a very real danger. In truth, it was so wrapped in ambiguity and contained so little fresh information as to be of very little intrinsic value. Nonetheless, and not surprisingly, Churchill was infuriated to be told that Cripps had failed to deliver the message on the grounds that the Kremlin had already been inundated with similar reports and that he had himself just alerted Vyshinsky to the danger at greater length and more emphatically. For this reason, as Cripps told Eden, who had returned to the Foreign Office in place of Halifax three months earlier, it would be both ineffectual and a serious tactical mistake to deliver the Prime Minister's message. Eden was easily persuaded. He had already cautioned Churchill against saying anything to Stalin that might imply that we ourselves required any assistance from the Soviet government or that they would be acting in any interests but their own. Now, he advised the Prime Minister, I think there may be some force in Stafford Cripps's arguments against the delivery of your message. Churchill was not mollified. Cripps's refusal to pass on this extremely pregnant piece of information was unpardonable. In the event, the message eventually reached the Kremlin almost three weeks after its dispatch, though there is no evidence that Stalin bothered to read it. Had he done so, it would assuredly have served only to confirm his belief that the perfidious British hoped to provoke the Soviet Union into war against Germany. In the meantime, on the 9th of April, Churchill made a speech in Parliament which had precisely that effect. In one of his familiar tours d'horizon, he reported on the severe British setbacks in North Africa, where Rommel had launched a lightning counterattack against the British 7th Armoured Division and laid siege to Tobruk. The disasters in Greece and Crete, and the grave threat to the Atlantic lifeline posed by German U boats. It was what he went on to say, however, that had MPs on the edge of their green benches. It is, of course, very hazardous to try to forecast in what direction or directions Hitler will employ his military machine in the present year. He may at any time attempt the invasion of this island. This is an ordeal from which we shall not shrink. But there are many signs which point to a Nazi attempt to secure the granary of the Ukraine and the oil fields of the Caucasus as a German means of gaining resources wherewith to wear down the English-speaking world. This startling assertion, when in the secret circles of the British intelligence community it was still firmly believed that the Moscow-Berlin axis was indissoluble, garnered widespread coverage in the press. The impact on the Russians was predictable. As Maisky put it, the Kremlin concluded that the British were seeking to frighten us with Germany, but the Prime Minister's remarks produce an effect in Moscow quite opposed to the one he intends. Discovering that Churchill's warning was little more than surmise merely reinforced his view that the campaign of the British government and the English press was unsubstantiated and evidence that der Wunsch ist der Vater des Gedankens, the wish is father to the thought. At this point, Cripps's intense frustration led him greatly to compound the damage. Anguished by the fact, as he later put it, that not only Stalin, but even Molotov avoided him like grim death, and that Stalin did not want to have anything to do with Churchill, so alarmed was he that the Germans might find out. He made the impetuous and arrogant decision to break the conventional rules of diplomatic engagement. In a long and well-argued message to Molotov, which he sent via Vyshinsky, he warned that a German invasion was now inevitable. 
In this case, he added, Britain would assuredly wish to collaborate with the Soviet Union against the Nazis. He followed up with a number of proposals for Anglo-Soviet cooperation, which he had failed to clear with London, which were so vague as to be without useful content. Even worse, he went on to imply that in the absence of an agreement with the Soviet Union, Britain might in due course feel bound to make peace with Germany. It was, he wrote, not outside the bounds of possibility, if the war were protracted for a long period, that there might be a temptation for Great Britain, and especially for certain circles in Great Britain, to come to some arrangement to end the war. As a servant of the Crown, this was an egregious diplomatic offence. It was also counterproductive. Nothing could have been better calculated to deepen the Kremlin's paranoia about Britain's real intentions. Golikov, who was at the centre of the GRU web in Moscow, collating such evidence, and who knew that his career, if not his life, depended on telling Stalin what he wanted to hear, was adept at nurturing his leader's belief that Britain's principal objective was to provoke a war between Germany and the Soviet Union. As he put it in one of his regular briefings to the Kremlin, any report emanating from British sources was undoubtedly intended to seek the worsening of relations between the USSR and Germany. Stalin was by now more determined than ever to regard the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact as inviolable, and even more likely to repudiate any intelligence from any source, like those that had started to reach him over three months earlier from the likes of Ariets in Berlin, which suggested that he might be deluding himself. Churchill's cryptic warning about Barbarossa was as nothing compared with far less ambiguous evidence from the growing cascade of intelligence now pouring into the Kremlin, all warning of an imminent Nazi invasion. They came from agents in Berlin, from Hitler's satellite capitals in Eastern Europe, and occupied Western Europe, as well as Soviet agents in Britain. But Stalin had so inured himself against the very thought that Hitler might use force to bend Moscow to his will, as to dismiss all evidence to the contrary. By April, these communications were being supplemented by even more persuasive reports from both within and without the borders of the Soviet Union. On the 10th of April, the NKGB, the military intelligence arm of the Soviet Secret Service, reported on a build-up of German forces on the Soviet border. Information from agent sources and statements by border crossers have established that the concentration of units of the German army on the border of the Soviet Union is continuing. At the same time, there is accelerating construction of defensive positions, airfields, strategic branch lines, highways and dirt roads. A detailed report using even stronger terms arrived from Ukraine, where the first secretary of the Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev, was warned by the regional head of the NKGB, agent reporting and debriefing of border crossers establishes that the Germans are intensively preparing for war with the USSR, for which purposes they are concentrating troops on our borders, building roads and fortifications, and bringing munitions. Stalin chose to look in the opposite direction, comforting himself with the fact that on the 13th of April, the same day that Belgrade fell to the Nazis, he had just signed a non-aggression pact with the regime in Tokyo. He was so elated by the thought that despite Japan's membership of the tripartite pact, he would not now have to contemplate a war on two fronts. He went in person to say farewell to the Japanese foreign minister, Yosuke Matsuoka who had come to Moscow to sign the agreement on Tokyo's behalf. Bystanders at Moscow's railway station were astonished to see the two men whose countries had so recently been at war walking arm in arm down the platform, deep in conversation. Embracing Matsuoka, Stalin was overheard to say, We are Asiatics too, and we've got to stick together. So carried away was he by the moment, that he strode about with great bonhomie, shaking hands with railway workers, government officials, and a gaggle of invited diplomats. Noticing Colonel Krebs, the German military attaché, he walked over and threw his arms round him, saying, We're going to remain friends, won't we? 
This did not mean that the Soviet leader had opted in favour of pacifism. On the 4th of May, the Politburo approved a resolution naming Stalin as chairman of the Council of People's Commissars to ensure that local officials should have every conceivable reinforcement in order to support their task of defending the country. The next day, with his supreme authority thus confirmed, he addressed the annual graduation ceremony for military cadets at the Kremlin. In a closed session, he spoke for some forty minutes without a script. Accounts of what he said differ, but that it was of significant moment was not in doubt. He spoke of a Red Army that was far better trained, armed and equipped, more mobile and more powerful than it had been three years earlier, and more than able to defend itself against attack. As the young officers would soon discover, his bullish review bore little relation to reality. Whether his purpose was simply to inspire the graduates or give Hitler pause for thought, his message had little impact on either the Commissar for Defence, Timoshenko, or the head of the General Staff, Zhukov, both of whom were well aware that the Red Army was still ill-prepared to face a full-scale German onslaught. On the same day, Richard Sorge, a Soviet spy based in Tokyo, where his cover was as a correspondent for the German newspaper Frankfurter Zeitung, sent a microfilm transcript of a phone call between Ribbentrop and the German ambassador to Japan. In the course of their conversation, the German foreign minister was recorded as saying, Germany will begin a war against the USSR in the middle of June 1941. Ten days later, on the 15th of May, Sorge was more precise reporting that the date had been fixed for the 20th to the 22nd of June. Stalin's ostrich-like response was to denounce Sorge, who had, it was true, acquired a reputation for avarice and debauchery, as a little shit who set up factories and brothels in Japan. Once again, the Soviet leader chose to look the other way. Knowing that he was risking Stalin's wrath, Beria decided to forward an alarming intelligence report that had been compiled for the Central Committee, the Council of People's Commissars, and the Defence Commissariat. This document detailed a massive build-up, three motorised divisions, six infantry divisions, nine or ten artillery regiments, and seven tank battalions close to the Soviet Union's northern frontier in East Prussia. Stalin ignored it. By now, the Politburo was aware that the NKGB believed that no fewer than 130 German divisions were massing along the long front from the Baltic to the Balkans. With almost daily reports of the German build-up, both from the border itself and from within Nazi-occupied Poland, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria, Timoshenko and Zhukov made a concerted attempt to persuade Stalin that more units should be sent to the front. Still obsessed by the fear that such a response would provide Hitler with a casus belli, Stalin turned them down. Instead, he chose to interpret the German military build-up as sabre-rattling, designed to intimidate him into granting further economic and political concessions than those agreed the previous January. The Soviet leader's refusal to face reality was hardened by his paranoid misinterpretation of one of the most bizarre incidents of the Second World War. On the 10th of May, Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, piloted himself to Scotland and parachuted to the ground on a crazed mission to broker a peace deal with Britain. Far from being Hitler's envoy, he was acting in defiance of his Führer, who was aghast at his mission. The Führer is absolutely shattered, Goebbels noted. He is very bitter. He never expected anything like this. One can be prepared for anything except the aberrations of a lunatic. London was bewildered and responded at once by imposing a news blackout on the media. Churchill was at Ditchley Park in Oxfordshire when he was told about Hess's arrival. His first instinct was to announce, in the words of his draft text, that Hess had flown to Britain in the name of humanity, but Cadogan and Eden protested that this would make it look like a peace offer from Hitler. They argued conversely that we may want to run the line that he had quarrelled with Hitler. According to Cadogan, this suggestion provoked Churchill to fly into a raging temper, 
from which he did not recover until the next morning, when he conceded that they were probably right after all. However, it was only after the rest of the war cabinet made it clear that they too opposed what the ever-scathing Cadogan called Churchill's stupid draft statement, that four days later he finally agreed to drop it. Instead, as Cadogan had advised, the government gave informal briefings to the effect that Hess had indeed fallen out with Hitler over the Soviet Union. Any hope that London might have had that this would soften Stalin's attitude towards Britain was doomed. Nothing would persuade him that the Hess mission was anything less than incontrovertible evidence that Berlin and London were hatching an anti-Russian plot to destroy Soviet communism. Stalin's belief that Hitler's objective was to blackmail rather than bludgeon the Russians into compliance was not confined to his inner circle in the Kremlin. In London, the Joint Intelligence Committee, JIC, overriding Enigma evidence to the contrary, persistently dismissed rumours of an imminent Nazi assault on the Soviet Union. Instead, the security chiefs stressed the overwhelming advantages to Germany of concluding an agreement with the USSR, while judging that the Kremlin would endeavour by every means in her power to avoid a clash by yielding to German demands. Still convinced that Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain, remained Hitler's prime objective and that he would not contemplate launching a war on two fronts, the JIC found a ready audience in the Foreign Office, sharing the widespread assumption, for which there was no evidence, that Berlin and Moscow were engaged in intensive political and economic negotiations. Whitehall managed to convince itself that a German invasion of the Soviet Union was virtually inconceivable. In a reference to these phantom negotiations, Cadogan noted on the 9th of May, I believe that Russia will give way and sign on the dotted line, adding, I wish she wouldn't, as I should love to see Germany expending her strength there, but they're not such fools. In the absence of unequivocal evidence to the contrary, the prevailing view both at the Foreign Office and the War Office continued to be driven by the phantasmagorical belief that the build-up of German forces along the Soviet border was designed to intimidate Moscow into making concessions that, as it happened, following their standoff over the Balkans, Berlin had not in fact demanded. It was not until the middle of June, only days before the date set for the launch of Operation Barbarossa, that the JIC finally accepted that an invasion was imminent. Blindsided by a well-nigh complete absence of information about the Soviet Union, but well served by Enigma code breakers at Bletchley Park, the entire Whitehall machine leapt to another conclusion. As the official historian of British intelligence during the Second World War, Professor F. H. Hinsley, who had himself been at the apex of the ultra operation at Bletchley Park, has magisterially observed. Doubt about Russia's readiness to withstand German pressure was replaced by certainty that she could not long survive a German attack. The cabinet was therefore formally advised by every relevant arm of the civil service that it would take the Germans between three and eight weeks to reach Moscow. Only the prime minister declined to share the almost universal pessimism that now prevailed in London. On the 14th of June, in an increasingly desperate effort to persuade himself as well as the rest of the world that all was well between Moscow and Berlin, Stalin ordered Tass to issue a communique rebutting false and provocative rumours which were being widely circulated in the English press as well as in the foreign press in general to the effect that Germany has begun to concentrate its troops on the borders of the Soviet Union with the objective of an attack on her, and that the Soviet Union, in its turn, has begun to prepare intensively for war with Germany and is concentrating troops on the latter's frontier. It was, the communique stressed, ridiculous to present the Red Army's forthcoming manoeuvres. Stalin had just authorised a cautious redeployment of reservists to positions nearer the western border as being hostile to Germany. Both Germany and the Soviet Union were, 
unswervingly observing the provisions of the Soviet-German non-aggression pact. In Berlin, the Nazi leadership greeted the release of the TASS communique with delight. A torrent of rumours is pouring out of London to the world, all to do with Russia, and in fact fairly accurate. But on the whole, the world continues to believe in bluff or blackmail. We do not react at all. In any event, Moscow seems to be doing nothing to counter any aggression. Marvellous, Goebbels noted. It was clear from the TASS communique that the Kremlin had chosen to swallow Berlin's explanation for the build-up of troops in Poland as forming part of the Wehrmacht's preparations for Operation Sea Lion, which, like the British, the Russians presumed to be Hitler's primary military objective. They had no inkling that the plans for the invasion of Britain had been discarded nine months earlier, or that the Soviet Union had been in Hitler's sights for almost as long. On the same day, the 14th of June, the Führer summoned his senior commanders to the Chancellery. In the course of an hour-long address, he told them, we will have the worst of the fighting behind us after about six weeks, and he reiterated that every soldier must know what it is we are fighting for. It is not the territory we want, but rather that Bolshevism is destroyed. It was a familiar refrain. The troops were engaged in a war of extermination, in which the traditional rules of engagement would have no meaning. As he said to Goebbels later that day, Bolshevism will collapse like a house of cards. We face victories unequalled in human history. Right or wrong, we must win. It is the only way. And victory is right, moral and necessary. And once we have won, who is going to question our methods? In the meantime, Goebbels' task was to continue to invent rumours. Peace with Moscow. Stalin coming to Berlin. An invasion of England is imminent, so as to conceal the real situation. I hope we can keep it up for a while yet. That Berlin was able to maintain one or other of these fictions with less than a week to go before the start of the invasion was a triumph of propaganda and planning. But it would not have been successful without Stalin's purblind refusal, even at this late stage, to accept the truth. He had invested every ounce of his diplomatic and political energy into averting, or at least postponing, a conflict with Germany until the Red Army was in a much stronger position to drive the invaders from Soviet territory. Until the borders were adequately fortified with carefully positioned and well-concealed artillery units. Until heavy concrete tank traps had been embedded across the likeliest lines of attack, as well as wide and deep ditches from which no panzer could escape, until minefields had been laid, until the armour had been overhauled and repaired, until the troops had been adequately trained and armed, and until their commanders had agreed upon not only the most likely invasion routes, but also how best to deploy their divisions accordingly. But as Stalin had also forbidden his generals to take any steps that might be interpreted as provocative, the Soviet Union's defences were in disrepair, and its armies were almost totally unready for what was about to happen. Like Chamberlain before him, Stalin opted to appease the Nazi monster. Unlike Chamberlain, however, he could not bear to contemplate the thought that his strategy had disintegrated. Under a burden of stress that even his thuggishly resilient character could barely sustain, he chose instead to close his mind to reason and to retreat into foul-mouthed tirades against those who persecuted him with the facts. On the 13th of June, Richard Sorge, who had hitherto proved uncannily reliable, warned from Tokyo, possibly in response to Golikov at the GRU, I repeat, nine armies with a strength of 150 divisions will begin an offensive at dawn on the 22nd of June, 1941. Stalin yet again dismissed the warning as he had done a month earlier when the same little shit had sounded an identical alarm. Three days later, on the 16th of June, a source in the German Air Ministry, Starshiner, corporal in Russian, a.k.a. Major Harro Schulze-Boysen, who had been recruited by the NKVD in 1940, 
confirmed Sorge's warning from another perspective. Starshiner frequently provided accurate information about Luftwaffe reconnaissance flights along the border. Now, only six days before the planned invasion, he reported, all preparations by Germany for an armed attack on the Soviet Union have been completed and the blow can be expected at any time. When this message landed on Stalin's desk, he scrawled a furious note on it. Tell the source in the staff of the German Air Force to fuck his mother. This is no source, but a disinformer. The Red Army's two most senior commanders, Timoshenko and Zhukov, were close to despair. Though not privy to the bulk of the foreign intelligence, they already had more than enough evidence from their own sources to confirm Starshiner's warning. On the 13th of June, not for the first time, they had tried without success to alert Stalin to the German manoeuvres on the other side of the border. The next day, though, he peremptorily dismissed their request to mobilise their forces. That means war. Do you understand that or not? He barked at them. When they tried to reason with him by explaining that the Germans were clearly on a war footing, he accused them of being duped by the intelligence, adding dismissively, you can't believe everything in intelligence circles. A couple of days later, he again refused their request to move troops to stronger defensive positions, saying, we have a non-aggression pact with Germany. Germany is up to her ears with the war in the West, and I am certain that Hitler will not risk creating a second front by attacking the Soviet Union. Hitler is not such an idiot and understands that the Soviet Union is not Poland, not France, and not even England. There was nearly a showdown at a meeting with the Politburo on the 18th of June. Timoshenko and Zhukov arrived at the Kremlin laden with detailed maps of the military dispositions on the front line as they sought to make the case for putting the army on full alert. The more compellingly they made the case, the more obdurate and intemperate Stalin became. Accusing them of warmongering, he eventually lost patience altogether, rose to his feet, walked over to where Zhukov was standing among the assembled satraps and started to abuse him. Have you come here to scare us with war? Or do you want a war because you're not sufficiently decorated or your rank isn't high enough? He sneered. The chief of staff abruptly resumed his seat. Timoshenko persisted, insisting that there would be chaos at the front if the Wehrmacht were to attack. His temerity roused Stalin to a paroxysm of malevolence. Gesturing towards the defence commissar, he railed, It's all Timoshenko's work. He ought to have been shot, but I've known him as a good soldier since the Civil War. When Timoshenko persisted, pointing out that Stalin had himself referred to the possibility of war with Germany at the military graduation ceremony on the 5th of May, Stalin looked around the room and, according to the commander-in-chief's own account, said, Timoshenko's a fine man, but apparently a small brain, adding as he raised his thumb to illustrate this, that he'd spoken in those terms on that occasion only to raise their alertness while you have to realise that Germany will never fight Russia on her own. At this, he evidently stalked out of the chamber. A moment later, he reappeared, putting his head round the door, shouting, If you're going to provoke the Germans on the frontier by moving troops there without our permission, then heads will roll, mark my words. He then slammed the door, leaving his audience flummoxed and intimidated. As all of them knew, a threat from Stalin was rarely a casual aside. Zhukov later defended his failure to defy the dictator by issuing the order deploy. While admitting that he had been frightened to do so in case Stalin had handed him over to Beria for punishment, he also insisted that it was not fear alone that held him back. I didn't regard myself as cleverer or more far-sighted than Stalin. I sensed the danger of a German attack the feeling was gnawing at my vitals, but my faith in Stalin and my belief that in the end everything would come out in the way he suggested was stronger. It was a fatal error of judgment. On the 21st of June, a Russian spy, Leopold Trepper, codenamed Otto, who had infiltrated the German command system in Nazi-occupied Paris, reported, 
Wehrmacht Command has completed the transfer of its troops to the Soviet frontier, and tomorrow, 22nd of June, will suddenly attack the Soviet Union. When he read this, Stalin wrote in the margin, This is an English provocation. Find out who the author of this provocation is and punish him. A few hours later, the first shots were fired in what was to become the most devastating conflict in recorded history. Part 2. Invasion Chapter 8. The Blitzkrieg On the midsummer evening of the 21st of June 1941, the Belorussian city of Brest-Litovsk appeared to be at ease with itself. All military exercises had been cancelled for the weekend. Off-duty soldiers strolled with girlfriends and mingled with families enjoying the late evening warmth. Bands played in the well-tended parks, crowded with young people who laughed and danced until darkness fell. It was lovely and pleasant, one of those revellers Georgi Garbuk noted, though he'd also detected a certain tension within the town. As he and his friends left the park, his sense of foreboding was heightened when the electric lights suddenly went out. This had never happened before. We continued on further to Pushkin Street, about half a kilometre, and the lights went out there too. Carbuck went home to bed, little knowing that the phone lines had also been cut. The work of German saboteurs preparing the ground for the cataclysm that was about to befall the city. From his forward observation post on the other side of the river Bug, General Heinz Guderian, the leader of Panzer Group II, as the 19th Army Corps had been renamed, could see that the city's defenders, who were still on duty, had no idea of the gathering storm. We had observation of the courtyard of Brest-Litovsk Citadel, and we could see them drilling by platoons to the music of military bands. The strong points along their bank of the bug were unoccupied. The peace was disturbed only by a German goods train which rattled across the bridge, steaming away from the Russian side on its way to Warsaw and the Third Reich. Even the pre-battle religious service for the men of the 45th Infantry Division waiting at the river's edge for the order to cross into the Soviet Union was conducted so quietly as barely to ruffle the twilight calm. Brest-Litovsk lay at the easternmost point of the bug which flows through the country in a southeasterly direction. Less than a hundred kilometres from the Polish border with Belorussia and Ukraine, it was not only a major river-crossing point, but also an important strategic stronghold. It was for this reason that Guderian had been so aggrieved when forced to hand over the fortress to the Russians after Panzer Group II had seized it from the Poles two years earlier. Now, as the Panzers prepared to remedy that frustration, a war correspondent, Gert Haberdank, embedded with the 45th Infantry Division as they edged their way to the river bank, noted, Silently, absolutely silently, we crept up to the edge of the bug. Sand had been strewn across the roads so that our hobnailed boots made no sound. In Berlin, the German propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels could barely contain his elation as the clock ran down to zero hour. Rumours of the invasion were still just that. The Red Army was not yet on a war footing. He could congratulate himself that in large measure it was due to his brilliance as a custodian of half-truths and lies that the German people and foreign states might speculate, but none of them could be certain. Surprise had been guaranteed. The business of Russia is becoming more dramatic by the hour, he noted. Our enemies are falling apart. The operation is being ushered in with magnificent skill. We shall have a good start. When he went to see Hitler later that evening, he was pleased to discover that the Führer was keen to listen to a selection of fanfares that he had chosen for him. After sifting through them all, Hitler chose a version of the Horst Wessel song, the Nazi Party's triumphalist anthem. As his theme for Barbarossa, he chose a passage from Franz Liszt's Les Préludes. On the face of it, Hitler had just cause for optimism. 
Under his orders, the Wehrmacht had mobilized the greatest invasion force in history. By the early hours of Sunday, the 22nd of June, 1941, some 3.3 million soldiers, equipped with 3,350 tanks, 7,184 pieces of artillery, 600,000 trucks, and 600,000 horses, all supported by 2,500 warplanes, were lined up along a 1,800-kilometer front that stretched from the Baltic to the Balkans. No fewer than 148 troop divisions marshaled into three army groups, North, Centre and South, commanded respectively by Field Marshals von Lieb, von Bock and von Runsted, just as the Soviet agent Ariets had predicted four months earlier. All three commanders were in their sixties, scions of military families reared in the Prussian tradition, graduates of leading military academies, veterans of the First World War, where they served with distinction, senior generals for the invasion of Czechoslovakia and Poland in 1939, and the Low Countries and France in 1940. Whatever their initial qualms may have been, they were at one in their readiness to put themselves fully at the service of Hitler's vision, strategy, and ideological convictions. Under their leadership, a battle-hardened phalanx of field commanders led troops that were well-drilled and highly motivated. They, too, had proved themselves in occupied Europe. Their armoury, panzer tanks, artillery and aircraft were battle-tested. They were poised for action. They had the overwhelming advantage of surprise, and they believed themselves to be invincible. They had also been indoctrinated by Nazi propaganda. With few exceptions, they revered their Führer. His prejudices had become their own. Hitler's struggle for the liquidation of Jewish Bolshevism was not only endorsed by the SS, the SD, and the Wehrmacht High Command, but force fed to the troops, who on the eve of Barbarossa were issued with the Wehrmacht's 14th of May guidelines, reminding them that Bolshevism was the mortal enemy of the National Socialist German people and specifying the ruthless measures that they would have to take to assure its destruction. In the days leading up to the invasion, the crudity of this propaganda intensified. Anyone who's ever looked into the face of a Red Commissar knows what Bolsheviks are, one Wehrmacht publication advised. There is no need here for theoretical reflections. It would be an insult to animals if one were to call the features of these largely Jewish tormentors of people bestial. In the shape of these commissars, we witness the revolt of the subhuman against noble blood. In the lead-up to Operation Barbarossa, as their units were moved piece by piece towards the Soviet border, very few soldiers paused to contemplate the full import of their Führer's search for Lebensraum or the annihilation of Judeo-Bolshevism. Nor did many of them know where they were heading, or the immensity of the undertaking before them. Wilhelm Pruller, who had been conscripted in Austria to serve as a dispatch rider in a tank battalion, discovered that his unit was on the move from its base in central Poland only on the day he returned from leave. I'm not yet sure what's happening, he wrote in his diary but we are to go to the east, and quite certainly Russia later on. But as what? I cannot believe that the Führer would sign a non-aggression pact only to break it two years later. Assuming that their advance was therefore bound to be a defensive move against a Soviet incursion, he wondered if Stalin might have made a deal with England. In which case, of course, it's clear, we've got to crack down. Karl Fuchs a tank sergeant in Army Group Center's Panzer Group 3, was similarly in the dark. Fuchs was an aspiring teacher who was given to writing in semi-mystical terms. In a letter home to his pregnant wife, as his division began its move to the border, he wrote, My dearest sweetheart, important, beautiful and holy things don't simply happen. You have to fight for them. Fight for them with all your might. The struggle for existence whether we are talking about a man or a woman, creates proud, free, honest and upright people. All others 
will remain repulsive creeps, inferior individuals. Fuchs's love for his wife was matched by his devotion to his Führer. He wrote in another letter, My dearest darling, I can understand your pain and sorrow because you have to be so alone now. Yet I can't provide any comfort or any consolation. Indeed, I must ask you to be strong and firm. Look, my dear, your husband stands in the midst of a proud and difficult time. He is a soldier, not a civilian. As a soldier, he has duties to his fatherland. These duties are important and sacred. We are engaged in a struggle that will assure us the well-being of our growing children and our nation. Late on the evening of the 21st, Hitler composed a long and rambling letter to Mussolini, which the Italian dictator received the following morning. Until that moment, the Führer's Axis partner had been given no inkling of what was afoot. Perhaps because he was aware that Mussolini's principal aim was to secure a large slice of Britain's African empire once London had been forced to sue for peace, Hitler refrained from referring to his deepest motives for Barbarossa. He did not mention his craving for the Soviet Union's bountiful supply of raw materials and its huge supplies of oil in the Caucasus. His hunger for the rich food-producing soils of Western Russia and Ukraine and overarching all those territorial ambitions, his compulsive urge to create an Aryan empire for the Third Reich, cleansed of all Bolsheviks, in which the Slavs would either perish or become a servant class, and from which the Jewish bacillus would be eliminated by whatever means might be required. Instead, he elaborated a military strategy designed to secure his fellow dictator's endorsement. Although Mussolini had joined the Axis in 1937, it was not until the 22nd of May 1940 that he signed the Pact of Steel, the military alliance with Germany. By this time, with France about to fall, he was confident that Britain would soon follow suit, and he hoped to share in the carve-up of the world's largest empire that would assuredly follow. His opportunism was overt. I only need a few thousand dead so that I can sit at the peace conference as a man who has fought, he confided to his chief of staff, General Pietro Badoglio. Hitler's rationale for invading the Soviet Union rather than Britain was a fragile structure of convoluted and contradictory suppositions, yet it provided his clearest exposition of the strategic case for a monumentally risky venture. England has lost this war, Hitler wrote but added that he could defeat Britain only by eliminating the Soviet Union. The danger, he explained, was that London might forge an alliance with Moscow. Both adversaries would then be reinforced by abundant supplies of materiel from the United States. In these circumstances, Britain might well survive. It followed that since he had no chance of eliminating America, he had to exclude Russia, which does lie in our power. With Russia out of the equation, he explained, Britain would soon be finished. We can, with our rear secured, apply ourselves with increased strength to the dispatching of our enemy, Britain. At least on paper, Hitler's armies faced a formidable foe on the other side of the line. More than four million men, 170 Red Army divisions, deployed in three overlapping layers to a depth of 400 kilometres from the border. But Stalin's fear of causing a provocation on the border and the resulting General Staff Directive of the 15th to the 18th of June forbidding any concentration of troops in the frontier areas meant that only 56 of these divisions were stationed along the front line. And although the Russians had a numerical superiority in tank numbers of 7 to 1, and of planes up to five to one, these statistics meant little when measured against the war-fighting potential of the two sides on the eve of battle. Although the Soviet leadership did not yet know for sure that Hitler was at the point of unleashing Barbarossa, the mood at the Red Army headquarters was far from sanguine. Reports from the front line were pregnant with alarm. The Germans were removing wire entanglements from their side of the border. German reconnaissance aircraft 
were openly violating Soviet airspace. German tanks could be distinctly heard rumbling along the front. When this was transmitted to the Kremlin, Stalin was nonplussed, irresolutely veering from the insistence at one moment that war could still be avoided to the recognition that it was all but inevitable at the next. Thus, even as he demanded that the Paris-based spy Otto be punished for reporting that the invasion was imminent, he simultaneously contacted the commander of the Moscow military district, General Ivan Tulinev, to ask, how do things stand with the anti-aircraft defence measures? When Tulinev told him that they were not yet ready for action, he ordered, you should bring the troops of Moscow's anti-aircraft defence to 75% of combat readiness. Similarly, he instructed the Moscow party leaders to order all party secretaries to stay at their posts, advising cryptically the Germans might attack. Once again, though, when he was told soon afterwards that a German NCO had crossed the border in the Kiev Special Military District to warn that the Germans would invade in the early hours of the following morning, he dismissed the deserter as an agent provocateur. That evening, Stalin summoned a meeting of the Politburo to discuss the crisis. Both the Defence Commissar Timoshenko and the Chief of Staff Zhukov were in attendance. After some desultory debate, Stalin repeated his wishful thought that the deserter who had come across the line at Kiev was trying to provoke a conflict. For once, his commanders contradicted him openly, saying they thought he was telling the truth. Stalin asked what could be done. There was silence until Timoshenko spoke up, urging that the armed forces on the front line should be put on full alert. Stalin objected, insisting that it was too soon for such a provocative order. On this occasion, Zhukov was not to be fobbed off. He had brought with him a draft order which advised that a surprise attack by the Germans was possible and instructed that the border forces be put on full alert. Again, Stalin hesitated. This time, though, he gave his reluctant approval to a watered-down directive ordering that all units be brought to a state of combat readiness and that all aircraft should be dispersed and camouflaged. But, in order to avoid complications, the directive added that in no circumstances should Red Army soldiers be incited by any provocation. There were other intimations of the approaching conflagration. Staff at the German embassy, along with their wives and children, were reported to have packed their bags to leave the city. This intelligence prompted Molotov to summon the German ambassador, Friedrich Werner Graf von der Schullenberg, to his office to demand an explanation. Schullenberg stonewalled, reminding the foreign minister that both he and his wife were still in the capital. Molotov did not press the point further. At the army club in Minsk, the Belorussian capital, some 750 kilometres southwest of Moscow and 340 kilometres from Brest-Litovsk, the commander-in-chief of the Soviet Western Front Colonel General Dmitry Pavlov was enjoying a relaxed evening with his staff. They had gathered to watch a popular comedy by the famous Soviet playwright Alexandra Konyachuk. In the middle of the performance, they were rudely interrupted by the head of the intelligence department for the Western Military District, Vasily Blochin, who entered their box and whispered in Pavlov's ear. He had just been informed that Red Army reconnaissance had reported seeing German troops readying for action and that they had even shelled some of our positions. It can't be true, Pavlov muttered, before turning to his deputy, General Ivan Boldin, to pass on the message, adding, seems nonsense to me, at which he tapped his number two on the hand as though to indicate that they should continue to watch the play. Before the curtain came down, another German soldier, Alfred Liskow, swam across the bug to the Soviet lines to warn his captors that an artillery barrage was to open up within a few hours and that at first light, rafts, boats and pontoons would be thrown across the river as a bridge for the invading troops to cross over into Soviet-occupied Poland. After a lengthy interrogation by a Russian border patrol, it emerged that the deserter was a Bavarian factory worker who had braved the crossing 
to alert his proletarian brothers to the danger. This counted for nothing. His warning was reported to the Kremlin, allegedly prompting Stalin to order that the hapless informant be shot for disinformation. Stalin was so promiscuous with such orders that it is not clear whether he had thus targeted Liskow or another provocateur. As it happened, events now unfolded at such a speed that it was impossible to carry out the order before Liskow's veracity was proved beyond doubt. By that time, however, Guderian's assault troops had advanced to the very edge of the bug and were waiting for the final order to cross. The Politburo meeting finally broke up as Timoshenko and Zhukov headed back to the Defence Commissariat to oversee the transmission to all military districts of the directive they had cobbled together on Stalin's behalf, and which stressed that the task of our forces is to refrain from any kind of provocative action. The directive was not ready for dispatch until after midnight. Most military headquarters never received the warning, and for those that did, it was far too late to be of any value. At 11 p.m., Stalin and his confidants repaired to the Soviet leader's dining room, where, according to one of them, Anastas Mikoyan, he tried to convince the gathering that Germany did not intend to start a war. I think Hitler's trying to provoke us. He surely hasn't decided to make war. None of the gathering dared challenge this self-delusion. Instead, just after midnight, they clambered into their armoured Zill limousines and left in a motorcade for Stalin's dacha at Kuntsevo. Once there, according to a competing range of reports from the participants, they either watched a film or merely sat drinking and dining until in the early hours of the next morning, the 22nd of June, they went home or back to their desks. Stalin went to bed. In Minsk, when the play came to an end, Pavlov returned to his office to be briefed on the situation at the front. He was unable to sleep. At around one o'clock in the morning, he received a call from Moscow. It was Timoshenko asking for an update. Pavlov passed on what he'd been told, which was very little. A build-up of German motorcycle units and special forces had been seen on the German side of the river, but there was no more than that to report. Pavlov must have sounded anxious, because the defence commissar sought to reassure him. Just try to worry less and don't panic. It cannot have given Pavlov much comfort, however, to hear him add, get the staff together anyway this morning, because something unpleasant may happen perhaps, but don't rise to any provocation. If there is a specific provocation, ring me. With the invasion now only hours away, the Red Army commanders in the military districts nearest to the border were not only unaware of what was about to happen, but also in no condition to respond effectively when it did. They had yet to mobilise their troops. Some were on weekend leave. Others were participating in exercises away from the front. Those who were in place lacked supplies and were often hamstrung by the absence of transport or if they had the vehicles, an acute shortage of fuel. Tank crews were disabled by inadequate training and qualification. Infantrymen, for the most part, had their rifles, but had yet to be issued with ammunition. The defences from which these troops were supposed to arrest an invading army had still not been completed. A scatter of pillboxes and gun emplacements, some of them still unmanned, was all that stood between them and the blitzkrieg that was about to engulf them. A little before 2am on the 22nd of June, yet another German deserter crossed the line. He reported that the invasion would begin within two hours. The news never reached Moscow. German sappers had already cut the telephone wires. Combined with an acute shortage of radio equipment and trained operators, this led to a mass breakdown of communications. Frontline officers lost contact with their men and their headquarters at the very moment that the invading armies were forming up in their starting positions to attack. As they waited for the order, the three German army commands transmitted their unique call signs to signal their full and final readiness for action. It was not until 3am, following an exceptionally imprecise instruction from Timoshenko, 
that Pavlov sent out the code word Grossa, Storm, authorizing frontline commanders to assume full combat readiness. He little knew that he'd issued this order too late for it to reach enough formations in time to have much effect. He did, though, make contact with Brest Litovsk to be told that saboteurs had cut the phone lines and severed the water and electricity supply to the 9,000 men stationed inside the citadel. Half an hour later, Pavlov was on the line to Brest Litovsk again to inform the garrison that a provocative raid by fascist bands onto Soviet territory might soon occur. Yet again, though, he instructed his commanders not to respond to the provocation and that their men should not cross the border in hot pursuit. A similar combination of caution and chaos prevailed along the entire front. Operation Barbarossa began with an artillery barrage that shattered the silence of the dawn sky in a blaze of exploding shells. As the first wave of the 3.3 million strong invasion force began to swarm in highly organised and tightly disciplined units across the border, a mighty aerial armada screamed down out of the clouds to rain high explosives on key targets, demolishing the border defences and destroying bridges, railheads, command posts and power stations. In the days leading up to the invasion, Luftwaffe spotter planes had not only mapped every square kilometre of the terrain along the 3,000-kilometre border, tracks, the roads, the bridges, but had pinpointed the location of every airfield. With meticulous care, they had identified the locations of the Soviet Union's warplanes, stacked in neat rows, out in the open, and easily visible from the air, as though offered up for target practice for the Stuka dive bombers. As the Luftwaffe struck, bemused Red Army commanders were left muttering to one another, Eto Nachalo. This is the beginning. In Berlin, Goebbels was awake. Now the guns will be thundering. May God bless our weapons. Outside on the Wilhelmplatz, it is quiet and deserted. Berlin and the entire Reich are asleep. I pace up and down in my room. One can hear the breath of history. A glorious and wonderful hour has struck when a new empire is born. Thus inspired, he went into the propaganda ministry studio where he was to read out a proclamation to the German people in Hitler's name, which the Führer had drafted a few hours earlier. In the pseudo-spiritual terms favoured by the Nazis, he was to declare that the reawakening of our people from despair, misery and an abusive disregard is the sign of a pure inner rebirth. For the benefit of a nation which might otherwise have been shocked at waking to such news, Hitler's explanation was as convoluted as it was meretricious. He had been obliged to jettison the 1939 pact with the Soviet Union in response to British attempts to strangle the Third Reich through encirclement and to counter the threat now posed by the Soviet divisions massing along the German frontier. The moment had arrived to counter this conspiracy of the Jewish Anglo-Saxon warmongers and the equally Jewish rulers of the Bolshevik headquarters in Moscow. About half an hour earlier, the Soviet ambassador to the Reich, Vladimir Dekonozov, who had been trying with increasing urgency to see Ribbentrop, only for his office to be told repeatedly that he was unavailable, was woken by his staff. An unnamed official had rung, saying, Herr Reichsminister von Ribbentrop wishes to see representatives of the Soviet government at the foreign office. When told that the ambassador was asleep, and it would take time to arrange a car, the official said, The Reichsminister's motor car is already waiting outside your embassy. The minister wishes to see Soviet representatives immediately. Dekonozov, a dwarfish figure, beak-nosed and bald, save for a few strands of oily black hair plastered across his shiny pate, was unprepossessing at the best of times. Nonetheless, he was a senior NKVD official and justly feared as one of Beria's most vicious interrogators. In defiance of diplomatic protocol, 
he had installed a secret chamber in the Soviet embassy where members of the Soviet community in Berlin, suspected of disloyalty, could be tested, tortured, and if found wanting, executed. He was as unswervingly obdurate as Stalin in his belief that Hitler would not breach his commitment to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Even when he was shown the proofs of a Russian phrasebook for the troops, delivered secretly to the Soviet consulate by a German communist, that contained the Russian words for surrender, hands up, and I'll shoot, he had failed to pass on the warning to Moscow. Now, in the early hours of the 22nd of June, Ribbentrop was about to shatter Dekonozov's faith by informing him that the agreement between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, which he had himself so proudly and carefully crafted, was unilaterally to be abrogated. The German foreign minister was ill at ease. According to the first secretary, Valentin Bereskov, who accompanied Dekonozov, his face was scarlet and bloated, his eyes were glassy and inflamed, as though he had been drinking. When the two men sat down, Ribbentrop interrupted the ambassador's opening words to say, the Soviet government's hostile attitude to Germany and the serious threat represented by Soviet troop concentrations on Germany's eastern frontier have compelled the Reich to take military countermeasures. It was clear to Dekanozov that under the guise of taking defensive measures, the invasion was already underway. Ribbentrop rose to leave. Dekanozov was speechless, but finally he too stood. Looking up at the vast bulk of the foreign minister, he found the torturer's presence of mind to retort, You'll regret this insulting, provocative, and thoroughly predatory attack on the Soviet Union. You'll pay dearly for it. He did not offer to shake hands, but made to return to the embassy, just as Ribbentrop, recovering his notoriously oleaginous poise, hurried up to him to say, Tell Moscow I was against the attack. A crescendo of reports now cascaded into the Russian capital from across the front line that even the Kremlin could not ignore. The Soviet Union was under all-out attack from the Baltic to the Balkans. At the Defence Commissariat, there was alarm and pandemonium. The news could hardly have been worse. Field Marshal Lieb's Army Group North, battle-hardened veterans of the Wehrmacht's victories in Western Europe, was scything a path towards Leningrad, which Hitler had vowed to raise to the ground. At the other end of the front, Field Marshal Rundstedt's Army Group South was launching a two-pronged attack from Poland and Romania deep into Ukraine towards Kiev, and Field Marshal Box Army Group Center was locked in a ferocious battle at Brest-Litovsk, en route for Moscow. As Timoshenko tried to digest the enormity of what he was hearing, he took a phone call from Boldin, who only a few hours earlier had been relaxing beside Pavlov at the theatre in Minsk. Boldin informed him that reports reaching Western Front headquarters indicated that at least eight cities, up to a depth of 80 kilometres from the border, were being attacked by Luftwaffe bombers that fighters were strafing both troops and civilians, and that German units had crossed the frontier in many sectors. He urged an immediate military response. Timoshenko would still not hear of such a move, insisting, no actions are to be started against the Germans without our consent. Goaded beyond endurance, Boldin shouted down the line, but our troops are retreating, towns are in flames, people are dying. When Timoshenko still failed to react, Boldin insisted, Comrade Marshal, we must act. Every moment is precious. This is no provocation. The Germans have started a war. The defence commissar merely repeated his previous instruction. But such reports could not be ignored for much longer. With great reluctance, Timoshenko decided that Stalin, who was still asleep at Kuntsevo, had to be woken to hear the news. Reluctant to make the call himself, he instructed his deputy, Marshal Semyon Budioni, to ring Stalin's dacha on his behalf and, as though to cover himself, told Zukov to do likewise. The chief of staff got through first, but the duty officer at Kuntsevo didn't want to disturb Stalin's sleep. Wake him immediately. The Germans are bombing our cities, Zukov ordered. Three minutes later, Stalin was on the phone. He listened to the chief of staff but said nothing. 
After a long pause, Zukov asked, Did you understand what I said? There was another silence. Then, by now clearly full awake, Stalin gave instructions that the Politburo should gather in the Kremlin immediately. Stalin hurried back to Moscow. Soon after 4 a.m., looking haggard and bewildered, he was joined in his office by, among others, Molotov, Beria, Timoshenko, Lev Meklis, Stalin's military enforcer, as head of the army's political department, and Zhukov. Still unwilling to face the facts, he once again tried to persuade himself that the attack was not Hitler's doing. Could this be a provocation by the German generals, he asked, prompting a sardonic Zhukov to recall, relying on his own wisdom, he had outwitted himself. Soon after 5 a.m., the German ambassador Schulenberg, who had been so coy with Molotov a few hours earlier, rushed to the Kremlin, seeking an urgent meeting with the Soviet foreign minister. He was hurried into Molotov's office, where he read out virtually the same message that Ribbentrop had handed to Dekonozov. Molotov could scarcely believe what he had heard. He was silent for a moment, and then stammered, Is this supposed to be a declaration of war? Schulenberg did not speak, but shrugged his shoulders as if to say that it was not his doing and that he deplored Hitler's act of aggression, which was true. Molotov suddenly found his voice and shouted angrily, The message I have just been given couldn't mean anything but a declaration of war. It is a breach of confidence unprecedented in history. Surely we haven't deserved that. At that, Schulenberg shook hands and left the Kremlin for the last time to join the exodus of German citizens from what was now an enemy capital. It was not until 7.15am on the 22nd of June that Stalin finally permitted Zhukov to issue Directive No. 2, which stated, 1. Our troops are to attack the enemy forces with all the strength and means at their disposal, and to annihilate them wherever they have violated the Soviet border. Two. Our reconnaissance and combat aircraft shall ascertain where enemy aircraft and land forces are concentrated. By striking mighty blows, our aircraft are to smash the main enemy troop concentrations and their aircraft on its airfields. Stalin had at last acknowledged the facts, but in the process had demonstrated the gulf of ignorance that separated the Soviet high command from the disaster that was already unfolding on the battlefield. Chapter 9. Hatreds and Horrors At 3.15am on the 22nd of June 1941, the Soviet border guards protecting one of the bridges spanning the bug 15 kilometres south of Brest-Litovsk were startled by shouts from their German counterparts on the other side of the river, asking them to come out to discuss important business. As soon as the Russians came into view, they were gunned down. The bridge was secured without delay and Guderian's panzers were soon across it, facing almost no resistance as they scorched deep into Soviet territory. At Brest-Litovsk itself, German sappers had crept up under cover of darkness to remove the primitive explosives attached to the railway bridge by the Soviets. Wave upon wave of infantrymen crossed over to lay siege to the fortress, where thousands of soldiers were soon cowering under an unremitting barrage of artillery fire. This all-embracing barrage literally shook the earth. Great fountains of thick, black smoke sprang up like mushrooms from the ground. We thought that everything in the citadel must already have been razed to the ground, the 45th Infantry Division's chaplain, Rudolf Geschepf, recalled. A number of servicemen had their wives and children living with them in the fortress, which was equipped with schools, shops and hospitals. The wife of one Russian officer recalled, Early in the morning, I was woken up with my children by a terrible noise. Bombs and shells were exploding. I ran barefoot into the street with my children. What a dreadful scene outside. The sky above the fortress was full of aircraft dropping bombs on us. Totally distracted women and children were rushing about looking for a place to hide from the fire. Before me lay the wife of a lieutenant with her young son. Both had been killed. Although most of the troops stationed at the fortress had taken advantage of the license given them to leave for a midsummer weekend break, 
3,500 of their comrades remained behind on duty. Now, besieged by the enemy, they and their families were effectively incarcerated. They began to run out of food and water. German sappers had cut off their electricity and severed the telephone lines to Minsk. The German high command might have expected them to surrender. However, they resisted with a ferocity and enterprise that took their attackers by surprise, an early harbinger of how resilient the Russian soldiers would prove in defence of the motherland. The wider city was engulfed by flames. Dead and wounded lay on the streets. Buildings were on fire. The main hospital's operating theatre was incinerated. The sky was red with flames that roared menacingly above the debris. The noise, the smoke and the dust provided a lurid backdrop for Guderian's infantry, who advanced like a great avalanche with no start or finish, their sleeves rolled up, hand grenades stuck in belts and machine pistols hanging from their necks or rifles at the ready. Fifty kilometres to the east in Kobrin, Colonel I.T. Starinov, a mining specialist, was on his way to Brest from Pavlov's headquarters at Minsk. He was awoken by a loudspeaker which blared, Everyone is to leave the building immediately. Pausing only to put on their uniforms and boots, the men rushed into the street, just in time to see a bomber squadron diving towards them. Starinov flung himself into a ditch. Amidst an eardrum-shattering cacophony, bombs started to land around them. When the columns of smoke cleared, Starinov saw that part of a building close by was in smithereens. In the silence, he heard a sound. A high-pitched, hysterical female voice was crying out a desperate, inconsolable, Ah! He and a fellow officer decided to press on for Brest. Hitching a lift in a staff car, they passed a long line of women fleeing the epicentre of the bombardment, carrying hastily dressed, sleeping children, bundles and baskets. In Cobrin's main square, another loudspeaker imperiously boomed out the early morning news from Moscow. Everyone paused expectantly, wondering what the radio announcer would say. The bulletin informed them of many things, notably that the Soviet harvest was ripening well and that a factory had fulfilled its production quota ahead of schedule. Starinov listened intently, expecting a special announcement, but to his astonishment and dismay, there was no mention of any invasion or any bombing raid. Instead, the weather forecast that concluded the bulletin was followed by a chirpy fitness instructor with his daily calisthenics lesson. To the cheery accompaniment of stretch your arms out, bend, livelier, up, down, up, down, Starinov watched as several trucks, laden with weeping women and children, rumbled through the square, heading to what might or might not prove a place of safety. The colonel and his colleague decided to return to Minsk for further instructions. On the way, they passed a military airfield near the town of Pinsk. It had been severely damaged. It was painful to see the smashed and burning planes, yet we still stubbornly believed that it was only here that the enemy had caught our troops unawares and that elsewhere Soviet aeroplanes were bombing the enemy. In fact, not only around Brest, but along the entire front, the Luftwaffe had the freedom of the skies from which to inflict torment with impunity. Scores of Soviet airfields were littered with the smouldering metal carcasses of warplanes, which, far from confronting the enemy as instructed by Stalin, had been wrecked in the early hours of the 22nd of June before their pilots had even got out of bed. By midday, with more than a thousand aircraft put out of action, the Soviet Air Force had effectively been eliminated as a serious fighting arm. By nightfall, a total of 1,800 aircraft had been lost. Those Soviet pilots who did manage to scramble into the air were generally outflown, outsmarted and outgunned. They proved incapable of striking any significant blow against the invaders, let alone the mighty blows demanded by Moscow that morning. The Luftwaffe pilots could scarcely hide their delight at this bonanza. Hans Ulrich Rudel, a Stuka pilot who was to become a war hero for his daring do exploits, described the ease with which the dive bombers picked off their targets. 
whether they were tanks, motor vehicles, bridges, fieldworks and AA sites, the enemy's railway communications or armoured cars. A fighter pilot, Pilot Officer Heinz Knocker, rejoiced at the scene below. Vehicles have been stripped of their camouflage and overturned by the blast. The Ivans at last come to life. The scene below is like an overturned ant heap as they scurry about in confusion. Stepsons of Stalin, in their underwear, flee for cover in the woods. After returning to his base to refuel, Knocker was soon on the offensive again, relishing the impact of strafing a fleeing enemy. Thousands of Ivans are in full retreat, which becomes an utter rout when we open up on them, stumbling and bleeding as they flee from the highway in an attempt to take cover in the nearby woods. If it was exhilarating, it was also dangerous. The pilots took risks that even the most foolhardy of their number would not have attempted if there had been Soviet warplanes to confront them. On one occasion, Rudel thought to rescue the crew of a plane forced down after being hit by Soviet anti-aircraft fire as it strafed a column of Russian troops. Accordingly, he lowered his flaps and went into land. Wang! A burst of machine gun fire hits my engine. There seems no sense in landing with a crippled aircraft. If I do, we shall not be able to take off again. My comrades are done for. Their waving hands are the last I see of them. The engine conks like mad but picks up and is running just sufficiently to allow me to pull out on the other side of the copse. The oil has plastered the window of my cockpit, and I expect a piston seizure at any moment. If that happens, my engine will stop for good. The plane and Rudel survived to return to base. The German pilots were highly trained and motivated. Flying 18 hours at a stretch, they paused only for the 20 minutes it took to land, refuel, and take off again. Rudel noted, every spare minute we stretch out underneath an aeroplane and instantly fall asleep. Then if a call comes from anywhere we hop to it without even knowing where it's from, we move as though in our dreams. Like many of their fellow pilots, most of whom were in their early twenties, Rudel and Nocker had been infected by Nazism. Nocker did not attempt to conceal his loathing for the enemy. We've dreamed for a long time of doing something like this on the Bolshevists. Our feeling is not one of hatred so much as utter contempt. It is a genuine satisfaction for us to be able to trample the Bolshevists in the mud where they belong. The citizens of Moscow, the Wehrmacht's ultimate destination, had as little inkling of what was about to befall the motherland as their counterparts in Brest-Litovsk, 1,000 kilometers to the west. After several days of rain, the weekend weather was fine, the temperature balmy. Those who had not left the city for their dachas relaxed after the shortest night of the year. Some tended their allotments or fished for their suppers on the banks of the Moskva. Others strolled in Gorky Park, relishing the start of a summer break. Potential delights abounded. In one of the capital's many theatres, Chekhov's The Three Sisters was playing to full houses. Opera lovers could choose between two Verdi tragedies, Rigoletto and La Traviata. Those who preferred the cinema could see, among other offerings, the popular If War Should Come Tomorrow, which reassured them that if the Germans were to attack, the Red Army would carry the fighting into the aggressor's homeland within days, the German workers would rise to greet them, and victory would come with a minimum expenditure of blood. On the morning of the 22nd of June, Muscovites were instructed by a state radio announcement to interrupt their weekend at midday for an important broadcast. Such alerts were not uncommon, but generally not to be missed. At the appointed time, small crowds duly huddled around the loudspeakers that, with disconcerting authority, bedecked every public place. If they had expected to hear the voice of their leader, they were disappointed. Instead, it was Molotov's monotone that echoed across the expectant city as he informed them tremulously that Germany had launched an invasion against the Soviet Union. This unheard-of attack on our country is an unparalleled act of perfidy, he intoned querulously, made despite the fact there was a non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Germany. Concealing the enormity of the disaster and minimising the loss of Soviet lives, allowing only that more than 200 soldiers had died, 
he sought to rouse the nation. They were about to embark on a patriotic war for our beloved country, for honour, for liberty. The government calls on you, men and women, citizens of the Soviet Union, to rally even more closely around the glorious Bolshevik party. He concluded with a passage that was apparently crafted by Stalin. Our cause is just. The enemy will be beaten. Victory will be ours. Quite why Stalin had eschewed the chance to address the nation himself was unclear, though it is possible that he was using his foreign minister, who had signed the pact with Germany, as a shield to protect himself from any opprobrium that he might otherwise have incurred. Although he was clearly grateful to Molotov, telling him that the speech went well, he could not resist jibing. You sounded a bit flustered. The news stunned the Soviet Union. People were in tears, speechless, confused, incredulous, angry and fearful. Reflecting the insecurity of a totalitarian state, the NKVD was on full alert, monitoring the mood closely through its unrivaled network of informers to find answers to critical questions. Would the nation fall in line and fulfil its patriotic duties? Or would dissidents, subversives, saboteurs and foreign agents sow seeds of disquiet and resentment against the Kremlin for its failure to predict the invasion or to protect the borders of the Soviet Union? Would fascist propaganda seep through the carapace of newspeak with which the state bombarded its citizens? The secret state went into overdrive, tapping phones, eavesdropping on gossip and intercepting personal correspondence. Some of the findings were disconcerting, but as the regime needed the truth, the NKVD did not dissemble. Its reports revealed widespread criticism and even contempt for the government that was often expressed with surprising and surprisingly incautious freedom, force and perspicacity. In his lacklustre attempt to rally the public to the Soviet cause, Molotov had inadvertently exposed a raw nerve. A doctor noted bleakly that the prisons were full, the peasants were ill-disposed, and half the population was opposed to the government. One woman was relieved that the war had started because life in the USSR had become unbearable. Everyone was sick of famine and forced labour. The sooner it was over, the better. An employee of Intourist, the state travel agency, who had once believed that the civil war was a struggle for freedom, now thought that there was nothing for them to die for. A government official named Danilov, supposing that the Germans were already in control of Kiev and other cities, expressed his delight at the prospect of a Nazi victory. Now at last we can breathe freely. Hitler will be in Moscow in three days and the intelligentsia will be able to live properly. And there was much more in a similar vein. The regime was swift to crush any threat of open dissent. More than a thousand people who had been fingered under the categories of terrorism, sabotage, wrecking, German, Italian and Japanese espionage, other forms of espionage, bacteriological sabotage, Trotskyism, former members of anti-Soviet political parties, sectarians and conscientious objectors, various anti-Soviet elements, were rounded up and imprisoned. They were not the first, and they would not be the last. Mercifully for the Kremlin, such enemies of the state were not in the ascendant. As the news began to sink in, a combination of genuine patriotism and government propaganda created a surge of anger at the perfidy of the Nazis. Volunteers from across the Soviet Union came forward to offer themselves to the cause. We will put up with any hardships to help our Red Army ensure that the Soviet people utterly destroys the fascists, one promised. Another, expressing himself in the leaden terms of a party apparatchik, nonetheless clearly spoke from the heart when he said, Hitler has violated the sacred borders of the first socialist country in the world. We will win because there is no power in the world that can vanquish a people who have risen up in patriotic war. Somewhat more ambivalently, Viktor Kravchenko, listening to Molotov's broadcast with colleagues at the Commissariat for Foreign Trade, mused subversively that under the terms of the trade deal between Moscow and Berlin, he and his colleagues had been responsible for overseeing the dispatch of 
sorely needed food, metals, oil, and munitions to facilitate Hitler's invasion. The thought was unpalatable. When they twiddled the knobs on the office radio for other news, they heard a voice booming out of the ether in flawless Russian. Citizens of Russia, Russian people, listen, listen. This is the headquarters of the German army. For 24 years you've been living in hunger and fear. You were promised life and got slavery. You were promised bread and got famine. You are slaves without any human rights. Thousands of you die every day in concentration camps and in the frozen wastes of Siberia. Death to the parasites of the Russian people. Overthrow your tyrants. They switched off the radio in disgust. Next day, lest a more gullible public be contaminated, the authorities ordered all private radios to be handed over to the police. Despite their misgivings, the great majority of Russian citizens rallied to the flag. While Molotov's broadcast was still echoing across the Soviet Union, Nikolai Amozov, a military surgeon based in the city of Cheropovitz, was ordered to join a team of doctors at a local school, school number two. Their task was to assess the fitness of prospective recruits and reservists who had already responded to the call-up. Those judged too weak or too old to bear arms were swiftly dismissed. The rest were subjected to a cursory medical examination. The commander of the local call-up commission told them, Please judge responsibly and strictly. You don't need, as is your normal custom, to send them for consultations or investigations. There is no time for that. We have two days to mobilise our contingents. Amozov inspected the young men as they stood awaiting examination, and he was touched by their appearance. Here they are in front of me, defenders of the motherland, aged between twenty and thirty-five. They are collective farmers from nearby villages, workers from our industries, sawmill, the port, timber farm, employees from offices, shoemakers and tailors. They are not at all well-dressed, but they take care of their appearance and their shirts are clean. Most of them are thin. They don't talk much. They undressed by the entrance of the classroom. They cover up their private parts when approaching the doctor. A naked person is defenceless. As the evening wore on, the throng of recruits waiting in the corridor outside the classroom became boisterous. The cause was apparent. Before long, a good many of the men were so drunk on vodka that they had to be sent to another room to sleep off the effects. Those who passed inspection were formed into platoons and lined up in the courtyard outside, where wives, sweethearts and children, ignoring the shouts of a corporal trying to impose order, pushed and shoved their way into the ranks to embrace their departing loved ones. As the new recruits marched away from the school towards the railway station or a local barracks, Amozov noted, Men are holding the hands of children, women hang on to their shoulders, there is noise, exclamations and sobbing. Later, the women will come back home, alone, lost. In Minsk, Colonel General Pavlov was psychologically paralysed by the scale of the emergency. Reports from the front suggested that his Western Front was under assault from 30 infantry divisions, five tank divisions and two motorised divisions, supported by 40 artillery and five aviation regiments. For weeks, at the Kremlin's behest, he had refused to contemplate any measures to increase the readiness of the combat troops under his command. Now he was at a loss. His troops were scattering before the onslaught and almost everywhere on the retreat. His deputy, Boldin, a far more decisive and clear-minded figure, pressed for permission to fly to the city of Bialystok, 120 kilometres north of Brest-Litovsk, to find out what was happening for himself. Somewhat reluctantly, Pavlov and Timoshenko approved his request. Accompanied by his ADC, Boldin left Minsk at around 3 p.m. As they flew closer to the epicentre of the battle, he looked down to see fires raging at a railway station, trains burning and warehouses on fire. Ahead, the horizon was ablaze. Enemy bombers were continuously streaking through the sky. Our pilot flew the plane at the lowest possible altitude. Skirting the populated areas, we neared Bialystok. The further we went, the worse it became. There were more and more enemy planes in the air. It was impossible to continue the flight. Up ahead, there was a small airfield with planes burning beside a metal hangar. 
Bolden ordered the pilot to land there. As they began their descent, a Messerschmitt fighter plane detected them. Roaring up from behind, it unleashed several machine gun rounds, but was forced to bear away before it scored a hit. Within minutes of landing, they heard the roar and shriek of nine aircraft, almost certainly Junkers U-87s, the Stukas, as they dived towards them. They just made it to cover before the earth shook with the impact of the bombardment. When they looked out from their shelter, they saw that several aircraft on the ground, including Bolden's, had been engulfed in flames. They were 35 kilometres from Bialystok. Bolden commandeered an army truck, picked up a stray group of soldiers who were slogging their way towards the front, and headed on. He came upon a gaggle of workers standing disconsolately by the roadside. Who are you? he asked. An elderly man replied, We had been working on fortifications, but the place where we worked is now a sea of flames. They had no idea what to do or where to go. A little further on, Bolden halted a column of cars heading towards them. An aspidistra was protruding from the window of one of the vehicles, a luxury Zill 101, to which only senior officers could aspire. Inside, there were two women and two children. Bolden reproached them. Surely at a time like this, you might have more important things to transport than your aspidistra. You might have taken some old people or children. The women and their driver looked away in embarrassment. As they spoke, a German fighter swooped overhead, strafing this sitting target. Three volleys hit Bolden's truck, killing the driver and everyone in it, apart from Bolden himself, his ADC, and a dispatch rider who had leapt out just in time. Nearby stood the remains of the Zill. Everyone inside was dead, noted Bolden. Only the evergreen leaves of the Aspidistra were still sticking out of the window. As they entered Bialystok, they found a city in chaos. Fuel depots and grain warehouses were ablaze. A railway station had been bombed, killing many women and children waiting there to escape the city. Fleeing civilians streamed down the road towards them. Navigating their way through this anarchic muddle of humanity, they reached the 10th Army's regional headquarters. It was deserted. They were directed to a field command post, which they found at the edge of a small wood 12 kilometres southwest of the city. It was minimally appointed, two tents, each with a wooden table, some stools, and one telephone. A truck with radio equipment was parked nearby. It had broken down. Dusk was starting to fall. Bolden was met by Major General K.D. Golubev and a group of staff officers, who confirmed his forebodings. Heavy losses of men and equipment, tanks wrecked or inoperable, aircraft and artillery destroyed, ammunition and fuel almost exhausted. Golubev bent over a map and sighed. We have remarkable people, strong-willed, dedicated, and with great fortitude. The situation is grave, very grave. This distressing sit-rep was interrupted by the general's communications officer. The link to Minsk had been re-established. Pavlov was on the line. The commander-in-chief listened to Bolden's report before giving him what were clearly preordained and detailed instructions that took no account of what he'd just been told. Bolden was to reorganise the front forthwith and, with what was left of two mechanised corps and one cavalry corps, to mount a major counter-offensive. He was to drive the invaders back and to prevent any further attempt by any enemy unit to break through the line. Pavlov continued, this is your immediate assignment and you are personally responsible for carrying it out. The operation was to begin that night. It was a preposterous order. Bolden tried to explain that in the present grave circumstances it would be quite impossible to carry out Pavlov's instructions. His commander-in-chief paused before saying with an air of finality, that's all I have to say, get started on the assignment. Pavlov had begun to inhabit a fantasy world, where fear of Stalin and wishful thinking had replaced all military logic in favour of a stream of absurd commands. But to avoid facing a court-martial and the firing squad, Bolden had no option but to comply. It was the start of a nightmarish 45 days, from which, against all odds, he emerged to become a national hero. Pavlov was to fare less well. At 9.15 that night, 
Timoshenko issued Stalin's Directive No. 3, which was as ludicrous as that which had just been issued to Boldin, but on a far greater scale. The Red Army was to launch a simultaneous counter-offensive across the entire 1,800-kilometre front against all three German army groups. The apparent objective was to hurl the invader back in one great counter-blow, much as a world champion wrestler might throw off a novice fighter who had temporarily pinned him to the ground. The recipients of Directive No. 3 were well aware that with their forces in disarray, on the retreat, or facing encirclement, this feat was beyond them. But Red Army commanders, like Boldin, had little choice but to obey Stalin's orders unquestioningly. At ten o'clock that night, as though to proclaim that it had lost touch with reality, the Soviet general staff released its first operational summary of the campaign. Regular troops of the German army during the course of the 22nd of June conducted operations against frontier defence units of the USSR, attaining insignificant success in a number of sectors. During the second half of the day, with the arrival of forward elements of the field forces of the Red Army, the attacks of the German troops along most of the length of our frontiers were beaten off and losses inflicted on the enemy. Even by Soviet standards, this was a breathtaking catalogue of delusionary falsehoods that concealed the catastrophe that was already engulfing Stalin's armies. The young men who had volunteered for the front did not yet realise quite how severely their patriotism was to be put to the test. Their papers told them that they had just joined the Red Army. They might have expected a welcome. Instead, they found confusion. In the absence of barracks or transport or unit commanders, they found themselves tramping the streets or dossing in classrooms. In Moscow, some slept on station platforms, waiting for trains that might in due course take them to the front. They mingled there with reservists who knew the realities of military service and advised them accordingly. It was a sobering experience. These old hands were unmoved by radio propaganda or exhortations from party commissars. Some of their comrades had been unable to face the prospect of a return to the battlefield. Police reports spoke of self-mutilation and even suicide among their number. However, most were doggedly fatalistic. Like the raw recruits they'd started to educate, they lingered obediently, an army in waiting without direction, support or inspiration. In this military limbo land, the streets of the capital were thronged with groups of men, several hundred at a time, just sitting, waiting, talking, drinking and reflecting on their fate. Any illusions that these young men may still have harboured were soon to be dispelled violently and terrifyingly. Chapter 10. Watching On Churchill was asleep at Chequers when the news of the German invasion reached Britain in the early hours of the 22nd of June, 1941. The Prime Minister had endured a particularly gruelling few weeks of military setbacks, during which even his extraordinary resilience had been put severely to the test. Following the debacle in Greece and the loss of Crete, he had sought to restore British fortunes in the Middle East, where Rommel had seized the initiative in the Desert War. Overriding an unusually assertive chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Dill, he instructed Wavell to launch a counterattack to drive the Desert Fox back from the Egyptian border, insisting that he should persist until you have beaten the life out of General Rommel's army. Churchill's impetuosity was Wavell's undoing. Much against his will, the Middle East Commander-in-Chief launched Operation Battle Axe on the 15th of June. His objective was to lift the siege of Tobruk and once again to drive the Axis forces back across the desert to Tripoli. The operation was a dismal failure. The British suffered severe losses on the first day. By the second day, the Army of the Nile was under intense pressure. On the third day, it crumbled. Rommel was stronger than ever. Churchill had set such store by battle-axe that he retreated to Chartwell, his country home in Kent, as he wished to wait alone to hear the first report of its outcome. Yet another British defeat in a battle in which he had invested so much authority was, he wrote, a most bitter blow. 
I wandered about the valley disconsolately for some hours. Had he been aware of Hitler's draft order number 32, written a week earlier, which called for the destruction of the British position in the Middle East and the Gulf by converging attacks from Libya through Egypt, from Bulgaria through Turkey, and possibly from Transcaucasia through Iran, which would have confirmed the chief of the Imperial General Staff's worst fears about Hitler's objectives, he might have been even more disconsolate. As it was, he returned to London and peremptorily sacked Wavell, with whom he had frequently been at odds, reflecting harshly that we had ridden the willing horse to a standstill. With Wavell removed, the PM swiftly bounced back. His guests at Chequers on the following weekend included Eden, Cripps, and the US Ambassador John G. Winnant. During dinner on the evening of Saturday the 21st of June, the Prime Minister, as usual, held court. With characteristic self-assurance, he not only declared that the Germans would inevitably attack Russia, but, equally inevitably, that the Russians would be defeated. In so saying, he did no more than reflect what was now the collective view of the government's most senior advisers, among whom General Dill said dismissively that the Germans would go through them like a hot knife through butter. Even Cripps, who had flown back from Moscow to brief the government a few days earlier, did not dissent, advising the war cabinet that the Red Army would not hold out for more than three or four weeks. Calculating that the Nazis would probably reach Moscow within six weeks, the Joint Intelligence Committee advised that very soon after that, Hitler would be ready to launch an invasion of Britain. Eden went to bed that night, reflecting that even if such fears were realised, the Russians would at least inflict enough damage on the Wehrmacht to ease some of the strain upon us. Before heading to bed, the Prime Minister took his customary nocturnal stroll around the garden. His private secretary, John Jock Colville, accompanied him. As they mused on the prospect of a German invasion, Colville suggested that for an arch-anti-communist like Churchill to support the Soviet Union against the Nazis would be tantamount to bowing down to the House of Rimmon by surrendering his principles on the grounds of expediency. Churchill replied that he had only one purpose, the destruction of Hitler. If Hitler invaded hell, he would at least make a favourable reference to the devil. In the early hours of the 22nd of June, Colville was woken by a phone call with the news that Germany had indeed just launched an attack on Russia. He padded around to wake Churchill, who greeted the information with a smile of satisfaction. It was the first good news for a long time. Soon afterwards, Eden was woken by the Prime Minister's valet bearing a silver salver with a large cigar and a message, the Prime Minister's compliments and the German armies have invaded Russia. The Foreign Secretary put on his dressing gown and sans cigar joined the Prime Minister in his bedroom to discuss their next move. Churchill said he would address the nation later that day and would tell the people that the Russians were now partners in the struggle against Hitler. Before Churchill's broadcast, Moscow still harboured the suspicion that Britain, even at this late date, might side with Germany. According to the former foreign minister Litvinov, who despite being a non-person, remained remarkably well informed, this suspicion ran so deep that, when certain that the German invasion was in earnest, the Kremlin leapt to the conclusion that the British fleet was steaming up the North Sea for a joint attack with Hitler on Leningrad and Kronstadt. In London, an anxious Maisky contacted the Foreign Secretary for reassurance that our war effort would not slacken, comfort that Eden was happy to provide. Nonetheless, it was with bated breath that the Soviet ambassador tuned in for the broadcast that evening. Churchill laboured at his address for most of the day, completing the final draft only 20 minutes before it was due for live transmission by the BBC at 9pm. To avoid any attempt by either Eden or Cadogan to tone down his words, he refrained from showing it to either of them. The result was vintage Churchill. It was orotund in language, potent in imagery, and delivered in his inimitable cadences, calculated to uplift and inspire the listener with the breadth of his prime ministerial vision. No one has been a more consistent opponent of communism than I have for the last 25 years, 
I will unsay no word that I have spoken about that, but all this fades away before the spectacle which is now unfolding. The past, with its crimes, its follies, and its tragedies, flashes away. I see the Russian soldiers, standing on the threshold of their native land, guarding the fields which their fathers have tilled from time immemorial. I see the ten thousand villages of Russia, where the means of existence is wrung so hardly from the soil, but where there are still primordial human joys, where maidens laugh and children play. I see advancing upon all this, in hideous onslaught, the Nazi war machine, with its clanking, heel-clicking, dandified Prussian officers. I see also the dull, drilled, docile, brutish masses of the Hun soldiery plodding on like a swarm of crawling locusts. We have but one aim and one single irrevocable purpose. We are resolved to destroy Hitler and every vestige of the Nazi regime. From this, nothing will turn us, nothing. We will never parley. We will never negotiate with Hitler or any of his gang. We shall fight him by sea. We shall fight him in the air until, with God's help, we have rid the earth of his shadow and liberated its people from his yoke. That is our policy, and that is our declaration. It follows, therefore, that we shall give whatever help we can to Russia and the Russian people. His choice of language had been carefully calibrated to give heart to the Soviet leadership, but not to make any precise commitment. And it worked. When Churchill proclaimed that he would never parley with Hitler, Maisky's elation was unbounded. A forceful speech, a fine performance, he chortled. Bellicose and resolute, no compromises or agreements. In his relief, he failed to note that the Prime Minister had carefully refrained from referring to the Russians as allies or to the form or scale of the help Britain intended to provide. The sincerity of Churchill's blistering attacks on Hitler in his BBC broadcast, which prompted a patronising Cadogan to note that he was overdoing the mudslinging, was not matched by a similar resolve to save Russia. He was still preoccupied with the struggle in the Western Desert. He could not know what was in the Fuhrer's mind, but his fear, shared by the Chiefs of Staff, that the Middle East was almost certainly in his sights, was not without reason. So confident was Hitler of a swift victory over the Red Army that the deputy chief of the general staff, Friedrich Paulus, who had played a large part in planning Barbarossa, was already putting the finishing touches to a strategic operation that would see three panzer divisions spearhead an invasion of Syria and Palestine via Turkey. The army would reach the Suez Canal in November 1941, from where they would open the land route to India via Persia. Far-fetched as this project might seem, Hitler not only endorsed it, but proposed to facilitate it by imposing a stranglehold on the Mediterranean, which in turn would mean seizing Malta and Gibraltar. The Prime Minister dreaded what he feared to be Hitler's imperial ambitions. His anxiety was reinforced by the Joint Intelligence Committee, which predicted an invasion along very similar lines to that simultaneously being planned by Paulus. Churchill, who was to declare, I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire, had no intention of squandering precious military hardware in a losing struggle for the Soviet Union, if there was any risk that the price would be the loss of the Middle East. The imminent arrival of General Claude Auchinleck to replace Wavell as the front's commander-in-chief was not expected to turn the tide against Rommel for some months. For these reasons, Churchill was willing only to provide Stalin with enough support to convince him that Britain shared his pain. A gesture was required. This took the form of a delaying tactic in the guise of a military mission, which was dispatched to Moscow on the 24th of June. It had no clear remit or mandate, and it lacked any sense of urgency. Eden confessed that he had no idea what its role might be, while Dill, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, openly expressed his abhorrence at the thought of collaboration with the Bolsheviks. The attitude of the War Office was illuminated by one of its junior ministers, Edward Grigg, who told his friend Harold Nicholson over lunch that, 
80% of the War Office experts think that Russia will be knocked out in 10 days, and that this would give great triumphs to Hitler and leave him free to fling his whole force against us. Reflecting on this, Nicholson noted, I cannot but feel that the War Office view is coloured by political prejudice and by the fact that Stalin murdered most of his senior officers. From the British perspective, the only useful role of the Red Army before its imminent defeat was to slow the German advance, deplete its forces and wear down its men, thereby providing Britain with the crucial breathing space necessary to rebuild its depleted defences on the home front and strengthen the frontiers of the empire in the Middle East, against either or both of which a Nazi onslaught was expected within weeks. The military mission's inglorious purpose was conveyed succinctly by Sir John Kennedy, the Director of Military Operations, to its reluctant leader, General Noel Mason McFarlane, who had a well-earned reputation for being tough, clever and courageous. We don't think this is anything more than an off chance, Kennedy told him, but we can't afford to miss even a poor chance like this. Your job will be to keep the Russian war going, and so exhaust the Bosch. Under no circumstances, Mason McFarlane was told, should he make any political commitment or agree to any form of military or other support. His primary role would be to assess the performance of the Red Army and the state of morale among its senior leadership. Had Stalin been aware of these prevailing sentiments, his abiding suspicion that London was only too happy to see Russians die on the battlefield to secure a British victory over Nazism would have been abundantly confirmed. And had the political and military elites in London been less contemptuous of the Soviet Union, they might have noted that their cavalier prediction that the Red Army would be a pushover was at the very least premature. The first evidence for this was at the fortress in Brest-Litovsk, where it took three days for Guderian's panzer group to gain the upper hand. The fighting was bitter and brutal, an early foretaste of the future. Instead of raising their hands in surrender, the defenders took desperate measures. They concealed themselves behind walls and rubbish tips, in cellars and sheds, from where they emerged suddenly to fire bursts of machine gun fire into the German soldiers as they forced their way into the citadel. Snipers occupied the upper floors, waiting to pick off individual targets. By this means, Lance Corporal Hans Teuschler was hit in the chest from 300 metres away and knocked unconscious. When he came round with his shirt and tunic soaked with blood, he saw another member of his unit lying beside his machine gun. His eyes had glazed over and he was clearly close to death. Teuschler struggled across to offer the dying man a canteen of water. To his right, another gunner sat bolt upright, unmoving. He was already dead. A sad concert of cries from the helpless wounded could be heard from all sides. Medic! Medic! God in heaven help me! he recalled. The commander of the 45th Infantry Division reported that it was impossible to advance because the highly organised rifle and machine gun fire from the deep gun emplacements and horseshoe-shaped yard cut down anyone who approached. Within 24 hours, he was to report, his division had lost 21 officers and 290 NCOs who had been picked off by snipers and machine guns wielded with great accuracy by the defenders. Providing a ghastly but epic illustration of how Russian infantrymen could fight traditionally in ferocious style, the defenders yielded only after a murderous hand-to-hand -hand struggle that left only a few hundred of them alive once the battle was over. According to a Russian nursing sister from the local hospital, who witnessed what happened when the German troops overran the compound, the invaders were not merciful. They took all the wounded, children, women, soldiers, and shot them all before our eyes. We sisters, wearing our distinctive white hats and smocks marked with red crosses, tried to intervene, thinking they might take notice. But the fascists shot 28 wounded in my ward alone, and when they didn't immediately die, they tossed in hand grenades among them. This was not the kind of resistance Guderian had expected. The important citadel of Brest-Litovsk, held out with remarkable stubbornness for several days, 
thus depriving us of the use of the road and rail communications across the bug, he noted in frustration. Reviewing progress across the entire front on the first day of Barbarossa from his headquarters at OKH, Army High Command, the Army's Chief of Staff Holder was already sounding cautious. After the first shock, the enemy has turned to fight. There have been instances of tactical withdrawals, and no doubt also of disorderly retreats, but there are no indications of an attempted operational disengagement. Such a possibility, moreover, can be discounted. Nonetheless, the panzers were soon advancing at blitzkrieg speed. Although both Army Group Center's panzer groups, under Generals Guderian and Hermann Hoff, met more resistance than they had expected, it was not enough to arrest their progress. A German pilot flying in a Stuka at 800 meters witnessed the Soviet retreat from Brest on the road towards Minsk. Bulky tanks of all sizes, motorized columns, carts pulled by horses and artillery in between, all frantically making their way east. The squadron dove down and we spattered the road with machine gun fire. Our bombs fell by the side of the tanks, guns, between vehicles, and panic-stricken Russians running in all directions. It was total panic down there. Nobody could even think of firing back. In order to leave the road intact for our own advance, we dropped the bombs only at the side of the road. The effect of the incendiary and splinter bombs was awesome. With a target like this, there are no mistakes. Tanks were turned over or stood in flames. Guns with their towing vehicles blocked the road, while between them horses thrashing around multiplied the panic. The almost total absence of Russian warplanes and the leaden-footed reactions of the Soviet commanders, still paralysed by the shock of what was happening, gave the Luftwaffe pilots free rein to slaughter. However, the advance was not without cost, sometimes of the most ghastly kind. As the Russians retreated from Bialystok towards Smolensk, 600 kilometres to the east, the ease with which the panzers cut through the faltering resistance of Pavlov's forces seduced some junior officers into taking devil-may-care risks. One young lieutenant, ignoring wiser counsel, raced his panzers forward before the infantry had time to clear the trees on either side of the main road ahead of them. After the tanks had disappeared from view, there was a silence. Then the air was rent by piercing screams and excited voices shouting in Russian. An infantry platoon, led by Lance Corporal Gottlieb Becker, was sent to investigate. They found that the entire unit had been massacred. Here and there a body jerked convulsively or danced around in its own blood, Becker recalled. The majority of the German soldiers had their eyes gouged out, others their throats cut. Some had their bayonets stuck in their chests. Two soldiers had their uniform jackets and shirts ripped apart and their naked stomachs slit open. Glistening entrails hung out of the blooded mass. Two more had their genitals cut off and laid on their chest. When evidence of such incidents was sent back to Berlin, the facts were exaggerated and recycled for public consumption in dramatic and lurid newsreels and documentaries that portrayed the Russians as having more in common with beasts than human beings. In the months ahead, such butchery would become so prevalent as to seem humdrum. Further along the front to the south, a 180-man infantry battalion was trapped by an unexpected Russian counterattack. The prisoners were led off in groups and taken into a field beside the road where they were ordered to strip. As they did so, their captors began to beat them around the head with their rifles and to pierce their exposed flesh with bayonets. Some had their hands tied behind their backs and were ordered to lie down. One infantryman, Hermann Heiss, described what happened to him. A Russian soldier stabbed me in the chest with his bayonet, at which point I turned over. I was then stabbed seven times in the back. I did not move any more. The Russians evidently assumed I was dead. I heard my comrades cry out in pain, and then I passed out. The following morning, after the Russian counterattack had been repelled, Heiss was discovered. He was still alive, lying in the midst of 153 half-naked corpses, 12 of which had been genitally mutilated. Heiss was one of only 14 survivors. Some Soviet commanders ignored such acts of depravity, regarding them as the inevitable price of close combat. 
others were less sanguine. Major General Mikhail Potapov, commanding the Fifth Army, reported in dismay, It has frequently occurred that Red Army soldiers and commanders, embittered by the cruelties of the fascist thieves, do not take any German soldiers and officers prisoner, but shoot them on the spot. He was not so bothered by the inhumanity of such reprisals as by their counterproductive consequences. I categorically forbid shootings on individual initiative. It is detrimental to our interests. To murder prisoners of war was not only to destroy a possible source of intelligence, but would assuredly deter enemy troops from deserting. News of the horrors began to spread like a virus through the ranks on either side. Atrocity was piled upon atrocity. Retaliation begat retaliation, until the field of battle was contaminated by so much fear and hatred as to obliterate any vestige of common humanity. Robert Rupp, an NCO serving in a motorised infantry unit, kept a diary in which he described a typical attack on a village that had been overrun by the panzers, but which was still infested with Russian troops. With a tank unit strategically placed to cut off any escape, a small contingent of infantrymen fanned out into the village to hunt down any Russians who might have concealed themselves in the tumble-down cottages and outbuildings which surrounded them. With two homes already ablaze, the terrified peasants scurried to rescue their meagre possessions and to drive their animals as far from danger as possible. It took a while, but by the time they had completed their search, the German soldiers had rounded up fifty men. A number of these were wounded. One of them had his cheek torn open by a hand grenade, Rupp noted. He asked me for water and greedily slurped down some tea. Others had to sit in the street for a long time before they received any treatment. Later, two of the prisoners were shot, one because he had allegedly used dum-dum bullets, which were deemed illegal by the Hague Conventions of 1899, a ruling that was routinely ignored and because he had apparently fired his weapon after initially raising his hands in surrender. Their bodies were thrown into a grave dug for them by their comrades. One of them was still alive, Rupp noted. He continued to wheeze even beneath a thick layer of earth, which rose up as an arm worked itself up into the air. Later, four Russians were instructed to dig another grave. A prisoner was marched forward and made to lie in it whereupon he was shot by a fellow NCO. The victim was the same man to whom Rupp had earlier given some tea. His misfortune was to be identified as a commissar, and thus subject to Hitler's commissar orders ruling that such individuals were to be executed on the spot. Though killings of this sort, often on a far larger scale, were commonplace, they did occasionally cause the invaders a frisson of disquiet. When a motorcycle battalion, shot the entire inhabitants of a village, women and children too, and cast them into graves they were made to dig themselves, allegedly because the whole village had been involved in an ambush that had cost the motorcyclists dearly. Rupp reported that this retaliation had provoked differences of opinion. One of the few unnamed German soldiers to be aghast at such crimes against humanity wrote, Here war is pursued in its pure form. The scenes which one observes border on insane hallucinations and nightmares. In the absence of any recognised rules of warfare, there were no boundaries to restrain even the worst excesses. For German soldiers who had been indoctrinated to believe that Slavs lacked those traits which made them worthy of treatment as human beings, murder was not only a means of assuaging the red rage of battle against a hated enemy, but also a simple way to dispose of unwanted detritus. Hitler's diatribes had anaesthetized the sensibilities of both rank and file soldiers and their leaders alike. Even the commander of the 43rd Army Corps, General Gotthard Heinrichi, an otherwise sophisticated and thoughtful officer, was culpable. When he led his troops into Poland, such an awful country, he became obsessed by the filth which he attributed to the character of the Slavs as much as to their poverty. Describing the general government, where some 12 million Poles, including more than a million Jews, had been corralled and redefined as stateless people, as the scrap heap of Europe, he was revolted by the serf-like living conditions they were forced to endure. 
holding these victims of Nazi racism responsible for the miseries the Nazis had imposed on them, he looked with horror at their half-ruined homes. They were dirty, with shreds of curtains at the windows, filthy. It feels as if we attract lice and fleas merely by walking through the streets. In the Jewish quarters, it stinks so much that we have to blow our noses and spit out in order to get rid of the inhaled dirt. Once on the Russian battlefield, this generalized revulsion merged toxically with an awed outrage at the obduracy of the enemy soldiers, which he described variously and repeatedly as cunning, devious, and deceitful. Heinrichi was incensed by the fact that instead of surrendering to superior might, they hid behind trees and in foxholes, from where they shoot every German from behind. In punishment for this egregious tactic, he noted coolly, our men have cleaned up among them on various occasions without mercy. And, since the Russian was like a beast towards our injured soldiers, he was content to observe that our men shot and beat to death everything in brown uniforms, with the result that hetacombs of people lose their lives. His dispassionate account of such atrocities, in marked contrast to the paternal concern he showed towards his own men, was a measure of how swiftly and how far Barbarossa had descended into barbarism. While other commanders similarly either averted their gaze or acquiesced in these outrages, a few, at least in the early days, sought to stop them. General Joachim Lemelson, serving under Guderian as the commander of the 42nd Panzer Corps, was appalled by the brutality of his own men. On the 25th of June, he issued them with a formal rebuke. I have observed the senseless shootings of both POWs and civilians have taken place. A Russian soldier who has been taken prisoner while wearing uniform, and after he put up a brave fight, has the right to decent treatment. When this made little impact, he tried again. In spite of my instructions, still more shootings of POWs and deserters have been observed, conducted in an irresponsible, senseless, and criminal manner. This is murder. The German Wehrmacht is waging this war against Bolshevism, not against the Russian people. He had not only been dismayed by the barbarism, but also alarmed by its consequences, noting that scenes of countless bodies of soldiers lying on the roads, clearly killed by a shot through the head at point-blank range, without their weapons and with their hands raised, will quickly spread in the enemy's army. But Lemelson's authority, like that of his peers who held a similar view, had been fatally undermined by OKW's own collusion in the murderous means by which the Nazis had elected to conduct their war of extermination against Bolshevism, which Hitler had outlined in a meeting with his generals on the 30th of March. After several iterations, these had been enshrined in his notorious Commissar Order of the 6th of June, which stated, in the struggle against Bolshevism, we must not assume that the enemy's conduct will be based on principles of humanity or of international law. In particular, hate-inspired, cruel, and inhumane treatment of prisoners can be expected on the part of all grades of political commissars who are the real leaders of resistance. To show consideration to these elements during the struggle, or to act in accordance with international rules of law, is wrong and endangers both our own security and the rapid pacification of conquered territories. Political commissars have initiated barbaric, Asiatic methods of warfare. Consequently, they will be dealt with immediately and with maximum severity. As a matter of principle, they will be shot at once, whether captured during operations or otherwise showing resistance. These guidelines had been an injunction, not a suggestion. Along with the Barbarossa Decree, issued by the Wehrmacht High Command three weeks earlier, which specified the jurisdiction of martial law and special measures to be taken by the troops, the Commissar Order authorized murder as a weapon of war. Only a handful of senior generals found the courage to express their disquiet at such measures. Among these was the commander of Army Group Centre, Field Marshal Bock. It is so worded, he noted in relation to the Barbarossa order, 
that it virtually gives every soldier the right to shoot at, from in front or behind, any Russian he takes to be, or claims he takes to be, a guerrilla. The order rules out any constraint towards punishment of any offences in this regard. He raised his concern with the army's commander-in-chief, Brauschitz, who, true to his pusillanimous character, reassured him that such orders were not incompatible with the prevailing regulations under which a soldier was answerable to a military court for his actions on and off the battlefield. Instead of pressing his point, Bock seized on this comforting interpretation with alacrity. Withdrawing his objections, he thereby joined his fellow generals by giving his tacit consent to what Ian Kershaw has aptly described as the premeditated barbarism that was unleashed on the peoples of the Soviet Union. Heinz Guderian was to claim subsequently that Hitler's commissar order was never sent to him by Bock. For this reason, he asserted, it was never carried out by my troops. As Lemelson could have testified, this was untrue. Yet, notwithstanding his dismay at the excesses of his men, even Lemelson felt obliged to qualify his rebuke to them with the reminder that the Führer's instruction calls for ruthless action against Bolshevism and any kind of partisans. People who have been clearly identified as such should be taken aside and shot only by an order of an officer. In attempting to conceal these extrajudicial killings beneath a veneer of military discipline, commanders like Lemelson, reluctantly or not, were, as the historian Omar Bartov has noted, simultaneously engaged in furnishing them with arguments lifted directly from Hitler's ideological arsenal as a means to motivate them in battle and make them believe that the murders they were ordered to carry out were an unavoidable existential and moral necessity. Pumped up with battlefield adrenaline, Hitler's brutalized soldiers were, in any case, unlikely to be deterred from dispensing their own summary justice, especially when they knew that they were unlikely to be detected or punished. On a significantly smaller but equally barbarous scale, extrajudicial killings by the Germans were reciprocated by the Red Army. Wounded men were frequently executed to save the trouble of treating them, likewise those who refused to cooperate under interrogation. These casual murders, along with revenge killings, became so commonplace as barely to merit comment in official Soviet reports. In a mirror image of the prevailing attitude among Wehrmacht commanders, General Mikhail Potapov, the commander-in-chief of the Soviet Fifth Army, serving in Ukraine, casually signed off a report dated the 30th of June, which stated, It has frequently occurred that Red Army soldiers and commanders, embittered by the cruelties of the fascist thieves, do not take any German soldiers and officers prisoner, but shoot them on the spot. Chapter 11. Stalin's Rallying Cry As his panzer division sped eastwards, Guderian hastened from one to another of them, chivying them on to ever greater efforts. Deliberately taking risks that few of his peers, with the exception of Rommel in North Africa, would contemplate, he frequently put his life in danger. On the 24th of June, as he was driven to the town of Slonim to meet up with the 17th Panzer Division, Guderian stumbled on a firefight between a Russian infantry unit and one of the 17th's artillery batteries. I joined in this action and by firing the machine gun in my armoured command vehicle, succeeded in dislodging the enemy from his position. I was then able to drive on, he wrote, with the self-regarding bravado that this buccaneering commander could not resist. When he arrived at the 17th Panzer Division's headquarters, Guderian joined its commander, General Hans Jürgen von Arnim, Lemelson, the corps commander, and a group of their subordinates. While we were discussing the situation, there was a sudden outburst of lively rifle and machine gun fire in our rear. Our view of the road from Bialystok was blocked by a burning lorry, so we were in ignorance of what was going on until two Russian tanks appeared out of the smoke. They were attempting to force their way into Slonim, with cannons and machine guns blazing, and were pursued by German Panzer IVs which were also firing heavily. Catching sight of this gathering, both Soviet tanks opened fire. We were immediately subjected to a rain of shells which, fired at such extremely close range, 
both deafened and blinded us for a few moments. They threw themselves to the ground, but a commanding officer was killed and another wounded. Guderian was unscathed. The Russian tanks drove on into the town, where they were destroyed. Later that afternoon, after issuing instructions to maintain the forward momentum, Guderian left Slonim to return to his headquarters. Almost at once, he ran into a Russian infantry unit on the edge of the city. I ordered my driver who was next to me to go full speed ahead, and we drove straight through the Russians. They were so surprised by this unexpected encounter that they did not even have time to fire their guns. Guderian was flattered to discover that he must have been recognised, as he noted with satisfaction that the Russian press later announced my death. I felt bound to inform them of their mistake by means of the German wireless. Guderian's self-regard was boundless, as was his ability persuasively to exaggerate his own role as a pioneer in the development of modern tank warfare. However, his aggressive attitude and personal courage on the battlefield gave him a degree of operational independence, influence and authority that, to their chagrin, was denied his peers. The Soviet forces were in disarray, but pockets of resistance abounded. Two days after the first panzers crossed the border, the army's chief of staff, Franz Holder, was driven to note, the enemy is making a stand almost everywhere in the border area. Our troops do not fully grasp this because resistance is disorganised. There are still substantial enemy forces broken up in smaller groups. There are no signs of an operational withdrawal by the enemy. The relentless German bombardment nonetheless took a severe toll, pushing the Soviet troops up to and sometimes beyond the limits of human endurance. On the 25th of June, the chief of staff of the 4th Army, Colonel Leonid Sandalov, reported that several of his divisions had been so battered by Guderian's tanks that they no longer had combat capability. When his frontline commanders strove to persuade their men who were demoralised and not showing stubbornness in defence to hold their collective nerve, they were frequently ignored, some panicked. The poet Konstantin Simonov, serving as a war correspondent, watched as a terrified soldier fled down the Minsk highway, shrieking, Run! The Germans have surrounded us, we're finished! An officer shouted, Shoot him! Shoot that panic monger! When a volley of shots failed to arrest the would-be deserter, a captain jumped out in his path and trying to hold him grasped his rifle. It went off, and, frightened still more by this shot, the fugitive like a hunted animal, turned round and with his bayonet rushed at the captain. The latter took out his pistol and shot him. Three or four men silently dragged the body off the road. The Wehrmacht had a carefully planned and well-rehearsed battlefield tactic for breaking the Red Army's resistance. Advancing at speed, Panzer Groups 2 and 3, supported by infantry and artillery, were to break through the Soviet defences with flanking attacks designed to trap the Soviet divisions inside an ever-tightening noose until they were militarily asphyxiated and forced to surrender. This operation depended on close cooperation and coordination between the various attacking forces. However, the speed with which the panzers advanced became a source of growing friction between OKH in Berlin and the commanders on the ground. Both Guderian's Panzer Group II and Hoth's Panzer Group III advanced so rapidly that the supporting infantry divisions, travelling by truck, on foot and with horses, soon fell far behind. Bock faced a dilemma. His instinct was to allow the panzers to press forward as fast as possible. But, as he noted on the 25th of June, the Führer is debating whether the encircled area will be so large that our forces will be insufficient to destroy the trapped Russians or force them to surrender. Later that day, he was instructed by Halder to reduce the area of the encirclement from that which they had previously agreed. This was bound to slow the panzer's advance and, in Bock's judgment, would give the enemy precious time to regroup. I am furious, he noted. The order significantly narrowed the army's area of attack. He was still seething the following morning when Brauchitz arrived from Berlin. 
I was still so annoyed by the order to close the pocket prematurely that when he congratulated me, I replied gruffly, I doubt there's anything left inside now. Bock's anger highlighted a persistent tension in the Army High Command's approach. There was the urge on the one hand to press on towards Moscow as fast as possible, but on the other to capture or kill as many Soviet troops as could be netted by encirclement. The theory of kettling the enemy in pockets was clear enough. As the historian Robert Kershaw has noted, the centres of resistance were bypassed, overtaken and ringed by panzers and motorised infantry until the pocket killers, the marching infantry divisions, came up with heavy artillery to reduce them. Impatience and a lack of coordination between different branches of the Ostheer, the Army of the East, meant that in practice these operational principles were often stress-tested to the point of destruction. Nonetheless, when they worked, they were devastating. As it happened, both Holder and Brauschitz sympathised with Army Group Center's frustration. As they still had the authority to bypass what Holder described disparagingly as the Fuhrer's old refrain that we are operating too far in depth, the Chief of Staff instructed Bock to close an inner ring around Bialystok, but allowed him to press on eastwards to establish a far larger outer ring of encirclement around Minsk, 240 kilometres further towards Moscow. In this way, they hoped to meet Hitler's strictures without squandering the advantages to be secured by the speed of the panzer onslaught. As the smaller noose tightened around Bialystok, General Boldin did his best to mount the counter-offensive ordered by Pavlov. As he had warned, it proved to be an impossible task. The remnants of the 10th Army had been sliced up by the panzers and had all but run out of ammunition. The troops, subjected to a ceaseless bombardment by the Luftwaffe, were drained of energy. The last operational tank corps, under the command of General Mikhail Haskilevich, was effectively immobilised. An agitated Haskilevich arrived at Boldin's field quarters with a bleak message. We are firing our last shells. Once we've done that, we shall have to destroy the tanks. Boldin replied, Yes, I do not see what else we can do. With virtually every corps and division under his command now surrounded, Boldin's only hope of survival was to break out of the inner ring in which they were trapped. The commander seized the initiative, ordering his generals, officers and men to split into small groups. He instructed them to find their own means of escape from the tightening noose. Bolden managed to steer his own unit into the no-man's land beyond the Bialystok encirclement, but well shy of the panzer's forward units. As they skirted the German lines, they were joined by other units that had also found a way of escape into the vastness of the Belorussian forest. Like a military Pied Piper, Bolden gradually accumulated a bedraggled following of 1,600 exhausted men, whose morale sank even lower when they picked up Nazi propaganda leaflets which read, Moscow has surrendered. Any further resistance is useless. Surrender to victorious Germany. Bolden had rare qualities of leadership, formidable self-confidence, personal courage, a clear mind, and a resolute will to succeed. Against all the odds, he somehow managed to galvanize his followers to join him in an epic attempt to reach the city of Smolensk. By the 28th of June, Guderian's panzers had advanced from Brest-Litovsk to seize Minsk, the Western Front's former headquarters. Pavlov had already fled the city, withdrawing 180 kilometres east to set up a new operations base in the forest outside the city of Mogilev. In a state of near panic, he had contacted Moscow to report that up to a thousand tanks are enveloping Minsk from the northwest. There is no way to oppose them. With his entire front in disarray, he now instructed every division under his command to withdraw. In the absence of telephones and radios, Pavlov attempted to deliver this instruction to his frontline commanders by means of an elderly biplane, which was swiftly shot down, and then by a succession of armoured cars, all of which were also destroyed. Eventually, two intrepid liaison officers 
managed to parachute into what remained of the 10th Army's command center, where they were at once arrested under suspicion of spying for the Germans. Unhappily, the 10th Army's cipher clerks were unable to read the orders that the two officers had brought from Pavlov, as the codes had just been changed and had yet to reach this benighted outpost. The two officers were shot on the spot. Exasperated and demoralized, Pavlov decided he should head closer to the front to find out for himself what was happening. It was a desultory effort that yielded nothing of note. He returned to Mogilev in time to welcome a delegation from Moscow, headed by General Andrei Yeremenko, who had been summoned from his Siberian command for the purpose. Yeremenko arrived on the 29th of June, while Pavlov was eating breakfast. Looking anxiously at his guest, Pavlov asked, What fate brings you here? Are you staying long? In reply, Yeremenko said nothing, but handed him a piece of paper. This informed him that he had been removed from his command forthwith and that Yeremenko was there to replace him. Looking bewildered, Pavlov asked, And just where am I going? Yeremenko replied, The People's Commissar for Defence, Timoshenko, has ordered you to Moscow. Pavlov became voluble in his own defence, complaining with some justification that the collapse of his frontline forces had been caused in large part by the tardy receipt of the order to put the troops on combat alert. However, he conceded that the stupefying strikes of the enemy caught our troops unawares. We were not prepared for battle. We were living peacefully, training in camps and on ranges. Therefore, we sustained heavy losses. Such unpalatable facts would carry no weight in Moscow, where on the same day Stalin was railing against the monstrous crime committed by Pavlov's armies in failing to withstand the German onslaught, adding ominously that those responsible must lose their heads. That afternoon, flanked by four of his most powerful henchmen in the Politburo, Molotov, Yorgi Malenkov, Beria and Mikoyan, Stalin strode into the defence commissar's office to confront Timoshenko and Zhukov. Neither general was able to give a coherent account of the unfolding catastrophe. Incensed, Stalin turned on Zhukov and spat. What kind of chief of staff panics as soon as the fighting starts, loses contact with his forces and represents nothing and commands nobody? Even Zhukov was crushed by the savagery of Stalin's onslaught. It was enough to cause the chief of staff to break down in tears and leave the room. A little later, he was persuaded to return for a rather more sober assessment of a crisis that none of those present knew how to contain. On his way out of the building, Stalin turned to Mikoyan and the others, and according to all of them, said one or another version of Lenin founded our state and we've fucked it up. Stalin was evidently close to despair. He retreated to Konsevo to be alone. Exhausted and humiliated by a failure of judgment for which even his most loyal acolytes could hardly avoid holding him responsible, he isolated himself at the dacha, holding no meetings and answering no phone calls for a full 24 hours. Whether he feared that the Politburo would remove him from office, or more cunningly, had decided that this was the best way to test their loyalty, was never to be clear. Either way, reassurance soon arrived in the form of a deputation from the Politburo. Why have you come? he asked them anxiously, as though they were about to take him into custody. Molotov answered for his comrade, saying, I tell you here and now that if some idiot tried to turn me against you, I'd see him damned. We're asking you to come back to work. Stalin apparently responded by saying, Yes, but think about it. Can I live up to people's hopes any more? Can I lead the country to final victory? There may be more deserving candidates. This unlikely display of humility was an effective ploy which at once elicited the response he must have craved. As the others nodded in a display of fervent agreement, Voroshilov said, I believe I shall be voicing the unanimous opinion. There's none more worthy. Molotov then said, that his comrades had discussed the creation of a new State Defence Committee, 
the GKO. At this, Beria, one of its architects, stepped forward to confirm that they wanted the new body, which was to have supreme authority for the conduct of the war, to be led by Stalin. This confirmation of his undisputed leadership made the dictator more powerful than ever. With only Molotov, Voroshilov, Malenkov and Beria as its other members, the decisions of this inner cabinet were not open to challenge. Its terms of reference were explicit. All citizens and all party, Soviet, Komsomol and military bodies are to carry out the decisions and provisions of the State Committee for Defence without question. The dictatorship of the proletariat was now formally vested in one man, and with his status thus reaffirmed, he was more than ready to obey the summons. On the 3rd of July, Stalin finally addressed the Soviet people, who crowded around loudspeakers in offices, factories and civic squares across the Soviet Union to listen, many of whom were evidently nervous and often frightened and bewildered. Hitherto, the instigator of the great purge and the great terror had inspired a distant awe and admiration among the masses who were largely unaware of the true horror for which he had been responsible. Now, though, he adopted a tone they had never heard before. They were astonished when, for swearing wooden communist clichés, he addressed them less as a domineering Bolshevik than a brotherly patriot. Comrades, citizens, brothers and sisters, fighters of our army and navy, I am speaking to you, my friends, he began, in a speech that was devoid of ideological platitudes, but in words that carried an echo of Churchill's masterly We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches speech following the calamity of Dunkirk did not shrink from acknowledging that they faced a life-and-death struggle against a wicked and perfidious enemy. To defeat these cruel and merciless invaders, the entire Soviet population would need to fight for every inch of Soviet soil, fight to the last drop of blood, for our towns and villages. In comfortingly calm tones, he concluded by reassuring his listeners that they were not alone that theirs was not merely a defensive struggle, but a war of liberation for all Europe, in which, somewhat prematurely, he claimed that Britain and the United States would stand shoulder to shoulder with the Soviet people. Our arrogant foe will soon discover that our forces are beyond number. Forward to victory. By almost every contemporary account from every standpoint, the effect of Stalin's words was transformative. Like other leaders facing similar crises, he inevitably glossed over the true scale of the military disaster, but he had spoken with the clarity and conviction of a leader in whom the nation could place its trust. Only the most jaundiced or defeatist citizen could doubt their leader's belief that eventual victory was not just possible, but inevitable. Konstantin Simonov, by no means a communist sycophant, wrote, I felt that that was a speech hiding nothing, concealing nothing, relating the truth to the end and telling it the only way it could be told in such circumstances. That made me glad. It seemed to me that to tell such bitter truth in such circumstances meant to bear witness to one's strength. It pleased me and touched my heart to hear the address, my friends. This had not been heard in our speeches for a long time. Wandering the streets of the capital, the British journalist Alexander Worth detected a confident, determined look on all faces as they pored over the text of the speech, which had been reprinted in Pravda and widely distributed to be read out in the workplace or stuck on walls and windows. Posters sprang up across the city. They were not subtle, but effective. One portrayed a Russian tank crushing a giant crab with a Hitler moustache. Another, a red soldier ramming his bayonet down the throat of a giant Hitler-faced rat. Stalin's broadcast had burnished his image as a patriot, but behind the comradely carapace the dictator was as ruthless as ever. His anger at the collapse of the Western Front had already hardened into an unforgiving urge to find scapegoats for his own fatal errors of judgment. Pavlov, by now a broken man, was first in line. On the 4th of July, he was arrested 
and along with eight of his senior commanders, charged with forming an anti-military conspiracy, which had betrayed the interests of the motherland. The military tribunal did not allow itself to be sidetracked by legal niceties, but after a summary trial, found the officers guilty of lack of resolve, panic-mongering, disgraceful cowardice, and fleeing in terror in the face of an impudent enemy. The conspirators were duly sentenced to death and executed. In a characteristically vindictive act that ensured that his family could not escape his disgrace or inherit his pension, Pavlov was also stripped of his military rank. For good measure, his property was confiscated as well. It was his unfortunate distinction to be the first, but very far from the last commander, to pay the ultimate penalty for failing to conjure victory out of defeat on the Barbarossa front line. Such punitive measures could do nothing, of course, to halt the German advance. Within days of Stalin's broadcast, Bock's two panzer groups, Hoth attacking from the north and Guderian from the south, had not only advanced more than 350 kilometres from their starting positions, but had trapped the bulk of the Red Army's 3rd, 4th, 10th and 13th armies inside an oval pocket that covered thousands of hectares between Bialystok and Minsk. So rapid was the speed of their advance that, as Hitler had warned, the German infantry fell a long way behind the panzers. As a result, Bock lacked the numbers required to seal the pocket hermetically. Although several thousand men escaped, most elected to stand and fight. Instead of raising their arms in surrender, the Soviet gun crews remained obstinately in their bunkers, firing at the encircling troops until they ran out of ammunition. Bock was taken aback by their fortitude. In spite of the heaviest fire and the employment of every means, the crews refused to give up, he noted, adding grimly, each fellow has to be killed one at a time. As for the thousands whom he presumed to be hiding in the forests far behind our front, he comforted himself with the thought that they had only postponed the inevitable, as they would be forced to emerge when they get hungry. By the 8th of July, the battles in and around the Bialystok Minsk pocket were all but over. Twenty of the Western Front's 44 Soviet divisions had been annihilated, while the remaining 24 were so depleted with up to 30% of their original complement destroyed, as to be incapable of offensive action. Of the 671,000 men who had faced the initial German thrust, some 420,000 had been killed or wounded or were missing in action. The survivors, hungry, bedraggled and exhausted, were rounded up to be force-marched into captivity where they awaited new horrors as prisoners of war in a conflict that Hitler had decreed should not be constrained by any of the prevailing international rules of engagement. The panzers did not pause, but pressed on towards Smolensk. For the infantry, it was a wearisome advance. Their starting positions were already 600 kilometres behind them, but Moscow was still the same distance away. The long daily marches, interspersed with bitter fighting, were starting to exact a heavy toll. A German war correspondent, Arthur Grimm, who was attached to one of Bock's infantry divisions, described a landscape that stretches flat ahead with wave-like undulations. There are few trees and little woodland. Trees are covered in dust, leaves a dull colour in the brilliant sunshine. The countryside is a brown, grey, green, with occasional yellow expanses of corn. Over everything hangs a brown, grey pall of smoke, rising from knocked-out tanks and burning villages. Weighed down by heavy backpacks under a relentless sun, the soldiers plodded across the bleak Russian steppe, sweat pouring from their brows, muscles aching, feet blistering. To march from dawn to dusk, for up to fifty kilometres a day was gruelling for the infantry and for the supply columns, laden with medical supplies, spare parts, fuel, oats and hay for the horses that followed behind them. It was a logistical enterprise of great complexity that depended on open roads and an efficient train service. The advance would have been greatly hampered if the troops had been forced to rely exclusively on food supplies from the rear 
rather than the vast quantities of meat and grain that in defiance of the rules of warfare they stole from the farms of peasants through whose lands they passed. The more deeply Hitler's armies penetrated into Russia, the longer and more vulnerable to adverse weather and sabotage these routes would become. Under the clear skies and in the baking heat of the Russian summer, though, this was not yet apparent. The men just kept on marching. Our feet sank into the sand and dirt, puffing up into the air so that it rose and clung to us. The horses, coughing in the dust, produced a pungent odour. The loose sand was nearly as tiring for the horses as deep mud would have been. The men marched in silence, coated with dust, with dry throats and lips, noted Siegfried Knapp, an artillery officer riding alongside the horse-drawn gun carriages that carried the heavy guns. The monotony was unrelenting. As we marched, low hills would emerge from the horizon ahead of us and then slowly sink back into the horizon behind us. It almost seemed that the same hill kept appearing in front of us, kilometre after kilometre. Everything seemed to blur into uniform grey because of the vastness and sameness of everything. The men trudged three abreast, heads down, looking to neither left nor right, not talking or singing, but seeming to retreat into their own private worlds within which they might insulate themselves from an alien and hostile land. As an officer, Knapp was privileged to ride on horseback, and from this vantage point, he was not entirely unappreciative of the vastness of the country that he presumed would soon belong to the Reich. As a student of the natural world, he noted that in some forested places the earth was squeaky and springy beneath our boots. The leaves on the surface were little and brittle, but underneath lay leaves that had withered many years before and created a brown, spongy mass in which many tiny insects scurried. The living trees usually smelled fresh and damp, and the odour of the dead trees was dry and rich. Out in the open, he watched yellow butterflies and blue back beetles, while grass snakes rustled through the grass practically invisible. Grasshoppers were plentiful and could not seem to tell a moving soldier from a stationary tree, often hitching free rides. Swarms of gnats plagued us, and darting flies were everywhere. At midday, the men would halt for a meal, usually of stewed vegetables and whatever meat the catering corps had been able to pillage along the way, all cooked in a horse-drawn canteen. When they'd eaten, they were allowed to lie down and rest. Most fell instantly asleep, a jumble of bodies spread-eagled on the bare earth beside the road. According to Heinrich Harper, a surgeon serving in the 18th Infantry Regiment, this brief respite was of little value. The hour and a half sleep had done more harm than good. It had not been easy to wake the dog-tired men. Our bones were cold, muscles stiff and painful, and our feet were swollen. We pulled on our field boots only with great difficulty. One evening, Knapp was summoned to have dinner with his divisional commanding officer, Major General Helfried von Studnitz, whom he held in high regard as an administrator and intellectual. After asking after the morale of Knapp's men and the condition of the horses under his command, Studnitz said, How do you think the campaign has gone? Knapp replied, Great. Studnitz paused before saying, I was in Russia during the last war. I have experienced the Russian winter. It is savage, like nothing we have ever experienced. It will come, and it will come soon. We are just in this little part of Russia. We have a vast country ahead of us, and if we do not take Moscow before the weather turns bitter cold, I worry about what will happen. While Guderian's panzers accelerated towards Smolensk, Army Group North, under the command of General Lieb, made similar progress. Within three weeks of the invasion, his panzer divisions had advanced 450 kilometres, overrunning Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia before reaching the Leningrad Oblast, or province, on the southern outskirts of the city. Overwhelmed by the ferocity of this blitzkrieg, General Kuznetsov's northwestern front collapsed. His three armies retreated in chaos, losing 90,000 men 
and more than 1,000 tanks and 1,000 aircraft in the process. As a result, the armies under General Popov on the northern front came under intense pressure. Within six weeks, the totemic city founded by Peter the Great in 1703 would be under siege. The progress made by Rundstedt's army group south was less dramatic, but no less threatening. It was an arduous campaign that led through difficult terrain to the south of the Pripet Marshes, a 270,000 square kilometre area of rivers, wetlands and forests, covering most of southern Belarusia and northwestern Ukraine. Extending 230 kilometres from north to south, the marshes were virtually impenetrable except on foot. Army Group South was confronted by much stiffer resistance from General Mikhail Kopanos's southwestern front than Lieb had to face in the Baltic. The Stavka, the Soviet high command, had presumed that any attack against Russia would be launched on this front. Not only did Kopanos have the four strongest and best equipped armies in the Red Army, but he was also far abler, bolder, more imaginative and more flexible than either Popov or Kuznetsov. Despite making a number of tactical errors, he succeeded in launching a powerful counterattack around the city of Dubno, 430 kilometers west of Kiev. In what was to prove the largest such battle of the Second World War, some 3,000 Soviet and more than 700 German tanks pounded one another in a confused swirl along a 70-kilometer front for seven days before Rundstedt's panzers eventually broke through the Russian lines. It was a devastating setback. Kaponas had lost more than 241,000 men, 172,000 of whom were killed, captured or missing in action, as well as 800 tanks, 6,000 guns and mortars and more than 1,200 aircraft. The way was now open for Army Group South to accelerate towards the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, and beyond that to the Caucasus and Stalingrad. By the 3rd of July, Holder was so elated by the progress of all three army groups that he felt able to note on the same day that Stalin broadcast his rallying cry to the Soviet people that it was probably no overstatement to say that the Russian campaign has been won in the space of two weeks. The speed with which the invaders had advanced and the scale of destruction they had inflicted on the Soviet forces appeared to justify his hubris. Although, according to his calculations, the Ostia had lost more than 54,000 men, including 11,822 killed, 38,809 wounded, and 3,961 missing, the Red Army had fared far worse. 750,000 losses, of whom 590,000 were dead, wounded, or missing, as well as 10,000 tanks and almost 4,000 aircraft. In a little over a fortnight, the Soviet Union had suffered a devastating series of defeats. It was an epic humiliation. But though it might have seemed so, got a demerung, it was not. Chapter 12. A Shaky Alliance The leader of the military mission in Moscow, General Mason McFarlane, and the British ambassador who accompanied him, Stafford Cripps, were given an unusually warm welcome when their Catalina flying boat docked in the Russian port of Archangel on the 26th of June 1941 at the end of a 17-hour journey from the Shetland Isles. After a fine dinner and a comfortable night aboard a waiting yacht, they were flown to Moscow in the Defence Commissar's personal aircraft. This was a signal honour which did not escape Cripps's notice. He was even more gratified when Molotov, who had cold-shouldered him for almost a year, asked to see him twice within a day of his arrival in the capital. The atmosphere is so different here that it's difficult to realise it is the same place politically, he noted happily. Nonetheless, it soon became clear that Moscow sought what neither Mason McFarlane nor Cripps was authorised to deliver. A sustained supply of military hardware, and no less importantly, a joint commitment by both governments to refrain from making a separate peace agreement with Germany, the thought of which, despite Churchill's broadcast less than a week earlier, still troubled a suspicious Kremlin. 
the underlying tensions that had bedeviled Anglo-Soviet relations since the revolution still hovered only a little below the surface of the fragile bonhomie of their new relationship. On the 29th of June, Zhukov laid his military cards on the table. His detailed shopping list included 3,000 fully equipped fighters, a similar number of bombers, 20,000 anti-aircraft guns, and technical information on numerous secret devices. Mason McFarlane, who, like Cripps, felt instinctively that the Red Army was likely to perform far better than the gloom mongers were still predicting, forwarded Zhukov's demands to London. Judging by the response of the Chiefs of Staff, he might have sent them a bowl of cold porridge. He was told that the only item on Zhukov's agenda that could be spared for the time being was one, only one, night fighter. Meanwhile, he was to keep the talks going, but to make no commitments. On the 8th of July, Cripps was granted an hour with Stalin. It was only their second meeting, and on this occasion, the ambassador found him much more friendly and frank than the last time. It is a relief, he noted, to be able to talk to someone who can say what he thinks and whose word you know is the last word. Cripps's ostensible purpose was to hand over a copy of a letter from Churchill in which the Prime Minister reiterated, we shall do everything to help you that time, geography and our growing resources allow. Beyond that, there was no tangible commitment but rather a reminder that Bomber Command was at full stretch in Britain's efforts to obliterate major targets in Germany. As Stalin was far too shrewd not to have noticed, the Prime Minister might just as well have written, We can do very little to help you. We are under severe threat ourselves, but we hope you realise that by bombing Germany, which we have to do for our own sakes, we will also help your cause. I hope you fight with all your might. Your efforts on the battlefield are of inestimable value to us. Stalin concealed his disappointment, merely telling Cripps that the Russians were under extremely heavy strain and that he needed a very public agreement with Britain to ensure that there could be no separate Anglo-German peace settlement. Cripps had already pressed Churchill directly to demonstrate our desire to help even at some risk to ourselves if necessary. They realise what their fighting means to us, and not unnaturally, they look to us to do something practical to reciprocate the help they are giving. We are in danger of encouraging the collapse if we do not fully and frankly give the Russians everything possible to help and strengthen their resistance. Now he transmitted Stalin's desire for a joint declaration to London. Whitehall was profoundly sceptical but Churchill overrode the naysayers to jump at Stalin's proposal. Since the Soviet leader sought little more than a broad commitment to a common purpose, it was in effect a cost-free means of encouraging the Russians to fight Britain's war. Telegramming his agreement to Stalin, Churchill summoned a special meeting of the War Cabinet which duly endorsed his decision. On the 12th of July, after a further flurry of messages, Molotov and Cripps signed what became the first major agreement between London and Moscow since the formal establishment of the Soviet Union in 1921. It was a turning point. Cripps was so elated that when Molotov offered him a celebratory drink, he accepted at once. I definitely and ostentatiously broke my teetotalism for the occasion, so champagne was brought in and I took one large gulp of it as a toast to Down with Hitler. Three days later, Churchill announced the Anglo-Soviet Agreement for Joint Action in the House of Commons. It was, he declared, a solemn agreement to undertake the war against Hitlerite Germany to the utmost of our strength, to help each other as much as possible in every way and not to make peace separately. The agreement cannot fail to exercise a highly beneficial and potent influence on the future of the war. It is, of course, an alliance and the Russian people are our allies. It was somewhat stretching the terms of their agreement to describe it as an alliance, since it entailed no military commitment by Britain to the Soviet Union. Nonetheless, it served its purpose both by humouring Stalin and by appeasing British public opinion, which strongly favoured such an initiative. 
To demonstrate Britain's newfound solidarity, Churchill knew that a gesture was needed. In a note to the First Lord of the Admiralty and the First Sea Lord, he proposed that the Royal Navy conduct a joint exercise with the Soviet Navy. To win their support, he once again underlined the benefits that would accrue to Britain from such a boost to Soviet self-esteem. The advantage we should reap if the Russians could keep in the field and go on with the war, at any rate until the winter closes in, is measureless, he wrote, adding, These people have shown themselves worth backing, and we must make sacrifices and take risks to maintain their morale. As he surveyed the collapse of his armies before the Nazi Blitzkrieg, Stalin could also take comfort from the United States, where the White House was in no doubt about the need to keep the Russians in the field. Roosevelt's carefully constructed rapprochement with the Soviet Union had come to an abrupt end with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Even so, though mindful of the electorate's ideological and moral aversion to Bolshevism, he had been careful not to isolate Moscow entirely. Though he had described the Soviet invasion of Finland as a dreadful rape, he had resisted the pressure to cut off either diplomatic or commercial ties, in the fear that it would drive Moscow even further into Berlin's embrace. However, even after the Nazi invasion, he was still constrained to move cautiously towards a détente with Stalin. Whereas it cost Churchill little to promise whatever help we can to the Soviet Union, Roosevelt felt obliged to hedge, saying nothing in public about the invasion until two days afterwards, when he felt confident enough to make a similar commitment, albeit in answer to a correspondence question at a press conference, rather than in a direct address to the nation. And when pressed by a reporter as to whether the defence of the Soviet Union was essential to the security of the United States, he sidestepped, replying opaquely, Oh, ask me a different type of question, such as, How old is Anna, his eldest daughter? The President's caution sprang in part from his reluctance to alienate the voters, who as yet showed no enthusiasm for offering support to a communist dictatorship, and in part from the fact that the military establishment in Washington shared Whitehall's consensus that the Red Army would rapidly collapse under the German onslaught. However, this did not mean that he was content to sit on the sidelines. He not only believed strongly that to support Britain effectively entailed supporting the Soviet Union, but more pertinently, he was convinced that America's own security was entwined with the Soviet Union's ability to defeat the Nazis. Roosevelt's assessment was undoubtedly influenced by his former ambassador to the Soviet Union, Joseph E. Davies, who still carried weight in Washington. Davies had already made it clear that in his judgment, the Red Army would amaze and surprise the world. Moreover, as Roosevelt made it clear on the 26th of June, in a letter to his close friend, Admiral William Leahy, he was rather more optimistic about what he called this Russian diversion than his advisers. If it is more than just that, he wrote, it will mean the liberation of Europe from Nazi domination. And at the same time, I do not think we will need to worry about any possibility of Russian domination. On the 24th of June, as a first step towards improving relations with Moscow, Roosevelt authorised the release of $39 million of frozen Russian assets. The following day, he declared that the Neutrality Act would no longer apply to US ships transporting supplies to Soviet ports, any more than it did to any other Allied state. On the 10th of July, for the first time since the start of the Second World War, he summoned the Soviet ambassador, Konstantin Umansky, to inform him that $1.8 billion in supplies that had been formally requested would be delivered as soon as possible and that the first tranche was expected to reach the Soviet Union by the end of September. In making these commitments, he was more forthcoming, but just as hard-headed as Churchill. If the Russians could hold the Germans until the 1st of October, he explained, it would be of great value in defeating Hitler, since after that date no effective military operations with Russia could be carried on, and the consequent tying of a number of German troops and machines for that period of time would be of great practical value in assuring the ultimate defeat of Hitler. In the event, 
it would prove much harder to deliver the promised supplies by the end of September than the President hoped, but his public commitment to the Soviet cause mattered every bit as much to Stalin as the military hardware itself. The Soviet leader's relationship with Churchill was pricklier by far, and for good reason. Although the Prime Minister had been eloquent in support of the Russian people, he was ambivalent about the means with which to demonstrate this. He was frustrated by Stalin's failure to appreciate that Britain's bombing campaign against German cities and the battles against the Axis forces in the Middle East were in themselves a means of siphoning off German resources from Barbarossa. He was also easily bruised by what he regarded as Stalin's grudging expressions of gratitude and on occasion his open displays of ingratitude. For his part, Stalin made little attempt to dispel the abiding belief in London that he was a brutal dictator who for more than a decade had been stimulating Bolshevik revolution in Europe until he cynically sided with the Nazis against Britain in her time of greatest peril. Stalin's cynicism irked the Prime Minister. As Churchill put it, they had given important economic aid to Nazi Germany. Now, having been deceived and taken by surprise, they were themselves under the flaming German sword. Their first impulse and lasting policy was to demand all possible succour from Great Britain and her empire, the possible partition of which between Stalin and Hitler had for the last eight months beguiled Soviet minds from the progress of German concentration in the East. Churchill's underlying resentment found a petty outlet in his refusal to allow the BBC to broadcast the Internationale, not least because it was not only the Soviet state anthem, but also the marching song of the British Communist Party. The Prime Ministerial Edict was imposed in defiance of the fact that the anthems of every other British ally were broadcast routinely on Sunday evenings immediately before the nine o'clock news. That Britain had formed what he called an alliance with the Soviet Union made no difference. The omission of the Internationale from this musical pageant was widely noticed. It bemused Maisky, affecting to regard the decision as a tragicomic controversy. He noted dryly that the hair of thousands of British blimps stands on end when they hear it. But when his wife rushed out of the room one evening in tears of fury, when the BBC broadcast in its place a little-known Russian song, he changed his own tune to complain that Churchill's decision was an act of cowardice and foolishness. According to Maisky, the Minister of Information, Duff Cooper, explained that Churchill had growled, I am ready to do anything for Russia, but I will not allow the communists to make political capital from the Internationale. After he was mocked in the press and elsewhere, Churchill relented. The ban was lifted in January 1942. The Prime Minister was easily offended by Stalin. When the Soviet leader did not deign to respond either to his 22nd of June broadcast or his two personal messages, in all of which he promised every support to the Russian people for almost a month, he was mightily put out. He was further aggrieved that the reply, when it did arrive, contained an expression of gratitude that was brusque to the point of churlishness. Even more gallingly, the Soviet leader would insist on writing to demand that Britain open a second front against Germany, either in northern France or in the Arctic. At this stage in the war, with Britain still standing alone, neither option was even a remote possibility. On the 18th of July, the Soviet leader had the temerity to tell him that a second front in France would be popular with the British army as well as with the whole population of southern England. Churchill was outraged. Stalin was not only wrong, but his interference in British affairs was unforgivable. Offended by the presumptuous tone of Stalin's missive, Churchill was goaded into a blunt response. The chiefs of staff do not see any way of doing anything on a scale likely to be of the slightest use to you, he wrote. Nor could he resist adding pointedly, You must remember that we have been fighting alone for more than a year. We are at the utmost strain. However, he leavened his rebuke by advising that the British were planning a naval operation against the Germans around Russia's Arctic flank, 
and would soon be sending supplies to Archangel, which was, he wrote, the most we can do at the moment. Later, he reflected ruefully and bitterly on the long series of telegrams between the two leaders that now ensued. I received many rebuffs and only rarely a kind word. The Soviet government had the impression that they were conferring a great favour on us by fighting in their own country for their own lives. The more they fought, the heavier our debt became. This was not a balanced view. Two or three times in this long correspondence I had to protest in blunt language. It was, however, quite true, as Churchill was initially reluctant to acknowledge, that the more the Russians fought, the heavier our debt did indeed become. He was among the many who, despite their vivid memories of the First World War, found it hard to grasp quite how bloody and barbarous the struggle for the soul of the Soviet Union had already become. As the German panzers cut a swathe through the Soviet defences, Nikolai Moskvin, a young political commissar and a fierce patriot, had the task of sustaining the wavering morale of his beleaguered regiment, which had come under heavy fire on the Belarusian front. He hurried into the firing line to join his men. Just before his departure, he wrote in his diary on the 22nd of June, I love my motherland, I will defend it to the last ounce of my strength, and I will not begrudge my life for my people. It was a widely shared sentiment that after three weeks of death and destruction came under severe strain. On the 15th of July, Moskvin made plans to summon his unit to hear him read out Stalin's rallying cry to the nation, made in his radio broadcast ten days earlier. But so heavy was the German bombardment that the meeting had to be aborted. That evening he noted gloomily, It is possible that we are not completely defeated yet, but the situation is extremely difficult. The enemy's aviation is destroying absolutely everything. The roads are littered with the bodies of our soldiers and the civilian population. Towns and villages are burning. The Germans are everywhere, in front, behind, and on our flank. A little over a week later, by which time his regiment had been kettled inside box encircling noose, he made a further attempt to stiffen morale. He was not optimistic. What am I to say to the boys, he wondered, before gathering them together that evening. Whatever advice he gave himself, it was evidently inadequate. The following morning he asked himself despairingly, How can I get their approval? How? Am I to say that Comrade Stalin is with us? His chagrin was not hard to explain. Soon after hearing his homily, thirteen of his men had stolen away into the surrounding forest. The retreat was chaotic across the entire front. In many instances, discipline broke down. Thousands panicked and fled. Not infrequently, young men who had been rushed to the front with little training and worn-out weapons, and who were witnessing the brutality of war for the first time, maimed bodies and bloated corpses, opted in favour of a bullet in the back for desertion over the continuing agony of battle. Their commanders were unprepared for the scale or savagery of the German onslaught, but had no time to draw up plans for an orderly withdrawal. Lines of communication collapsed. Spasmodic and often contradictory orders arrived from army command posts either too late or not at all. With phone lines down and without radios, neighbouring units had no means of making contact with one another. They were easy prey for a mobile, flexible and fleet-footed adversary that could surround isolated groups and pick them off at leisure. Their predicament was aggravated by an acute shortage of trucks to transport ammunition or fuel for the tanks and an absence of repair facilities for vehicles that were damaged in battle or broke down from normal wear and tear. The Luftwaffe strafed and bombed the Soviet retreating columns with impunity, their victims the more easily identifiable because, to avoid the risk of causing provocation before the invasion, commanding officers had resolutely failed to provide them with adequate camouflage. The shambles was observed with dismay by General Ivan Ferdyuninsky, commander of the 15th Rifle Corps, serving on the southwestern front, who might have been describing any part of any front. 
Sometimes on narrow roads, bottlenecks were formed by troops, artillery, motor vehicles and field kitchens, and then Nazi planes had the time of their life. Often our troops could not dig in, simply because they did not even have the simplest implements. Trenches had to be dug with helmets, since there were no spades. Although Fedyuninsky had detected the enormous enthusiasm and patriotic uplift that Stalin's broadcast had aroused, lauding the way in which his message to the troops had been reinforced by the Red Army's political commissars, who explained that the whole Soviet people were rising like one man to fight the Holy Fatherland War. The evidence was markedly less reassuring. For the most part, it was true that the Soviet infantry, whether driven by Moskvinesque patriotism or fear of the firing squad, fought with astonishing valour, careless of their own lives. Brandishing antiquated rifles with fixed bayonets, they charged directly into the implacable precision of the German artillery, stealing themselves with mass cries of fury, as though that terrifying sound alone would silence the guns. Instead, though some German units were indeed intimidated by such ferocity and the sight of so many bayonets, they were felled by the thousand. Those who survived very often ran out of ammunition. Many units ran out of rifles. With breathtaking effrontery, Anastas Mikoyan, the Politburo member responsible for military supplies, blithely conceded later, We surely thought we had enough for the whole army, but thanks to his quartermasterly oversight, reservists going to the front ended up with no rifles at all. This oversight made no difference to his upwardly mobile status. Despite the best efforts of commissars and commanding officers, morale plummeted in many units. By July, untold numbers of officers as well as men were on the run. Despite the risk of being caught behind the lines by the NKVD and put before a firing squad. Nor was it only the infantry. Tank crews deserted as well. The Soviet engineers had already developed what would prove to be some of the most formidable armoured vehicles of the Second World War, including the heavy and virtually indestructible KV 1 and the lighter and faster medium T 34. But the great majority of the 15,000 tanks with which the Red Army started the war on the Soviet Union's Western Front, were both outmoded, like the T-26 and the T-28, and in need of renewal or repair. Poorly maintained by ill-trained mechanics and operated by inexperienced crews, they may have looked impressive in a military parade, but were arthritic in battle. Constrained by an outmoded military doctrine, the armoured brigades were arranged in fragmented units behind the ground troops, not concentrated in formations like the panzers, supposedly to provide the infantry with heavy covering fire while the foot soldiers fought the German advance to a standstill. In the event, transfixed by the relentless speed of the advancing panzer squadrons, they were stunned into vulnerable immobility, sitting targets for the German guns. Rather than waiting to be incinerated, Many tank crews opted to leap out and flee for the uncertain safety of the forest. Gabriel Temkin, a raw recruit making his way to a training camp just behind the front line, bore witness to this route. Travelling partly by train, but more often on foot from his home in Gomel to the town of Oriel, more than 300 kilometres away, he saw railway stations in ruins, roads blown up, and Stuka bombers, their terrorising sirens screaming, descending on defenceless columns. I saw people killed, some of the bodies twisted together. The wounded, especially the lightly wounded, were crying for help, which was rarely available. He noticed in awe the speed with which the contents of entire factories were loaded onto transporters that trundled past him, taking them to be reassembled on safer sites far behind the lines. Interspersed with these great trucks, but heading in the same direction, was a stream of civilians under near constant bombardment by the Luftwaffe. The planes, having dropped their bombs, were flying low, shooting their machine guns indiscriminately. Many houses were bombed and turned into rubble, or, being wooden, were burned out so that only chimney stacks and piles of ashes remained of them. 
the bombers also made a point of targeting the woods on either side of the roads with incendiary bombs, rightly presuming that men and horses would shelter under the trees at night. In one such bombardment, Temkin noticed that the burning greyish-white trees were turning reddish, as if blushing and ashamed of what was going on. It was in that beautiful birch forest that for the first time I smelled burned flesh. I could not distinguish between the smell of burning horse flesh from that of human. As he passed the sorry columns of troops similarly retreating from the front, he noticed their outdated rifles hanging loosely over their shoulders. Their uniforms were worn out, covered with dust, not a smile on their mostly despondent, emaciated faces with sunken cheeks. Temkin resisted any inclination to join them. When he arrived at the base on the outskirts of Oriel, he joined a large number of other conscripts who had made similar journeys. They were given new uniforms, but soon discovered that they would be unable to learn how to fire a rifle, as there were none. Instead, the young conscripts were required to march up and down on a parade ground, shouldering wooden imitations. He had been earmarked for training as a wireless operator, but before he had a chance to discover whether the camp possessed a radio, he was summoned to appear before his superiors. They told him that his military training was at an end. He was to be transferred to a labour battalion. As an immigrant from Nazi-occupied Poland, he was deemed too untrustworthy to carry a weapon on the battlefield. Like many others, and for similar reasons, he was ordered to hand back his uniform, which was replaced by a hand-me-down set of quasi-military clothes and a pair of well-worn shoes. With bemused resignation, he reflected later that the greenish half-padded coat he was also given was to serve him well for the next year, not only as a coat, but also as a blanket, and even its sleeves as a pillow. In Moscow, the newly formed State Defence Committee, with Stalin indisputably at its head, decided that urgent steps were needed to shore up the capital's defences. On the 4th of July, Stalin authorised the formation of 25 volunteer divisions, a total of 270,000 men aged between 17 and 55 that were to be sent to the front once they had been taught the basics of warfare. The men, many of whom were at the older end of that spectrum, were enlisted within days. The speed with which they were enrolled was impressive, but the process was shambolic. Medical students were enlisted as infantrymen when there was a dire shortage of doctors and nurses at the front. In some cases, Komsomol leaders, ever anxious to fulfil their quotas, managed to enlist as volunteers individuals who were already subject to the draft. Thus redesignated, these unfortunates were later to be registered as deserters, despite the fact that they were serving as volunteers and in some cases were already dead or missing in action. It was widely rumoured, though not confirmed, that other young men were press-ganged into becoming volunteers by the simple expedient of rounding them up on the streets. The training given to the volunteers was rudimentary. Their uniforms were the clothes in which they stood, and their weapons, if any were available, were antiquated rifles or pistols that often predated the First World War. A notable example of this awesomely disorganised response to the invasion was a militia unit, the 8th People's Volunteer Division, which was blessed with a disproportionate number of writers, artists, actors and musicians. Among these cultural luminaries was the novelist Alexander Beck, who was to write a vivid chronicle of the Battle of Moscow later in the year. Beck had earned a reputation as a prankster who dressed with an eccentric disregard for convention. He wore great big boots, putties which kept unwinding and trailing on the ground, a grey-coloured uniform, and most absurd of all, a forage cap which sat on top of his head like a bonnet, one of his colleagues noted. Among the 250 musicians from the Moscow Conservatoire who joined the division were the pianist Emil Gilelis and the violinist David Oystruck, who played for the troops and survived to be fated as 20th century maestros. The Conservatoire's rector, Abram Dierkov, who was also renowned as a pianist, was less fortunate. 
His fate was never discovered, but as one of the 7,500 men serving with the 18th when it was shredded at the Battle of Vyazma Bryansk in October, he was either killed in action or more probably died in captivity as a prisoner of war, very possibly shot because he was a Jew. His only legacy, poignantly enough, were the few recordings of his public performances which survived the war. Realising that Moscow itself might be in danger, the authorities also mobilised hundreds of thousands of its citizens into civil defence programmes within and around the city, as well as much further from the capital. Their task was to construct defensive barriers to protect the capital's outer perimeter. Initially, a task force of some 50,000 students, both male and female, were sent to construct trenches, tank traps, pillboxes and gun emplacements at strategic locations along a 100-kilometre arc from Roslavl, almost 400 kilometres southwest of Moscow, northwards towards Smolensk, a similar distance away. The mobilisation itself was straightforward. The party had a long-established system, which had been tried and tested during the Great Famine, for forcing people unquestioningly to leave their homes for unknown destinations at short notice and without explanation. The students dutifully, and in most cases with unswerving loyalty, left their homes and their studies to obey the summons. First by train and then on foot, one group of students found itself in a large village about 40 kilometres from Roslavl. After a few days without any instructions, and at first without implements either, the students were ordered to dig a large ditch alongside the banks of the river near to where they had been billeted. They set to work in a frenzy of energy, fortified by plentiful supplies of eggs and meat offered to them by peasants who were retreating in long columns from the distant sound of gunfire, herding their animals before them. Listening to this and watching enemy reconnaissance planes circling overhead, the students approached their leader, Mikhail Gefta, a history student and one of the few consumol officials to eschew an excuse to be anywhere but at the front. Anatoly Chernyaev, a fellow historian, asked Gefta on their behalf if they could be given rifles to defend themselves. He was told that this was not permitted, but that as it happened, there were no weapons to spare anyway. After completing their trench, the students were forced to withdraw some ten kilometres to the rear where they started to dig once more. It was the first of many such retreats, which would eventually end with their arrival back at the Kiev station in Moscow, from which they had departed less than two months earlier. Chernyaev was furious at so much wasted effort. He was also fortunate, as the German panzers overran or circumvented their fragile barricades. He was one of the second, third and fourth-year students to be pulled back before their positions were overrun. The first and fifth years, for unexplained reasons, were left to continue their fruitless task. Most of these were soon to be trapped in one or another of the pockets formed as the German panzers either bulldozed through or bypassed the Red Army's crumbling front. When the German infantry which followed the panzers began to tighten the noose around these trapped Soviet armies, the Moscow students were among those hundreds of thousands of young men who either died in last-ditch hand-to-hand struggles or were forced marched into captivity where they were to perish from hunger and disease. Those who belonged to the older generation of volunteers fared no better. In the middle of July, Konstantin Simonov looked pityingly at a forlorn group of middle-aged militiamen heading for the front. I found it hard to bear. I thought... Do we really have no other reserves besides these volunteers, dressed anyhow and barely armed? One rifle for two men and one machine gun? They marched without supply wagons, without the normal regimental and divisional support, naked men to all intents and purposes on naked ground. Their uniforms were second or third-hand tunics. Some had been dyed blue. Their commanders were not young either reservists who had not served for many years. They all still needed to be trained, formed, made to look like soldiers. Chapter 13. Hideous Realities 
The temptation to believe that Soviet soldiers were automata, blindly obeying orders, was widespread and penetrated deep into the psyche of the invading armies. Men whose minds were already poisoned by Nazi propaganda found it only too easy to accept that the people they were fighting belonged to a subhuman species that resembled the Aryan races only in bodily form and were thus akin to vermin, as cunning as they were vicious. The guileless diary written by Wilhelm Pruller, the dispatch rider, reveals him to be a tender husband, a vivid observer, a brave soldier, and an ardent Nazi who was simultaneously horrified and exhilarated by the intimacy of death. They were always on the move. On the 7th of July, he wrote, Everyone's in a fever of excitement, the way we always are before an attack, our cheeks glowing, our eyes sparkling, our hearts beating faster, and our thoughts concentrated on one thing, to get them, to destroy them. By chance I remember that Lawley's, Law his daughter, birthday is today, but I haven't time to think about it long. Orders are given, the attack begins, the fight sweeps me into its course. On the dot of 5.15, the steel giants move off, a hundred and forty of them. The Russians will soon be ready to shit. At one point, he watched as a solitary Russian tank appeared over the horizon and careered towards his unit with its turret open. Its commander stood upright. Ten Russian soldiers, including women, sat on its outer shell. It was soon incinerated. Some of the women, completely nude and roasted, were lying on and beside the tank. Awful. All along the whole road you see Russians who have been mashed up by our lorries or tanks. If you look at them, you can't believe that it was ever a human being. An arm there, a head there, half a foot somewhere else, squashed brains, mashed ribs. Horrible. In Prula, as in so many of his companions, relish and disgust were shockingly entwined. A few days later, his battalion was following a panzer unit as it rolled eastwards through ripening cornfields. He kept his eye on the tanks until they disappeared over a hill in front of them. It was only then that he realised that the hillside was infested with Russian soldiers who had hidden themselves in well-camouflaged foxholes. The Russians don't dare stick their heads out of the holes, Pruller noted. They simply stick their carbines out and press the trigger or throw their grenades out without looking where to aim them. After a while, a number of tanks returned. They followed what became a familiar routine, driving back and forth over the enemy foxholes. Mash up and back a few times over them, so you'd think the people in the holes had turned into soup. But no, they're still there all over the place. We have to creep up to each hole, hurl a grenade inside, and then finish them off with pistols or rifles. No cause of surrender. The Russians prefer to be flattened out in their holes. Here and there, a steel helmet with two raised dirty hands appears, but we don't recognise any pardon. In retaliation for a young German trooper, apparently shot dead by a Russian soldier even as his wound was being dressed, Pruller's unit did not pause but acted. It isn't a fight any more that we're conducting now, it's a massacre. It takes a long time for us to mop up, hole after hole, till there are no more shots. By the time they paused for breath, they had killed 135 Soviet soldiers at a cost of 11 of their own men. It was a satisfying tally for a young Nazi who had been taught to regard the Russian people as disgusting creatures and dirty beasts. The young artillery officer Siegfried Knapp similarly following the panzers on another part of the same front, was likewise complicit in extrajudicial killings that would have been regarded as war crimes had the Wehrmacht, under Hitler's orders, not disavowed the prevailing Geneva Conventions. In this Kafkaesque nightmare, Knapp sought to justify such atrocities by condemning the enemy's failure to abide by rules of engagement that his own commander-in-chief had explicitly repudiated but he had greater sensitivity to the consequences than the dispatch rider. On one occasion, as his regiment advanced along the road from Minsk to Smolensk, 
his platoon was ordered to fan out to clear away through a heavily wooded area where the Russian defenders had concealed themselves, hiding in trenches covered with twigs, branches and leaves. Knapp expected them to stand and raise their hands in surrender. On this occasion, though, they remained hidden until his unit had passed over their positions, at which point they rose up suddenly to fire at his patrol from behind. While acknowledging that these Russians were desperate men, Knapp was outraged that in shooting his men in the back, the Russians had broken a code of honour. Unlike Prula, however, he was dismayed by the overreaction of his soldiers, and even more by his own failure to deter them. In a combat situation, the soldier is under inhuman stress to begin with, and when he sees a friend he has been sharing his life with suddenly drop because he was shot in the back, it is too much. It is not just friendship, and it is stronger than flag and country. Our soldiers went berserk, and from that point on during the attack, they took no prisoners and left no one alive in a trench or foxhole. I did not try to stop them, nor did any other officer, because they would have killed us too if we had. They were out of their minds with fury. They were all killed without mercy or remorse. In the calm of that evening, his men sat around the field kitchen, eating their rations or smoking and drinking coffee that bubbled on top of a log fire. Some mended their boots or wrote letters home. Knapp wondered what they might tell their loved ones after the horror and exhaustion of that day, noting resignedly they had clearly adapted to this new type of warfare better than I had. Knapp was troubled enough to demand an audience with his immediate superior, Major Walter Kruger. The Major was in his command tent, inspecting a map in preparation for the Soviet counterattack expected the following day. Knapp must have betrayed his unease as Kruger, looking up from the map, paused before saying, You did not like what you saw today. Knapp replied, No, but I understood it. Kruger paused again before saying, Good, that is important. There is nothing that you or I can do about an incident like that. The Russians took control of the situation out of our hands. Across the length of the front, similar incidents were sanctioned by a collective shrug of the shoulders. Barbarity beget barbarity in a downward spiral that led otherwise civilised men to forsake humanity in a daily orgy of savagery. But there was a significant distinction between the attitudes on either side. From the perspective of the Russian soldier, the Nazi invaders were bent on destroying their motherland, their homes and their families. This engendered a hatred so intense as to justify in their minds any means of stopping their advance, however bestial. In the case of a great many German soldiers, the red rage of battle was not the sole explanation for the atrocities they inflicted on their hated enemy. Such men viewed Slavs as an inferior life form that had no right to be treated as human. For their commanders, many of whom shared that opinion, the murderous rampages in which their men indulged also provided a swift and simple way of releasing them from the burden of force marching their victims to prisoner of war camps hundreds of kilometres behind the ever-advancing front lines. It was easy to turn a blind eye to any excess, especially as their commander-in-chief, the Führer, had no qualms about such atrocities. Even so, by mid-July, hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers had been taken prisoner. Across the entire front, roads became clogged by ragged columns of exhausted and broken men shuffling towards the perdition that awaited them. On their way, they passed regiment upon regiment of German troops marching in the opposite direction. Among these was a young rifleman, Benno Zeisser. Soon after advancing through Poland into Ukraine, a stop-start journey on foot and by train that had taken a fortnight, Zeiser's company was resting at a railhead well inside the Soviet Union. He had already witnessed enough to temper his youthful exuberance at the prospect of the victorious battle ahead. He had seen a hospital train filled with wounded comrades, with missing limbs, blood-streaked uniforms, blood-soaked bandages on legs, arms, 
heads and chests. A ruined town, with chimneys sticking grotesquely from the rubble and iron girders snapped like matches. Burned out tanks, decapitated tanks, overturned tanks, and tanks inextricably bogged in marshland. Now as he and his comrades, most of whom like him were still teenagers, wandered idly about the marshalling yard, their attention was arrested by the sight of a broad earth-brown crocodile slowly shuffling down the road towards us. From it came a subdued hum like that from a beehive. Prisoners of war, Russians six deep. We couldn't see the end of the column. As they drew near, the terrible stench which met us made us quite sick. It was like the biting stench of the lion house, under the filthy odour of the monkey house at the same time. They went to move away from the foul cloud which surrounded them, but found themselves transfixed by the spectacle. Were these really human beings, these grey-brown figures, these shadows lurching towards us, stumbling and staggering, moving shapes at their last gasp, creatures which only some last flicker of the will to live enabled them to obey the order to march? Zysa saw a prisoner stumble and fall out of line. A guard drove him back into the column with a rifle butt. Another, with an open head wound, ran out to beg a scrap of bread from a local bystander until a guard yanked him back into line, using a leather whip which he lashed around his shoulders. Not yet hardened by conflict, these teenagers watched uneasily as the prisoners were goaded with rifle butts and leather thongs into the open wagons of a nearby freight train. One had so little strength that he was unable to climb aboard and just fell back on the track. There was a sudden pistol crack, and, as if struck by lightning, the rusky cramped all up in a heap and was still, blood from his half-opened lips oozing down in his left ear. One young recruit yelled out in spontaneous protest. He was silenced by the guard who had fired the fatal round. Pull yourself together, man. Can't you control yourself? Fresh out, I suppose, aren't you? But you'll soon get that baby talk knocked out of you. Such incidents were not rare. Very often, the last moment of life for any prisoner who was sick or wounded or merely exhausted was to watch helplessly as a guard pulled a pistol from his holster, took aim at his forehead and pulled the trigger. Many prisoners had untreated wounds of the most ghastly variety. At one holding camp, Edwin Erich Dwinger, a nationalist writer by profession, but now writing as a war correspondent for the benefit of SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler, had enough sensitivity to be horrified by the sight of a group of prisoners sitting on the ground awaiting transport into captivity. One, the right side of whose jaw had been blown away by a bullet, had tried to wrap some rags around his neck. Through the rags, his windpipe, laid bare, was visible, and the effort it made as his breath snorted through it. Another's arm was a ragged mass of flesh. He had no bandages, and blood oozed from his wounds as if from a row of tubes. Many had been so badly burned by flamethrowers that their faces had no longer any recognisable human features, but were simply swollen lumps of meat. They sat in silence, not even a moan or whimper between them. For Dwinger, there was a sight yet more tragic. Some of his fellow soldiers took pity on the victims and began to distribute bread and margarine. They began their distribution more than thirty metres distant from the place where the most badly wounded were lying, and these rose up, yes, even the dying rose up quickly, and, in an inexpressible stream of suffering, hurried towards the distribution point. The man with a jaw swayed as he stood up. The man with the five bullet wounds raised himself by his good arm, and those with burned faces ran. But this was not all. Half a dozen men, who had been lying on the ground, also went forward, pressing back into their bodies with their left hands the intestines which had burst through gaping wounds in their stomach wall. Their right hands were extended in gestures of supplication. As they moved down, each man left a smear of blood upon the grass, and not one of them cried, none of them moaned. They are all dumb, 
as dumb as the poorest of God's creatures. Within the first two months of the war, at least 150,000 and perhaps 200,000 POWs died before they reached the dumping grounds that served as prison camps. They were beaten or starved to death, either on forced marches or on the transport trains, which would stop from time to time to throw piles of corpses out. Few German soldiers, even those who were not directly implicated, showed sympathy for their victims. In one of his letters home, the tank gunner Karl Fuchs expressed a common sentiment. Hardly ever do you see the face of a person who seems rational and intelligent. They all look emaciated, and the wild, half-crazy look in their eyes makes them appear like imbeciles. And these scoundrels, led by Jews and criminals, wanted to imprint their stamp on Europe, indeed on the world. Thank God that our Führer Adolf Hitler is preventing this from happening. On the assumption that Operation Barbarossa would be swiftly accomplished, Hitler had moved his new headquarters deep into the forests of East Prussia on the 24th of June. Wolf's Schanzer, Wolf's Lair, was a sprawl of wooden huts and bomb-proof bunkers some eight kilometres east of the town of Rastenburg. The complex was divided into three security zones, the innermost of which, heavily guarded and ringed by a fence of steel, surrounded Hitler's personal compound. His bunker adjoined others for his most trusted acolytes. His vainglorious deputy, Hermann Göring, OKW's sycophantic commander-in-chief, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, its no less deferential chief of operations, General Alfred Jodl, and the sinisterly manipulative Martin Bormann, whose role as Hesse's successor had been dignified by the title of Deputy Führer of the Nazi Party Chancellery. So far from enduring the rigours of a normal field headquarters, these senior members of the entourage lived in some comfort. According to one of their number, the concrete walls of the bunkers were lined with brightly painted wooden panels and their spacious bedrooms enjoyed the luxury of built-in cupboards, glazed basins, and baths with water laid on, central heating, and every type of electrical gadget. In addition to staff quarters, meeting rooms, and an operation centre from where Hitler could follow Barbarossa's progress, the complex contained a large dining hall. There, in a series of rambling monologues over dinner, the coarsest, cruelest, least magnanimous conqueror the world has ever known, as he was described by the historian Hugh Trevor Roper, expounded his ideological and political theories to his fawning entourage. His aperçus were dutifully recorded by the obsequious Bormann, who acted as his official Boswell. Much of what he said, at inordinate length, would have been familiar to students of Mein Kampf, where he had written, as Trevor Roper was to summarise, that the struggle between Germany and Russia was to be the decisive battle of the world, a war of life and death, empire or annihilation, deciding the fate of centuries, a war not against the past, that was already dead, but between two titans disputing its inheritance. In early July 1941, 15 years after the publication of Mein Kampf, when victory seemed imminent, such sentiments must have had peculiar force. Bolshevism must be exterminated. Moscow as the centre of the doctrine must disappear from the Earth's surface as soon as its riches have been brought to shelter, the Führer avowed at dinner on the 5th of July. After a meeting with Hitler two days later, Halder noted, it is the Führer's firm decision to level Moscow and Leningrad and make them uninhabitable. In addition to depriving not only Bolshevism but also Muscovite nationalism of their centres, he told Halder that both cities were to be raised by the Air Force, which would relieve us of the necessity of having to feed the populations through the winter. The reason for that was well understood. Those among the seven million citizens who survived the aerial bombardment would either starve to death or flee eastwards towards Siberia where their chances of scavenging a living were as remote as the wastelands they would inherit. The insouissance with which Hitler's high command accepted the fate their leader had allotted to the civilian population of the Soviet Union is horrific, 
but not inexplicable. Even those generals who did not entirely share Hitler's maniacal precepts were aware of the immense challenge posed by the need to provision an invading army of nearly three million men. In the weeks leading up to Barbarossa, the planners had come up with a solution. Unlike the variety of nascent ideas then being proposed for the extermination of European Jewry, the Hunger Plan, as it was known, was not shrouded in secrecy, but was overt and explicit. It had much in common with principles applied during Stalin's Great Famine, which had been visited on the same benighted region less than a decade earlier. It entailed the mass starvation of millions of people. Concocted by senior officials who were, for the most part, ardent Nazis, the prospect of a subhuman species dying in large numbers raised few qualms. The fundamental challenge for them was to feed the invading troops without rationing the supply of basic foodstuffs to the Reich's civilian population. Germany, like much of Europe, had not been self-sufficient even in peacetime, and the war had exacerbated this deficit. Though the Nazis were plundering the territories they had occupied in Western Europe for a wide range of raw materials and industrial goods, they were unable to requisition a significant quantity of surplus food for the very good reason that there was none. Agricultural output had slumped across the continent. The blitzkrieg across the Low Countries and through France had not only caused hideous human dislocation, but also disrupted the production and distribution of foodstuffs. Already aggravated by Britain's naval blockade, Germany's food shortages looked certain to be further exacerbated by Operation Barbarossa unless an alternative solution could be found. Grim memories of the First World War and its aftermath, when millions went short of food and many were brought to the verge of starvation, were still fresh in the German mind. In popular European mythology, Ukraine's bountiful soil held the elixir of life. The region was held to be a breadbasket, overflowing with enough grain to feed all Europe. The Third Reich's Ministry of Agriculture knew better. Not only did Ukraine produce a modest annual surplus, but since collectivization, this had been requisitioned by Bolshevik bureaucrats, sometimes at the point of a gun, to feed the workers in the Soviet Union's industrial heartlands. Appreciating this, the ministry's overlord, Herbert Bakker, who was a zealous Nazi, came up with a swift and simple fix. In the spring of 1941, he proposed that the food chain between Ukraine and the cities of central and northern Russia be severed and grain redistributed among the invading armies. Bakker found a ready ally in OKW's economic guru, General Georg Thomas who was far less committed to Nazism, but, as a soulless administrator, merely saw the hunger plan as a solution to a looming logistics problem. If the soldiers were allowed to plunder Ukraine's granaries, tens of thousands of trucks would be liberated for the crucial task of maintaining a steady flow of men, weapons, ammunition, and fuel to the front. On the 2nd of May 1941, the heads of the Reich's key ministries were summoned to a meeting at OKW where the hunger plan was duly endorsed. An official minute of the meeting confirmed that its implications were well understood. If we take what we need out of the country, there can be no doubt that many millions of people will die of starvation. Bakker was more precise. By his estimate, the surplus population of Soviet citizens who would perish as a result of the hunger plan was likely to be in the order of 20 to 30 million. The German high command did not shrink from this prospect. In fact, it was fully complicit in it. A little before the invasion, OKW's guidelines for the implementation of the hunger plan were published in a green book. The forecast was unequivocal. Many tens of millions of people in this territory will die or must emigrate to Siberia. Attempts to rescue the population from death by starvation by drawing on the surplus from the Black Earth regions can only be at the expense of the food supply to Europe. They diminish the staying power of Germany in the war and the resistance of Germany and Europe 
to the blockade. There must be absolute clarity about this. Mass starvation was not an accidental by-product of the invasion, but an essential component of it. Nor was that all. From Hitler's perspective, the hunger plan had a further benefit. It would not only resolve an economic and operational quandary, but also play a critical role in delivering Lebensraum. As well as shelling Moscow into oblivion to destroy Bolshevism, Hitler intended to bring every part of the Soviet Union west of the Urals under permanent Nazi suzerainty. At a dinner on the 27th of July, he dilated specifically on the future of Ukraine, whose indigenous inhabitants were destined for the role of rural helots. Nothing could be a worse mistake on our part than to seek to educate the masses there, he explained. It is to our interest that the people should know just enough to recognise the signs on the road, though he conceded that to ensure they would be able to perform their allotted role, they must be allowed to live decently. In the southern part of Ukraine, he proposed to go further. This particularly verdant and fertile region would be designated as exclusively a German colony, explaining that there'll be no harm in pushing out the population that's there now. Hitler expounded his vision for the Aryan region. In place of the subhuman Slavs, the Reich would allocate the land to tens of thousands of German soldier peasants who would till the soil, marry fecund countrywomen, it would be forbidden to marry a townswoman, and produce large numbers of children whose own offspring would steadily repopulate the region. As guardians of the Reich, the soldier peasants would bear arms so at the slightest danger they can be at their posts when we summon them. For all Germans, the beauties of the Crimea would become our Riviera, and in Croatia they would be able to relax in an exclusively German tourist's paradise. Given the chance, Hitler's favourite filmmaker, Leni Riefenstahl, would doubtless have provided the images required to promote this Aryan vision of bucolic perfection. If any of the toadies at his dinner table were moved to ponder that their Führer had become totally insane, they refrained from expressing even the mildest degree of scepticism. Hitler's notion of Lebensraum had seeped into the collective psyche of the German nation. When the family-loving Wilhelm Pruller wrote home, he was sometimes engulfed by a wave of homesickness, contrasting his native Austria with the homesteads they passed on their way east. Peasant houses with straw roofs which looked more like dog huts, a ragged, dirty, animal-like people. Yet he also looked beyond the immediate squalor to the future that Barbarossa would deliver to him and his family. You simply cannot imagine what a happy feeling it is to see such a country, Henny, as far as the eye can see fields, corn, wheat, field after field. This great country we are capturing for our children. This earth, this wreath, this wealth, it's simply wonderful. Whether or not Pruller might have become one of his Führer's soldier peasants, Hitler's freedom to fantasize was unbounded by any external pressure to contemplate reality. Issued from his cocoon-like inner sanctum at Wolfschanze, Hitler's diktats, however aberrant they might have seemed to frontline commanders, went unchallenged by his immediate entourage. This thraldom served to exacerbate the Führer's urge to interfere from a position of ignorance in the detailed decisions that in a more conventional conflict would have been left to the generals. OKW's Deputy Chief of Operations, Walter Wallemont, who was not exempt from blame, attributed Hitler's obsessive need to make every significant decision himself to his limitless suspicion and overriding determination to exercise his authority, the glaring inadequacies of his self-taught generalship and his incapacity to subordinate to well-tried military principles his own wishful thinking, based on politics, economics and prestige desiderata. In the months leading up to the invasion, Hitler failed to resolve what he already knew to be the potential tension between two distinct military objectives, the seizure of the Ukrainian heartlands 
for their abundant industrial, mineral, and agricultural resources, and the eradication of the roots of Bolshevism by way of annihilating the Soviet capital. This apprehension had been camouflaged by the Wehrmacht's confidence that the Red Army would be crushed so rapidly that both objectives could be secured simultaneously. By the middle of July, a cursory look at the campaign cartography might have seemed to confirm their judgment. Taken in isolation and at a glance, these maps offered a snapshot of an overwhelming military triumph that appeared to foreshadow the realization of Hitler's maniacal dreams. All three army groups were well on the way to their allotted targets. Army Group South was advancing steadily on Kiev, Army Group North was closing on Leningrad, and Army Group Center was scything its way towards Moscow. Such snapshots, though, concealed some disconcerting facts. That the advance had slowed, that in some areas it had stalled altogether, and that it had been made at an unexpectedly heavy price in men and materiel. On all three fronts, the fighting had become fiercer and the enemy's counterattacks more frequent. By contrast with the invasions of the Balkans and Western Europe, when troops who had been surrounded opted to surrender rather than face certain death, Soviet soldiers facing a similar predicament usually chose to die rather than surrender. Already, to the Ostheer's most discerning commanders, victory no longer promised to be as swift or certain as the high command had predicted. The spectacular progress of Bock's army group centre had come at a particularly high price. As the general commanding the 43rd Army Corps, Gotthard Heinrichi, was under pressure to close the gap between his infantry and Guderian's panzers, which had advanced so rapidly eastwards from Minsk that they were already encircling the retreating Soviet armies in another huge pocket around Smolensk. Despite marching up to 50 kilometers a day, however, his men were lagging some 200 kilometers behind the leading tanks. The strain on his men was intense. On the 11th of July, in one of his many letters to his wife, he wrote that they were utterly exhausted, and two days later that the heat and the dust are killing us. It gets hotter and more humid each day. We do not feel like eating, just drinking. We try to march only during the afternoon and at night. It is simply not bearable during the day. Today, the heat is so bad that I can hardly write a letter. At OKH headquarters, Holder noted on the 15th of July that the enemy is doing all he can to avoid being pushed back any further to the east. The Russian troops now are fighting with savage determination. This combined with the fact that large numbers of the enemy had managed to escape the Smolensk pocket, began to alarm Brauschitz. In turn, this prompted Halder to note that OKH's commander-in-chief had been plunged into a severe depression by the unexpected strength of the Soviet resistance. The first signs of the rift that was about to open up between the generals at the front and their superiors at OKH came when a rumour reached Bock on the 13th of July of a proposal to divert some of his panzer divisions to reinforce Army Group North and Army Group South. This alarmed Bock, who believed with great passion that the overriding priority was to completely smash the Russian forces around Smolensk and then for his entire armoured strength to drive quickly to the east until I can report that the enemy is offering no more resistance in front of Moscow. Bock was not to know that on the same day Hitler had decided that the dash toward Moscow should be put on hold, and had already made it clear to a disgruntled holder that a quick advance to the east is less important than smashing the enemy's military strength. The army chief of staff's frustration was matched by his impotence. The Führer's perpetual interference in matters the circumstances of which he does not understand is becoming a scourge which will eventually become intolerable, he noted. By confiding such criticism exclusively to the pages of his diary, 
Holder, of course, ensured that Hitler's arbitrary diktats would rarely be challenged. Two days later, Brauschitz, who was little more than the Führer's mouthpiece, delivered unpalatable news to Bock. A further advance to the east by the panzers after the capture of the area around Smolensk is out of the question. Once again, the generals failed to challenge Hitler's mercurial strategic whims. On the 19th of July, a supreme commander of the armed forces, Hitler issued Directive No. 33, instructing that army group centres advanced towards Moscow should be with infantry formations only. Three days later, on the 23rd of July, to put the matter beyond doubt, he issued a more detailed supplement to Directive No. 33, ordering that this advance should not begin until Bock had completed mopping up operations around Smolensk and further south. Meanwhile, Army Group South was to extend its operations beyond Kiev to the Caucasus and into the Crimea, while Army Group North, which he judged would very soon take Leningrad, was to make preparations to send considerable forces back to Germany, presumably for rest and recreation, before relieving and reinforcing the Reich's Western Front, perhaps before a renewed attempt to invade Britain. In what one of his senior acolytes at OKW described as a flight of fancy, the Führer also ordered the Luftwaffe to launch air attacks on Moscow, not yet to raise the Soviet capital, but as a reprisal for Russian bombing raids on Helsinki and Bucharest. On the 24th of July, Brauschitz advised Bock that Guderian's Panzer Group II and Hoth's Panzer Group III were to be temporarily removed from his command, respectively to reinforce Rundstedt's Army Group South and Leib's Army Group North. Bock was furious at this sudden shift in strategic focus. In a sharply worded reaction, he retorted that if the High Command persisted with this plan, it might as well abolish his command altogether. Perhaps they will correctly construe from this suggestion that I am piqued, he wrote angrily in his diary. But if the army group is to be carved up into three parts, there will be no need for the headquarters. Bock was not alone. The generals under his command shared his contempt for the craven way in which Keitel and Jodl were content to be Hitler's errand boys, rubber-stamping rather than questioning his judgment. As commander-in-chief of Luftflotte II, General Albert Kesselring had acquired a reputation for strong leadership and sound strategic judgment during the pre-invasion bombing campaign against Britain in 1940-1941. Now in command of the Luftwaffe's operations on the Eastern Front, he was similarly offended, and for a very simple reason that Hitler had clearly overlooked in his enthusiasm to punish Moscow. Commiserating with Bock, Kesselring complained that it would be quite impossible for him to mount an effective aerial attack on the capital until the Luftwaffe had established bases much closer to the city. Both men agreed that this would be possible only once the two panzer groups that were about to be removed from Bock's command had between them broken up the Red Army's reserve formations that were beginning to regroup between Smolensk and Moscow. From their perspective, the core purpose, the liquidation of Bolshevism via the destruction of the Soviet capital, was being jeopardised by the Führer's caprice. At the end of a long meeting with Hitler, which left him bitterly critical of the Führer's long-winded and unjustly critical comments about the Ostheer's frontline commanders, Halder commented that the Führer's fiat would allow the enemy to dictate our policy and would mark the beginning of the end of the decline of our initial strategy of imaginative operations. He had tried to make the case for pressing ahead with the advance on Moscow rather than pausing to round up the enemy in small, encircling actions of a purely tactical character, as the Führer now ordained. It was to no effect. My representations, stressing the importance of Moscow, are brushed aside without any valid counter-evidence, he noted glumly. This time, though, it was not the end of the matter. The battles around Smolensk, the springboard for the final attack on Moscow, had started to exact a heavy toll on the German infantry. 
Again and again, frontline commanders reported the absolute exhaustion of their troops. When Heinrich's four divisions finally caught up with Guderian's panzers, they were at once embroiled in a ferocious Soviet counterattack southwest of Smolensk. On the 22nd of July, the general wrote despairingly of finding artillery carriage drivers sleeping like the dead in front of their horses, and of the huge mental stress endured by men who had to face challenges that have never been experienced before in any other campaign. In a telling note that foreshadowed worse to come, he wrote, No one knows how long this battle will last. There is no sign of an end at the moment, despite all the victories we have won. It does not seem as if the Russians' will to resist is already broken, or that the people want to be rid of their Bolshevik leaders. The fatigue was eating away at morale. On the 27th of July, the day that Hitler was dazzling his dinner guests at Wolfschanze with his crazed vision of how Germany's peasant soldiers would transform Ukraine into a land fit for Aryan heroes, a surgeon serving in the 18th Panzer Division's motorcycle battalion wrote that the men in his unit had to endure a far too great mental and nervous strain under a powerful barrage of heavy artillery. The enemy charged them penetrating their positions, and was repulsed in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The men could not shut their eyes day and night. Food could be supplied only during the few hours of darkness. A large number of men, still serving with the troops at present, were buried alive by artillery fire. The men were promised a few days of rest, but instead found themselves in an even worse situation. The men are indifferent and apathetic are partly suffering from crying fits, and are not to be cheered up by this or that phrase. Food is being taken only in disproportionately small quantities. Over the course of three weeks, the 18th Panzer Division would lose 150 of its original complement of 200 tanks, an unsustainable rate of attrition. Bock was baffled by the strength of the Red Army's resistance. Astonishing for an opponent who is so beaten, they must have unbelievable masses of materiel, for even now the field units still complain about the powerful effect of the enemy artillery. The Russians are also becoming more aggressive in the air, which is not surprising, for we can't yet get at their air bases near Moscow. A few days later he noted, I have almost no reserves left to meet the enemy massing of forces and the constant counterattacks. From his frontline headquarters, General Heinrichi was even more disconcerted. My corps has got to get out of this messy situation. The endless fights in the forest will be the end of the troops. Even the best troops cannot fend off an attack in the forests and the swamps, he wrote on the 30th of July. With 43rd Army Corps bogged down to the southwest of Smolensk, he noted bitterly, we are still left with this thankless task, with all these obstacles, the atrocious forests and swamps, the dreadful state of the roads. So many things are not happening which would be a matter of course under normal circumstances. We have all underestimated the Russian. It was always said that his leaders are pathetic. Well, they've proved their leadership skills with the result that our operations have come to a halt. There is no doubt it would be a blessing for the whole world if Bolshevism, its methods and repercussions, would vanish from the face of the earth. It is awful, it is a disgusting beast, but it is furiously defending itself. At this point, the realisation that the disgusting beast was far from the point of collapse forced Hitler to reverse the major operational decision he had made only one week earlier. In Directive No. 34, released on the 30th of July 1941, he cancelled Directive No. 33 and ordained that Army Group Centre's panzers would not, after all, be diverted to the northern and southern fronts. Explaining this astonishing volte-face, he cited the appearance of stronger enemy forces on the front and to the flanks of Army Group Centre, the supply situation, 
and the need to give second and third armoured groups about ten days to rehabilitate their units, which make it necessary to postpone for the moment further tasks and objectives. This was not only an unexpected reverse, but also a startling acknowledgement that Operation Barbarossa, which by now was supposed to be at the point of annihilating the Red Army, had been put on hold. Hitler's self-congratulatory boast of the 4th of July, which echoed holders of the day before, that, to all intents and purposes, the Russians have lost the war, had proved to be recklessly premature. Within six weeks of launching Barbarossa, his clarity of vision had succumbed to doubt and indecision. The Smolensk crisis was the first significant setback for Hitler's armies since the invasion of Poland, and it began to have a baleful effect. The semblance of harmony, easy to preserve when their armies seemed to be invincible, gradually gave way to discord, confusion, and recrimination, all of which was exacerbated by the flow of conflicting orders that now started to emanate from the Wolfschanze. On the 28th of July, Hitler confided to his army adjutant, Major Gerhard Engel, that he was not sleeping at night, since he was uncertain about many things. Within his breast, two souls wrestled, the political strategic and the economic. Politically, he would say that two separating boils had to be got rid of, Leningrad and Moscow. That would be the heaviest blow for the Russian people and the Communist Party. Economically speaking, there were quite different objectives. The South was more important, where oil, wheat, more or less everything, was located necessary to keep the country going, a land where milk and honey flowed. One thing at least was absolutely required, and that was a proper concentration of forces. Hitler had identified this potential dilemma before Barbarossa, but had suppressed it in the conviction shared by the Wehrmacht High Command, that both objectives could be secured simultaneously and within weeks. With his options narrowing, he now leapt to the conclusion that he had a binary choice. It was one or the other. His vacillation between the two options opened up a strategic vacuum, which the generals belatedly found the courage to fill. The stage was set for a fundamental, fateful, and bitterly contested reappraisal of the entire campaign. Chapter 14 America Makes a Move At 6.30pm on the 30th of July 1941, a gaunt and sickly American was driven through the gates of the Kremlin and ushered into Stalin's office. Harry Hopkins was the personal envoy of Roosevelt and in addition to the bag of medicines that accompanied him wherever he went, he was armed with a letter from the president. It asked the Russian leader to treat Mr. Hopkins with the identical confidence you would feel if you were talking directly to me. The meetings between the president's envoy and the Soviet leader over the next two days were to prove of lasting moment. Hopkins was Roosevelt's closest confidant. His wartime home was at the White House, where the president had given him his own private quarters. As a principal architect of Roosevelt's New Deal and its associated relief and works programs, he had earned a reputation as a clear-minded and decisive administrator. For a while, his success in these roles had tempted him to consider running for the presidency, but any such hopes were abandoned when he was diagnosed with stomach cancer in 1937. He had been dogged by ill health throughout his life. He was 49 at the time of the diagnosis, and it was widely presumed that the disease would soon carry him away. In 1939, he was so ill that Roosevelt wrote to a friend, The doctors have given up Harry for dead. After treatment at the already famous Mayo Clinic, he survived on a diet consisting largely of pills and intravenous injections from his ever present supply, a combination that accounted for his cadaverous appearance. As a younger man, he managed to acquire a reputation as a playboy, but with the outbreak of war, he surrendered the high life to serve Roosevelt as his most intimate and influential friend. Though his detractors regarded him as a sinister figure, a backstairs intriguer, 
and an iron combination of Machiavelli, Svengali, and Rasputin, the President's faith in him was absolute. The arrival of Hopkins in Moscow was as unexpected as it was sudden. He had been in London for two weeks, leading an intensive and testing round of talks between the two governments. He had first met Churchill earlier in the year, when at Roosevelt's behest he flew to London on a fact-finding mission, not least to discover more about the Prime Minister. On that occasion, he had travelled widely, witnessing the courage of the British people at war. He also forged a strong personal bond with Churchill, who, he reported back to the President, was the government in every sense of the word, and I cannot emphasise too strongly that he is the one person over here with whom you need to have a full meeting of minds. No one else really mattered. In July 1941, that meeting of minds had yet to be established. The US chiefs of staff were disdainful of what they regarded as Churchill's anachronistic obsession with sustaining the British Empire. In particular, they resented having to dispatch scores of US vessels laden with military hardware to the Middle East to bolster what they regarded as Britain's folie de grandeur. A few weeks earlier, Roosevelt had intimated that he shared their view, advising the Prime Minister in May that the loss of Egypt and the Middle East would not be an unmitigated disaster to the Allied cause. When Churchill reacted badly, the President hastened to mollify him, but insisted that, should the Mediterranean prove in the last analysis to be an impossible battleground, I do not feel that such a fact alone would mean the defeat of our mutual interests. I say this because I believe the outcome of this struggle is going to be decided in the Atlantic, and unless Hitler can win there, he cannot win anywhere in the world in the end. As Hopkins swiftly appreciated, this underlying Anglo-US tension was bound to be aggravated by Barbarossa. The dynamics of a special relationship, which for twenty years had been marked as much by doubt and suspicion as by mutual regard, were bound to be affected. In London, the President's emissary exuded charm, but he was tough. Flanked by three senior US commanders, he told Churchill and the British Chiefs of Staff at No. 10 Downing Street that the American Joint Chiefs of Staff thought that the British Empire is making too many sacrifices in trying to maintain an indefensible position in the Middle East, and that it was essential for the people in authority in Washington to be given a good reason why they must get supplies to the Middle East. With the Russians fighting for their very survival, both Western leaders had pledged, in Churchill's words, to provide the Soviet Union with whatever help we can, since both Washington and London believed at the time that the Red Army would collapse within weeks, this expression of support cost little. By late July, though, with the Soviet armies by no means yet broken, the sincerity of London's and Washington's commitment could no longer be taken for granted. The defence chiefs in both capitals were exceedingly reluctant to dispatch precious supplies from their own arsenals to shore up the Soviet Union. Roosevelt's arsenal of democracy which was not yet overflowing with weaponry, was coveted by the Joint Chiefs for the defence of the United States and the protection of US interests in the Pacific. It was difficult enough for Roosevelt to justify the diversion of military hardware for Britain's imperial campaign in the Middle East. To divert further resources to the Soviet Union was certain to meet resistance from the Department of War but more especially in Congress where isolationists and anti-communists found common cause in their aversion to the Bolsheviks in Moscow. And there was a further problem for the President. The inevitable competition between Britain and the Soviet Union for whatever largesse the White House might bestow on America's two unlikely allies. Roosevelt's own instinct was to provide the Soviet Union with generous quantities of material as well as political support. In the back of his mind, was the thought that the Russians were likely to play a greater part in the defeat of Nazism than the British. This led to a further calculation. The British were heavily dependent on America's generosity and had nowhere else to turn. Nor was Churchill's commitment to the defeat of Hitler in doubt. The same could not be said for Stalin. 
It was widely believed in both Western capitals that a rapprochement between Moscow and Berlin could not be ruled out. While Roosevelt's emissary in London knew little of the Soviet leader, Assistant Secretary of State Adolf Berl, an outspoken and influential advocate of that view, warned him that Moscow was unpredictable. There might be a military coup in Germany, with a general emerging as dictator and an immediate Russo-German alliance. Judging by their propaganda, the Russians are apparently playing for something like this now. So for God's sake, warn the sentimentalists to watch themselves. Roosevelt was not a sentimentalist, but he was inclined to the somewhat romantic view that an undertaking by the United States to provide sustained political and military support was likely to cause Moscow to pause before pursuing such an alarming option. And there was another thing. He nurtured the pragmatist's hope that American largesse might, in due course, steer the Soviets away from their ideological cul-de-sac towards the primrose path of social democracy, and thereby, following the defeat of Nazism, establish a sound basis for a post-war global settlement. In London, Hopkins and Churchill discussed the final preparations for the first summit between the two leaders, which, it had been agreed, should be held aboard a warship in Canadian waters early in the following month. The main purpose of the Atlantic Conference, as it was to be known, would be to draw up a charter embodying a set of guiding principles for a new world order that would secure broad, if not universal, approval. As Hopkins was well aware, though, the summit would take place in something of a vacuum without a clearer appreciation of the Soviet Union's ability to prevail against Germany. It was arranged, therefore, for Hopkins to meet Ivan Meisky, the Soviet ambassador to Britain, at the US Embassy in London. They had a desultory conversation in which each sparred genially with the other, until apparently out of the blue, Hopkins asked, what could be done to bring Roosevelt and Stalin closer? Meisky was nonplussed. Hopkins explained that for Roosevelt, the Soviet leader was little more than a name. There is nothing concrete, material or personal in Roosevelt's perception of Stalin. It was at this point that Hopkins evidently conceived a bold diplomatic initiative. Mindful that the Anglo-US summit was imminent, he asked the Prime Minister if it was possible to get to Moscow and back within a week. Churchill affirmed that it was, but only via the long and hazardous flight on the route taken by Mason McFarlane's military mission in a Catalina flying boat a month earlier. That, he intimated, was too arduous for someone as frail as Hopkins to contemplate. Hopkins was not deterred. With the assistance of John Winnant, the US ambassador in London, he drafted a telegram to Roosevelt asking for permission to make the journey. I have a feeling that everything should be done to make certain the Russians maintain a permanent front even though they may be defeated in the immediate battle. If Stalin could in any way be influenced at a critical time, I think it would be worth doing by a personal envoy. I think the stakes are so great that it should be done. Stalin would then know in an unmistakable way that we mean business on a long-term supply job. Roosevelt gave his assent at once. Two days later, Hopkins was on his way. Among those to wave him off was Avril Harriman, the newly appointed presidential envoy to the United Kingdom. Later, Harriman wrote that his flight seemed as much of an adventure as a trip to the moon today. The flight was every bit as arduous as Churchill had warned. The conditions in the Sunderland flying boat were spartan and the journey took even longer than expected. Hopkins spent 24 hours either sitting on the machine gunner's stool at the rear of the plane or trying to sleep in one of the canvas stretchers slung along the fuselage for the crew. It was extremely uncomfortable, and when they entered the Arctic Circle, also exceptionally cold. Owing to a navigational error, they failed to make the expected landfall on the Russian coast. For a while, they were lost, and without charts of one of the remotest regions on the planet. Only a faint radio signal from the White Sea port of Archangel, their intended destination, put them back on track. Roosevelt's envoy was evidently unperturbed. After a brief stopover, he flew on to Moscow in a lavishly appointed Douglas airliner owned by the government. At the US Embassy, he was briefed by the ambassador, Lawrence Steinhardt. 
The ambassador's pessimistic dispatches to Washington reflected the views of the U.S. defense attaché, Major Ivan Yeaton, who had convinced himself that the Red Army was doomed to imminent defeat. Hopkins was skeptical about this. Before his arrival, he had read a long and well-argued memorandum from the former U.S. ambassador, Joseph Davies, whose sanitized version of Stalin's rule of terror had done much to sustain U.S.-Soviet relations in the mid-1930s. Davies not only claimed that the Russians were far more resilient than was widely supposed, but warned that it was essential to convince Stalin that the United States was not a capitalist enemy. Otherwise, there remained a risk that he might yet make peace with Hitler as the lesser of two evils. More significantly, Hopkins also had a long conversation with the British ambassador, who was at the airport with his US counterpart to greet him. Roosevelt's envoy was due to have his first meeting with Stalin that evening, and Cripps was anxious to engineer a private conversation with him beforehand, without mortally offending Steinhardt, whom he held in low esteem. Hopkins was evidently no less anxious to meet Cripps. When the two Americans visited the British embassy later that morning, the envoy contrived to get rid of Steinhardt on the plea that he, Cripps, had to tell me a lot of things from the PM. Cripps wasted no time before letting his guests know exactly what he thought of both Steinhardt and Yeaton. This prompted Hopkins to say, on the basis of his earlier briefings, that he agreed that both men entirely failed to take any broad view of the situation. Cripps was much relieved to discover that he and the President's envoy saw very much eye to eye on every important issue, and he was delighted when Hopkins told him that Roosevelt was all out to help all he could, even if the Army and Navy authorities in America didn't like it. It was, noted Cripps, a great joy to have the opportunity of talking to him. Before his meeting with Stalin, Steinhardt took Hopkins on a sightseeing tour of Moscow. He could hardly have missed the way in which the city had been elaborately camouflaged against aerial attack. Iconic buildings had been given a variety of disguises. The Bolshoi Theatre was draped in canvas which was decorated by false doors. Lenin's mausoleum in Red Square was covered with sandbags and dressed up as a two-storey cottage. The bright red lights that illuminated the spires of the Kremlin churches were hidden under grey cloth, and a graffiti specialist had done his best to turn the walls of the Kremlin itself into a row of apartment buildings. The effort was impressively strenuous, but of limited value, as it was impossible to conceal the route of the river Moskva which snaked through the heart of the city. By the time of Hopkins' arrival, the capital had been under bombardment by the Luftwaffe for just over a week. Hopkins, who had once worked for the American Red Cross as a director of civil relief, was impressed by the measures taken by the city's authorities to protect its inhabitants. The first bombs had fallen on the night of the 21st of July. Around 200 aircraft in wave after wave took part in the raid. The British journalist Alexander Worth was in his apartment when the attack started just after 10 p.m. He was mesmerized by the dazzling array of searchlights arcing across the sky, air raid sirens, the roar of approaching aircraft, and then the violent crunch of bombs landing, followed by the rat-tat-tat of anti-aircraft guns. As what he described as the real fun started, he looked out of his kitchen window to see a fantastic piece of fireworks, tracer bullets and flares, and flaming onions and all sorts of rockets, white, green and red, and the din was terrific. Never saw anything like it in London, which he had witnessed firsthand during the Battle of Britain. Worth's colleague, the Associated Press correspondent Henry Cassidy, was in his room on the top floor of a five-storey wooden plaster apartment block. The building started to shake and shudder as bombs began to fall. The cascade of incendiaries that rained down in bundles sent him rushing to the House Committee Room on the ground floor, where he found an air of remarkable order and calm. A woman was on the phone calling neighbouring House Committees to ask if they needed help. A group of teenagers had been deputed to climb up to the roof in relays to act as fire watchers. At midnight, a second wave of bombers arrived directly overhead, scattering incendiaries up and down the streets like postmen delivering mail. One landed on the roof of the building. Soaking wet with sweat, his red shirt open at the throat, rubbing his elbow-length asbestos gloves, 
one of the boys told the assembled women how he had tossed a bomb into the yard below. He was at once a hero. The women brought him a stool, made him sit down, despite his own objections, and petted him like a world heavyweight championship winner in his corner. Cassidy ventured up to the roof to find that the bomb had fallen immediately above his bedroom. Nor did the British embassy escape. Cripps was preparing for bed when four incendiaries landed on the embassy roof. The staff managed to extinguish three of them, but the fourth had landed in an inaccessible corner and set the building alight. Fire hoses were rushed in, and very soon a cascade of water was pouring down the main stairs. The worst of the blaze was above Cripps's bedroom, and its ceiling was soon dripping water. He was not greatly put out. I was able to sleep there to the accompaniment of water dripping into two buckets and the firemen hammering away in the roof, as well as the fighters flying over and a few final bombers coming. No real damage was done to anything that matters. Despite the cacophony and the casualties on that first night, Worth saw no signs of any devastation as he wandered through the city on the following morning. He noted that the tramcars were clattering along merrily, and that everyone looked quite cheerful, perhaps rather startled at the results of the blitz. Not everyone was so fortunate. Ambulances raced back and forth across the city, ferrying to hospital those who had been caught in the open or trapped beneath falling masonry. Altogether, upwards of 370 Muscovites were either killed or severely wounded on that night, some of the latter being brave but foolhardy young men who tried to remove the bombs by picking them up with their bare hands. More than a thousand buildings had been hit in that bombardment, but the impact was muted by the efficiency of the firefighters and the speed with which well-drilled teams of civil defence volunteers and others, dragooned forcibly by the NKVD and other city authorities, cleared the damage. Craters were filled in, tram lines repaired, glass windows replaced, and streets swept of debris. These volunteers were doubtless encouraged in their task by the knowledge that three of their comrades, fighters found guilty of neglect for allowing a warehouse to burn down, were summarily executed. Compared with the ravages inflicted on London, the damage wrought by the Luftwaffe was modest in scale. However, many of the capital's most prominent landmarks were to be destroyed or badly damaged in the following weeks, despite the camouflage. They included Moscow University, the Pushkin Art Gallery, the Bolshoi Theatre, Tolstoy's house, and the offices of Pravda and Isvestia. Only the metro stations were truly safe during a raid. As in London, these became bomb shelters at night. Muscovites, mostly women and children, queued patiently as they waited to file down onto the platforms. As one local doctor observed, order prevailed. They lie in careful order. Each family has its area. They spread out newspapers, then blankets and pillows. Children sleep. Adults amuse themselves in various ways. They drink tea, even with jam. They visit each other. They talk quietly. They play dominoes. There are several pairs of chess players surrounded by fans. Many read books, knit, darn stockings, repair linens. In a word, they were set up well and for a long time. Places are permanent, subscribed. Along both sides of the tunnel stand trains, where on the seats small children sleep. N. Erastova, her full name remains unknown, was among the thousands of young women who had signed on to join the Red Army as a volunteer in the hope of being sent to the front as medical orderlies and nurses. Instead, she was sent to a metro station to administer first aid to the sick and wounded. During a rudimentary training programme, she'd almost fainted at her first sight of blood. In the crowded gloom of the underground, she was relieved that she did not have to assist at one of the many premature births that the crisis appeared to induce. But she was busy throughout the night. With our medical bags and red crosses on our sleeves, we were in constant demand. The most common request was for some sedative. So great was the need that the nurses took to mixing the sedative, valerian, with water. It appeared to be just as effective. There was so much gratitude. Thank you, dear nurse. I feel better now. It was pure psychotherapy. Before long, Erostova's wish to be at the front would be granted. She would join the 6th People's Militia Division, where, as she put it, 
I saw so much blood that I became quite used to it. During the early days, the stations were crammed with up to 750,000 sleeping bodies, but as the bombing became a routine event, the fear began to evaporate. Many citizens elected to emulate the British ambassador and sleep in their own beds, evidently judging their lives to be at little greater risk in their lath and plaster apartments than underground. They were not, of course. Figures produced by the Soviet authorities put the total death toll for the first nine months of the Luftwaffe's bombing campaign at upwards of 2,000, with almost three times as many wounded. The number would have been far higher without the heavy guns that girdled the city and the scores of Soviet fighters that patrolled the skies overhead, between them downing an estimated 10% of the attacking aircraft. Roosevelt once said of his envoy, Harry is the perfect ambassador for my purposes. He doesn't even know the meaning of the word protocol. When he sees a piece of red tape, he just pulls out those old garden shears and snips it. And when he's talking to some foreign dignitary, he knows how to slump back in his chair and put his feet up on the conference table and say, Oh yeah? Hopkins adopted that approach, if not that posture, when he was ushered into the presence of Stalin for the first time. He was neither overawed nor intimidated, but he was immediately impressed. He welcomed me with a few swift Russian words. He shook my hand briefly, firmly, courteously. He smiled warmly. There was no waste of word, gesture, nor mannerism. After the preliminaries, during which Stalin spoke of the interests shared by their two nations, Hopkins cut to the chase. This meeting, he said, was about aid to the Soviet Union both the immediate supplies required by the Red Army and those that would be needed if the war were to last a long time. Stalin did not hesitate before rattling off a detailed shopping list in both categories. His urgent need was for 20,000 pieces of anti-aircraft artillery, both large and small, machine guns for the defence of his cities, and more than a million rifles. In the case of a long war, he would need aviation fuel and aluminium. Give us the anti-aircraft guns and the aluminium, and we can fight for three or four years, he declared, as their first meeting came to an end. The two men arranged to meet again the following evening. On the next day, the 31st of July, Cripps and Hopkins again had lunch together unaccompanied. It was a crucial occasion at which Hopkins listened closely as the British ambassador outlined his strong personal view, which was by no means yet endorsed by London that the future of Europe depended on the establishment of an Anglo-US-Soviet alliance, and this could be achieved only by immediate military cooperation sustained by long-term political agreements. Knowing that endorsement by Hopkins would be crucial, Cripps advocated a tripartite conference between Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union. Hopkins agreed. At his second meeting with Stalin, the Soviet leader once again demonstrated his mastery of detail and his clarity of strategic purpose. In an office lined with elaborate maps of the battlefront, he listed at much greater length the weaponry required to withstand the German onslaught. It was, noted the US ambassador afterwards, the first time that the paranoid and secretive Soviet leader had opened up with such unparalleled frankness to any foreign official. Thus encouraged, Hopkins responded by elaborating the proposal floated by Cripps over lunch. He suggested that the tripartite conference should be held in Moscow to allow the three great powers fully and jointly to explore the relative interests of each front as well as the interests of our several countries. Stalin responded enthusiastically, asking Hopkins to convey a personal message to Roosevelt. The might of Germany was so great that even though Russia might defend herself, it would be very difficult for Britain and Russia combined to crush the German military machine. The one thing that could defeat Hitler, and perhaps even without firing a shot, would be the announcement that the United States is going to join in the war with Germany. Hopkins was careful to remain non-committal about that, but he was heartened by Stalin's tone and especially by his flattering assertion that the President and the United States had more influence with the common people of the world today 
than any other force. Roosevelt's envoy was too steely to be seduced by the Soviet leader's blandishments, but he was not unmoved by his force of personality and commanding presence. In as vivid a portrait as any other, he wrote subsequently, No man could forget the picture of the dictator of Russia as he stood watching me leave, an austere, rugged, determined figure in boots that shone like mirrors, stout, baggy trousers, and snug-fitting blouse. He wore no ornament, military or civilian. His hands are huge, as hard as his mind. His voice is harsh, but ever under control. What he says is all the accent and inflection his words need. He curries no favour with you. He seems to have no doubts. He assures you that Russia will stand firm against the onslaughts of the German army. He takes it for granted that you will have no doubts either. After breakfast on the day of his departure, the 1st of August, Hopkins made time for a further meeting with Cripps. The British ambassador had not been idle. Encouraged by Hopkins' account of his meeting with Stalin, Cripps handed him the draft of a joint message that he had crafted the previous evening for Churchill and Roosevelt to send to Stalin. It contained a formal proposal for representatives of the American and British governments to meet Stalin in the Soviet capital. To press his case further, Cripps sent a memorandum via Hopkins for the two Western leaders to discuss at their forthcoming summit, which was due to start within a few days. Advising that the Russians should be given all the supplies that we can raise because that is at the moment the weakest point of the enemy and therefore our best chance of success, he added that it would be an act of supreme folly to deprive the Soviets of materiel, the absence of which might turn their retreat into a rout. Cannily enclosing with his memorandum a tin of Russian caviar and two bottles of vodka for the president, he also added a note in which he expressed his hope that the two Western leaders would implement the suggestion that I know he, Hopkins, is going to put forward. Cripps's plea on Stalin's behalf could hardly have been interpreted as other than an inconcealed dig at his own Prime Minister's curmudgeonly exchanges with the Soviet leader. By contrast, the American president was, as he knew from Hopkins, very likely to be sympathetic. On the very day that Cripps was colluding with the American envoy to push their joint initiative, Roosevelt was goading his officials to accelerate the delivery of aid to the Soviet Union. Berating the Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson at a cabinet meeting for failing to dispatch the 200 aircraft and other token shipments which had already been promised to Moscow, he evidently said that he was sick and tired of hearing that they, the Russians, are going to get this and they're going to get that. He wanted to hear what was on the water. In Hopkins' absence, he summoned another senior administrator, Wayne Coy, and instructed him to free the logjam. Please, with my full authority, use a heavy hand, act as a burr under the saddle, and get things moving. And on the eve of his own departure for his summit with Churchill, he told Coy that if the German invasion could be held for the next two months, Russia is safe until the spring. Step on it. Hopkins flew back to London, elated by his triumphant visit to Moscow, but forgetting the bag of medicines on which his very life depended. Buffeted by strong headwinds, the flying boat took 24 hours to reach Scarpa Flow in Orkney. By the time the pilot touched down in a rough seaway close to the shore, Hopkins was not merely exhausted, but so ill that according to his biographer, there were renewed fears for his life. Doctors were summoned, and he was sent to bed with enough drugs to ensure he had a long sleep. When he awoke, it was time to join the Prime Minister aboard HMS Prince of Wales for the voyage across the Atlantic for the first summit between the two Western leaders. Churchill noted solicitously that his friend was much exhausted, though he soon recovered enough to fill the spare hours on the five-day crossing playing backgammon with the Prime Minister. Despite seas so rough that the destroyers escorting the battleship were forced to turn back, leaving the Prince of Wales to steam alone to the rendezvous in Placentia Bay at a speed no marauding U-boat could possibly match. The Anglo-American summit took place aboard the cruiser USS Augusta. The two leaders had been in correspondence, 
but it was their first meeting as the heads of their respective governments. Each regarded the other with wary respect. According to Churchill's aide-de-camp, Sir Ian Jacob, their initial conversation had something of the nature of the first meeting between two stags. The two great men wanted to have a good look at each other. They were both aware that aside from a shared abhorrence of Nazism, their priorities did not yet align. Moreover, the balance of power between them was not as even as the cavalcade of military chiefs and government officials accompanying them might have suggested. Churchill's private secretary, John Colville, noted sniffily that his boss had brought with him a retinue which Cardinal Wolsey might have envied. When Hopkins told friends, you'd have thought Winston was being brought up to the heavens to meet God, he was merely giving expression to the fact that the British Prime Minister arrived aboard Augusta as more supplicant than peer. Among the papers Hopkins had carried with him from Washington on his trip to London and Moscow was a one-line aid memoir, which he had jotted down following his pre-departure meeting with Roosevelt. It was blunt and unambiguous. No talk about war. At number 10, Hopkins had made this very clear to the Prime Minister. He was not to raise the issue during the summit. The subject was taboo. Churchill was disinclined to heed this injunction. On his very first evening aboard the US vessel in Placentia Bay, he seized the moment with characteristic chutzpah. At an informal getting-to-know-you session with the Americans, who barely knew their British counterparts, he held forth without restraint. Even Roosevelt's anglophobic son Elliot was captivated by the Prime Minister's artistry. Churchill reared back in his chair, slewed his cigar from cheek to cheek. His hands slashed the air expressively, his eyes flashed. He held the floor that evening, and he talked. Nor were the rest of us silent because we were bored. He held us enthralled. The President listened intently, without once interrupting his guest. Churchill's tour d'horizon was clearly also a tour de force, conveying the clear if unstated message that it would be in the interests of the United States, no less than those of the United Kingdom, to take up the cudgels against Nazi Germany. A short while later, during a conversation with Roosevelt's most senior advisers, he made the point unambiguously, telling them, I would rather have an American declaration of war now and no supplies for six months than double the supplies and no declaration. Churchill's hyperbole reflected the intensity of the sentiment. He knew that without America's direct participation, the challenge of securing Britain's global needs against the threats posed by both the Japanese in the Pacific and the Nazis in Europe was likely to prove insuperable. His purpose at Placentia was therefore to seduce the president into making public commitments that would inevitably draw America openly into war. Roosevelt was sympathetic, but far too wily to succumb. Although he foresaw that in due course, the United States was bound to take up arms against the enemies of freedom and democracy, he was also a cunning politician who recognised that ambiguity and duplicity had crucial roles to play in steering the American voters towards that inevitability. His political antennae were acutely sensitive to the isolationist sentiment that still held sway across the nation and in Congress. According to Churchill, the President explained that he was skating on pretty thin ice in his relations with Congress, and any request for a declaration of war would only produce a long, drawn-out and inconclusive debate. From Roosevelt's standpoint, therefore, the purpose of the Atlantic Conference was merely to alert American opinion to the threat to their own values and interests posed by the Nazis. It was not, as Churchill had hoped it might become, an undertaking to mobilize the United States for war. Both sides had agreed that their summit needed to conclude with an Anglo-American declaration of intent that might form the constitutional basis for the establishment of future global peace and security. Officials on both sides spent three days wrangling over the wording of every line of what was to be called the Atlantic Charter. They drafted and redrafted until on the 12th of August, 
they produced a document to which the two leaders were able to give their approval. The joint declaration was something of a damp squib. The principles it enshrined, which would later form the blueprint for the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, were couched in such innocuous terms as virtually to guarantee universal consent. Only the most purblind dictators would fail to see the cost-free advantages of putting their names to a grandiose statement of intent that could be ignored with impunity. To Churchill's disappointment, Roosevelt refused to commit himself to the establishment of an international organisation to police the post-war order which the Joint Declaration envisaged. However, he managed to draw some comfort from the astonishing fact that the leader of an ostensibly neutral power, the US, had joined with a belligerent state, the UK, to endorse a charter that included a reference to the final destruction of the Nazi tyranny. In truth, these were thin pickings and he knew it. Though he and Roosevelt did their best to promote the global significance of their eight-point charter with their respective electorates, it made little impact. As Eden's private secretary, Oliver Harvey, noted, it was a terribly woolly document full of all the old clichés of the League of Nations. A few days later, the well-connected diarist, Harold Nicholson, observed that the eight points have fallen very flat. The American voter was similarly unmoved. Moreover, the polls, which came as no surprise to Roosevelt, showed that 70% of the public remained stubbornly resistant to the idea that our boys should be sent into battle against the Germans. On his return to London, Churchill tried to rally the nation in a broadcast to the British people. He was at his most mellifluous and grandiloquent, claiming to have returned across the waves, uplifted in spirit, fortified in resolve, as a result of his meeting with our great friend, the President of the United States. He also allowed himself to indulge an unwarranted degree of wishful thinking by interpreting the Atlantic Charter's reference to the final destruction of the Nazi tyranny as a presidential pledge which must be made good. He was therefore cast into gloom when he heard Roosevelt insist firmly and publicly that the United States was not on the brink of declaring war on Germany. If his broadcast was designed to bounce the president into war, it failed lamentably. In a bleak note to Hopkins a few days later, Churchill wrote, The President's many declarations with regard to the United States being no closer to war and having made no commitments have been the cause of concern here in London and in the Cabinet. I don't know what will happen if England is fighting alone when 1942 comes. Neither Hopkins nor Roosevelt was sympathetic though the former did appreciate that the President's often opaque interventions could easily be misinterpreted by a wishful thinker as conveying more than was intended. He was also worried enough by Churchill's gloom to warn Roosevelt that if the British came to believe that the United States had no intention ever of becoming a belligerent, it would be a very critical moment in the war and the British appeasers might have more influence on Churchill. As it was, the Prime Minister's disappointment should have been tempered by knowing that Roosevelt had every intention of steering the United States towards belligerency at his own pace and in his own way. At a meeting of the War Cabinet on his return to London, Churchill reported the President as telling him that he would wage war but not declare it, and that he would become more and more provocative. This was precisely Roosevelt's strategy to advance crabwise towards a confrontation with Germany rather than to make public declarations of belligerency. Nor was the Soviet Union excluded. On the contrary, nearly every significant decision made at Placentia Bay was made behind closed portholes and without any attendant publicity. And almost every one of these decisions related either directly or indirectly to the Soviet Union. Roosevelt's impatience with his officials for the tardy implementation of his commitment to provide the Soviets with aid sprang from a growing sense of urgency. Convinced that Germany's eventual defeat hinged as much, if not more, on the outcome of Operation Barbarossa as on Britain's indomitability, 
he was determined to ensure the delivery of US aid to both allies as swiftly and safely as possible. The principal threat to the provision of this support came from the U-boats prowling the Atlantic in search of merchant convoys to sink. Nothing was now more important to him than combating this menace. If, in the process, he were to engineer a confrontation with the U-boats in the Atlantic, for which the blame could be pinned on German aggression, he was confident he could secure the approval of Congress to accelerate the preparations for war without laying himself open to the charge of war-mongering. Even before Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, Roosevelt had unilaterally, in April 1941, extended the geographical boundaries of the US security zone in the Atlantic well beyond the Western Hemisphere as far out as longitude 26 degrees west, a north-south line on the chart between Greenland and the Azores and some 2,600 miles from the American coastline. Within that vast expanse, U.S. air and maritime patrols were charged to monitor the movement of hostile vessels and alert the Royal Navy to any perceived threat to the Allied convoys. At the Atlantic Conference, he went much further. In a private meeting aboard Augusta, he told his military and naval advisers that as from the 1st of September, U.S. warships would be required to escort any merchant convoys through the hazardous seas between the Atlantic seaboard and Iceland, which was the stop-off on the main sea route from the United States to Britain and the Soviet Union. This was tantamount to warning Berlin that an attempt to sink any vessel in such a convoy between the United States and Iceland would be treated as an act of aggression against the United States. All he needed was a pretext to provoke such an act. He soon found it. On the 4th of September, a German U-boat, under strict orders from Hitler to avoid attacking any U.S. vessel, was goaded into attacking the USS Greer. The U.S. warship escaped unscathed, but the president seized on the incident to deliver a fireside chat in which he ridiculed the tender whisperings of appeasers that Hitler is not interested in the Western Hemisphere, and insisted that this skirmish in the Atlantic represented one determined step towards creating a permanent world system based on force, on terror, and on murder. As righteous as it was disingenuous, his performance was vintage Roosevelt. While insisting that the United States did not seek a shooting war with Hitler, he advised his listeners that henceforth, if any German or Italian vessels of war enter the waters the protection of which is necessary for American defence, they do so at their own peril. This shoot-on-sight policy, as it became known, was the logical escalation of the plan he had hatched with his officials during the Atlantic Conference. His fireside chat was an unofficial, not de jure but de facto, declaration of a not-so-phony war. It could only hearten both London and Moscow. Stalin had even greater cause to be gratified by another decision reached in the seclusion of Placentia Bay. Although neither Churchill nor Roosevelt made any public reference to the memorandum drafted by Cripps and endorsed by Hopkins at their meeting in Moscow, it had landed in the President's intray at an opportune moment. Unlike Churchill, who had no choice but to endorse what he described begrudgingly as the arrival of Russia as a welcome guest at a hungry table, Roosevelt was genuinely committed to providing the Soviet Union with as much materiel as his arsenal of democracy could provide. Churchill had to conceal his pique at the thought that every piece of weaponry dispatched to the Soviet Union was one less for Britain. On the 14th of August, using Cripps's draft almost verbatim, the two Western leaders sent their first joint message to Stalin, describing the long and hard path to be traversed before there can be that complete victory without which our efforts and sacrifices would be in vain, and warning that our resources, though immense, are limited, and it must become a question of where and when those can best be used to further the greatest extent of our common effort, they proposed a meeting which should be held in Moscow, to which we would send high representatives who could discuss these matters directly with you. 
Stalin was elated and gave his ready consent to the suggestion. He would have been even happier if he had been privy to the private letter that the President sent to his Secretary of War Stimson at the end of August. I deem it to be of paramount importance for the safety and security of America, he wrote, that all reasonable munitions help be provided for Russia, not only immediately, but as long as she continues to fight the Axis powers effectively. I am convinced that substantial and comprehensive commitments must be made. It was a transformative moment in the relationship between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union, from which can be traced a flow of events that would shape the course of the Second World War and the fate of the Third Reich. Chapter 15. Disarray on the Soviet Front In his meeting with Hopkins, Stalin may have spoken with unparalleled frankness, but he had been decidedly economical with the truth. His measured and cautiously optimistic account of the Red Army's prowess on the battlefield was belied by the facts and by his own agitated response to a growing crisis at the front. More especially, but not surprisingly, he made no mention of his stormy encounter with his chief of staff on the very day of the American envoy's arrival in Moscow. Summoned to the Kremlin on the 30th of July, Zhukov laid out his maps before Stalin and the ever-attentive and always sinister political commissar Lev Meklis. His appreciation of the Red Army's predicament was candid. He did not disguise the scale of Soviet losses or the weakness of the reserve forces at his command. He was in the midst of predicting where the next German thrust might threaten when he was interrupted by Meklis who, in his silkily subversive fashion, asked on what basis he had derived his assessment. Not unreasonably, the chief of staff replied that he was unaware of the enemy's plans, but his conclusions were drawn from a considered analysis of the enemy's current deployments. Stalin prompted him to continue. Zhukov did not hold back. The Soviet armies were under severe pressure at the most dangerous and weakest sector of our line. The Central Front. What do you suggest? Stalin demanded. Again, unlike most of his peers, Zhukov did not hesitate to speak his mind. Three armies, two from the Southern Front and another from the Headquarters Reserve protecting the approaches to Moscow, should be redeployed to plug the gap. Pressed brusquely by Stalin, he explained that this would not weaken the capital's defences, as at least eight divisions could be summoned from the Far East as replacements. Stalin interjected roughly, and hand over the Far East to the Japanese. Zhukov was not to be deflected, but insisted that forces on the southwestern front protecting Kiev should be withdrawn from their positions east of the river Dnieper, and that five divisions be moved from there to support the southern edges of the central front. Stalin became belligerent. And what about Kiev in that case? The chief of staff retorted, that the appropriate tactical move would be to allow the city to fall. Stalin erupted. You're talking rubbish. At this, Zhukov became incensed. If Stalin really believed that that was so, he shot back angrily. Then he should be relieved of his post and sent to fight at the front. Stalin did not back off. Telling him to calm down, he sneered. Since you mention it, we will get by without you. After further heated argument, Zhukov gathered up his maps and stalked out. Forty minutes later, Stalin summoned him back, but only to tell him formally that he was indeed to be released from his post. He would take command of the reserve front armies where, Stalin told him mockingly, he was to plan a counterattack on the salient at Yelnia, fifty kilometres southeast of Smolensk, which the chief of staff had identified as a likely launch pad for the next stage of the German assault on the capital. As Stalin would soon discover, far from speaking rubbish, Zhukov had been spot on. The Red Army's predicament was acute, with Army Group North approaching Leningrad's outer defences from the south, and seven Finnish infantry divisions advancing towards the city's northern suburbs. The Northern Front's four Soviet armies under General Popov were in mounting disarray. Leningrad was clearly going to be besieged, and might even be encircled. 
At the other end of the 3,000-kilometer front, Army Group South's armies had advanced relentlessly through eastern Ukraine and despite suicidally brave counterattacks by the Soviet infantry, were poised to cross the Dnieper. Like Leningrad, Kiev too was threatened by encirclement. It was no better on the Central Front. As both Zhukov and Timoshenko were aware, Box armies, though themselves wearied by the stubborn resistance of the Soviet troops, were exacting a fearful toll in lives and military hardware. At the outbreak of war, Vasily Grossman, already renowned as writer and novelist, was seconded to the Red Army newspaper Krasnaya Zevda, Red Star, to serve as a special correspondent. He was disappointed to have been turned down for active duty, although as he was both short-sighted and distinctly overweight, his rejection was perhaps not surprising. Since this forcibly liberated him to become the finest chronicler of the Nazi-Soviet campaign, however, it was to prove an invaluable reprieve. Grossman was not only intrepid, but also astonishingly careless of his own safety. His determination to play a full part in the great patriotic war was assuredly influenced by his intense anxiety and guilt about his mother, who had been trapped in the Ukrainian city of Berdichev by the invading German troops. On the 5th of August, after repeatedly pressuring his editor, he was finally allowed to head for the town of Gomel, 560 kilometers southwest of Moscow, where Pavlov's replacement, Yeremenko, had set up his Western Front headquarters after his forced withdrawal from Minsk. Grossman, who was 35, was accompanied by two younger war-hardened colleagues who had been deputed by his editor to look after the eminent writer. Grossman was a humane and gifted observer who rarely missed a telling detail. At Bryansk, where they had to change trains, Grossman noted that every corner of the railway station was filled with Red Army soldiers. Many of them are badly dressed in rags. They have already been there. Abkhazians from the North Caucasus look the worst. Many of them are barefoot. On the next stage of their journey, the three men had a disconcerting encounter with a female nurse who used her boots and her fists to try to force them off the steps of a train steaming at full speed, shouting, Jump off this second! It is forbidden to travel on hospital trains! She did not succeed. In Gomel, they were welcomed by an air raid siren. Once the bombs had fallen and the planes had left, Grossman went for a stroll. What sadness there is in this quiet green town, in these sweet public gardens, in its old people sitting on the benches, its sweet girls walking along the streets. Children are playing in the piles of sand brought here to extinguish incendiary bombs. The Germans are less than 50 kilometers away, he noted. At Yeremenko's headquarters, he was told by the chief of the front's political department, Brigade Commissar Kozlov, that the military council was very alarmed by the news that had just reached them. Roslavl, only 150 kilometers to the northwest, had just fallen to Guderian's panzers. Already the mere mention of that name sent a frisson of fear throughout the Soviet high command. His pre-war book, Achtung, Achtung, in which he'd assiduously promoted and exaggerated his own contribution to revolutionary ideas about modern tank warfare, had been widely read by military strategists across Europe. Their successful application of the Blitzkrieg through the Low Countries and France, as well as on Soviet soil during the previous six weeks, had given Guderian near-mythical status. The capture of Roslavl appeared to be one more milestone on his way to Moscow. Grossman's gloom and disillusion were not dispelled by picking up a copy of the Brigade newspaper to read its leading article, The Much-Battered Enemy Continued on His Cowardly Advance. Accompanied by one of his colleagues, Oleg Noring, Grossman was driven to a military airfield outside Gomel, where the 103rd Red Army Aviation Fighter Division was based. On the way, they passed wagons, carts and peasants retreating from the German bombardment. He arrived in one village that seemed to be full of peace, nice, calm village life with children playing and old people and women sitting on benches until suddenly three German bombers appeared overhead. 
Bombs exploded, screams, red flames with white smoke. Grossman himself came under fire and hurried to hide on the edge of a cemetery. Some nearby soldiers, digging a grave for a fallen colleague, rushed to hide in a ditch. This displeased the officer in charge. The lieutenant shouts, Carry on digging, otherwise we won't finish until evening. They ignore him. Everyone runs in different directions. Only the dead signaller is lying full length, and machine guns are chattering above him. At the airbase, where many buildings had been destroyed, he was impressed by the bravado of a young pilot. I've shot down a Junkers 88 for the motherland, the pilot told Grossman, adding, There's no anxiety, but anger, fury, and when you see he's on fire, light comes into your soul. Who's going to turn away? Him or me? I am not going to. I have become a single hole with the plane and don't feel anything any longer. Bravado went hand in hand with self-delusion. The regiment's commander, Nikolai Nemtsevich, wanted Grossman to believe that no German aircraft had appeared over his airbase for ten days. His explanation for this was categorical. The Germans have no fuel. The Germans have no aircraft. They have all been shot down. Grossman was dryly impressed. I've never heard such a speech. What optimism! This trait of character is both good and harmful at the same time. But at any rate, he'll never make a strategist. That night, he was put up in a large, empty, multi-story building at the airbase. It was deserted, dark, frightening and sad. Hundreds of women and children were living here a short time ago families of pilots. He did not sleep easy. At one point he was woken by a frightening low humming and went outside. Squadrons of German bombers were flying eastwards over our heads. Evidently, those very ones Nemtsevich spoke about during the day, the ones he said had no fuel and were destroyed. The Soviet pilots raced to their aircraft. Grossman described the roar of engines starting up dust and wind, Aircraft went up into the sky one after another, circled and flew away, and immediately the airfield became empty and silent, like a classroom where the pupils have skipped away. Later they returned. The lead aircraft had human flesh stuck in the radiator. That's because the supporting aircraft had hit a truck with ammunition that blew up at the moment the leader was flying over it. Popper, the leader, is picking the meat out with a file. They summon a doctor who examines the bloody mass attentively and pronounced it Aryan meat. Everyone laughs. Yes, a pitiless time, a time of iron has come. The laughter did not last long. A few days later, Grossman was forced to join the flight from Gomel, which fell soon after to Guderian's panzers. A little further to the north, Nikolai Amozov, the army surgeon, was setting up his field hospital in the village of Zudri, a mere eight kilometres from Roslavl. The staff of Field Hospital 226 had travelled 180 kilometres over six days with 22 horse-drawn carts carrying their equipment as well as those nurses who were unable to walk because their blisters were too severe or because they had not been provided with boots. The medical team was stoical. We only drive on small dirt roads as we want to avoid bombings and vehicles. We don't even know the news as we have no radio. We sleep on the ground. We fall asleep in the evening, but the cold wakes us at night. The nights are so terribly cold, Amosov noted. They only realised how close they were to the front when they began to see Red Army soldiers, artillery and ammunition trucks. At one point, Amosov went forward to find out what was happening. He found confusion and contradiction. There is fighting in Roslavl. Our men are defending the line ten kilometres west of Roslavl. The Germans have broken through and are pushing forward. It is scary. And, don't you see, Roslavl is on fire. As dusk fell, Amozov and his team reached the main highway. They saw soldiers setting up their artillery and firing in the direction of the smoke. Obeying his original orders, which had dispatched them to a front that, though they did not yet know it, had already fallen, and Mozov continued along the highway towards Roslavl. The road was crowded with vehicles. An officer in a command truck stopped them. Show me your map and the order, he demanded. He read it briefly 
and then instructed, Turn around and go back as fast as you can. In his confusion, Amozov stood in silence. Come on, I give the orders. I am responsible. I am Colonel Tikhonov. Is that clear? Field Hospital 226 duly turned to retreat eastward until they had reached the village of Sukhinichi, twenty kilometres down the road. There they pitched camp and set up a dressing station. As they were doing so, bombs started to fall nearby. A nurse rushed in. The wounded are here, she shouted. Three trucks packed with injured soldiers drove into the compound. Here they are, Amozov noted. Sunken cheeks, dirty, most of them in their tunics, no greatcoats. Slit sleeves or trouser legs. Most of them have fresh bandages. Many of them are falling asleep while leaning against the wall or on the floor. We take them to the bathhouse. The hot water evidently raised their spirits. There are smiles and even jokes. Comrade military doctor, thanks for the banya. I've not washed since I was in the reserve regiment. On another part of the same front, the young political commissar Nikolai Moskvin was in a very different state of mind. Three weeks earlier, he had shot his first deserter. Maddened by the accumulating terror of shelling, lack of sleep and long retreating marches, the soldier suddenly took it upon himself to urge his comrades to lay down their arms. He came up to Moskvin. He made a salute to, I suppose, Hitler, shouldered his rifle and walked off towards the scrub. Red Army Private Shulyak brought him down with a bullet in the back. The man fell to the ground. They'll kill the lot of you, the soldier swore, before looking up at Moskvin to spit out, and you, you blood-stained commissar, they'll hang you first. Trained to be ruthless, the commissar took out his revolver and fired into the writhing body. The boys understood. A dog's death for a dog. It was a duty, not a pleasure. Stalin's reaction to reports that large numbers of troops were either deserting the front or surrendering prompted him to a characteristic response. On the 16th of August, he issued Order No. 270. In leaden and repetitive language, he began by commending those commanders who had behaved courageously and sometimes heroically in leading their men out of one or another of the encirclements. Among others, he singled out the deputy commander of the Western Front, General Boldin, who had led more than a thousand men not only out of the encirclement at Bialystok, but also eastwards behind enemy lines until they managed to rejoin the main force 45 days later near Smolensk. In the course of this epic venture, Stalin noted, they destroyed the headquarters of two German regiments, 26 tanks, 1,049 passenger vehicles, transport vehicles and staff cars, 147 motorcycles, five batteries of artillery, four mortars, 15 machine guns, one aeroplane at the airport, and a bomb arsenal. Even if the figures Stalin gave were suspiciously precise, there was no doubt that it had been an heroic achievement. But there had also been shameful acts of surrender, and certain generals had been a bad example to our troops. Among these, he cited the commander of the 28th Army, Lieutenant General Vladimir Kachalov, whose troops were encircled at Smolensk. According to Stalin, Kachalov had showed cowardice and surrendered to the German fascists, choosing thereby to defect to the enemy. Although this accusation was entirely false, Kachalov had in fact been killed in action. He was in absentia, posthumously sentenced to death. Stalin also singled out Major General Pavel Ponidelin, the commander of the 12th Army during the defence of Kiev. Along with the 6th Army, Ponidelin's troops had been trapped on open ground to the west of the Dnieper at Uman by the overwhelming firepower of Rundstedt's Army Group South. On the 1st of August, after repeated attempts by both Soviet armies to break out, Ponidelin sent a message to the Southern Front Command, which was copied to Stalin. The situation has become critical. The encirclement of the 6th and 12th armies is completed. There are no reserves. There is no ammunition. The fuel is running out. By the 6th of August, Runstead's troops had closed the noose so tightly that both armies were under artillery fire on all sides, 
from a distance of no more than ten kilometres. Rather than being mown down where they stood, a hundred thousand Soviet troops surrendered. Instead of falling on his sword, Ponidelin allowed himself to be taken prisoner when his tank was hit by enemy fire. By deserting to the enemy, he had, in Stalin's book, committed the crime against the country of breaking a military oath. Order number 270 continued, Can we put up with the Red Army cowards, deserters who surrender themselves to the enemy as prisoners, or their craven superiors, who at the first hitch at the front tear off their insignia and desert to the rear? No, we cannot. There followed a list of punishments for such criminals. In future, they would be considered as malicious deserters who should be shot on the spot, while their families would be arrested for this betrayal of their homeland. All encircled units and formations were to selflessly fight to the last. Any unit that prefers to become a prisoner would be destroyed by all means possible on land and air, and their families deprived of public benefits and assistance. The practice of punishing a soldier's family by withholding his pension and other entitlements was not new, but as Catherine Merridale has pointed out, the prospect of imprisonment in a system where even a child's schooling depended on a family's collective honour in official eyes was peculiarly harsh. One of the cruelest side effects of these vindictive measures was the Kafka-esque ruling that those who were missing in action, whether they had been shot down over rivers and marshes, blown to pieces or gnawed away by rats, were, like those who surrendered, to be treated as malicious deserters, with similar consequences for their families. So that no one could be in doubt about its meaning, Stalin instructed that Order No. 270 be read out in full to all companies, squadrons, batteries, teams and staffs. The promulgation of these regulations was a mark not only of Stalin's merciless nature, but also of his deepening fear that the Soviet Union was in extreme peril. If the nation's soldiers were not inspired by patriotism to choose a suicidal death on the battlefield, then they would be terrorised into doing their duty for the motherland. was another means of instilling terror into any soldiers contemplating surrender. It was just as potent and entirely beyond Stalin's ability to control. It was the growing awareness of what would happen to you if you fell into enemy hands. Commissar Moskvin found this out by chance, soon after he had dutifully executed a deserter, a dog's death for a dog, when his unit came under fierce attack once again. This time, Virtually the entire regiment was annihilated. Moskvin and two comrades found themselves alone in the forest. Moskvin was seriously wounded and despairing. Unable to sleep and fearful of gangrene, he nonetheless found the strength to make a note in his diary. I am on the verge of a complete moral collapse. I feel guilty because I am helpless and because I know I should pull myself together. In the event, the men were found by a group of peasants who evidently thought that once they had recuperated, they could be put to work in their fields. It was then that Moskvin met the first of several Soviet soldiers he would encounter who had escaped the Nazi prison camps. He was horrified by what he was told. 
they say there's no shelter, no water, that people are dying from hunger and disease, that many are without proper clothes or shoes. They're treated like slaves, shot for the slightest misdemeanour, or just from mischief, for a kind of fun. This was not an exaggeration. The word soon spread, as thousands of their comrades had already discovered, to be taken prisoner, herded onto a train or frog-marched into captivity, was to suffer a fate equally bad as, if not worse than, being killed on the battlefield. On paper, the prisoner of war camps were coated with a veneer of traditional military propriety. They were given official designations. The Dulag, transit camp, the Stalag, for enlisted men and non-commissioned officers, and the Offlag, for officers. In reality, these distinctions were meaningless. Had the German high command chosen to treat their prisoners according to the minimal standards required by the prevailing 1929 Geneva Conventions, they would have been obliged to provide housing conditions similar to those used by the belligerents' own soldiers in base camps, along with food of a similar quality to that of the belligerents' own soldiers, adequate clothing, medical facilities. If they died, they were to be honourably buried in clearly marked graves. None of these rights was either available or even considered by the Nazis, who chose to argue that since Moscow had failed to sign up to the Geneva Conventions, their standards did not apply to Soviet POWs. The three grades of prisoner camp were thus as indistinguishable from each other as they were from the surrounding terrain. Facilities were rudimentary or non-existent. There were few medical supplies or health clinics. Latrines, if they existed, were holes dug on open ground. There was little or no shelter. Prisoners very often had to sleep in the ragged remains of their uniforms in temperatures that could fall well below freezing at night. Most cruelly of all, there was very little food. The provision of starvation rations dovetailed neatly with the hunger plan, which foresaw the deaths of millions of subhuman Slavs, but in the case of the POW camps, only fortuitously so. It was not so much by design as from indifference that the German high command presided over the deaths of millions of Soviet soldiers held in captivity. The daily calorie intake mandated by the OKH was well below the levels required for survival. In one characteristic camp, each prisoner was allocated a daily ration of two bowls of watery cabbage soup and one pound of bread. Hot water, not tea, was available at breakfast. These rations were provided only to those with the strength to work as slave labour. Their death from starvation was thus postponed for a little longer than for their weaker peers. In August 1941, Following the encirclement at Uman, between 15,000 and 20,000 wounded Soviet soldiers lay in the open at one camp. Benno Zeisa was among the guards set over them. He noted, Nearly every day we had men die of exhaustion. The others would take their dead back to camp to bury them. They would take turns carrying corpses. The camp graveyard was very large. The number of men under the ground must have been greater than that of those still among the living. At another collection point nearby, 8,000 prisoners were herded into a compound designed to hold between 500 and 800 men. The heat was extreme, and so was their hunger. One day, a group of prisoners decided to make a run for the perimeter fence in the forlorn hope of escaping this torment. Soon afterwards, one of the guards, Leo Mellart, heard the sound of heavy-caliber gunfire, followed by shouts and cries of terror. The shooting was directed at a grain silo in which a number of prisoners had been locked up following the thwarted attempt to escape. When the guns stopped firing, he recalled, the body count was between 1,000 and 1,500 men, killed or severely wounded. Sometimes, starving men were driven to extreme measures to survive. One week in August, Hans Becker, a young NCO, was instructed to go to the prisoner of war camp in the town of Dubno, the scene of a major tank battle during the first week of the invasion. Becker had believed himself to be fighting against 
a uniformly brutish and impoverished people nearer to beasts than men who fought like a pack of hungry wolves. It was his first visit to the camp, where he was under instructions to find twenty men who were strong enough to join a working party. The prisoners were housed in what had previously been a school. The first room I entered was large and bare. The prisoners in it were Mongols. The atmosphere, lacking light, was murky and sinister, and what air there was had become indescribably offensive. I gulped and was nearly sick. It was a pigsty, except that all the pigs I had ever seen had been far cleaner than these men. Becker knew that people would find it hard to believe what he witnessed in that room, but later, by which time his disgust for the enemy had turned to remorse and horror at the brutalities inflicted on Barbarossa's victims, he wrote, If truth sits on the lips of dying men, as we are told, it sits on mine. As he peered into the gloom, he heard a savage scream. He watched as a whirling mass of bodies staggered through the gloom, grunting, biting, and tearing at each other. A figure was hurled onto a plank bed, and I realized that they were all attacking one man. They were gouging his eyes out, twisting his arms right off, and tearing the flesh from his bones with their nails. He was knocked down and literally torn apart. Becker tried to intervene, but to no effect. As the famished men began to tear at their victim's flesh, he called for a guard, but no one came. He rushed out to find the camp's commanding officer, who simply shrugged, saying, Tell us something new. This happens every day. We stopped worrying about it a long time ago. For Becker's benefit, a Russian prisoner, who spoke a little German, explained that the Mongols had a code word, which was used as a command. When this was spoken, Becker wrote, they all pounced on the one who had previously been selected to provide the day's meat ration. He would be murdered so that the rest of them could stave off for another day the hunger which their scanty camp food could not satisfy. By the end of August, some 800,000 Soviet soldiers had been taken prisoner. Within a few months, their number would swell to more than three million. Of these, only a million survived. Of the rest, some 600,000 died from exposure, starvation and disease. The remainder would be executed.